Hi, welcome to the Corp Mavs Ultimate GCSE Foundation Revision video. In this video, I'm going to go through every single topic on the GCSE Foundation Mavs course. And the aim is to spend two or three minutes on each one of those topics to make sure you're familiar with anything that you can encounter. Now, this video is going to be really useful for you if you've got upcoming exams. So if you've got your GCSE Mavs Foundation papers coming up, this will be a really useful video for you. Also be useful for anyone who just wants to brush up on the math skills. Now, as I said, I spent two or three minutes going through every single topic, so it's quite a long video. So you may want to watch it in chunks, or you may want to make notes as you go through and watch the video. As well as the video, I've made a booklet, and I'll talk more about that later, but I've made a booklet, and that booklet has a question every single topic that I cover. And I think there's nearly 400 questions in that booklet, so it's going to be really useful for you to try that booklet as you go through and watch in the video or at the end. So let's have a look at the topic. So these are all the topics that I'm going to cover in this video. And in red, we've got the number or the ratio and proportion topics. So these are the topics I'm going to go through first. So topics such as words and figures, your operations, place value, square numbers, product of primes, order and fractions, fractions, decimals, percentages, compound interest, reverse percentages, proportion, best buys, topics like that. Then in green, we have got our geometry, our shape, space, and measures topics. So topics such as angle, symmetry, your volume, area, speed, transformations, trigonometry, Pythagoras, topics such as those. Then we're going to go through in blue the algebra topics. So there's topics such as substitution, equations, factorizing, expanding brackets, drawing straight line graphs, the equation of a line, quadratics, the nth term, changing the subject, simultaneous equations, topics like those. And then in orange, we're going to go through the topics that are the statistics or the probability topics. So your bar charts, pictograms, frequency trees, pie charts, scatter graphs. Then we've got our averages, our estimated mean, Venn diagrams, probabilities, topics like those. So we're going to go through all of these topics. So all these topics are the topics you need to know for your GCSE foundation maths. There are one or two subtle differences between the exam boards, not much in terms of the topics they're pretty much identical in terms of the three exam boards and the only two topics that i can think of are stem leaf diagrams and frequency polygons where one of the exam board covers them and the other two don't but for the sake of two or three minutes i think it's worthwhile watching them and it's good practice for the average and range anyway so i'm going to go through all of these topics and as i said i'm going to spend about two or three minutes going through each of them so what i'd recommend you do is you watch this video and if you need any extra help on any one of these topics you've got the video tutorial on corporate miles which can help you and this revision checklist will be really useful for you it's in the description below and I'd recommend that you print it, you keep it in your notes, or even stick it on your wall at home. Now, as I've said, this is a company and booklet. So I've called it the Ultimate GCSE Foundation Revision Question Booklet. Very catchy title, I know. But in that booklet, there's a question on every single topic as we go through this video, and they're in the same order. So that booklet would be really useful for you. And there's a QR code which brings you to this video, the revision video, and there's a QR code that brings you to the answers. So that booklet would be really useful for you to practice what you're watching in the video. Now, in this video, as I go through each one of the topics, I do some Sometimes you use the Corp Mouse revision cards and I take some of the information or I just use the whole card. These revision cards will be perfect for you whenever you're revising for your GCSE Mavs. So if you are interested in those, there's a link to them in the description below, but they're perfect to go alongside the video and that other booklet that will, that will really help you with your GCSE Mavs revision. As well as the revision cards, I'd highly recommend our five a days. Rather than cramming your revision just before the exams, a little and often approach is fantastic. And if you're revising for your foundation exams, I'd highly recommend the orange foundation books and the yellow foundation plus books. And those two books will be perfect because they give you five questions for every single day of the year. And that little and often approach will build your confidence. But let's have a look at our first topic. So our first topic is words and figures. Now, every single topic we go through in this video, in the top right hand corner, we have got our video numbers. So if after you watch the video you want to try some practice questions you can go to corpmavs.com forward slash contents and you can scroll down to video 362 and 363 and there's some practice questions so you can see lots of questions on this topic and there's also the video tutorial if you need any extra help there's that video for you as well so as i said i'm going to spend two or three minutes going through each of the topics but if you need a longer tutorial the video tutorial is there for you as well so our first topic is words and figures so our first question says write 6840 in words so whenever we're writing figure in words we write down what we say so it's six thousand eight hundred and forty so we would write that down we would write down six thousand comma eight hundred and forty and that's it and if you want to write words in figures you write down what you read so if we seen six thousand eight hundred and forty we would write that down Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Well, our next topic is actually four topics, and they are addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and they are operations, and it's very important that you can carry out written methods for those. So let's have a look at addition. So we've got 381 
plus 64. And I'm just lining the numbers up in columns. So we've got the ones or the units, the tens, and then the hundreds. So let's line them up and then let's start with the right hand side, the ones, and let's add those. One plus four is equal to five. 8 plus 6 is equal to 14, so let's put our 4 down and carry our 1. And 3 plus 1 is equal to 4. So 381 plus 64 would be 445. Okay, let's have a look at subtraction. So we've got 514, take away 175. So again, lining them up in hundreds, tens, and ones or units. And we're going to subtract them. So we're going to do 4 take away 5. Well, we can't do that, so we're going to borrow. So we'll borrow from the 1 and call that a 0. Now we've got 14. So we've got 14 take away 5, that's equal to 9. 0 take away 7, again, we can't do that, so we're going to borrow. So we'll cross that out and call it a 4, and then that's 10. 10 take away 7 is equal to 3, and 4 take away 1 is equal to 3. So the answer would be 339. So it's very important you can do these written methods for addition and subtraction. Now let's have a look at multiplication and division. So multiplication, so we've got 83 multiplied by 29, so we've got 83 multiplied by 29. And we're just going to line them up like this, and I'm going to use the column method for multiplication, so I'm going to multiply 83 by 9. And then going to do 83 times 20 and then add them together. So let's do 83 times 9 to begin with. So 9 times 3 is equal to 27. So let's put our 7 down and carry our 2. And then 9 times 8 is equal to 72 plus 2 is equal to 74. So if we do 83 times 9, the answer would be 747. Now we're going to do 83 multiplied by 20. So let's put our 0 down and we're going to do 2 times 3 is equal to 6. So put our 6 down. And 2 times 8 is equal to 16. So 16. And now we just need to add these together. 7 plus 0 is equal to 7. 4 plus 6 is equal to 10. Put our 0 down. Carry our 1. 7 plus 6 is equal to 13, plus 1 is equal to 14, put our 4 down, carry our 1, and finally 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. So 83 multiplied by 29 will be equal to 2,407. Now let's have a look at division. So we've got 1,032 divided by 6. So we've got 1,032, and then we've got our bus shelter divided by 6. So we say how many 6s go into 1? That's 0, remainder 1. How many 6s go into 10? Well, there's 1 6 in 10, remainder 4. How many 6s go into 43? Well, that's 7, because 7 times 6 is 42. So that's 7, remainder 1, because 42, the remainder would be 1. And finally, how many 6s go into 12? The answer would be 2. So 1,032 divided by 6 is equal to 172. And that's it. So we've gone through addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. And if you need a video tutorial on any of those topics, they're found here. And also remember, in that bumper booklet, you've got a question in each of those, or you've got a few questions in each of those, so feel free to do those now if you want to as well. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is order of operations. Now whenever you're given something to work out it's very important that everyone works it out in the same way and sometimes on social media you'll see these questions and people are answering it in different ways and they're getting different answers and a lot of the time it just depends on this order of operations. Now the video is 211 on corporate maths. Now some people call it bod mass, some people call it bid mass, um, you know, it's got different names. I tend to call it order of operations. Um, I just remember there's an order, like a hierarchy. It starts off with any brackets. So you look for any brackets. Then you look for any orders or indices. And that's like a, that's a, a sort of sounds complicated, but it's just anything with a squared or a cubed or a square root. Then you look for any divisions and multiplications, and they're of the same importance. So if you've got a question which has divisions and multiplications only, you work from left to right. And finally, you work out any additions or subtractions. And they're again of the same importance as each other. So if you've got a question which has just additions and subtractions, you work from left to right. So let's have a look at our first question. So our first question says, work out 5 plus 10 multiplied by 2. Now, whenever I'm looking at this, the first thing I'm looking for is any brackets. No. Then I'm looking for any squares or cubes or square roots. No. Then I'm looking for any divisions or multiplications. Yes, we've got this 10 multiplied by 2. That means we need to do 10 multiplied by 2 first. So 10 multiplied by 2 is 20. So this is 20. So I'm going to write 20, and I'm just going to write it directly beneath the 10 multiplied by 2. But in front of that, we still had 5 plus. So I'm going to write 5 plus. And we've got 5 plus 20, and 5 plus 20 is equal to 25. Okay, let's have a look at our next example. So our next question says, work out 2 plus 8 squared. So again, we're going to look for any brackets. No. Then we're going to look for any orders. That's your powers, your squares, your cubes, your square roots. As you can see, there's a squared there. So we're going to work out that first of all. We're going to work out 8 squared. 
Now, later on in the video, we're going to go through squares. So if you haven't got that far, you, you know, you might want to come back to this and if whenever you've done that. But squared means to multiply by itself. So we're going to do 8 squared. Well, that's 8 times 8, which is equal to 64. And we write it directly beneath it, so 64. And we still have the 2 plus in front, so 2 plus 64. And 2 plus 64 is equal to 66. And that's it. So it's very important you follow the correct order of operation. OK, let's have a look at our next topic. OK, it's very important that you know how to round numbers. So our first question says round 235 to the nearest 100. And this is the Corp Miles Revision card. So we're rounding 235 to the nearest 100. So because 235 is in between 200 and 300, so our answer will either be 200 or 300. So if we consider where it is on the number line, we've got 250 in the middle, and 235 would be below 250. So 235 on the number line would be somewhere like here. So that means that it's closer to 200 than it is to 300. Now, some people would just like if you round into the nearest hundred, they would look in the tens column and see it's a three. And because that's below 250, below the five, that means you round down. So if the number in the tens column is a zero, a one, a two, a three, or a four, you would round down here. If it was a five, a six, a seven, an eight, or a nine, you would round up. But I tend to just think what's in the middle of 200 and 300, because we know it's in between 200 and 300, which is 250, that's below it, so we're going to round down. OK, our next question. Our next question says round 7,680 to the nearest thousand. So because it's to the nearest thousand, it's either going to be 7,000 or 8,000 because that's the two thousands that's in between. So we've got a number line here between 7,000 and 8,000. In the middle would be 7,500, and that number is clearly above it. So it would look something like this, where the number is above 7,500. So that means that our number is closer to 8,000 than it is to 7,000. So the answer would be... 8,000. Again, another way to look at it is because we're rounding to the nearest thousand, we would look in the hundreds column. We've got a six there, which means we round up, so the answer would be 8,000. And finally, it's important to be able to round to decimal places as well. So we're going to round 5.18 to one decimal place. So we've got 5.1 and 5.2 because 5.18 would be in between 5.1 and 5.2. So we want to figure out if 5.18 is closer to 5.1 or 5.2. Well, in the middle would be 5.15. So 5.18 is much closer to 5.2 than it is to 5.1. So the answer would be 5.2. And again, because we're rounding to one decimal place, we could have just looked at the second decimal place, which is an 8, which then would tell us that we're going to round up, so it's going to be 5.2. To be able to round to one significant figure, uh, it's quite useful for estimation as well. And we've got some numbers here. This is, again, the core maps revision card, and we've got our number, 394, 1,273, and so on. And we're going to round each of these numbers to one significant figure. So rounding to one significant figure, well, it makes the number much more easier to deal with because it's just going to be one number followed by zeros. So if we had 394, that's closer to 400 than it is to 300. So the answer would just be 400. We've got 1,273, where well, we're allowed just one number followed by zero. So we're either going to have 1,000 or 2,000. This is closer to 1,000, so the answer would just be 1,000. Then we've got 7,961. So again, we're allowed just one number followed by zero. So we could have 7,000 or 8,000. This is closer to 8,000. So to one significant figure, we would have 8,000. And again, like with rounding, some people, if you're rounding to one significant figure, they look at the second digit and they figure if it's five or above, you round up. If it's four or below, you round down. So here we've got 394. The second significant figure is the second digit. So that's the nine. So we round up to 400. 1,273. Well, the second significant figure, the second digit is a two. So we round down to 1,000. 7,961, the second significant figure is a 9, so we're rounding up. OK, let's have a look at our next one. So our next one's a decimal number, and whenever we're dealing with significant figures and decimals, you ignore the naught points and so on, all the zeros at the front, and you're looking for the first digit that's not a zero whenever it's a decimal number. So we've got 0.618. So our first significant figure here would be the 6, you ignore the zero, and our second one would be a 1. Because it's a 1, it's below. Four, it's 4 below, so you round down, so it's going to be 0 0.6. Another way to look at it would be, if you're 0 0.618, it's either going to be 0 0.6 or 0 0.7. This is closer to 0 0.6, so the answer would be 0 0.6. OK, let's have a look at our last one. So our last one, we've got 20.501. Because we've got a 2 at the front, that's significant. And then that's our first significant figure. And then it's followed by zeros. So that would be significant. It's only not significant if it's at the front, the zeros. So like here, it was 0 point, so we just ignored that and look at the 6. But here we had our 2, so that's, that's significant. That's our first one. Second one, 
third one, fourth one, and fifth one. So we want to round it to one significant figure. So we just want one number followed by zeros. So this number is 20.501. So to one significant figure, you could have 20 or 30. This is much closer to 20. So our answer would be 20. 20. So we've now looked at how to round numbers to one significant figure, but we may want to be a little bit more accurate sometimes. So we may want to round our answers to two significant figures or three significant figures and so on. So let's have a look and see how we would round numbers, the same numbers, to two significant figures. So let's have a look at our first one. So we've got 394. So we want two significant figures. So for this number, that would mean we would want two digits and then followed by zeros. So our options would either be 390 or 400 because they are two digits, so 39 and then followed by zeros, or 400, that's 40 followed by zeros. And we would want to round it to two significant figures, so let's choose the closest one. So it's either 390 or 400, so it's going to be 390 because this is closer to 390 than it is to 400. So answer would be 390. Or an alternative way to look at it is if we had 394 and we wanted to round this to two significant figures, well, we want to have two numbers then followed by zeros. So we look at the third significant figure, which is a four, and that means that we round down, so it'd be 390, not 400. Okay, our next one is 1,273. We want to round that to two significant figures. So we either want to have 1,200 or 1,300, where we've got two digits then followed by zeros. Now, as you can see, 1,273 would be closer to 1,300 than it is to 1,200. So the answer would be 1,300. Or again, we could look at the third significant figure. We've got the first two, and then the third significant figure is a seven. So we round up, so the answer would be 1,300. Okay, our next one. Our next one is 7,961, and we want to round that to two significant figures. So that means we want to have two digits followed by zeros. So we could either have 7,900 or 8,000, because it's 8, 0, and then followed by zeros. So because this is 7,961, it's closer to 8,000 than it is to 7,900. So that means our answer would be 8,000. Or again, another way to look at it is, if we want to round this to two significant figures, we look at the third significant figure, which would be a six, and that means we round up, so it'd be 8,000. Okay, let's have a look at our next one. Our next one is 0.618, so we want to round this to two significant figures. Now remember with decimal numbers, we ignore the 0 point and the zeros in the front, so we're just going to look at our 618, and we want to round this to two significant figures. That means we either want 0.61 or 0.62, and because it's 0.618, we're going to round up, so it's going to be 0.62. Okay, and our last number is 20.501. We want to round this to two significant figures, so we want two digits, then followed by zeros, or if it's just a two-digit number, we just want a two-digit number. So we've got 20.501, so our choice is either going to be 20 or 21. And because it's 20.501, we're going to round up, so our answer would be 21. Or again, another way to look at it is, because we have 20.501, we look at our significant figures. Well, our first significant figure is a 2. Our second significant figure is a 0. And then we look at our third significant figure, which is a 5. That means we round up, so our answer would be 21. Okay, so we looked at rounding. Now we're going to look at finding what the highest number could have been or the lowest number could have been. So here we've got the population of Wales, and that's 12,000 to the nearest thousand. And we've been asked to find what was the lowest possible population of Wales and what's the highest possible population of Wales. So we're told the population of Wales is 12,000 to the nearest thousand, and we've been asked to find the lowest possible population of Wales. So let's consider the numbers below 12,000 that would round up to be 12,000 to the nearest thousand. So the population of Wales could have been 11,999, and that number would obviously round up to be 12,000 to the nearest thousand. It could have been even lower, it could have been 11,900, if we rounded that to the nearest thousand, it would be 12,000. It could be even lower, it could have been 11,600, if we rounded that to the nearest thousand, our answer would be 12,000. It could even be as low as 11,500. That number would round to 12,000 to the nearest thousand. But it couldn't be 11,499, because that would round down to 11,000. So the lowest possible population of Wales would be 11,500. 11,500, because that's the lowest possible number that would round up to be 12,000 to the nearest thousand. Okay, next question, what's the highest possible population of Wales? So let's consider the numbers above 12,000 that would round down to be 12,000, to the nearest thousand. So the population of Wales could have been 12,001. Obviously, if we rounded that to the nearest thousand, it would be 12,000. It could be something even higher. It could be 12,200. If we rounded that to the nearest thousand, it would be 12,000, not 13,000. It could be something even higher. 12,400 would round down to be 12,000, but it wouldn't round up to be 13,000, so it could be 12,000. 
12,400, and it could be anything as high as 12,499, because 12,499 would round down to be 12,000 and not up to 13,000. It couldn't be 12,500, because 12,500, if we rounded that to the nearest thousand, because it's a five in the hundreds column, we would round it up to be 13,000, so it couldn't be 12,500. So the answer would be 12,499. So the answer would be 12,499. So the lowest possible population of Wales would be 11,500, and the highest possible population of Wales could have been 12,499. Now in this question we've looked at what we call discrete data, and that's data that can only take certain values. With a being population, we didn't need to consider decimal numbers. Later on in this video, we'll look at what we call continuous data, and that's data that can take any value on a given scale. And we'll look at that whenever we look at a topic called error intervals. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is estimation, which is video 215 in Cobra Maths. So here we've got a typical question, and we've got a shop sells 78 magazines that cost £5.15 each. Estimate the total cost of the magazine sold. So whenever we're doing estimation questions, we want to use nicer numbers to make it a bit easier for ourselves. And this will typically be on the non-calculator paper. And we've got 78 magazines. Now I notice that 78 magazines is quite close to 80. And that would be a nicer number to use than 78. And we've got a cost of £5.15. Well, that's quite close to £5. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to round these numbers to what we call one significant figure. So rounding 78 to one significant figure is 80. It's a nice number. It's quite close to 78. And instead of using £5.15, I'm going to use £5. And what I'm going to do then is work out the total cost. So if I sold 80 magazines at £5.8, I would do 80 multiplied by £5. And that would tell me the total cost. So 80 multiplied by 5 is 400. So that would be £400. Now remember, we have rounded these numbers of 80 and £5, so this £400 wouldn't be the exact amount of money the magazines would sell for, but this is our estimation, it's our like, educated guess. By rounding the numbers to one significant figure, or rounding them to nice numbers, so instead of 78 we chose 80, and instead of £5.15 we chose £5, and we done 80 multiplied by £5 is £400, so that's our estimation. And that's it. And sometimes in estimation questions, we're given questions like this, where we've been asked to work at an estimate for 40.18 multiplied by 6.87, all divided by 0.512. Now, whenever we're doing a question like this with estimation, it can be useful to round our numbers to one significant figure. So let's round our numbers to one significant figure. So let's start off with our first number, 40.18. So we're going to round that to one significant figure, So, but that means one digit followed by zeros. So that means that we're either going to have a choice of 40 or 50. Because it's 40.18, I'm going to choose 40. It's much closer to 40 than it is to 50. Our next number, well, we've got multiplied by, and then we've got 6.87. So our choices will be 6 or 7. Now, 6.87 will be closer to 7 than it is to 6, so we're going to choose 7. And then finally, we've got divided by, and then we've got 0.5. 512. We want to run this to one significant figure, so our choices will be 0.5 or 0.6. This number is closer to 0.5 because it's 0.51 than it is to 0.6, so we're going to write then 0.5. Now, whenever I round my numbers to one significant figure, obviously, whenever I carry on, the answer is not going to be the exact answer. So instead of writing an equal sign here, I do this curly equal sign. It looks like this. And that means it's approximately equal to. So whenever you round your numbers, whenever you do an estimation question, you round your numbers, rather than putting an equal sign after you've round them, it can be useful to put this approximately equal to symbol. It just shows uh, your teacher, your examiner, or even just remind yourself that you've rounded the numbers. So now what we're going to do is we're going to work this out. So we're going to work out 40 multiplied by 7. Well, 4 times 7 is 28. So 40 times 7 would be equal to 280. And then we've still got divided by 0 0.5. So we now just need to work out 280 divided by 0 0.5. And that will give us our approximate answer to this question, our estimate. Now, our next topic is going to be ordering decimals. And just after that will be arithmetic with decimals. And I'm going to show you how to divide by decimals like this really nicely and easily. And what you would do is you would just times both of these numbers by 10. And you would do 2,800 divided by 5. And you could do your bus shelter method to get that answer. Or another way to do it is to just consider how many halves there would be in 280. So if we had 280 pizzas, how many halves would there be? And the answer would be 560. And you can check this using the bus shelter method. We could do 2,800 divided by 5, and hopefully we'll get 560. How many 5s are there in 2? 0, remainder 2. How many 5s are there in 28? Well, that'd be 5, remainder 3. How many 5s are there in 30? That's going to be 6. And how many 5s are there in 0? Zero? 0. So the answer is 560. So our estimate for the answer to this question would be 560. Now, it's not going to be exactly 560, unless we're very, very lucky. Um, but that's our estimate. That's our the approximate answer. 
Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is ordering numbers and ordering decimal numbers. And they are videos 221 and 95 on corporate maths. And this question says, arrange an order starting with the smallest 7.81, 7 7.49, 7.3, 7.007, 7.102, and we've been asked to arrange them in order starting with the smallest. So let's start off by finding the smallest number here. Now they all start with 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, so that's not going to help us. So let's look at the next one to the right of the decimal point, which is the tenths column. And we're looking for the number with the lowest number of tenths. Well, this one has eight tenths, this one has four tenths. This one has three temps. This one has zero temps, so that's going to be our candidate for our smallest number. And this one's got one temp, so this is going to be our smallest number. So we've found our smallest number. Now let's carry on. Let's keep looking at the temps column. We have eight temps, four temps, three temps, and one temp. So our next one would be 7.102 and then carrying on. And again, we're looking at the temps column. Now, if you did have some numbers which have the same digit in the temps column, you'd look at the hundredths. So our next number, well, we've got 7.81, 7.49, and 7.3. So that's got a three in the temps column, so that's our next smallest. And then next would be 7.49, because it's only got a four in the temps column. And finally, our biggest number would be 7.81. And that's it. So we've arranged the numbers in order from smallest to largest. So the next topic is arithmetic with decimals. So we're going to look at adding and subtracting decimals. We're going to look at multiplying decimals. And we're going to look at division involving decimals. So let's start off with our first question. So our first question says, work out 4.2 subtract 1.79. Now, whenever you're adding and subtracting decimals, you do it in the same approach as addition and subtraction as you've seen earlier on in the video, but it's just very important that you line up the numbers so that the decimal points are all in a line. So we'd write 4.2, like subtraction, you'd put the first number at the top, and then you're going to put the next number beneath it. Now we've got 4.2, so we're then going to write 1.79. And we've lined them up in columns. We've got our ones or our units, the four and the one. We've got our decimal points lined up. We've got the tenths lined up, and we've got the hundredths lined up. As you can see, there were no hundreds for the 4.2. So what I'm actually going to do here is, just so there's a, a placeholder in there, I'm going to put a zero there as well, just so that whenever I'm subtracting these, there's something there. Okay, so let's then put the line beneath. So now what we're going to do is we're going to work out a subtraction. Now before I do that, I tend to put the decimal point in the right place. So I just line up and put a decimal point in my answer beneath the other decimal points. And let's work out the subtraction. So 0 take away 9, well, we're going to need to borrow. So that's going to be a 1 and a 10. 10 take away 9 is 1. 1 take away 7, again we can't do, so we're going to borrow. So that would be a 3 and an 11. 11 take away 7 is 4. And 3 take away 1 is 2. So 4.2 subtract 1.79 is 2.41. And you use the same approach as addition, where you again, you line up the numbers with the decimal points, and then you add them. So let's have a look at our next question. So our next question is multiplication involving decimals. Now there's two common approaches for this question. One approach is to count the number of decimal places in the question, and then that means that the answer will have the same number, and to put the decimal point in like so. Or then there's a second approach, which is my favorite, and I'll talk about that in a second. So if I had 0 0.8 multiplied by 0 0.3, well, ignoring the 0 point and the 0 point, you would be left with 8 times 3. Now, 8 times 3 is equal to 24, so the answer will have a 2 and a 4 in it. And then if we look at the question, you have one digit after decimal point here, and then we have another digit after decimal point here. So because two digits after the decimal point in the question, there's going to be two digits after the decimal point in the answer. So it's going to be 0 0.24. And as you can see here, the 2 and the 4 are digits after the decimal point. So that's 1, 2. So then that would be the right answer. 0 0.8 multiplied by 0 0.3 is 0 0.24. Another approach which is quite useful is instead of doing 0 0.8 multiplied by 0 0.3 is to change these into whole numbers. So multiply 0 0.8 by 10 to get 8 and multiply 0 0.3 by 10 to get 3 and do 8 times 3 is equal to 24. Now we made 0 0.8 10 times bigger and we made 0 0.3 10 times bigger. So that means we've made our answer 100 times bigger. We've multiplied by 10 and by 10 again. So if we divide our answer by 100 or divide it by 10 and by 10 again, we'll get our answer. So 24 divided by 10 would be 2.4 and divided by 10 again would be equal to 0.24. 
and that's it. Okay, let's have a look at the next topic. So the next topic is division involving decimals. So we've got work out 11.4 divided by 3. Now, whenever I'm dividing a decimal number by a whole number, well, that's quite nice, actually. You can just use the bus shelter method as normal, but just make sure that you put your decimal point in. So 11.4, the first number, goes under the bus shelter, or a short division. And we've got the decimal point here, so we put it there in the answer. And we're going to divide that by 3. So we put the 3 at the front. 3 into 1 doesn't go, so put the 0, remainder 1. We've then got 3 into 11. Well, 11 divided by 3, well, 3 times 3 is 9, so that would be 3, remainder 2. And then we've got 24 divided by 3. Well, 24 divided by 3 is 8. So answer would be equal to 3.8. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So our next question says, work out 15.7 divided by 0.2. Now here we've, we're dividing by a decimal number, which is a wee bit trickier. So what I, I tend to want to change this number into a whole number. Now, one thing to notice is if I had six divided by three, well, six divided by three is two. If I multiply both these numbers by 10 and I done 60 divided by 30, well, how many 30s go into 60? Well, that's also two. Or if I times both of these numbers by 100 and said, what's 600 divided by 300? That's also two. So whenever you multiply both the number you're dividing and the number you're dividing by, by 10 or 100 or 1,000, after you do the division, the answer will always be the same. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to multiply both of these numbers by 10. So that will give me 157 divided by 2. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work out the answer to this question. And whatever the answer will be, will be the same as the answer to the question we were asked. So we're going to do 157 divided by 2. So the answer will be 78.5. So 157 divided by 2 would be 78.5. So that means the answer to our question would also be 78.5. And that's it. So our next topic is real life negatives or ordering negative numbers. So that's video 208 and 209 on Corbett Mavs. And here's a typical question where we've been asked to write the cities in order of temperature from coldest to warmest. So here's the map of the UK and Ireland. And we've got Belfast with negative 8 degrees Celsius, Cork at negative 7 degrees Celsius, Cardiff at 0 degrees Celsius, London at 2 degrees Celsius, Newcastle at negative 4 degrees Celsius, and Aberdeen at negative 6 degrees Celsius. So we've got those cities, and we've been asked to order them in order of temperature from coldest to warmest. So if we have a look, Belfast is the coldest at negative 8. Then we've got negative 7, which is Cork. Then we've got Aberdeen, which is negative 6, so Aberdeen. After that, then we've got Newcastle, Cardiff and London left. Well, Newcastle has a temperature of negative four degrees Celsius, so Newcastle. And then we're left with Cardiff and London. Well, Cardiff is zero degrees Celsius. And finally, the warmest city is London with a temperature of two degrees Celsius, so London. So in order from coolest to warmest, the cities would go Belfast, Cork, Aberdeen, Newcastle, Cardiff and London. OK, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is arithmetic, which involves negatives. So our first question is six subtract ten. Well, 6 take away 6 is 0, so if we do 6 take away 10, it's going to be a negative number. And if we take away 6, we get the 0, we'd have another 4 to take away, so our answer would be negative 4. So 6 take away 10 is negative 4. Our next question, negative 7 plus 12. Well, if we're at negative 7 and we add 7, we get to 0. And then we'd have another 5 to add, so our answer would be 5. So negative 7 plus 12 is 5. Our next question, our next question is negative 13 take away 4. So that means we're going to go 4 more down from negative 13. So that'll be negative 14, negative 15, negative 16, negative 17. So the answer would be negative 17. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So our next question says 5 plus negative 3. Now when we add a positive number, it goes up. When we add a negative number, it goes down. So we're going to do 5, add negative 3, would be the same as 5 take away 3. And 5 take away 3 is equal to 2. Our next question, our next question is 8 subtract negative 7. Now when you subtract a positive number, it goes down. When you subtract a negative number, it goes up. So here we're going to do 8 plus 7. And 8 plus 7 is equal to 15 because 8 minus minus 7 is 15. 8 plus 7 is 15. And our last question here, we've got negative 10. Now we're adding negative 5. Now when you add a positive number, it goes up. When you add a negative number, it goes down. So we're going to be adding a negative, which is the same as taking away. So we've got negative 10 take away 5. And negative 10 take away 5 would be negative 15. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is multiplication and division involving negatives. So let's go through our rules. Well, a positive times a positive is a positive. A positive times a negative is a negative. 
A negative times a positive is a negative, and a negative times a negative is a positive. And the way I remember this is, if they're both positive, whenever you're, whenever you're multiplying, you get a positive answer. And if they're both negative, you get a positive answer. So if they're both the same, you get a positive answer. And whenever you're multiplying, you've got one positive and one negative, you get a negative answer. So let's have a look at our first question. So our first question is 8 multiplied by negative 3. Well, 8 times 3 is 24. But we've got a positive times a negative. And when we've got a positive times a negative, we've got one of each is going to be a negative answer. So instead of being 8 times 3 being 24, the answer will be negative 24. And let's have a look at our next multiplication. We've got negative 5 multiplied by negative 4. Well, it's a negative times a negative, so our answer is going to be positive. And we've got 5 times 4, which is 20. Now, the same rules apply for division. So let's have a look at our first question. So our first question is negative 64 divided by 8. Now, it's a negative divided by a positive, so we know it's one of each, so it's going to be a negative answer. And 64 divided by 8 is 8, because 8 times 8 is 64. So 64 divided by 8 is 8. So negative 64 divided by 8 would be negative 8. And our next question, we've got negative 30 divided by negative 6. So it's a negative divided by a negative, so we're going to get a positive answer. And we'll get 30 divided by 6, that's 5, so the answer would just be 5. And that's it. So our next topic is place value. So it's very important to know place value, so you get your decimal point, and then go into the left, or the first column, I tend to call it units, but it's also called ones. So you've got your ones or units, then you've got your tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundred thousands and millions. And going to the right of the decimal point, you've got your tenths, your hundredths, your thousandths, and so on. And here's a typical place value question. So the question says, write down the value of eight in the answer to 183 multiplied by 100. So let's start off by working out the answer to 183 multiplied by 100. So we've got 183, so 183. And we're going to multiply by 100. So that means we're going to move the digits two columns to the left. Each of the digits is getting 100 times larger. So the one would move into the tens of thousands. The eight would move into the thousands. The three would move into the hundreds. And then we've got zeros. So the answer to this question would be, would be 18,300. And the question says, write down the value of the eight in the answer to that question. So the eight's in the thousands column. So the answer would be 8,000. So the value of the 8 in the answer to that question would be 8,000. So our next topic is to look at the inequality sign. Now, there are four different inequality signs you're going to need to know. They are the smaller than symbol, the greater than symbol, the smaller than or equal to symbol, and the greater than or equal to symbol. And these are our four inequality signs. So we use these to show that either one number is perhaps bigger than another number, or smaller than another number, and so on. So let's have a look at this question. The question says, write the correct symbol in each box to make the statements correct. So our first box, we've got 58 and 55. Now 58 is bigger than 55, so we're going to put in the greater than symbol. Um, I'm going to avoid talking about crocodiles. Um, my daughter likes to say, you know, the crocodile eats the bigger number, so they say the inequality sign is going to eat the 58 and so on. Um, I remember as the greater than, you know, the bigger side going towards the bigger number. So here we've got 58, and then we've got the, you know, the the bigger part of the inequality sign here, and the smaller part pointing towards the smaller number. Um, but however you want to remember it, it's important to know these signs. So 58 is bigger than 55. Next, we've got 99 and 101. Well, a 101 is larger than 99. So we're going to put the larger side towards the 101 or the less than symbol. So we've got 99 is less than 101. And finally, we've got 151 and 149. Well, 151 is bigger than 149. So we're going to put the greater than symbol in, which is this one with the bigger side towards the 151. So we've got 151 is greater than 149. And that's it. Okay, so we've looked at place value. Now we're going to look at a type of questions that I call place value using calculations. So our first question, so we've been given that 67 multiplied by 34 is equal to 2,278. Well, here we've got 67 multiplied by 340. And as you can see, in the question we're trying to work out, the 340 is 10 times larger than 34. So that means that our answer will be 10 times larger than this. So if we multiply 2,278 by 10, that will give us the answer to this question. So the answer will be 22,780. So that would be our answer. Okay, let's have a look at our next one. So again, we know that 67 multiplied by 34 is equal to 2,278. And we've been asked to work out 6.7 multiplied by 34. So if we have a look at our 67, if we divide that by 10, we are given 6.7. So that means that if we divide our answer by 10, we'll get the answer to this question. So 2,278 divided by 10 would be 227.8. So because one of the numbers is 10 times smaller, the answer would be 10 times smaller. So that means that our answer would be 227.8. 
And finally, we've been asked to work out the value of 670 multiplied by 340. Well, if we have a look at the calculation we've been given, 670 is 10 times larger than 67, and 340 is 10 times larger than, is 10 times larger than 34. So that means if we want to find the answer to this calculation, we need to times this answer by 10 and by 10 again, or we could just multiply by 100. So if we take our 2,278 and we multiply by 10, that'll be 22,780. And if we multiply by 10 again, answer will be equal to 227,800. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is multiples, or video 220. And here's part of the Corp Mass Revision card on multiples. So the multiples of 4 are 4, 8, 12, 16, 20, and so on. So 4 times 1 is 4, 4 times 2 is 8, 4 times 3 is 12, 4 times 4 is 16, and so on. Or you could just start off with 4 and then add 4, add 4, add 4, and so on. So it says, work out the first five multiples of 12. Well, the first multiple of 12 is going to be 12. And then I could do, well, 12 times 2 is 24. 12 times 3 is 36. 12 times 4 is equal to 48. Or I could just be adding 12s here and do 12 plus 12 is 24, plus 12 is 36, plus 12 is 48. And add another 12 will be equal to 60. And that's it. So the first five multiples of 12 will be 12, 24, 36, 48, and 60. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is common multiples, which is video 218. So common multiples, so if we wanted to find common multiples of two numbers, we are looking for numbers that are multiples of both of those numbers. So we've been asked to find three common multiples of six and eight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to list the, the multiples of six, I'm going to list the multiples of eight, and then I'm going to look for some common multiples. Now we've been asked to find three common multiples of six and eight. So we're looking for numbers that are in both of these lists, in the multiples of six and in the multiples of eight. So first of all, I noticed that we've got 24 because 24 is a multiple of 6, but it's also a multiple of 8. The next number that I notice is 48. That's in both of the lists. And actually, the next number I'd write down as a multiple of 6 would be, well, adding 6 for 60, 66, add another 6 is 72. And there we've got our three common multiples, or the first three common multiples. Obviously, there'd be loads more, infinitely many more. Um, but the we were asked to list three of them, um, and the first three that I can find are 24, 48, and 72. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Our next topic is called LCM, or lowest common multiple, and that's video 218 and 219 on corporate maths. To find the lowest common multiple of two numbers, you consider their multiples. So if we had six, the multiples of six would be six, 12, 18, 24, 30, 36, and so on. The multiples of 15 would be 15, 30, 45, and so on. And the lowest common multiple, or the LTM, is the first number in both of those lists. And as you can see, 30 is the lowest common multiple. It's the first number in both the multiples of 6 and the multiples of 15. So 30 is the lowest common multiple, and that's it. Okay, our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is factors, and that's video 216 on corporate maths. And this is part of the corporate maths revision card on factors. So factors of a number are whole numbers that divide into it without a remainder. So it says, find the factors of 20. Well, 1 times 20 is 20. 2 times 10 is 20. And 4 times 5 is 20. So that means the factors of 20 are 1 and 20, 2 and 10, and 4 and 5. And whenever we put them in order, they would be 1, 2, 4, 5. 5, 10, and 20. And they're the whole numbers that divide into 20 without a remainder, because you can divide 20 by 1, 2, 4, 5, 10, and 20, and you'll have no remainder. OK, so let's find the factors of 30. Well, 1 times 30 is equal to 30. Then we could try 2. Well, 2 times 15 is equal to 30. Let's try 3. Well, 3 times 10 is equal to 30. Now, 4, well, 4 times 7 is 28. 4 times 8 is 32. So 4 is not a factor of 30. Let's try 5. Well, 5 times 6 is equal to 30. Now, we've done 5 times 6. That's actually all the numbers we can try because we've done 1, 2, 3. We've tried 4, we've tried 5, and then we've got to 6. So that's it. And let's list them as factors. So let's list them in order. 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 10, 15, and 30. And remember, if you do want to practice some questions on factors, if you go into that booklet, revision booklet, practice question booklet, um, there will be questions there on factors and all the topics that we've done so far. So it's very important that after you've watched me go through a topic to pause the video, maybe write some notes on it, try some questions, and then carry on. 
Okay, our next topic is common factors. So we've looked at common multiples. Now we're going to look for common factors. So whenever you're finding common factors of two numbers, you write the factors out for both of those numbers, and you look for factors that are factors of both of those numbers. So the factors of 20, of 20, well, we had 1 times 20, we've got 2 times 10, and we've got 4 times 5. They're all the numbers, the whole, the whole numbers are multiplied together to give you 20. So 1, 2, 4, 5, 10 and 20 and 30 we've just done 30 they were 1 2 3 5 6 10 15 and 30 now we're looking for common factors of 20 and 30 well one's a common factor of both of them straight away two also now three is not on the list for 20 four is not on the list for 30 five is a common factor Six isn't a common factor, it's not on the list for 20. 10 is a common factor, it's in both of the lists. And then 20, 15, and 30, none of those are common factors. So the common factors of 20 and 30 would be 1, 2, 5, and 10. Our next topic is finding the highest common factor. We're going to do this by considering the factors and finding the highest common factor. And again, videos 218 and 219 will go through the HCF, highest common factor, and the LCM. So let's have a look at the highest common factor. So let's consider 16. So 16 is equal to 1 times 16, 2 times 8, and 4 times 4. So the factors of 16 are 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16. And if we consider 20, well, 20 is equal to 1 times 20, 2 times 10, and 4 times 5. So the factors of 20 are 1, 2, 4, 5, 10, and 20. And let's look at our common factors. Our common factors are 1, 2, and 4. So they are common factors. And the highest common factor, well, that's going to be 4. So the highest common factor of 16 and 20 is 4. And this topic is particularly useful if you want to cancel fractions and factorize and things like that. Okay, our next topic. Okay, so our next topic is prime numbers. And this is the court mass revision card on prime numbers. So we've got a prime number is a number with exactly two factors, one on itself. So 5 is a prime number, as its factors are 1 and 5. So 9 is not a prime number, as its factors are 1, 3, and 9, because obviously 9 is 1 times 9, but it's also 3 times 3. So it's actually got three factors, whereas a prime number only has two factors, one in itself. And here's a list of our prime numbers, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29, 31, and so on. And it's very important to know these prime numbers. And if you want to recap on prime numbers, watch video 225 on corporate maths. So our next topic are square numbers. And again, I'm using the corporate maths revision card. And these revision cards are really useful, particularly if you do have a set of them, you can sort of set these, you know, the ones that I'm going through, you can set these cards out and sort of pin them up or you can blue tag them onto the wall so they're there to revise. So square numbers, that's video 226 on corporate maths. But here's the revision card. A square number is a number that you find by doing one times one, two times two, three times three, and so on. So one times one is one, so one's a square number. 2 times 2, or 2 squared, is 4, so 4 is a square number. 3 squared, that's 3 times 3, which is 9, so 9 is a square number. 4 times 4 is 16, so that's a square number, and so on. And the square numbers are 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, 100, 121, 144, and so on. I would learn these first 12 square numbers off by heart. It's just really useful to know them, okay? So these are your first 12 square numbers. 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, 64, 81, 100, 121, and 144. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is squaring numbers, which is video 227. So our first question says, work out 30 squared. So that little 2 is squared. We've looked at it already in order of operations. Uh, so this is the squared symbol. It's a little 2 above the number. And what that means is you have to multiply the number by itself. So whenever it says work out 30 squared, you do 30 multiplied by 30. So we do 3 times 3 is equal to 9, and it would have 1, 2 zeros. So the answer would be 900. It's very important to know where the squared button is on your calculator. So obviously there's lots of different types of calculators. So the squared symbol on this type of calculator would be here. Where we've got this x with the little 2 above it, x squared. So that's the squared button. 
On this model of calculator, again, we've got the X with the little two symbol there, the X squared symbol, so that would be the squared button. And on this type of calculator, we've got this time, instead of having an X with the two above it, uh, the X squared, this time we've got a little white box, a little white square with the two above it, and that's the squared button there. So obviously with different calculators, the position of the squared button may be in different positions. So my squared button looks something like that. So it's got a little X with the squared symbol. So if I wanted to work out something such as 1.5 squared, I would type in 1.5 and then, so I type in 1.5 and then I would press the squared button like so and my calculator would look something like this and then I would press equals. It would give me my answer of 2.25. So the square number on a calculator, make sure you're familiar with this button here. And you could try it out, try it out on seven squared equals and you should get 49 and so on. So squaring a number, you just multiply that number by itself. Okay, our next topic. Okay, so our next topic is to square root, and square root is the inverse of square, so it's the opposite operation. So, for instance, if you know that 5 squared is 25, the square root of 25 is 5. It's going back to it's finding the number that you would multiply by itself to give that answer. And the square root symbol looks something like this. It's this symbol here. And our first question says, work out the square root of 49. Well, 7 times 7 is equal to 49, so the square root of 49 is equal to 7. So make sure that you know where the square root button is on your calculator. Mine's is this button here. It's got the little square root and a little white square beneath it. And if I wanted to work out the square root of a number, I would press that button to get the square root symbol. And then I would just type in. So if my question said to work out the square root of 32.49, I'd press that button and then I would type in 32.49 and then I would press equals and then it would give me my answer of 5.7. That's it. So the square root is the inverse of square, and it's finding what number was squared to give you the number beneath the square root symbol. So if you had the square root of 49, it would be 7. If you had the square root of 100, it would be 10. And there's the square root button on your calculator. And if you want to watch more practice on this, watch video 228 on Corporate Maths. Right, so our next topic is cube numbers. So a cube number is the result of multiplying a number by itself and by itself again. So we've got 1 cubed, that's the cube symbol, is 1 times 1 times 1, which is 1. 2 cubed is 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. 3 cubed is 3 times 3 times 3, which is 27. 4 cubed is 4 times 4 times 4, which is 64. And 5 cubed is 5 times 5 times 5, which is 125. I tend to learn these ones off by heart. So the first five cube numbers are 1, 8, 27, 64, and 125. Also, I tend to learn that 10 cubed is 1,000, just because 10 times 10 times 10 is 1,000. So these are the cube numbers that I would learn off by heart. Okay, our next topic. Okay, so our next topic is cube root. So the cube root is the inverse operation to cubing. So in other words, you're saying what number do you multiply by itself and by itself again to give you the number under the cube root. So the first question says, find the cube root of 8. Well, 2 times 2 is 4, multiplied by 2 is 8. So the cube root of 8 is equal to 2. This is the cube root symbol, so it's like the square root, but it's got a little 3 above it there. So it says work out the cube root of 125. Well, that's going to be 5, because 5 times 5 times 5 is 125. But it's also important to know how to use it on the calculator. And just above the square root symbol, you've got the cube root symbol here in yellow. So to press this button on the calculator, what you do, first of all, because it's in yellow, you press Shift. So the button here, shift, and then you press the square root button. And then on your calculator, the cube root symbol will come up like so. Then you just type 125. So you've got the cube root of 125, and then press equals, and you'll get the answer of 5. And that's it. So that's it. So to find the cube root of a number, you just figure out what number do you multiply by itself and by itself again to get that number. And on the calculator, it's usually above the square root button. So you just press shift and then the square root button, and then that would bring you up the cube root symbol. Topic is index notation. And that is video 172 on corporate maths. So if I had 5 times 5 times 5, that is 5 cubed. And if you remember your cube numbers, which is multiplying a number by itself and by itself again, you may want to write an index notation, which means write it as a number with a power. So we could write that as 5 cubed because there's three fives multiplied together. Here we've got 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. So write that in index form because there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 2s. So we would write 2 to the power of 6. And if we had y times y times y times y because it's 4 y's multiplied together we would say y to the power of 4. It's very important to be able to write these in index form, particularly for a topic called product of primes, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So if, for instance, you wanted to work out 2 to the power of 6, so we would just do 2 times 2, which is 4, times 2, which is 8, times 2, which is 16, times 2, which is 32, 
times 2, which is 64. So 2 to the power of 6 would be 64. You can use a calculator to help you. So here's a calculator. So what I would do is I'd press the 2 button. So I'd press 2. And then there's the power button. And on my calculator, it's an X with a little white square just above it, like so. So I'd press that button. And on your calculator display, above the 2 would be a little rectangle or a little box appears. And then press 6, and then press equals, and then you will get the answer. So 2 to the power of 6 is 64. And that's just a quick way of working it out on your calculator rather than writing 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. So that's index notation. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is laws of indices. And there's three very important laws of indices that I would recommend, you know, and this is video 174 in corporate maths. So our first law, well, if you're multiplying things with the same base, so for instance, if you had m cubed multiplied by m to the power of 4, well, that would be m times m times m, m cubed, multiplied by m times m times m times m, and altogether there'd be seven of them, so that'd be m to the power of seven. And a quick way to work that out is, because we've got m to the power of three, and we're multiplying by m to the power of four, you can add these powers, you can do three plus four is equal to seven. And this is the corporate mouse revision card on laws of indices, so if you've got the revision card, this revision card will be very useful for you. Okay, next one, if we're dividing, if you had m to the power of eight, so if you had m times 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 m, and you divided that by m squared, that's m times m, Two of the M's would cancel out with two of the M's, so you'd be left with M times M times M times M times M times M, and that'd be M to the power of six, which is M to the power of six. And a quick way to work that out is, if you're dividing and you've got the same bases, you can take away the powers. You can do eight take away two, and that's M to the power of six. And finally, we've got a power of a power, so if you've got a power and then another power, you multiply the powers together. And let's have a look and see why that works. So if you had M cubed, squared. Remember squared means multiplied by itself, so we're doing m cubed multiplied by itself. So that's m times m times m multiplied by itself, so that's m times m times m. And if you multiply all those together, you'd get m to the power of 6. And a quick way of doing it is to multiply the power. So if you've got a power to a power, you can multiply the two powers. 3 times 2 is equal to 6. So let's have a look at some examples. So if I had 3 to the power of 4 multiplied by 3 squared, I'd add the powers together because it's multiplied and that would be to the power of 6. If I had 3 to the power of 10 divided by 3 squared, I would subtract the powers. So 10 take away 2 is equal to 8. And finally, if I had 4 squared cubed, I would multiply the powers because it's a power of a power. You've got a power and then another power. So you'd multiply the powers together. 2 times 3 is equal to 6. So it would be 4 to the power of 6. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is negative indices, and it's a number topic because it's in red, and it's video 175 in corporate maths. And let's consider this pattern where we've got 5 to the power of 3, 5 to the power of 2, 5 to the power of 1, 5 to the power of 0, 5 to the power of negative 1, and 5 to the power of negative 2. So 5 cubed, well, 5 times 5 times 5 is 125. 5 squared, well, that's 25. 5 times 5 is 25. 5 to the power of 1, well, that's just a 5, so the answer would be 5. Okay, next. Next, we've got 5 to the power of 0. Well, 5 to the power of 0 is 1. Okay, and next one is 5 to the power of negative 1. Well, if we look at our numbers here, we've got 125, 25, 5, and 1. Now, there's a pattern here. To go down in this pattern, we're dividing by 5. We're dividing by 5. We're dividing by 5. We're dividing by 5. And then if we want to find out our next one, we would just divide by 5 again. So if we do 1 divided by 5, well, that'd be 0 0.2, or we could just write as a fraction, which is 1 over 5. If we want to get our next answer, we could divide by 5 again. Okay, so we do 1 over 5, or fifth divided by 5, so that'd be 1 over 25. Now, what's actually quite useful to spot here is, because we've got 5 to the negative 2, that's the same as putting 1 over and 5 squared. And 5 squared is 25. So that's our rule. If we have x to the power of negative n, that's the same as 1 over x to the n. So you can just put 1 over and then just use the positive power. So here, if we were asked to work out 2 to the power of negative 3, we could just put 1 over and then just write 2 cubed, changing our negative 3 to just 3. And then 2 cubed is 8, so the answer would be just 1 over 8, or 1 eighth. So 2 to the power of negative 3 is 1 over 8. Next, 10 to the power of negative 2, well, we would put 1 over and then just write 10 squared. And 10 squared is 100, so the answer would be 1 over 100. So if we had 10 to the power of negative 2, our answer would be 1 over 100. And that's it. So if we want to work out a negative power, you just put 1 over and then just use the positive power on the denominator. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is product of primes, and that's video 223 on corporate maths. So every single whole number that is greater than 1 is either prime or can be written as a product of primes. And the word product means to multiply, so it either means that every single number that's greater than 1 is either a prime number 
or is equal to prime numbers multiplied together. So our first question, our example says, write 60 as a product of primes. So it's very important that you know your prime numbers and your prime numbers are 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, 23, 29, 31, and so on. And it's very important you know those prime numbers. So we're going to write 60 as a product of primes, and we're going to give our answer in index form. So let's start off with 60, and I like to do this using a prime factor tree. You can use another approach by using sort of an upside down bus shelter, whatever approach you prefer is totally fine. But I like to use a prime factor tree like so. So 60, I think of two numbers that multiply together to give me 60. So I'm going to go for 2 times 30. So 2 times 30 is equal to 60. Now we look and see if either of these numbers are prime, and 2 is prime, so I'm going to circle it, but 30 is not prime. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to think of two numbers that times together to give me 30. So 3 times 10. Now 3 is prime, so I circle it, whereas 10 is not. So I'm now going to think of two numbers that multiply together to give me 10, and that's going to be 2 times 5. I never choose 1 in the number itself because you don't get any further. So 10, so 10 would be 2 times 5, so 2 times 5, and let's circle them. And that's it, we're finished. So 60 is equal to 2 times 3 times 2 times 5. So let's write that out. 60 is equal to, and let's just do it in order. So instead of doing 2 times 3 times 2 times 5, I'm going to do 2 times 2 times 3 times 5. So 2 times 2 times 3 times 5. And let's just check it works. 2 times 2 is equal to 4, times 3 is equal to 12, times 5 is equal to 60. And as you can see, we've written 60 as a product of primes. But the question says to write an index form. Now, as you've just seen earlier on with index notation, if you've got something such as 2 times 2, that's 2 squared. So we can write 60 is equal to 2 squared multiplied by 3 multiplied by 5. So we've written 60 as a product of primes in index form. And that's it. And it's very important to be able to do that. And video 223 will go through that. And also, if you go to corporatemaths.com and you go to videos and worksheets and you scroll down to 223, as well as having the video tutorial, there will be some practice questions and textbook exercises on this topic. So if you do want extra practice, feel free to do those. But also remember there's the revision booklet, which you can print. It's the links in the description below. And if you have that, there's some questions on this now. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is applying product of primes. And that's video 223A in Corporate Maths. So let's start off by looking at this question. So a number m has been written as a product of primes as 2 multiplied by 3 squared. So this is m, 2 multiplied by 3 squared. And the first part a is to say what number is m. So let's work this out. Now remember, we've got our order of operations. That is, we do any brackets? No. Orders, now that's another name for powers, so that's squared. So we're going to work out the squared first of all. So we're going to do 3 squared. So 3 squared is 9. And then we're going to multiply by the 2. 2 times 9 is equal to 18. So that means m is equal to 18. And part b says, write the number 10m as a product of primes. So 10m, well, if we know that m is equal to 18, 10m would be equal to 10 times m. So that would be 180. So you could take 180 and do that prime factor tree and find out what 180 is as a product of primes. And what's really useful here is we know that 10 is equal to 2 times 5. So two prime numbers, 2 and 5, multiplied together would give me 10. 2 times 5. Now we know that m is equal to 2 times 3 squared. So m is equal to 2 times 3 squared. So if we multiply this 10 by m, which is 2 times 3 squared, that would be our answer. But we want to write this obviously in index form. And as you can see, we've got 2 times 5 times 2 times 3 squared. I would look at the 2s first of all. You've got 2 times 2, which is 2 squared. We've then got our 3 squared, so multiply by 3 squared, and then multiply by 5. So 2 squared times 3 squared times 5 would be 10m. And we can check that, because remember we knew that 10 times m was 180. Let's check this as 180. 2 squared is 4. 3 squared is 9. 4 times 9 is 36. And multiplied by 5 would be 180. So that means that 10m as a product of primes would be 2 squared times 3 squared times 5. Okay, our next part. Now we can also use product of primes to find square numbers and cube numbers. So for instance, if we knew that 280 was 2 cubed multiplied by 5 multiplied by 7, and we were asked what the lowest whole number that 280 would need to be multiplied by to give a square number, what we can do is we can consider what a square number is. So a square number is a number multiplied by itself, and that would give you a square number. So if we take what we've been given here, so 280 is 2 cubed, that's 2 times 2 times 2, times 5 times 7, just write an out in full. If we share these prime numbers out as evenly as possible, and then find out what extra ones we need, then we can find out what number you can multiply 280 by to get a square number. So let's share these numbers out as evenly as we can. So we've got 2, 2, 2, that's three twos. So we're going to have to give one circle two twos and one circle one two. 
We've got a five. Well, unfortunately, that's just going to have to go in one of the circles as well. We can't, you know, we don't have two fives. And we've got a seven. So again, that's going to have to go in one of the circles. Now, we want the same thing in both of these circles. So let's put some extra prime numbers in this circle. So we had two twos. So we're going to need number two. We're going to need a five. And we're going to need a seven. If we multiply 280 by two, five, and seven, that should give us a square number. So let's see what two times five times seven is. So two times five times seven is equal to, well, two times five is 10, times seven is 70. So if we multiply 280 by 70, we should get a square number. So 280 multiplied by 70 is equal to 19,600. And if we work out the square root of that, we get that's equal to 140, so it is a square number. So if you want to find a square number, what you need to do is share out the prime numbers that you've been given as evenly as possible, and then add in the actual ones you need. And there is a bit of a shortcut. If we take all the numbers in the circles here, are two times two times five times seven times two times two times five times seven, that would be two times two times two times two, which is two to the power of four, times by, and we've got five times five, that's five squared, and we've got seven times seven, that's seven squared. If you notice, all the powers are even. So if you want a square number, all you'd need to do it is to make all the powers even. So if I was doing this question, I would first of all just look and see, well, it's two cubed, but I'm gonna need an extra two. I've got five, what's well, five to the power of one, so I need an extra five. And I've got seven to the power of one, so I need an extra seven. So if I multiply this by two and by five and by seven, I will get a square number. And likewise, if I wanted to find a cube number, all the powers would have to be multiples of three. So for instance, if I had two to the power of nine multiplied by five to the power of three, that would be a cube number because this power is a multiple of three and this power is a multiple of three. We use the product of primes to work out the LCM, that's the lowest common multiple, or the HCF, the highest common factor. So let's have a look at our first question. So let's write some numbers as product of primes and then we'll use that information to find the lowest common multiple and the highest common factor. So our first part says, write 92 as a product of primes. So I'm gonna do my prime factor tree. So 92, that's two times 46. Let's circle the two. And 46, that's two times 23. And they're both primes, so let's circle them. So 92 as a product of primes would be two times two times 23. And in index form, that would be two squared times 23. Now our next question is to write 48 as a product of primes. So I'm actually gonna use my calculator to write 48 as a product of primes. So on my calculator, I've got this yellow fact there. So what I do is I press 48, then press equals, and 48 comes up in my calculator display. Then I press shift, and then where it says fact there, and on the display, it will show me two to the power of four multiplied by three. So 48 equals two to the power of four times three, or two times two times two times two times three. So we've got 92 as a product of primes, and we've got 48 as a product of primes. Let's now use that information to work out the lowest common multiple and the highest common factor of those numbers. So here we've got our question. It says write down the highest common factor of 48 and 92, and write down the lowest common multiple of 48 and 92. So let's write down what they were as product of primes again. So 48 was equal to two to the power of four multiplied by three, or if we wrote it out in full, it would be two times two times two times two times three. And 92, 92 was equal to two squared multiplied by 23, or in full, two times two times 23. Now let's put those numbers in our Venn diagram. So here we've got a Venn diagram, and we've got one circle for 48 and we've got one circle for 92 and we're going to put their prime factors into this Venn diagram. So first of all let's see if they share anything. So as you can see 48 is 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 3 and 98 is 2 times 2 times 23. So they've both got two twos. 92 has got two twos and 48 has got two twos. So we're going to put two twos in the middle. Now as you can see here 48 had two more twos so let's put those two twos in the 48 side. 48 also had a three, but 92 doesn't, so let's put the three there as well. And finally, 92 has a 23, so we'll put that into the 92 side. So as you can see in both circles, we've got 48, and we've got two times two times two times two times three, and that's 48. And for the 92 circle, we've got two times two times 23. So you put what they share in the middle, and then you put the extras onto each side. So the first question says, work at the highest common factor of 48, 92. So to find the highest common factor, we multiply the prime numbers in the middle. So we're going to do two times two. So the highest common factor will equal two times two, and two times two is equal to four. So the highest common factor is four, okay? Our next question says to work out the lowest common multiple of 48, 92. 
So to find the lowest common multiple, we multiply all the numbers in the Venn diagram. So we're going to do 2 times 2 times 3 times 2 times 2 times 23, or in order, the lowest common multiple equals 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, because there's four twos, times 3 times 23. And when we do that, we get that's equal to 1,104. So we've worked out the highest common factor and the lowest common multiple of 4892 really quickly and easily by using this Venn diagram. So what you do is you write each number as a product of primes. You put the numbers into the Venn diagram and make sure whichever ones they share go in the middle and put the extras on each side. And that's it. And to find the highest common factor, you multiply the prime numbers in the middle. And to find the lowest common multiple, you multiply all the numbers in the Venn diagram. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is called Standard Form, and that's videos 300 to 303 in Corporate Maths. Now, Standard Form is a really useful way of writing very large or very small numbers very quickly and easily. So rather than writing a large number out lots of times, we can use Standard Form to help us. And a number's in standard form if it's in this format. We've got a number between 1 and 10, so it's a number bigger than or equal to 1, but less than 10. So, for instance, 1 or 4.22 or 9.9 .9, multiplied by 10 to a certain power. So maybe 10 cubed or 10 to the power of 8 or even 10 to the power of negative 3. And we're going to look at how to write some large numbers in standard form and some small numbers in standard form. And I'm actually going to do this part of the video twice. I'm going to actually use two different techniques here because some teachers will use a technique where they add zeros and move decimal points. And some teachers will move the digits and say the decimal points have to stay fixed. My job is to help you and make sure that I cover the way that you are familiar with. And I don't want to confuse you by using just one technique. And then you think, oh, hold on, my teacher talks about it in a slightly different way. So to begin with, I'm going to talk about adding zeros and moving decimal places and then I'm going to do the questions again by moving the digits rather than the decimal points. So first of all, we had 7,000 and we wanted to write it in standard form. Well, a number between 1 and 10 to choose. Well, I'm thinking 7 would be a good choice and then we're going to multiply it by 10 to a certain power. Now, whenever we have a whole number and we multiply by 10, we add a 0 on. So 7 times 10 is 70 by adding a 0 on. If here we want to add 3 zeros on, so what we actually want to do is multiply 7 by 1,000, and that would be 10 cubed, because 10 times 10 times 10 is 1,000. Now notice that if you have a whole number, and you want to add 1, 2, 3 zeros on, the power would just be 3. So the answer would be 7 multiplied by 10 cubed. If we had a number such as 80,000, which is 8 followed by 4 zeros, we could have 8 multiplied by it, and because it's a whole number, we could say it's 10 to the power of 4, because it's 1, 2, 3, 4 zeros. Okay, let's have a look at our next one. So our next one is to write 2,500,000 in standard form. So we're going to choose a number between 1 and 10. Now we've got 2,5, so we're going to choose 2.5 here, because that's a sensible number to choose between 1 and 10. Now what we're going to do is we're going to figure out if we have 2.5, how many times we need to move the decimal point to get it at the end of the number. So we want to move the decimal point from here to here. So we would move it 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six times. So that means we need to multiply 2.5 by 10 to the power of six, because that would move the decimal place one, two, three, four, five, six places to the right. Okay, next, let's look at some small numbers. So here we've got 0 0.0000004. So that would be four, would be our number we would choose between one and 10. We need to multiply by 10 to the power of now we've got a small number here, which is less than one. So this is going to have a negative power. And we need to figure out how many times we move the decimal point to get from four to be this number. So if we had four, the decimal point would be here. And we would move it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. So answer would be four times 10 to the power of negative seven. Or a student once actually told me a bit of a shortcut. They said, well, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven zeros in front. So you can just write four times 10 to the negative seven. And I thought that was quite a, a neat way to do it, is just count the number of zeros. Okay, and finally, we've got 0 0.018. And if we want to write that in standard form, well, it's going to be 1.8, because that's the number we choose between one and 10, multiplied by 10. And now, We've got 1.8, so the decimal point's here, and we want to move the decimal point one twice to the left, so the power would be negative two. Alternatively, you might have spotted the pattern that my student mentioned to me, and because it's a small number, a not point number, and it's got two zeros, it'll be to the power of negative two. Okay, now let's have a look at these questions using the other approach, so let's get rid of that. Okay, let's have a look at our first question. So our first question is to write 7,000 in standard form. So we want a number between one and 10, and a sensible number to choose here would be seven. And we're then gonna have multiplied by 10 and to a certain power. Now if we have seven, seven's in the unit to the ones column, and we wanna move it one, two, three columns to the left. So we wanna move the seven, three columns to the left. So we would multiply by 10, 
a hundred and a thousand. So it's actually a thousand is ten cubed. So if we want to move our three columns to the left, we have a power of three. So the answer would be seven multiplied by ten cubed. Next, we've got two million five hundred thousand. So we've got to choose a number between one and ten. So a sensible choice here would be two point five, and then times ten and to a certain power. So let's put two point five in. So the two would be in the ones column or the units column there. We'd have our decimal point and we'd have our five. And we want to move the digits one, two, three, four, five, six columns to the left. So we would have to the power of six. So two point five times ten to the power of six would be two million five hundred thousand. Okay, let's have a look at some small numbers. So we've got 0 0.0000004. So that would be, well, we need a number between 1 and 10. So we're going to have 4 times 10. Now, because this is a small number, we're going to have a negative power because 10 to the negative 1 is 0 0.1. So we'll be multiplied by 0 0.1. 10 to the power of two, negative 2 would be 0 0.01 and so on. So we want, a, we want a negative power, a very small number. And if we, and if we put our 4 in our units or our ones column there, we want to move the 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 columns to the right. So because we want to move it 7 columns to the right, the power would be negative 7. So the answer would be 4 multiplied by 10 to the power of negative 7. And finally, 0 0.018, well a sensible number to choose between 1 and 10 would be 1.8, and we want to multiply it by 10 to the power of negative something because we want it to be smaller. And we've put one, our 1 1.8, in our columns, our one is in our units column, or our ones column, and we want to move it to our hundredths column. So we want to move the one, one, two columns to the right. So we want to times it by 1.8 times 10 to the power of negative two. Okay, next. Now let's look at how we would write numbers that are almost in standard form in standard form. So if we have a look at this number, 562.8 times 10 to the power of 5. This number is almost in standard form. And what I mean by that is we need a number between 1 and 10. And this number at the front isn't between 1 and 10. So we need to make it between 1 and 10. So if I had the number 562.8, I would divide that by 100. Because if I divide that by 100, I would get 5.628. And that's between 1 and 10. But if I divide one number by 100, so for instance, if I had 700 multiplied by 2, the answer is equal to 1,400. If I divide this number by 100 and get 7, I would need to multiply this number by 100 to get 200 to still keep the same answer. So if I've divided this by 100, I need to multiply this by 100 to make sure our answer stays the same. So it's going to be 5.628 multiplied by 10. So if I multiply this by 100, I'd multiply by 10, so that'd be 10 to the power of 6, and I multiply by 10 again, so that'd be 10 to the power of 7. So the answer would be 5.628 times 10 to the power of 7. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at another one. Okay, this time we've got 0 0.0024 times 10 to the power of 9. Now this isn't a standard form because this number needs to be between 1 and 10. So we're going to have to write 2.4 here because that would then make sure that we would have a number between 1 and 10 at the front. And then we would do multiply by 10 to the power of something. So we'll multiply this by, we'll move the 2, 1, 2, 3 places to the left. So we'll multiply this by 1,000. So if we multiply this by 1,000, we need to divide this by 1,000. So dividing it by 10 would be 10 to the power of 8. Dividing it by 10 again would be 10 to the power of 7. And dividing it by 10 again would be 10 to the power of 6. Or another way to look at it is if we were dividing it by 1,000, remember that's 10 cubed. And then if we take away the powers, we get 10 to the power of 6. And that's it. So just make sure that if you have a number that's almost in standard form, if you make the number at the front 10 times larger, you need to make the times by 10 bit 10 times smaller to make sure that the answer stays the same. Okay, next. Okay, let's look at how to do our arithmetic with numbers in standard form. So how to do adding numbers in standard form, multiplying numbers in standard form, dividing numbers in standard form, and so on. Now, with adding numbers in standard form, there's no set rule. So if I had 5.3 times 10 to the power of 7, plus 7.96 times 10 to the power of 8. The way I would do this question would be to write them out in full. So I'm going to write R 5.3 times 10 to the power of 7 in full. So that would be 5, 3, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 zeros. And then we've got 7.96 times 10 to the power of 8 will be plus 7, 
96. So that'd be 796. And then we would then have another six zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then we need to add these numbers together. And whenever we're adding them together, I'm just going to use the column method. So let's line them up. So we've got 796 and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 zeros. 5, 3 and then 6 zeros. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and then 3, 5. Okay, and then we're going to add them. So let's just add them and see what we get. So it would be 0 plus 0 is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. We've then got 6 plus 3 is 9. 9 plus 5 is equal to 14. So put the 4 down, carry the 1. And 7 plus 1 is equal to 8. So the answer would be 849 million. Or we might want to write it in standard form again. So it would be 8.49 times 10 to the power of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So it would be to the power of 8. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So the next question is multiplying numbers in standard form. And I like this because we can now put together our laws of indices. If we have 9 times 10 to the power of 4, multiplied by 2 times 10 to the power of 5. So what we can do is we can multiply the numbers at the front. We can do 9 times 2 is equal to 18. And then we can multiply the 10 to the powers. So we could do 10 to the power of 4 multiplied by 10 to the power of 5. And whenever we're multiplying things with the same base, they're both 10 to the power of something, we add the powers. So we would do 10 to the power of 4 plus 5 to the power of 9. So that's not our answer because that's 18 times 10 to the power of 9. Remember, if for our answer to be in standard form, we want it to be between 1 and 10. So we're going to do 1.8 times 10. Now we've made 18 10 times smaller. So we need to make this 10 times larger. So 10 to the power of 9 times by 10 would be 10 to the power of 10. So the answer would be 1.8 times 10 to the power of 10. Now, as well as being able to do this in a non-calculator paper, it's also important to be able to do it in a calculator paper. So let's have a look and see how we would type this in in our calculator. So on our calculator, we've got our standard form button here, down at the center there at the bottom. We've got our multiplied by 10 to the power of x there. Now, whenever I'm doing a question like this, I tend to like to use brackets. Um, so I would write it like this. So I would open up my brackets to begin with. I would press my 9, because that's the number between 1 and 10 we're going to use. And then I would press the standard form button there. And then you would get, it would come up with 9 times 10. And then you'd press 4. And that would be how you type in 9 times 10 to the power of 4. It would look something like this. And then close brackets. So you press, so you open up your brackets, you press 9, the standard form button, and then press 4 to show that the power is 4, and then close brackets. Then press times. And then for this 2 times 10 to the power of 5, you're going to do 2, the standard form button, and then 5 and then close brackets and press equals. And you should get this as your answer. It'd be a good idea to practice that now. Get your calculator and try typing this in. And the answer in your display should look something like this, where we had 1.8 times 10 to the power of 10. And that was our answer. And that's it. OK, let's have a look at our next question. So this time we've got a division question. And we've got 4.5 multiplied by 10 to the power of 7 divided by, or over, 9 times 10 to the power of negative 5. So we've got a large number divided by a very small number. And whenever we divide by a very small number, it's going to get even bigger. So let's have a look at this question and see what we do. So we've got 4.5 times 10 to the power of 7. And we're dividing that by 9 times 10 to the power of negative 5. So we're going to do 4.5 divided by 9. Let's actually do that quickly. Now I know the answer is 0 0.5, but I'm just going to show you how. 4 divided by 9 is 0, remainder 4. And 45 divided by 9 it would be equal to 5. So that would be equal to 0 0.5. So 4.5 divided by 9 is 0 0.5. Then we've got our multiply by 10 part. So we've got 10 to the power of 7 divided by 10 to the power of negative 5. And remember, whenever we're dividing, we take away the power. So we've got 7 minus minus 5. And 7 minus minus 5, we would add on the 5, would be multiplied by 10 to the power of 12. Because 7 minus minus 5 would be 12. So we would get 0 0.5 multiplied by 10 to the power of 12. Now this isn't in standard form because this needs to be between 1 and 10. So we're going to multiply that by 10 to get 5. But we need to divide this by 10. So 10 to the power of 12, take away one of those 10s, would be 10 to the power of 11. So that would be 5 multiplied by 10 to the power of 11. Now to work out a fraction of an amount, you divide by the denominator and you multiply by the numerator. So let's have a look at two questions here. So we've been asked to work out 1 third of 24. So to work out a third of 24, well, the denominator is 3. So I'm going to take my 24 and I'm going to divide it by 3. We're dividing by the denominator. So 24 divided by 3 is 8. So we've got 8. And then we would times that by the numerator. Now the numerator is just 1 here and 8 times 1 is just 8. So the answer would be 8. So 
to find a fraction of an amount, you just divide by the denominator and multiply by the numerator. If the numerator is 1, you could just divide by the denominator. OK, let's have a look at our next question. We've been asked to work out 4 fifths of 35. So again, we're going to take our 35 and we're going to divide by the denominator. So we're going to do 35 divided by 5. And 35 divided by 5 is 7 because 5 times 7 is 35. Now we're going to take that 7 and we're going to multiply by the numerator. 7 multiplied by 4 and 7 times 4 is equal to 28. So 4 fifths of 35 is equal to 28. And that's it. Now this is a very important topic where you're quite often asked to find fractions of amounts, whether it's in the exam or whether it's even in real life in a shop and so on. Um, so working out fractions of amounts is very important and that's video 137 on Corbett Maths. So our next topic is to express as a fraction. So sometimes you're asked to express something as a fraction. So here's a typical question. It says, write two days as a fraction of three weeks. So here we've got three weeks and three weeks, well, the seven days in a week, so three times seven is equal to 21 days. So we've been asked to write two days as a fraction of 21 days and so we would just write down two days out of 21 or 2 over 21 and that's it so to express something as a fraction whatever the total is you put that on the denominator and whatever you've been asked to write as a fraction of that total you put on the numerator and that's it OK, let's have a look at our next topic. So the next topic is to find a fraction of a shape. So here we've got a grid and we've been asked to shade in two thirds of the grid. Now, whenever you find in two thirds of this grid, you can do it in different ways. You could say, well, if I'm shading in two thirds, that's two out of every three squares. So if I had a look at this top row, you've got three squares and you could shade in two of them. Shade in, shade in and leave blank. Then go to the next row and shade in, shade in and leave blank. And then the last row, again, you could go shade in, shade in and leave blank. Um, <laughs> my shade is terrible there. Um, so that's one way you could do that question. Uh, so you could just consider as in if you're being asked to shade in two thirds, you'd shade in two of them but leave one blank. Or if you were to shade in three quarters, you'd shade in three of them and leave one blank and so on. Alternatively, you could have looked at the columns here and you could have said, well, there's three columns, one, two, three. I need to shade in two thirds so I could shade in two columns and leave one blank and then that would have worked as well. Alternatively, you could have said, well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine squares. You could work out two thirds of nine and that would be six as well. And then you would just shade in the six squares. That's it. OK, so fraction of a shape and that's video 143 on Corbett Maths. Right, so let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is equivalent fractions and that's video 135 in Corbett Maths. So here we've got two fractions that are equivalent to each other, one half and five tenths. And as you can see, one half is the same as five tenths. Now, for two fractions to be equivalent to each other, the numerator and denominator must be multiplied or divided by the same number to get an equivalent fraction. So as you can see here, if we multiply 1 by 5, we get 5. And if we multiply the denominator of 2 by 5, we get that's equal to 10. So we've multiplied the numerator by 5 and we've multiplied the denominator by 5, and that's given us an equivalent fraction. And it also works for division. If we started with the 5 tenths, if we divided by 5 and divided by 5, then you get a half. So for two fractions to be equivalent to each other, the numerators and denominators must be multiplied or divided by the same number. So here we've got two thirds, and that's equal to 8 over blank. And we're trying to find this missing number for these equivalent fractions. So to get from 2 to 8, we multiply by 4. So multiply by 4. So we've multiplied the numerator by 4. So let's multiply the denominator by 4. So let's do 3 times 4. And 3 times 4 is equal to 12. So 2 thirds is equal to 8 twelfths. They're equivalent to each other. OK, so let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is simplifying fractions or cancelling down fractions. So here we've got three fractions and we're going to cancel them down. We're going to simplify them. So let's have a look at our first one. So our first question says to simplify 6 eighths. So to simplify 6 eighths, we see what we can divide them both by or what are the common factors. Now, with the two numbers, they'll always have a common factor of 1, but dividing them by 1 won't help us simplify it or make the numbers any smaller. So we're going to look for common factors apart from 1. So with 6 and 8, I can divide both of these by 2. So let's divide 6 and 8 both by 2 and see what we get. Well, 6 divided by 2 is 3, and 8 divided by 2 is 4. So our answer would be 3 quarters. So whenever you simplify 6 eighths, Eighths, that's the same as three quarters. OK, our next one. So our next one is 15 25ths. So we're looking for a common factor. What can we divide both of these numbers by? And well, 15 and 25, they're both in the five times tables. So let's divide both of them by five. Well, 15 divided by five is three and 25 divided by five is five. So then we get three fifths and three and five. Well, we can't divide these by anything. Well, you know, we could divide them by one, but that's not going to change anything. So we've simplified it as far as possible. 
Okay, let's have a look at our last question. So our last question is a simplified 12 8 times. Now, 12 8 times, you can actually divide both the numerator and the denominator here by different common factors. We could divide both of them by 2, and that would give us 6 over 9. But as you'll notice here, 6 and 9 are both divisible by 3, so then you'd divide both of them by 3, and that would give you 2 over 3. We could have divided 12 8 times both by 3 because both of these numbers are in the 3 times tables. And if we divide both of them by 3, we get, well, 12 divided by 3 is 4. And 18 divided by 3 is equal to 6. So you get 4 sixths. Now they're both even, so you can divide them both by 2 to get 2 thirds. Or alternative, you might have noticed that 12 and 18 are both in the 6 times tables. So you do, you can, if you can divide them by the highest common factor, that would be fantastic if you can spot it. So 12 and 18, you can divide both of them by 6. 12 divided by 6 is 2, and 18 divided by 6 is 3. So you get to 2 thirds. So whenever you simplify fractions, you might be able to cancel it down to the final answer straight away. Or sometimes you might want to just half both of the numbers to give you sort of smaller numbers, then you can divide again and so on. And that's it. So the next topic is to order fractions. And this is video 144 in Corporate Maths. And we've been asked to arrange in order smallest first, 3 quarters, 2 thirds, 5 sixths, and 7 twelfths. So what we're going to do is we're going to make all these fractions have the same denominator. So if we've got 4, 3, 6, and 12, we want to make all these denominators the same number. Now what's great is, if you notice here we've got 7 twelfths, well, we can times 4 by 3 to get 12, we can multiply 3 by 4 to get 12, and we can double 6 to get 12. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find equivalent fractions, but all of them are going to have 12 on the denominator and then we can look at them and see which one's the biggest and so on so we've got three quarters well to get from four to 12 you multiply by three so we're going to need to multiply the numerator here by three well three times three is nine so three quarters is nine twelfths to get from three to 12 you multiply by four so you need to multiply this numerator by four two times four is equal to eight so two thirds is the same as eight twelfths We've got five sixths. Well, to get from six to 12, you double it, or you multiply by two. So doubling five would give us 10. And then finally, well, we had seven twelfths, that's seven twelfths. Now we need to arrange in order. Now, as you can see here, we've got nine twelfths, eight twelfths, 10 twelfths, and seven twelfths. As you can see, the smallest one would be our seven twelfths. So in order, it would be seven twelfths. Then our next smallest, so we've done that one, our next smallest would be this one, which was 8 twelfths, but in the question it was 2 thirds, so let's write what they gave us in the question, which is 2 thirds. Next, we've got our 9 twelfths, and again in the question they give us 3 quarters, so let's write that down, 3 quarters. And finally, the largest fraction was our 10 twelfths, which is 5 sixths, so we'll write that down, 5 sixths. So our answer is 7 twelfths, 2 thirds, 3 quarters, and 5 sixths. And just remember, if you want to practice any more questions like this, that booklet is really useful. So if you go to the description and click on that, you'll find that there'll be questionnaire and order and fractions. Our next topic is adding fractions, and that's video 133 on corporate maths. So to add fractions, it's very important that the fractions have the same denominator, a common denominator. So for instance, if we were asked to work out two fifths plus a quarter, as you can see, the denominators, the numbers on the bottom of the fraction, aren't the same. We've got a five and a four. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the lowest common multiple of five and four. Well, that's going to be 20, because 5, 10, 15, 20, 4, 8, 12, 16, 20. The lowest common multiple of both of them is 20. And what we're going to do is we're going to find two equivalent fractions. Now remember, to find an equivalent fraction, we consider what do you multiply 5 by to get to 20? Well, that's 4. So you multiply the numerator by 4 as well. So 4 times 2 is equal to 8. So 2 fifths is the same as 8 twentieths. Next, our quarter. We want to have 20 on the denominator. So to get from 4 to 20, you multiply by 5. So you need to multiply the 1 by 5 as well. So that's going to be 5. So 1 quarter is 5 twentieths. And finally, we've got 8 twentieths plus 5 twentieths. When we're adding fractions with the same denominator, we just add the numerators. So if we had 8 twentieths plus 5 twentieths, that's going to be 13 twentieths. And that's it. So 2 fifths plus 1 quarter is 13 twentieths. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So our next question is to work out 2 and 7 ninths plus 1 and 2 thirds. So here we've got some mixed numbers, and the mixed numbers where you've got a whole number and a fraction. So for instance, 4 and a half. And we're going to be dealing with these mixed numbers. And whenever we're dealing with mixed numbers, whenever we're adding or subtracting or multiplying and dividing fractions, it can be very useful to turn them into top-heavy fractions. And that's where we write them as a fraction with a larger number on the numerator than on the denominator. 
And to do that, well, we just consider two, and we're dealing in ninths here. So if I had a cake or a pizza and I cut it into ninths, it'd be nine ninths in a pizza. In two pizzas, there would be 18 slices. You'd have 18 ninths. So two is equal to 18 ninths. And then we've got another seven ninths. So if I had 18 ninths and another seven ninths, that would be 18 plus seven is 25 ninths. Now the shortcut I take with this is, so if I just take the whole number, which is two, and times it by the denominator, so two times nine is 18, and add on the seven is 25. So that gives me the 25 ninths. Next, I take the whole number, which is one, and I do one times three is three, and add on the numerator, which is two, so three plus two is equal to five, so it would be five, thirds. And again, let's just check this. If I had a pizza and I cut it into thirds, that's three slices. And another two slices is five slices. So here we've written our mixed numbers as top heavy fractions. So we want to have the same denominators. So we've got ninths and we've got thirds. So the lowest common multiple of nine and three would just be nine. We can multiply both the numerator and the denominator of this fraction by three, and that would give us nine on the denominator. So let's do that. So we've got 25 ninths, and then we're going to add, if we multiply both of these by three, we get, well, five times three is 15, and three times three is equal to nine. So we've got 25 ninths plus 15 ninths, and that's fantastic because they've both got the same denominator. So if we just add the numerators, 25 plus 15 is 40, so the answer would be 40 ninths. Now if the question's in mixed numbers, such as like, you know, two and seven ninths, I would change this top heavy fraction or answer into a mixed number as well. Remember the line in a fraction means divided by, so how many nines go into 40? Well, four nines is equal to 36, so it's going to be four. And 36, well, we have 40, so our remainder would be four. So our answer would be four and four ninths, and that's it. Our next topic is now subtracting fractions, and that's the same technique. We get a common denominator, and then we just take away the top numbers. We take away the numerators instead. So if we had nine tenths and two thirds, so if you look at the denominators, we've got 10 and three. Now the first number in the 10 times tables and three times tables would be 30. So I'm gonna write a common denominator of 30. So if I multiply both of the numerator and the denominator of this fraction by three, well 10 times three is 30, and nine times three is 27. And with this fraction, we had two thirds. If we multiply the three by 10, we get 30. And if we multiply the two by 10, we get 20. So we've got 27 thirtieths, take away 20 thirtieths. Well, if you had 27 thirtieths and you took away 20 thirtieths, you're left with 7 thirtieths, just taking away the numerators. And that's it. Okay, our next topic. Our next topic is multiplying fractions. So multiplying fractions is really easy. You just need to multiply the numerators and multiply the denominators, and that's it. So if you had two fifths times a quarter, if you multiply the numerators, two times one, that's two. And if you multiply the denominators, five times four, that's 20. Now the answer here is two twentieths. I'm gonna cancel this down, I'm gonna simplify it. We can divide both of these by two. So our final answer would be one tenth. Okay, next, we've got one and one seventh multiplied by two thirds. Again, this is a mixed number, so let's make this a top-heavy fraction. One times seven is seven, plus the one is eight, so one and one seventh would be eight sevenths. Or another way to think of it is if you had a pizza and you cut it into seven slices, and then you had an extra one, that's gonna be eight slices, so that's eight sevenths. And then multiply by two thirds. So let's multiply the numerators, so eight times two is 16, and seven times three is 21. So the answer would be 16 over 21. 16 and 21 have no common factors apart from one, and that's not gonna help us. So if you want more practice in multiplying fractions, if you watch video 142 on corporate maths, you can watch the video tutorial on it, you can do some practice questions, do the textbook exercises, but also remember you've got that practice question booklet, so you can do these questions down that booklet and just make sure you're, you're happy with this topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Our next topic is dividing fractions, which is video 134 in corporate maths. So to divide fractions, what we do is we multiply by the reciprocal of the number we're dividing by. And that sounds really complicated, but what it means is if you've got 7 fifteenths divided by 3 quarters, instead of doing 7 fifteenths divided by 3 quarters, what we can do is we can do 7 fifteenths multiply by, and then we can find the reciprocal of three quarters. And the reciprocal is a fancy word for flipping it over. So instead of writing three quarters, we could write four thirds. Okay, so we've got seven fifteenths multiplied by four thirds. Now we've got multiply, so we can just multiply the numerators and multiply the denominators. So seven times four is equal to 28, and 15 times three is equal to 45. So the answer is 28 45ths. And apart from one, they've got no other common factors, so that's it. 
So if you watch video 134, that'd be quite a useful video to see why this works. But in this video, I'm just trying to make sure that you're familiar with each of these topics. So to divide fractions, so what we do is instead of dividing by three quarters, we multiply by its reciprocal. So we change the divide to multiply and you find the reciprocal of the second number. And then you just multiply the fractions and that will give you the answer. Okay, our next question. Our next question is to work out two and a half divided by one and three fifths. So we've got mixed numbers here, so let's turn them into top-heavy fractions. So 2, well, we've got 2 times 2 is 4, plus 1 is 5, so it's going to be 5 halves. And another way to think about it, remember, is if we're dealing with halves, if you had two pizzas and cut them into halves, you've got four of them, and another one would be five of them, so that would be five halves. And we're dividing by, well, if we look, we've got 1 and 3 fifths, so 1 times 5 is 5, plus 3 is 8, so it's going to be 8 fifths. Now, remember, we want to multiply by the reciprocal of the number we're dividing by. So we're going to write 5 over 2 multiplied by 5 over 8. Next, we're going to multiply. So we've got 5 times 5 is 25, and 2 times 8 is 16. So our answer would be 25 over 16. Now, because the question is given in mixed numbers, I'm going to write this top every fraction as a mixed number. So the line means divide by, so we've got 25 divided by 16. So there's 1 16 in 25, and the remainder is 9, so we've got 1 and 9 sixteenths, and that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is equivalent fractions, decimals, and percentages. So it's very important to know that if you had a half, that's the same as 0 0.5, which is the same as 50%, or a quarter is the same as 0 0.25, which is the same as 25%, and so on. So it's very important to know these key fractions, decimals, and percentages. So for instance, knowing that 7 tenths is the same as 0 0.7, or 7 tenths, which is 70%. So it's important to know these key equivalences here, and the, this is the code mass revision card on fractions, decimals, and percentages. But it's also important to to know how to change a fraction to a decimal or a fraction to a percentage, a decimal to a fraction, a decimal to a percentage, and a percentage to a fraction, a percentage to a decimal. And it's important to know how to change between these. And if you watch video 121 all the way up to video 129, that will show you in detail how to change between each of them. One way which I tend to do is I just learned to change a fraction to a decimal. I did the numerator divided by the denominator, so that gives me 0 0.5. 1 divided by 2 is 0 0.5. The change from a decimal to a percentage, I times by 100. So 0 0.5 times 100 is 50, so then I write 50%. And then if I want to go the other way, if I wanted to write a percentage as a decimal, I just divide by 100. And then to write a percentage as a fraction, I just, because it's a percentage, I know it's out of 100, so I would write 50 over 100, and I would cancel it down to 1 half. And that's it. Okay, so let's have a look at some questions. So here's a table, and we've been asked to fill in the missing numbers. So 1 half, well, a half is the same as 0 0.5. And if you do 1 divided by 2, you get 0 0.5. As a percentage, well, 0 0.5 times by 100 is 50. So it's going to be 50%. Here we've got 0 0.25 and 25%. Well, I know straight away off by heart that's equal to a quarter. But if I didn't, I would write 25 over 100 because that's a percentage. And then I would cancel it down and simplify it. So I could divide both of these by 25. So 25 divided by 25 is 1. And 100 divided by 25 is 4. So that would be 1 quarter. So that's 1 quarter. Here we've got a fifth. So we've got 1 fifth. And that's 20%. So let's divide our 20% by 100 to get it as a decimal. So 20 divided by 100 is 0 0.2. So that would be 0 0.2. So 1 fifth is 0 0.2, which is 20%. And finally, we've got 0 0.17. Well, let's write that as a percentage to begin with. So let's multiply this by 100. So 0 0.17 multiplied by 100. Well, that would move the 1 two columns to the left. So it would be in the tens. The 7 would move two columns to the left. So it would move into the units or ones. So it would be 17%. So that would be 17%, and as a fraction, that's 17 over 100, and I don't think that can be cancelled down, no. So that's it, so 17 over 100, and that's it. Okay, so our next topic is expressing as a percentage. Now we've looked at expressing as a fraction, so let's look at expressing as a percentage, and that's video 237 on Corbett Maths. So whenever I'm expressing something as a percentage, I tend to express it as a fraction first of all, and then I change it into a percentage. So the question says, in a box there's 20 counters. Nine of the counters are blue. What percentage of the counters are blue? So I can express that as a fraction to begin with. I know that nine of the counters are blue, so I know there's 20 counters in the box, and nine of them are blue. So that means that nine twentieths are blue. Now, if I'm doing this on a non-calculator paper, I want to get this to a percentage, which means that I want to write this as a fraction with 100 on the denominator. To get from 20 to 100, we multiply by 5. So 20 times 5 is 100. I then look at my numerator, which is 9, and I times that by 5 as well. And 9 times 5 is 45. So that means that if I know that 9 twentieths of the counters are blue, that would be the same as 45 out of 100 being blue, which is 45%. 
So that's how I would do it without a calculator. But if I was doing this on a calculator, what I would tend to do is I would write it as a fraction to begin with, which is 9 over 20, like so. And then I want to change that into a percentage. So I would just do 9 divided by 20 on my calculator. And 9 divided by 20 on my calculator is equal to 0 0.45. So I would just do the division, 9 divided by 20. And that gives it as a decimal, 0 0.45. And then I times by 100. So I times by 100. And that would give me... 45%. Okay, our next topic is percentage of amounts. And this is a very important topic. And quite often we'll be asked to do it either with or without a calculator. I'm going to do it without a calculator to begin with. And then I'm going to show you how to do it on a calculator. So this is videos 234 and 235 on corporate maths. Now, whenever I'm working out percentage of amounts without a calculator, I tend to remember these four building blocks. You've got 50%. To find 50% of something, you divide by two. To find 25% of something, you divide by four or you half it and half it again. And that will give you 25%, so that's divided by 4, half and half and again. Then we've got to find 10%, you divide by 10, and to find 1%, you divide by 100. And with these four building blocks, we should be able to work out these questions quite nicely. So our first question says, work out 25% of 60. So to find 25% of something, you divide by 4. So we're going to take our 60, and we're going to divide it by 4. So 60 divided by 4, well, to divide by 4, you could divide by 4 using our short division, or you could divide it by 2 and divide it by 2, or half it and half it again. So 60 halved is 30, and halved again is 15. So the answer would be 15 centimetres. Okay, our next question. Our next question says, find 60% of 800. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find 50%, I'm going to find 10%, and then I'm going to add them together. So if we take our 800 and we take 800 and we divide it by 2, we will find 50%. So 800 divided by 2 is equal to 400. So that's equal to 400, so that's 50%. Now we want to find our 10%. So to find 10%, we divide by 10. So we take our 800 and we divide it by 10. And 800 divided by 10 is 80, and that's 10%. Now we want to find what 60% is, so we would add these two together. So if we add our 50% and 10%, we will find 60%. Now 400 plus 80 is 480. So 60% of 800 is equal to 480. Okay, and our last question. Our last question says, find 5% of 90. Now to find 5%, I tend to want to find 10% and then half it. So let's find 10% of 90 to begin with. So to find 10%, we divide by 10. So we're going to do 90 divided by 10. And 90 divided by 10 is 9, so that's 10%. So we find 10% is equal to 9, but we want 5%, which is half of 10%. So if we do 9 divided by 2, that's equal to 4.5. So the answer would be 4.5. So whenever we find a percentage of amounts with a calculator, there's two common approaches. One of them is to find 1% and then multiply by the percent you want. So for instance, if we were asked to find 19% of 240, what I would do is I would divide 240 by 100 to find 1%. So I would do 240 divided by 100 to get 1%. And because it's a calculator, you can type in 240 divided by 100 and you get 2.4, so 2.4. And then if we wanted to find 19% of 240, I would just take our 1%, which is 2.4, and I would multiply by the percent we want, which is 19. So then you do 2.4 multiplied by 19, and you'll find an answer of, 45.6 and that's it so 19 percent of 240 is 45.6 so to find the percentage of an amount on a calculator i tend to divide by 100 to find one percent and then multiply by the percent you want and there is another approach and that's by changing the percentage that you want to find of the number into a decimal so changing 19 percent to a decimal that's 0.19 this is called a multiplier and you multiply the 0 0.19 by the 240 and that would give you 45.6 as well so if you want to find a percentage of an amount on a calculator you can divide by 100 to find one percent and times by the percent you want or you can change the percentage of the amount you want to find, so 19% into a decimal, and then you can multiply that decimal, that multiplier, by the number you're finding the percentage of. So you could do 0.19 times by 240. Okay, let's have a look now, finding a percentage of an amount where the percentage is greater than 100%. So we're going to find 180% of £300. Now, there's lots of different ways to do this, but I'm going to show you one way to begin with, and then I'll talk about a few of our approaches you could use at the end. So we're going to find 180% of £300. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find 80 80% of £300 and then add it on to 100% of £300. So let's find 80% of £300 to begin with. So let's find 80%. So to find 80%, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find 10% and then times it by 8. And that would give me 80%. So let's find 10% of £300. So 10% of £300, if I divide £300 by 10, I will get 10%, which is equal to £30. So £30 is 10% of £300.
Now we want 80%, so I'm going to times that by 8 to get 80%. So I'm going to find 80% of £300. So 80% of £300, if I times that by 8, well, 8 times 3 is 24, so 8 times 30 would be £240. So we've now found 80% of £300, which is £240. Now to find 180%, I just need to add that on to 100%. So 100% of £300 would obviously just be £300. So if I take our £300, or 100%, and I add the 80%, which is £240, that will tell me 180% of £300. So 300 plus 240 would be equal to £540. So 180% of £300 would be £540. So that's one way to do it. There's other approaches that we could use. We could take our £300 and we could divide it by 100 to get 1%, which would be £3. And then we could just times by 180, and that would tell us 180%, which is equal to £540. Okay, and that's it. Okay, let's have a look now at increasing and decreasing by percentage. And we're going to do these questions using a non-calculator approach. If I was increasing or decreasing by percentage using a calculator, I would often use multipliers, and that's mentioned later on in the video. But in this question, I'm going to show you how to increase amounts by percentage and decrease amounts by percentage without using a calculator. And that's video 238 in Corporate Maths. So let's increase 75 centimetres by 20%. So if I wanted to increase 75 centimetres by 20%, first of all, I want to find out what 20% of 75 centimeters is so let's find 10 percent. so 10 percent of 75 centimeters so to find 10 percent of 75 centimeters we're going to divide by 10 so 75 divided by 10 would be 7.5 centimeters now 20 percent will be double that so to find 20 percent of 75 centimeters we'll just double that so double 7.5 will be equal to 15 so that would be 15 centimeters so that means that 20 percent of 75 centimeters would be 15 centimeters but we've been asked to increase 75 centimeters by 20 percent so what that means is we need to add that 20 percent on that 15 centimeters onto what we started with so we're going to take our 75 centimeters and we're going to add 15 centimeters and that's equal to 90 centimeters so if we were to increase 70 75 centimeters by 20 percent our answer would be 90 centimeters okay our next question says to decrease nine thousand pound by three percent so if i wanted to decrease nine thousand pound by three percent i'm going to find one percent and then i'm going to times it by three to find three percent and then because we've been asked to decrease nine thousand pound by three percent whatever that three percent is i'll take it away from nine thousand to decrease nine thousand by three percent so let's find one percent to begin with so one percent of nine thousand pound so to find 1% of an amount, we would divide by 100. So 9,000 divided by 100 is equal to 90. So 1% is equal to 90 pound. But we don't want 1%, we want 3%. So we could add three lots of 1%. So we could add three lots of 90. And three lots of 90 would be 270 pound. Or we could just take our 1% and we could just times it by 3, and that would be equal to 3%. So 90 times 3 would be equal to £270. So 3% of £9,000 is £270. But in this question, we weren't asked what 3% of £9,000 is. We were asked to decrease £9,000 by 3%. So that means we need to take that £270 away from £9,000, and that will tell us our answer. So if we take our £9,000, and we take away £270, that will decrease £9,000 by 3%. So 9000 take away 200 is 8800 and take away another £70 would be equal to £8,730. And that's our answer, £8,730. And that's it. Okay, so our next topic is percentage change, and this is video 233 in Corporate Maths. So percentage change is calculated by change divided by original times 100. Sometimes in a question you might be asked to find the percentage increase, percentage decrease, percentage profit or percentage loss, and they'll all be calculated the same way by using this formula. So this is a typical question. It says the height of a plant increases from 30 centimetres to 46 centimetres. Work out the percentage increase. So the formula is change. So as you can see, the change is 16 centimetres, so change is 16, divided by the original, which would be 30, and then times by 100. So if we do 16 divided by 30 times 100, we get... We get that's equal to 53.333 and so on percent. So the percentage increase would be 53.333 so on percent. Or we could round this. Sometimes in the question you're asked to give your answer to one or two decimal places. So let's round this to two decimal places. So the answer would be 53.33%. And that's it. So percentage change is change divided by original times 100. 
Okay, our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is simple interest. So simple interest is where interest is added on to money in a bank account. And simple interest is where the same amount is given every single year. So the question says £600 is invested for three years at 5% per year simple interest. Work out the total interest. So in this question, we're told that it's 5%. So let's work out 5% of 600. So let's take our 600 and divide it by 100. So that'll tell us 1%, which is six. And then take our six and multiply it by the percent we want, which is five. Six times five is equal to 30. So every single year, because it's simple interest, every single year, 30 pound of interest is earned. So in the first year, 30 pounds added on. In the second year, 30 pounds added on and so on. And we've been asked to work out the total amount of interest. So the money's been invested for three years. So that means that three lots of 30 has been earned in interest. So 30 multiplied by three is equal to 90. So the question asks us to work out the total interest earned. So that would be 90 pound. And that's it. If we were asked how much money would be in the bank account at the end of the three years, that 90 would be added on to the 600, so that would be 690 pound. But the question just asks us for the total interest, so that would be 90 pound. Right, so our next topic is compound interest, and that's video 236 on corporate maths. So compound interest is where the interest is added at the end of every single year. So our question says, James invested £8,000 in the bank for two years, and it earns compound interest at a rate of 5% per year. Calculate the total amount of money that James has in the bank at the end of two years. Now, there's two different ways to do this question, and I'm going to show you both approaches now. The first approach is to just treat it like a percentages question. So we're going to increase it by 5% to see how much James has at the end of the first year, and then to work out another 5% of that and add that on to see what he has at the end of two years. So at the beginning, he has £8,000, and let's work out 5% of that. So let's divide that by 100 and times by 5. So when we divide by 100, we get that's equal to 80. And if we do 80 multiplied by 5, because it's 5%, that gives us £400. So 5% of £8,000 is £400. Now, if we add that on, that's how much money James has at the end of the first year. So at the end of the first year, James would have 8000 plus 400 That's £8,400. Now, to see how much money James has at the end of the second year, we now need to work out 5% of this and add it on to find out what he has at the end of the second year. So we take our £8,400, because that's how much he has, divide that by 100, we get that's equal to £84. And then if we take our £84 and we times that by 5, we get 5%. So 84 multiplied by 5 is equal to £420. So in his second year, James earns more interest. He earns £420. And if we add that on to the £8,400, we'll see how much money James has in the bank account at the end of two years. So £8,400 plus 420 is equal to £8,820. So at the end of two years, James has £8,820 in the bank. So that's one approach, and that's quite a useful approach for a small number of years, maybe two years. But as we go into three years, four years, five years, it can get quite time consuming to do it that way. So there is a quicker way to do that. And to do that, I'm going to show you another topic called multipliers and then come back to compound interest. So we're going to look at multipliers, which is video 239 in corporate maths. Now, increasing by a percentage and decreasing by a percentage. Now, we can use a thing called a multiplier to do that really quickly and easily. So if we were asked to increase 500 by 8%, we can use a multiplier. Now, if we start off with 100% and we increase by 8%, we'll have 108%. And 108% is the same as 1.08 as a decimal number. So that would be our multiplier. So if we increase by 8%, we'll have 108%, and that's 1.08. So if we take our number, 500, and we multiply by 1.08, that will tell us our answer straight away. It will increase 500 by 8%. So that would be if we do 500 multiplied by 1.08, that gives us 540. So if we increase 500 by 8%, the answer would be 540. So we can use this multiplier really quickly and easily to do it. So in next one, if we wanted to increase 3,500 by 13%, well, the multiplier, well, if we had 100% and we increase by 13%, that's 113%. So our multiplier is 1.13. That's an increase of 13%. So if we take our 3,500 and multiply by 1.13, we get our answer. So 3,500 multiplied by 1.13 is equal to 3,955. So these multipliers are really great for increasing by percentage really quickly and easily, and that'll be useful for compound interest. Likewise, we can decrease using a multiplier. If we decrease something by 2%, we're left with 98%, because we would have started with 100%, and decreasing by 2% leaves us with 98%. So as a multiplier, 98% 98 is the same as 0.98, converting the percentage to a decimal. So we can just multiply 3,000 by 0.98. 
and that will tell us our answer right away. So 3,000 multiplied by 0 0.98 is equal to 2,940. So you can use a multiplier to decrease by a percentage as well. So if we wanted to decrease 8,000 by 24%, we would take our 8,000 and we would multiply by, well, we would have started off with 100%. We're decreasing by 24%, so 100 take away 24, 76. So our multiplier would be 0 0.76. And if we multiply those, we'll get our answer straight away. So 8,000 multiplied by 0 0.76 is equal to 6,080. And that's it. So this topic of multipliers will be really useful whenever we're looking at compound interest, because if we go back to our question, we had James invested £8,000 in the bank account for two years. It earned compound interest of 5% per year. So 5% increase would be 1.05 as a multiplier because it's gone from 100% to 105%. So we can use this multiplier really quickly and easily to work out our answer. So if we want to work out how much money James had in the bank account after one year, we could take the 8,000 and multiply it by 1.05. If we wanted to work out how much money he had at the end of two years, we could then times by another 1.05, and that would tell us how much money he has in the bank after two years. Or a really quick and easy way to do it is to do 8,000 multiplied by, because we're multiplying by 1.05 and multiplying by 1.05, we could write 1.05 squared using that index notation. So we could do 8,000 multiplied by 1.05 squared, and let's see what we get. So 8,000 multiplied by 1.05 squared equals 8,820. And that's the same answer as before. So this is really quick and easy way of doing compound interest questions. And it's got a formula. It's the initial, so the amount of money or whatever started with, multiplied by the multiplier to the power of time. So this formula will help us work out compound interest questions really easily. So our initial is the amount of money that was invested to begin with, the 8,000. Our multiplier, because it's a 5% increase, we used 1.05, so that's the multiplier. And because it was two years, so we used squared. If it was three years, we'd use cubed. If it was four years, we'd use to the power of four, and so on. And that's it. So our next topic is the reverse percentages, and that's video 240 in Corporate Maths. And remember, you can watch that video tutorial, video 240 in Corporate Maths, and it will go through reverse percentages in a lot of detail. Also, beside that video 240 in Corporate Maths, you'll find the practice questions, which are really great because they will have a lot of curveball questions in there, which are really fantastic to do. It'll have the textbook exercises, and it'll have the answers as well. So video 240, and also remember there's reverse percentages questions in that bumper pack of questions, which is in the description below. So here's a typical reverse percentages question. And it says, Rebecca is given a 35% pay rise. She is now paid 13.77 per hour. What was Rebecca's pay before the pay rise? So to do this, what we need to do is consider the fact that we have increased her pay by 35%. So that means she now has 135% because she had 100% before pay rise, and then she's given a 35% increase. So she's now got 135%. And 135% is equal to 13 pound 77. Now to find what her pay was before, we want to find 100%. So let's find 1% and then find 100%. So if we know what 135% is, we can divide by 135. We can divide by 135, and we can divide by 135. And when we do that, we get 1%, and 1% is equal to 0 0.102 pounds. And then we want to find what 100% is, so we'll multiply by 100. So let's multiply by 100, and let's multiply by 100. And when we do that, we'll get, well, 1% times by 100 is 100%, her pay before the pay rise. And whenever we multiply 0 0.102 pounds by 100, we get that's equal to 10 pound 20. So Rebecca's pay before the pay rise was 10 pound 20. Now there is another way to do this. I went through a topic called multipliers. And to increase by 35%, we use a multiplier of, we multiply by 1.35. So if you want to go backwards and find what number was increased by 35%, we could divide by the multiplier. So if you do 1377 divided by 1.35, you'll also find 10.20. And that's it. Okay, our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is simplifying ratios, and that's video 269 on corporate maths. And we're told the ratio of oranges to apples in a box is four to six. And whenever you go those two little dots, you read it as the word two, so four to six. And what that means is for every four oranges, there's six apples. So as you can see here, for every four oranges, there's six apples. And sometimes we can cancel ratios down. Because here we've got simplify four to six. Well, both of those numbers are divisible by two. So we divide both of them by two. So four divided by two is two. And six divided by two is three. So if we had the ratio of 4 to 6, we could simplify it to 2 to 3, and that would be an equivalent ratio. And that's it, and we've simplified these as far as we can go.
Okay, let's have a look at some more ratios and simplify those. And our next one is simplify 35 to 10. So both of these numbers are divisible by 5, so let's divide both of them by 5. So 35 divided by 5, that's 7. And 10 divided by 5 is 2. So the answer would be, if we, had, if we were asked to simplify 35 to 10, our answer would be 7 to 2. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So our next question says simplify 28 to 40. Now both of these numbers are divisible by 4, so we can divide 28 by 4, and we can divide 40 by 4. So 28 divided by 4 is 7, and 40 divided by 4 is 10. So 28 to 40 would be the same as 7 to 10. So if you're asked to simplify 28 to 40, the answer would be 7 to 10. And we can't simplify this any further because the only, thing you, only whole number you can divide these by is 1, and that wouldn't actually help. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is ratio, and writing ratios in the form of 1 to n, or n to 1. And that means 1 to a certain number or a certain number to 1. And in certain situations, it can be very useful to do that. So here we've got a question that says the ratio of adults to children on a school trip is 5 to 24. So that means that for every 5 adults, there's 24 children. So there could be 5 adults and 24 children, or it could be 10 adults and 48 children. It could be 15 adults and 72 children. It could even be 50 adults and 240 children, and so on. And we've been asked to write this ratio in the form of 1 to n. So instead of being 5 to 24, we want it in the form 1 to a number. So we want the left-hand number in the ratio to be 1. So to go from 5 to 1, we're going to have to divide by 5. So 5 divided by 5 is 1. So if we divide the left-hand side of the ratio by 5, we're going to have to divide the right-hand side of the ratio by 5. So we're going to have to do 24 divided by 5 as well. So divided by 5. And 24 divided by 5 is equal to 4.8. So if we were asked to write the ratio of adults to children in the form 1 to n, the answer would be 1 to 4.8. And that means that for every one adult, there's 4.8 children. Now, obviously, there can't be one adult and 4.8 children, but what it does is it lets us know that for every one adult, there's just under 5 children. Or perhaps there's even a rule. It might be that for a school trip, there needs to be a ratio of 1 to 4.5. So for every one teacher, there's 4.5 children. And with there being 1 to 4.8 in this trip, that they're actually going past that rule. So writing a ratio in the form of 1 to a certain number or a certain number to 1 can be very useful. And if in this question, instead of being asked to write the ratio in the form of 1 to n, we were asked to write it in the form n to 1, what we would want to do is make the number on the right-hand side of the ratio 1. So we'd divide both of these numbers by 24, and that would give us 0 point something to 1. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, let's have a look now at form and ratios. So we're told there's red and purple counters in the bag, and there's five times as many purple counters as red counters in the bag. Write down the ratio of red counters to purple counters in the bag. So we don't know the exact number of counters in the bag, but we do know there's five times as many purple counters as red counters. So for instance, there could be five purple counters and one red counter. There could be 10 purple counters and two red counters. There could even be 50 purple counters and 10 red counters. So we don't know the exact numbers, but we do know there's five times as many purple counters as red counters in the bag. And we've been asked to write down the ratio of red counters to purple counters in the bag. So for instance, if there was one red counter, there would be five purple counters. So that means the ratio of red counters the purple counters in the bag would be 1 to 5. For every one red counter, there's five purple counters. And that's it. Now, we could have chosen other numbers here. We could have said, for instance, there were two red and ten purple. And then we could simplify the ratio. And when we divide both of these numbers by two, we would get one to five. So the ratio of red counters to purple counters in the bag is one to five. So our next topic is ratios and fractions. And that's video 269A in Corbett Maths. And our question says, a box contains white beads and grey beads. And the ratio of white beads to the grey beads is two to three. So we don't actually know how many white beads and grey beads there are but what we do know is that for every two white beads there will always be three gray beads like so and we're asked what fraction of the beads are gray well if we have a look at this diagram this little sketch this will help us so if we work out what fraction of this is gray that will be the answer to how many fractions of the beads in the box are gray so we've got all together five beads here one two three four five so we'll put five on the denominator and for the numerator what fraction are gray well there's three that are gray so that means that three fifths of these five beads are gray so that means that three-fifths of the beads will be grey, and that's it. So whenever you're asked to write a ratio as a fraction, a diagram, a little sketch like this can be very useful, and our answer here would be three-fifths. And instead of being asked what fraction of the beads are grey, we could have been asked what percentage of the beads are grey, so we would then write it as a fraction, as we've just done, three-fifths, and then we'd just change the three-fifths to a percentage, so then that would be 60%, because three-fifths is 60%. If we're asked the question what percentage of the beads were white, well, altogether there was five beads and two of them are white. So we would write that as a fraction, two out of five, two-fifths of the beads are white. And then let's change 
degrees, that's a percentage. That would be, well, two fifths is 40%, because one fifth is 20%, so two fifths is 40%. So that would be 40%. So if you're asked to change the ratio to a percentage, I would often change it to a fraction to begin with, and then change that fraction into a percentage. Now, whenever we're dealing with ratio questions, we may encounter questions that look like this. Omar says there's 91 beads in the box. Explain why he must be incorrect. So it's very useful to consider what the ratio means. So we've got the ratio of white beads to gray beads in the box is two to three. So that means that in the box there could be, we could have white beads and gray beads, white and gray. There could be two, because the ratio is two to three, there could be two white and three gray, and altogether the total number of beads would be five there. Now there may not be five beads in the box, there may be more, so there could be another two white and another three gray. So another two white would be four, another three gray would be six, so that would be ten beads altogether. Now there may not be ten, so there may be more beads, there may be if we add another two white and another three gray, that would be six and nine, and six plus nine is equal to fifteen. And as you notice, the total number of beads is a multiple of five, because if we add the two and three together every time we're adding another five beads. So Omar says there's 91 beads in the box. Well, there can't be 91 beads in the box because if then the ratio of two to three, that means it must be a multiple of five. There must be a multiple of five number of beads in the box and 91 isn't a multiple of five. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is sharing in a ratio and that's video 270 on Corbin Mavs. So here's part of the Corbin Mavs revision card and we've got Jack and Chloe share 75 pound in the ratio two to three. How much money do they each receive? That's very important to be able to share a number in a ratio and to share a number in a ratio the first step is to add together the parts in the ratio because Jack gets two parts and Chloe gets three parts so all together two plus three would be five so there's five parts in total now what we're going to do is we're going to take the grand total of what they're sharing so in this case it's 75 pound and we're going to do 75 divided by whatever you get whenever you add the ratio together so we're going to divide it by five because two plus three is five so we know there's five parts in total so if we divide 75 by five we'll see how much money is in one part so 75 divided by five is 15 so that means it's 15 pound in one part now we know that Jack gets two parts and Chloe gets three parts. So that means that Jack gets two lots of 15 and Chloe gets three lots of 15. So for Jack, we're going to do 15 multiplied by his number in the ratio, which is two. So 15 times two is 30 pound. And for Chloe, she gets three parts. So we'll do the 15 pound multiplied by three, her number in the ratio. So for Chloe, we'll do 15 multiplied by three and that's equal to 45. And what's great is if we add £30 and £45, we get the £75 that we started with. So if you're asked to share something in a ratio, the steps would be, first of all, add the parts together in the ratio, then divide the grand total by the total number of parts, and then times each of the numbers by how much is in one part, and that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic, which is whenever we're dealing with ratio questions, whenever we're given one quantity, and that's video 271 on corporate maths. So here we've got the ratio of lemon sweets to strawberry sweets in a tub is five to three. So in this tub, for every five lemon sweets, there's three strawberry sweets. And we're told there's 120 lemon sweets in the tub. So rather than the last time when we we're told how many sweets there were all together, what we're told is how many lemon sweets there are. And we're asked how many strawberry sweets will there be in the tub? So in a question like this, whenever you give them one quantity, we know there's 120 lemon sweets. Now we're told the ratio of lemon to strawberry is five to three. So the lemon number in the ratio is five. So if we divide 120 by five, we'll find out how many sweets there are in one part. So 120 divided by five is equal to 24. So that means there's 24 in one part. And we find that by dividing how many lemon sweets there were by the lemon number in the ratio, the five. Now we're asked how many strawberry sweets were in the tub. Now strawberry is three parts, so what we'll do is we'll multiply 24 by three. So we'll do 24 multiplied by three, and that's equal to 72. So whenever you give them one quantity, so in this case we were told there was 120 lemon sweets, what you do is you divide that by the lemon part in the ratio, which was the five, and whenever you do 120 divided by five, that tells you how many sweets are in one part. And then you can times it by the other number in the ratio to see how many strawberry sweets there were in this case. And that's it. And if you were asked how many sweets there were in total, you could add together the 120 and the 72, and that tells you how many sweets there were all together. So that's it. Okay, so we're now going to look at what happens whenever we're given two ratios, and this is video 271A in corporate maths. So here we're told that a farmer keeps sheep, cows, and chickens on a farm and the ratio of sheep to cows so sheep to cows on the farm is four to three so that means that for every four sheep there's three cows and the ratio of cows to chickens is ten to seven so that means that for every ten cows 
the seven chickens. And we've been asked to find the ratio of sheep to cows to chickens. So whenever I'm given a question like this, I like to do a little table. So I like to write down what we've been given. So we've got sheep, so we've got sheep, cows, and chickens. Now it could have been in the question, it may not have told us what we're looking at. It could have just been the ratio of A to B and B to C. And then the headings in my table would be A, B, and C. But in this case, we were told what we're looking at, sheep, cows, and chickens. So the ratio of sheep to cows is four to three. So sheep to cows is four to three. So I'm gonna write that ratio down, four to three. And then we're told the ratio of cows to chickens is 10 to 7. So cows to chickens, and I'm just going to write that beneath, is 10 to 7. So if we have a look, we've got the ratio of sheep to cows is 4 to 3, and the ratio of cows to chickens is 10 to 7. So we've been asked to write this as one ratio of sheep to cows to chickens. So the key thing is going to be the cows, because if we have a look, the cows are in both ratios. For every four sheep, there's three cows, and for every ten cows, there's seven chickens. So if we can find a common multiple of three and ten, that will help us combine these as one single ratio. Now I'm going to find the lowest common multiple of three and ten. Well, the lowest common multiple of three and ten would be 30, because if you write down the multiples of three, three, six, nine, twelve, and so on, and if you write down the multiples of 10, 10, 20, 30, 30 would be the first number both of those lists. So I'm going to write 30 beneath the 3 and the 10 because that's the lowest common multiple of 3 and 10. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a look at this top ratio and I want it instead of being 4 to 3 I want it to be something to 30. So to get from 3 to 30 we multiply by 10. So if we multiply the 4 by 10 as well then we will know what number this is in the ratio. So if we times by 10 and times by 10 that would give us 4 times 10 is equal to 40. So 4 to 3 is the same as the ratio 40 to 30. Now if we have a look at our next ratio the, the cows the chickens ratio which was 10 to 7 well we instead of having 10 to 7 we want to write 30 to something so if we multiply 10 by 3 we get 30 so if we multiply 7 by 3 we'll find this number in the ratio so 7 times 3 is equal to 21 so we've got that the ratio of cows to chickens would be 30 to 21 and that's an equivalent ratio as 10 to 7 so now we've got one ratio we've got the ratio of sheep to cows to chickens is 40 to 30 to 21 Okay, now let's have a look at writing ratios as equations and equations as ratios, and that's video 271D on Corbra Maths. So we've been given the ratio x to y is equal to 1 to 4, and we've been asked to write this as an equation linking x and y. So here we've got the ratio, and we know that the ratio of x to y is 1 to 4, and that means that y is 4 times larger than x, because for every 1 of x is 4 of y. So it could be that x is equal to 1 and y is equal to 4. It could be that x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 8. It could be x is equal to 10 and y is equal to 40, and so on. But what we know is the value for y is 4 times larger than the value for x. So let's write that as an equation y is equal to 4x because 4 times the smaller number x 4 times x is equal to y because y is 4 times larger and that's it and we can show this just looking at this diagram here we've got y and we know the ratio of x to y is 1 to 4 so in other words if we've got y y is 4 times larger than x if we multiply x by 4 we would get y is equal to 4x and that's it Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So our next question says, given the ratio of x to y is equal to 2 to 3, write an equation linking x and y. So here we've got x and y, and x and y are two numbers, and when we simplify the ratio, we get 2 to 3. Now, it could be that x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 3. It could be that x is equal to 4 and y is equal to 6. It could be that x is equal to 20 and y is equal to 30. But what we know is that when we simplify that ratio, we get 2 to 3. And that means for every 2 of x, is 3 of y. So y is going to be bigger than x. And I've represented it here as a diagram, where I've got that my x is equal to 2 centimeters and my y is equal to 3 centimeters. So that's a little diagram here, where x is equal to 2 centimeters and y is equal to 3 centimeters so it represents this ratio now if we were to double y and we were to treble x they would be the same as each other if we have a look here if we had two y's and we had three x's they would be the same length and that's it so that means we've got an equation that 2y is equal to 3x so that's our equation linking x and y now that is an equation linking x and y but if i had something like this i would tend to make y the subject or x the subject but if i was making y the subject i would divide both sides by two so divide by two and divide by two and my left hand side of the equation would just become y because 2y divided by 2 is just y and if we have 3x divided by 2 we could write 3x over 2 like so so y equals 3x over 2 I would tend to write it like this as 3 over 2 x so y equals 3 over 2 x okay let's have a look at our next question so we're going to write an equation as a ratio so if we've got the equation y equals 2x and we've been asked to write down the equation of x to y let's have a look at the equation to begin with we know that y is equal to 2 times x that means that y is 2 times larger than x for instance if x was equal to 10 y would be equal to 20. so let's write that as a ratio so for instance if x was equal to 10 then y would be equal to 20 and then you can just divide those by 10 and you get 1 to 2. we could have just written 1 
one to two to begin with. For instance, we know that y is twice as big as x. So if we just had, say x is equal to one, y is equal to two, and that's it. So our ratio of x to y would be one to two. And that's video 271D in corporate maths. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is called the unit tree method, which is video 255A in corporate maths. And we're told the four candles cost 13 pound find the cost of seven candles. Now this is called the unitary method because we want to find the value for one. So in this case, we want to find the cost of one candle. And then when we know the cost of one candle, we can multiply by seven to find the cost of seven candles. So if we know that four candles cost 13 pound, if we just divide 13 by four, we can find the cost of one candle. So 13 divided by four is equal to three pound 25. So that means that one candle costs three pound 25. So that's one candle. Now we know the cost of one candle, we can find the cost of seven candles really easily by just multiplying the cost of one candle by seven. So if we do three pound 25, multiply by seven, that gives us 22 pound 75p. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic, which is exchange rates or currency. And that's video 214A in corporate maths. And we're told Nicola went to Italy and she changed 800 pound into euros. And the exchange rate was one pound is one euro 40. So in other words, for every pound, the bank give her one euro 40. And the question says to change 800 pound into euros. So to change from pounds into euros or pounds into whatever currency you're converting into, if you've got what one pound is, you just need to multiply how many pounds there are, the 800, by the number in the exchange rate. So here we've got one pound is one euro 40. So if we do 800 multiplied by 1.4 or 1.40, well, we don't really need the zero there. So if we do 800 multiplied by 1.4, we'll see how many euros she gets because for every pound, she gets one euro 40. So 800 multiplied by 1.4 equals 1,120 euros, and that's it. Now, while she's there, Nicholas seen a watch that she likes, and it costs 105 euros, and she wants to know how much that is in pounds. Well, if she wants to convert back from euros into pounds, we need to divide the 105 by the number in the exchange rate, the 1.4. So if we do 105 divided by 1.4, that will tell us how many pounds it would be. So if we do 105 divided by 1.4, that is 75. So the watch costs 75 pound and that's it. Okay, so our next topic is recipes and that's video 256 on corporate maps. So here we've been given a recipe or a list of ingredients and we've been told it serves five people. And we've got our 500 grams of cod, 400 grams of haddock, 600 milliliters of milk, 120 grams of butter, 40 grams of flour and one kilogram of potatoes. And Ben would like to cook the meal for four people. So he would like, instead of cooking it for five people, he would like to cook it for four people. And we've been asked how much of each ingredient should he use or how much should he use, how much does he need of each ingredient? So obviously he's not served cooking for five people, he's cooking for four people. If it was me, I would just cook for five people and just eat the extra bit. But he wants, Ben wants to know how much of each ingredient should he use if he's cooking the meal for four people. So here we've got the list of ingredients and we've got how much of each of them. Now, if it was for 10 people he wanted to cook it for, it'd be really easy. We could just double all these measurements. If it was for 15 people, we could just times them all by three. Now we want to find for four people, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to find how much he would need for one person by dividing all these by five. And that would tell us how much of each ingredient he would need for one person. And then I'm going to times it by four and that would tell us how much of each ingredient he would need for four people. So let's write for one person. And to find how much he needs for one person, we're going to need to divide all of these by five. So 500 divided by five would be 100 grams of cod. 400 divided by five, well that's going to be 80 grams of haddock. 600 milliliters of milk, well we want to divide that by 5, so that's going to be 120 milliliters of milk. 120 grams of butter, if we divide that by 5, that would be 24 grams of butter. 40 grams of flour, if we divide that by 5, that would be 8 grams of flour. And finally, 1 kilogram of potatoes, which is 1,000 grams, if we divide that by 5, that would be 200 grams of potatoes. Now, we could have written it as 0.2 kilograms. I've just changed it into grams because I just think it's a bit easier to, to consider. Okay, so we've now got how much he needs for one person. If he was cooking this meal for one person, how much he would need. But we've been asked to cook the meal for four people. So we're going to multiply all these measurements by four. So four people. So we've divided by five. Now we're going to times by four. So 100 grams times by four would be 400 grams of cod. 80 grams of haddock. Whenever we times that by four, that would be 320 grams of haddock. 120 milliliters of milk, when we times that by four, that'll be 480 milliliters of milk. 24 grams of butter, when we times that by four, that'll be 96 grams of butter. Eight grams of flour, when we times that by four, that'll be 32 grams of flour. And finally, 200 grams of potatoes, when we times that by four, that'll be 800 grams of potatoes. 
and that's it. So it can be useful in recipe questions to be able to just double it or half it, but sometimes what we need to do is we need to find how much of each ingredient we need for one person, and then to times that by how many people we want to serve the meal for. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, so our next topic is proportion. That's videos 254 and 255 in corporate maths. So sometimes in proportion questions, we're given a context and we're given a formula. And here's an example. The number of months M to complete a piece of research is found by M, the number of months, is equal to 2,400 divided by N, where N is the number of scientists. And we've been asked to work out how long the research should take if 30 scientists are working on it. So we've got this formula, and what this is telling us is the amount of time it takes to complete the research is found by doing 2,400 divided by N, where N is the number of scientists. And in this case, the more scientists that there are, the less time it would take to complete the research. So this is inverse proportion. And whenever we're dealing with inverse proportions, what we know is that as one number gets bigger, the other number gets smaller. So the more scientists there are, whenever we divide 2,400 by a bigger number, what we'll find is that the number of months taken to complete the research will get smaller. Now in this question, we've been asked to work out how long the research should take if 30 scientists are working on it. So we just need to, in this question, substitute 30 into the formula to work out M equals 2,400 divided by 30. And if we do 2,400 divided by 30, that's equal to 80. And we're dealing with months here, so it's 80 months. So if there was 30 scientists working on this piece of research, it would take 80 months for them to complete this research. So sometimes in proportion questions, you're given a context and you're given a formula, and you just need to maybe substitute in values into it. But sometimes with direct proportion and inverse proportion, we need to be able to recognize how it's represented as an equation or as a graph. So let's start off with direct proportion. So here we've got y is directly proportional to x. So what that means is as the value for x increases, the value for y increases. And we represent that using this equation, y is equal to kx. And that means y is equal to k, a certain number, multiplied by x. So for instance, we could have y is equal to 2x, or y is equal to 10x, or even y is equal to 0.4x. So these equations could represent relationships that are directly proportional because as the value for x increases, the value for y increases. For instance, if we multiply 2 by a larger number, we're going to get a larger answer. So it's important to recognize that y equals kx represents y is directly proportional to x. And as a graph, if we were to represent it as a graph, it would look something like this. We've got our x-axis and y-axis, and we've got a line that's going up, passing through the origin. So as the value for x increases, the value for y increases. And that's it. So if we wanted to represent y is directly proportional to x as an equation, it would be y equals kx. And as a graph, it would look something like this. So now let's have a look at inverse proportion. So if something's inversely proportional to something else, that means as one gets bigger, the other one gets smaller. And we can write that as an equation as something like this. Where we've got y is equal to k, a certain number, divided by x. So as we divide by bigger numbers, we get a smaller answer. So if we had something like this, where y is equal to 20 divided by x, if we divide that by 1, we get 20 divided by 1, which is 20. But then if we divide it by 2, if we do 20 divided by 2, we get 10. So as the value for x increases, the value for y decreases. So y is inversely proportional to x is represented as y equals k over x. And as a graph, it would look something like this where we've got our x and y axis, and we have a curve that comes down like so. And as we divide by bigger numbers, we get a smaller and smaller answer. And that's it. Okay, now let's have a look at this question. So we're told that y is directly proportional to x, so y is equal to k times x, or y equals kx. And we're told that whenever y is equal to 30, x is equal to 6. Find y whenever x is equal to 11. So because we know y is directly proportional to x, we can write down that equation, y equals k times x. Remember, k is just a number. And we're told two bits of information. We're told that whenever y is equal to 30, x is equal to 6. So we've got y is equal to k times x. That'd be 30 is equal to k times 6. So if we have a look at this, we've got 30 is equal to k times 6. So that means that k would have to be equal to 5. k is equal to 5, dividing both sides of this equation by 6. So that means that our equation is y equals 5 times x, or y equals 5x. And then we've been asked to find what y is whenever x is equal to 11. So we can then just say y is equal to 5 times 11, and 5 times 11 is equal to 55. So y equals 55. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look now at a question which involves inverse proportion. So we've got w is inversely proportional to x. Let's write that down. w equals k, a certain number, divided by x. And we're told that whenever w is equal to 10, so when w is equal to 10, x is equal to 4. So 10 equals k divided by 4.
Now let's find what k is by multiplying both sides of this equation by 4. So we'll multiply by 4 and multiply by 4. 10 times 4 is equal to 40. And our right hand side, k divided by 4 times by 4 would just be k. So this number k, that certain number is 40. So w is equal to 40 over x. Now we want to find w whenever x is equal to 5. So we just put x is equal to 5 in here. So we get w equal to 40 divided by 5. And 40 divided by 5 is equal to 8. And that's it. Now, sometimes whenever we're dealing with proportion, we have questions that involve time. And this is proportion, dealing with time. And this is video 256A in corporate maths. So here we've got our question. It says, it takes 20 hours for three pumps to fill a swimming pool. How long would it take if four pumps were used? So in a question like this, we're told that it takes 20 hours for three pumps to fill a swimming pool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider how long it would take for one pump to fill a swimming pool. Well, if there's three pumps, one pump would take three times longer. So if there's 20 hours, if we multiply that by three, that would tell us how long it would take one pump to fill the swimming pool. So 20 multiplied by three would be equal to 60. So if there was one pump, it would take 60 hours. If there was two pumps, it would take half of that time. It would take 30 hours. If there was three pumps, you would divide it by three to get 20 hours and so on. And the question says, how long would it take if those four pumps used? So if there's four pumps being used, well, if it takes one pump 60 hours, four pumps would take four times less time. We would divide it by four. So we're going to take 60 and divide it by four. And 60 divided by four is equal to 15 hours. So if there was four pumps used, instead of taking 20 hours, for three pumps, it would take for four pumps 15 hours. And that's it. Okay, and that's video 256A in corporate maths. Okay, our next topic is money. Now, in with money, there's lots of different possible questions you could be asked on money. And if you go to video 400 in corporate maths, you, you find this video 400A, 400B, 400C, and so on. And they've got lots of different types of money questions. I'm going to show you one particular type of question now. So it says a ruler costs 70p, Adrian has 10 pound, Adrian buys as many rulers as he can. How much change does he receive? Now, first of all, we're told that each ruler costs 70p and he's got 10 pound. Now, I'm going to change the 10 pound into pence. So each pound is 100 pence. So 10 pound would be 1,000 pence. So he's got 1,000 pence and he's going to buy as many rulers as he can. So let's get our calculator and we're going to divide the amount of money he has, the 1,000 by 70. And that'll tell us how many times 70 goes into 1,000. And when I do that, I get 14.285714 and so on. So that means this 70 goes into 1,000 14 and a bit times. Now, if he goes into the shop, Adrian can't buy 14 and a bit rulers. He can buy 14 rulers. He doesn't have enough money for his 15th ruler. So we know that he buys 14 rulers. Now we know each ruler costs 70 pence. So if we do 14 times 70, we will find the total amount of money it costs for the 14 rulers. So 70p multiplied by 14 rulers. And when we do that, we get, that's equal to 980 pence, so nine pound 80. But Adrian had 10 pound or 1,000 pence. So if we take our 1,000 pence or our 10 pound and we take away the 980 pence, we see that there's 20p left over. That's how much change Adrian would receive. So Adrian receives 20p change. So here we've got a finance question. So here's a typical question. It says the value of a car decreases by 5% each year. And so if you bought a car two years ago for £10,000, work out the value now. So we can use this formula initial multiplied by the multiplier to the power of time. So initially the car cost £10,000. And then the multiplier, well, it's decreasing by 5% each year. So if we had 100% and we took away 5%, we'd be left with 95%. So that's 0.95. And we're wanting to find the value of the car after two years, so that's going to be to the power of two. So we do 10,000 multiplied by 0 0.95 squared, and that gives us 9,025 pound. So the value of the car after two years would be 9,025 pound, and that's it. Okay, so let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is Best Buys, which is video 210 on Corporate Maths. So here we've got a question, a Best Buys question, that says packets of biscuits are sold in two sizes. You've got a regular box of biscuits, which has 10 biscuits for 95p, or you've got a large box of biscuits. And we've got a large box of biscuits, which is 15 biscuits, and it costs £1.50. And the question asks, which packet of biscuits is better value for money? Now, there's two ways which I typically answer questions like this. So using the first approach, we could divide the total cost, the 95p, by the 10 biscuits to find the cost per biscuit. So I could do 95p divided by 10, and that would tell me how much it costs per biscuit in the regular box. So 95 divided by 10 is 9.5p. So it's 9.5p per biscuit here, per biscuit. And in the large box, it's £1.50, which is 150 pence, and that's for 15 biscuits. So you can divide a 150 for 150 pence by 15 biscuits, and that would tell us that's equal to 10p per biscuit. 
So 9.5p per biscuit is cheaper than 10p per biscuit. So that means that the regular box is better value for money. So that's one approach to divide the total amount by how much you get. Another approach is to buy the same amount of biscuits by either buying just the regular boxes or the large boxes. So with the regular box, I could buy 10 biscuits, I could buy 20 biscuits, I could buy 30 biscuits by buying just regular packets. Or with the large box, I could buy 15 biscuits, or if I bought two packs, that would be 15 plus 15, which is 30 biscuits. Ah, so I could buy three regular boxes, and that would be 30 biscuits. So that would be three boxes at 95 pH, so three times 95 P, which is equal to 285 P, or £2.85. Or alternatively, if I was looking at just the large boxes to buy 30 biscuits, well, 30 biscuits would be two boxes of those. So that would be two lots of £1.50. And two lots of £1.50 is £3. So if I wanted to buy 30 biscuits, I could buy use the regular boxes, which are 95 pH, and that would cost me £2.85. Alternatively, I could use the large boxes to buy the 30 biscuits, and that would cost me £3. So as you can see, it's better value for money to buy the regular boxes. So the regular is better value. So our next topic is use of a calculator. So it's very important, first of all, that you've got your calculator, that you're familiar with it. You bring it to class every lesson, and you're really confident with using that calculator. And you could perhaps be asked to work something out on the calculator, which will involve you knowing how to put in fractions or square roots and things like that. So here we've got a question that says to work out 19.1 subtract 2.5 divided by the square root of 20. And we'd have to type this in our calculator. So let's have a look at some of the calculator buttons which are quite useful. Now, first of all, if I wanted to type this in, because you've got that line, that fraction, I would press the fraction button, this button here. And whenever I press that button, my display would look something like this. Next, then I would type in the top line, the numerator of the fraction, the top line of the fraction, that 19.1 subtract 2.5. So we'll just type in 19.1 subtract 2.5. Then I would press the down arrow here to bring me down to the denominator. And then I would want to type in the square root of 20. So I would press the square root button, which is here, which is next to the fraction button, this one. So it appears on the denominator here. And then I would type in 20. And then whenever you type in 20, my calculator display should look something like this. And then I would press equals. Now, depending what mode your calculator is in, you might get two different displays. If you press equals, you could get this display, which says 83 times the square root of 5 divided by 50. If it comes up like that and you want it as a decimal number, you then press this button here, SD, this button here. And whenever you press that, it then would display it as a decimal number for you. And it would come up as 3.711872843. So you could be asked a question to work out something which involves you typing something into your calculator. And if you want to recap that topic in corporate maths, it would be video 352. Okay, so let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is error intervals, and that's video 377 on corporate maths. So we've looked at rounding, and we've looked at finding the lowest number or the highest possible number whenever we've looked at data such as the population of whales. Now let's have a look at what happens whenever we round numbers that can take any value at all. And we often do that whenever we're looking at error intervals. So here we've got the mass of a letter is 80 grams to the nearest 10 grams. So because it's the mass of the letter, it can take any value. It can be whole numbers or it can even be decimals. And and we've been told to write down an error interval for the mass of the letter Y. So the mass of the letter has been rounded to the nearest 10 grams. So that means that the mass of the letter may not be 80 grams. It could have been 80 grams. It could have been 79 grams. It could have been 76 grams. It could be anything as low as 75 grams because that's the lowest possible value that it could be because 75 grams would round up to 80. But anything below 75 grams, so it would be 74 point something, and that would round down to be 70 grams to the nearest 10 grams. So 75 grams would be the lowest possible mass of the letter. Now let's consider the masses above 80 grams because, as I said, the letter could be 80 grams, but it could be something that's even higher than 80 grams as long as it rounds to 80 to the nearest 10. So it could have been 81 grams. It could have been 82 grams. It could have been 84 grams. It couldn't be 85 grams because 85 grams would round up to be 90 grams, but it could be 84.7 grams. It could be 84.9 grams, it could be 84.99 grams, and so on. It could be anything that is up to, but not including 85 grams. So let's write this as an error interval. 
So let's start off with the mass of the letter, which is y, so y. And we know that it's bigger than or equal to 75 grams. So it could be 75 grams or a number's bigger than that. So we're going to write bigger than or equal to 75 grams. But it can go up to, but not include, 85 grams. So we then write it's less than 85 grams. So this reads that y, the mass of the letter, is bigger than or equal to 75 grams, but less than 85 grams. And that's our error interval. It shows all the possible values for the mass of the letter, y. Okay, let's have a look at another question. Okay, let's have a look at our next example. So Nigel rounds a number x to one decimal place. So there's a certain number x and he's rounded it to one decimal place and his answer is 7.3. Write down an error interval for x. So the number could have been less than 7.3. It could have been 7.29. That would round to 7.3 to one decimal place. It could have been 7.26. It could be anything as low as 7.25 because 7.25, when we round that to one decimal place because it's a five and above, in the second decimal place. When we round that to one decimal place, it'll be 7.3. But it couldn't be anything lower than that. So Nigel's number could be as low as 7.25. But it could have been a number bigger than 7.3. It could have been 7.3. It could have been 7.31. It could be 7.34. But it couldn't be 7.35 because then that would round up to be 7.4. So Nigel's number could be anything up to but not including 7.35 because it could be 7.348 and so on. Right up to but not including 7.35. So let's write that down. X, his number could be bigger than or equal to 7.25 but it can be up to but not including 7.35 and that's it. So that's the error interval for x. Okay, so let's have a look at our next question. So next question says, Chloe truncates a number w to one decimal place. So Chloe's got a number, she truncates it. So she's not rounding it, she's truncating it. And what that means is if you get a decimal number and you just chop it off, so for instance, if we had pi, which is 3.14159 and so on, and if I rounded this to three decimal places, it would be 3.14, and then because the fourth decimal place is a five, I'd round up, so it'd be 3.142. So that's rounding. If I was to truncate this to three decimal places, what that would mean is I just chop off, I just ignore anything after the third decimal place. So if I truncated this to three decimal places, it would be 3.141. So in this case, Chloe has truncated a number w to one decimal place and her answer is 1.4. So she's got 1.4. So Chloe's number, it could have been 1.4. It could have been 1.41. If we truncated that to one decimal place, that'd be 1.4. It could have been 1.47259. If we truncated that to one decimal place, it'd be 1.4. Chloe's number could have been 1.498972. And if we truncated that to one decimal place, it'd be 1.4 but it couldn't be 1.5, so it'd be anything up to, but not including 1.5. So let's write down the error interval for Chloe's number W. So W, it could have been 1.4, so it could be bigger than or equal to 1.4, but then it can go up to 1.5, but not be 1.5, so less than 1.5. So that would be the error interval for W, and that's it. So our next topic is types of angle, and here's the Cobra Maps revision card. So we've got an acute angle, and they're small angles. They're between zero and 90 degrees, so this is an acute angle. The next type of angle, here we've got a right angle. So it's a right angle if it's equal to 90 degrees. So if it's 90 degree angle, that's a right angle. Next, we've got an obtuse angle. Obtuse angles are bigger than right angles. They're bigger than 90 degrees, but less than 180 degrees. Then you've got a straight line, which is 180 degrees. An angle's bigger than that. So bigger than 180 and smaller than 360 degrees would be a reflex angle. So we've got an acute angle, a right angle when it's equal to 90, an obtuse angle, and then a reflex angle if it's bigger than a straight line. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So it's important that you're able to draw angles and measure angles. So here we've got an angle and let's measure it. So let's take our protractor and let's measure this angle. So if we put the protractor on the angle, so like so, where we've got the cross of the protractor on the center of the angle, so here where the two lines meet, and then one of the lines is on zero and we're gonna count around to whenever we get to the other line. So as you can see, we've got zero degrees, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120, 130, 140, and we've got to 145. So this is a 145 degree angle, 145 degrees. And support whenever you're measuring angles that you start at zero and you count round to the other line. If it was the other way around, you might need to look at the angles on the inside. So start at zero and count round the other way.
Okay, let's do our next question. Our next question says to draw a 60 degree angle. So we're going to draw a 60 degree angle. So let's put our protractor so that it is the cross of the protractor is at the end of the line and that we've got zero on the line. And we're going to count around to whenever we get to 60 degrees. So as you can see, the zero is on the inside this time. So we're going to go around to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So 60 degrees would be here. So there. And then we're going to get a ruler and a pencil. And you're going to draw a nice straight line starting at the point at the center here through that point there and that means that that would be a 60 degree angle so let's label it so let's put an arc in there and then write in 60 degrees and that's it we've drawn a 60 degree angle so it's very important to be able to measure and draw angles and therefore it's really important to have your protractor in every single one of your maths lessons ready to use it okay our next topic our next topic is measuring lines sometimes we're asked to measure line segments such as this line a b and as you can see here we've got our line a b a is the beginning of the line so here and b is the end of the line here we've been asked to measure the length of the line so it's important whenever you're measuring lines that you use the centimeters. It's very rare in MAV, so you'd use the inches side. So we're going to get our centimeters. So we're going to put our zero at the beginning of the line, and we're going to see how long the line is. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six centimeters. So this line is exactly six centimeters long. So it'd be six centimeters. So if we went a little bit further, it could be 6.1 or 6.2 centimeters or so on. But this is exactly six centimeters. So this line AB is six centimeters. Okay, our next topic. Our next topic is angle facts, and it's very important to know these angle facts. So for instance, that a right angle is 90 degrees, a straight line would be 180 degrees, the angles on a triangle add up to 180 degrees, the angles on a quadrilateral add up to 360, and so on. So these are very important angle facts. So here we've got a right angle, and that means that these two angles will add up to 90 degrees. So if we know that one of them is 70 degrees, we can take that away from 90 to see what's left of the other angle. So if we do 90 subtract 70, that's equal to, well 90 subtract 70 is equal to 20, so that means that this angle X would be 20 degrees. Here we've got a straight line, and this time we've got a little right angle marked in here, so that means that this angle is 90 degrees, so let's put in 90 there, 90 degrees, and we're trying to find out this angle here, this X. So we've got two angles, and we know what's left would be this angle X, so the, all three angles will have to add up together to give you 180 degrees. So if we add the two that we're given, the 90 and the 55, we can see what's left. So let's do 90 add 55 and that's equal to 145 degrees and if we take that away from 180 we'll see what's left for x so 180 take away 145 is equal to 35 degrees so that means that x is equal to 35 degrees so the angles in a right angle will add up to 90 degrees and the angles in a straight line will add up to 180 degrees and if you ever see a little right angle symbol write 90 beside it okay the next ones so here we've got a full circle. The angles in a full circle or a full turn will add up to 360 degrees. So here we've got one angle, an obtuse angle, which is 140 degrees, and we want to see what's left for this reflex angle. So if we take the 140 degrees away from 360, we'll see what's left for x. So do 360, take away 140, and that's equal to 220 degrees. So that means that this angle x is 220 degrees. Okay, next we've got two lines that cross each other. Now when you've got two lines, two straight lines that cross each other, the opposite angles are equal to each other. So that means that x here would be equal to 156 degrees, and the y would be equal to the angle opposite it. These are called vertically opposite. When you've got two straight lines that cross each other, the opposite angles are always equal to each other, and they're called vertically opposite. So here x will equal 156 degrees, because it's vertically opposite to the one we're given. And then to find the y, well there's two ways we can find this. One way is to just look at the straight line and say, well, y and 156 is in a straight line. So if we take 156 away from 180, we can find y. Or another way to do it is to look at the full circle and say, well, if you've got 156 here, and this is 156, you can add those two together to be 312. And you can take 312 away from the full circle, which is 360, to see what's left for y and the one opposite it. And when you know that amount, divide it by two, half it to see what y is. So I'm going to do it using just a straight line approach here, that I know that y and 156 is in a straight line so I'm going to do 180 minus 156 and that's equal to 24 degrees okay and if you do want extra practice in these angle facts the useful videos for you in Cobra Maths are 35 30 34 and 39 okay let's have a look at our next questions this time we're going to look at angles in a triangle which is video number 37 and the angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees so here we've got a triangle and we've got two angles given to us 75 and 80 and we've got our missing angle x that we need to find so if we add the two angles we're given the 80 and the 75 we can then take that away from 180 and see what's left so 80 plus 75 is equal to 155 degrees and then if you do 180 take away 155 
That leaves us with 25. So it means that x is equal to 25 degrees. Next, we've got an isosceles triangle. With an isosceles triangle, two of the angles are the same. So as you can see here, we've got our two lines that are the same length, and the two angles here and here, this one and the 35, will be equal to each other. So it means that this angle is 35 degrees. So that means to find the angle x, we'll add our 35 and 35, and then take that away from 180. So 35 plus 35 is equal to 70 degrees. And then if we do 180, take away 70, that's equal to 110 degrees. So the angle x is equal here to 110 degrees. And if you do want extra practice on these, remember there is that practice booklet you can find it in the description below. Our next topic is angles in a quadrilateral. So here we've got a four-sided shape. Every single time you add on an extra side of a shape, you add on 180 degrees to its angles. So you know that with a triangle, the angles add up to 180. If we add another side in, that means that now the angles in a quadrilateral will add up to 360 degrees. So that means that if we add up the angles that we're given here, the 70, the 50, and the 90, here's a right angle, you can then take that answer away from 360 and see what's left for x. So 70, plus 50 is equal to 120 degrees, plus 90 is equal to 210 degrees. Now we're going to take that away from 360, so 360 take away 210 is equal to 150. So that means that x is equal to 150 degrees. And that's it. So the angles in a quadrilateral add up to 360 degrees, and that was video 33 in Corporate Maths. Okay, our next topic. Okay, so let's have a look at our next topic. And our next topic is topic 34 in Cobra Maths, and that's angles and polygons. And a polygon is just a straight-sided shape, so we've got our triangles, our quadrilaterals, pentagons, hexagons, heptagons, octagons, and so on. And this is the Cobra Maths revision card on angles and polygons. So it tells you the angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees, the angles in a quadrilateral add up to 360 degrees, the angles in a pentagon add up to 540 degrees, and it's very useful to know that, or alternatively know that if a quadrilateral adds up to 360, you can just add on another 180. If we add on another 180, that's 720, so the angles in a hexagon add up to 720 degrees, the angles in a heptagon add up to 900 degrees, the angles in octagon add up to 1080 degrees, and so on. And this is very useful, this is the Corp Master Revision card, and if you want to get a set of those, they're in the description below. And So here we've got a polygon, and it's got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 angles. So, and it's also got one, two, three, four, five sides. So that means it's a pentagon. And the angles in a pentagon add up to 540 degrees. So if we want to find the size of this missing angle x, we can add together the angles we're given, the 80, the 140, the 95, and the 130. And we can take that away from 540 to see what's left for x. So let's do that. So 140 plus 80 plus 95 plus 130 is equal to, and I'll just do that on my calculator, 445 degrees and if we take that away from 540 we can see what x is so 540 take away 445 equals 95 degrees so that means that x is 95 degrees and that's it if you were given a hexagon they would give you five angles and you would add those up and take it away from 720 to find the size of the sixth one and so on now, there's a formula that's really, really useful, and that if you want to find out the sum of the interior angles or what the angles in the shape add up to, you could use this formula, which is n take away 2, so the number of sides take away 2, multiplied by 180. So, for instance, if I wanted to know what the angles added up to in an octagon, I could take the number of sides, which is 8, take away 2, that gives me 6, and then multiply by 180, and that gives me an answer of 1080. Likewise, if we knew what the angles in a shape added up to, and we needed to find out how many sides there were, we could work backwards, so we could divide by 180, and then add 2. And that's it, so this formula is really useful. Okay, let's have a look at a question based on that. So here we've got a question, and it says, find the sum of the interior angles of a 12-sided polygon. So a 12-sided polygon, that's a dodecagon, I believe, and we need to find the sum of the interior angles. We need to find out what the angles in that 12-sided shape will add up to. And the formula is to do n take away 2 times 180. So if we take our 12 sides and do 12 take away 2, that's equal to 10, and then do 10 multiplied by 180, that's equal to 1,800. So in a 12-sided polygon, the angles would add up to 1,800 degrees. Okay, our next example. So our next question says, the sum of the interior angles of a polygon is 4,500 degrees. So it's got a few more sides than a 12-sided one. And the question says, how many sides does it have? So to find this answer, this 4,500 degrees, we've taken the number of sides, we've subtracted 2, and then we've multiplied by 180 degrees. So if we want to work backwards, we're going to take our 4,500, divide it by 180, and then that will give us... 25 but remember we've taken away 2 so because we're going backwards we're going to add 2 so we're going to do 25 plus 2 is equal to 27. So the angles in a 27 sided polygon will add up to 4500 degrees and that's it. 
Okay, and that's it. Now this formula is really useful. It's really useful for both regular polygons. So regular polygons are where all the sides are the same length and the angles are the same size. And it's also useful for irregular polygons, polygons where the angles aren't all the same size. So for instance, if we knew that it was irregular, we could add up the angles that were given and then take it away and then find out the size of the missing one. But if it's a regular polygon, what we can do is, so for instance, with this 27 sided polygon, if we divided 4,500 by 27, and we could find the size of each one of those angles. Now the sum of the rules of polygons, and they are the exterior angles. So if you've got the interior angle and you carry on that straight line, the angle between the polygon and that straight line is what we call the exterior angle. And I've marked them all on this diagram in red. So all of these red angles are exterior angles. So the sum of all those exterior angles, all of these red angles will be 360 degrees. So, so for no matter what polygon you've got, if you add up all the exterior angles, it will always add up to 360 degrees. And then also the interior angle and the exterior angle, because they make a straight line, they will add up to 180 degrees. So there are two very useful rules as well. The sum of the exterior angles, all those outside angles there, all those red angles will add up to 360 degrees and the interior angle and the exterior angle will add up to 180. So let's do some questions based on that now. So here we've got a typical question. It says, work out the size of each exterior angle for a 20-sided regular polygon. So this is a regular polygon. So I mean that all the interior angles are the same size and also all of the exterior angles are the same size. And it's got 20 sides. And we know that all the exterior angles will always add up together to give you 360 degrees. So if we divide 360 by 20, we will find the size of each exterior angle. So if we do 360 divided by 20, that's 18. So that means that each of the exterior angles will be 18 degrees. So we'll have 20 exterior angles and they'll all be 18 degrees each. This time we're asked to work out the size of each interior angle of a 20 set of regular polygon. Now we've got two different ways to do this. We could use our first formula where we take away two, so that's 18, times that by 180, and that would tell you what the angles add up to in a 20 set of polygon, and then divide that answer by 20 to find the size of each one of those angles. So that's one approach. Alternatively, if we know that all the exterior angles are 18 degrees each, if we take that at 18 degrees away from 180, we will find the size of the interior angle, because remember the interior angle and the exterior angle will always add up together to give us a straight line, 180 degrees. So if we do 180, take away 18, that's equal to 162 degrees. And that's it. Our next topic is angles and parallel lines. Now, whenever you get two parallel lines and a line that crosses them, a straight line that crosses them, you'll find that many of the angles are the same. Um, because as you can see, you've got lots of vertically opposite angles. Like for instance here, this obtuse angle is vertically opposite to this one, so they're the same. This acute one's equal to that one. Now, as it's a straight line that crosses the two parallel lines, then the angles below will be exactly the same. You'll also have a 75, 75, and so on. Now we've got some special names to use whenever we're talking about these angles being the same as each other. So if you've got two parallel lines and a line that crosses it, and you've got this Z shape, these are called alternate angles because they're alternate to each other. So this 75 is the same as this 75 because they're alternate angles. And it's very important to know that, that word alternate angles. Try not to use Z angles, use the term alternate angles. So this angle is the same as this angle because they're alternate to each other. Here, these angles, these green angles, are 130 degrees, these obtuse angles, and they're the same as each other, so they're called corresponding. Because you've got, if you look at it, you've got the angles at the top and the angles at the bottom. They're both in the bottom right corner, here and here, so they're corresponding to each other. The bottom right angle and the bottom right angle are the same, because they're corresponding. Some people call it an F angle, because you've got this F shape, <laughs> and the angles at the bottom below the F are the same, uh, but try to learn the word corresponding. So as well as our alternate and corresponding angles, we've also got co-interior and vertically opposite angles. So if we've got two parallel lines, this angle and this angle will add to 180 degrees. And that's very really useful because if we know one of them, we can then work out the other one by taking it away from 180. So this angle and this angle will add up to be 180 degrees. So they are co-interior angles. And also this angle and this angle will add together to be 180 degrees. So they're co-interior angles as well. So that's really useful because if you know one of them, you can then find the other one. Also, we think of vertically opposite angles. So remember, if you've got two straight lines across each other, the opposite angles will be equal to each other. So if this angle's 135 degrees, the angle opposite it will be 135 degrees. Also, if this angle's 45 degrees, the angle opposite it is equal to 45 degrees. So opposite angles, where you've got two lines across each other, the opposite angles are equal to each other. And again, that's really useful for co-interior angles. So if we could look at this diagram here, we know that if this angle's 60 degrees, this angle will be 60 degrees because they're opposite each other. And if this this angle's 120 degrees, this angle's 120 degrees because they're vertically opposite each other. And that's it. 
So here we've got a question just to practice we remember which one's which. So we've got our two parallel lines, RS and TU, and you've got that straight line that crosses them. And we've been asked to find which angle is corresponding to A. So we've got A here, and A is the top left angle in this little section here. So if we look at the angles below at the other line, the angle on the top left there is E. So A and E are corresponding to each other, E. B would be corresponding to F, D would be corresponding to H, and C would be corresponding to C. Our next question says, which angle is alternate to C? Now, when we see alternate, we're thinking of that Z angle. And you can see here, we've got that C here. And if you look at my pen here, you've got this sort of Z shape here, where you've got the C in there and the F there. They are alternate to each other, so C is alternate to F. So C is alternate to F. D would be alternate to E, and they would be the alternate angles. C is alternate to F, and D is alternate to E. And that's it. Okay, so let's have a look at our next topic. And our next topic is scales, which is video 283 and 284 in corporate maths. And here we've got a map, and we've got two towns out there, town I made up, Leek and Milton. And we've got a scale down the bottom, and it says one centimetre represents or equals 30 miles. So one centimetre on this diagram would be 30 miles in real life. And the question says, what is the actual distance between Leek and Milton? So if I was doing a question like that, the first thing I would do is I would get a ruler and a pencil, and I would join up the two places, so I would join them up like so. Then I would get a ruler and I'd measure the length of that line and here our line is eight centimeters so that's an eight centimeter line so on our map we've got the distance between leek and milton is eight centimeters now and obviously in real life it's going to be much bigger than eight centimeters and we're told that every centimeter represents 30 miles so if we have eight lots of 30 miles that would be the real distance between leek and milton so we need to do eight lots of 30 or eight times 30. so if we do eight times 30 well eight times three is 24 so eight times 30 would be 240 and that's in miles because the question says every one centimetre is 30 miles. So it's eight lots of 30 miles. So the answer would be 240 miles. And that's it. If you were given a distance between them in real life and you were asked what the distance was on the map, then you would divide by the scale. So, so for instance, if I knew the distance between two towns was 150 miles and the question said how far apart would they be on the map, I would divide 150 by 30, which is five, and then it would be five centimetres. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic, and our next topic is compass directions, which is video 27B in corporate maths. So here we've got a compass, we've got north, then we've got east, and we've got south, and we've got west. And in between north and east, we've got northeast, and between south and east, we've got southeast, between south and west, we've got southwest, and between north and west, we have northwest. So these are our compass directions, they're very important to know. Some people remember saying, such as, never eat shredded wheat. Um, I do like shredded wheat, but you've got never eat shredded wheat. They could be your uh, little mnemonic to help you remember the north east, south and west, but you need to know what, what directions they go in. And here we've got a little diagram and we've got some made up towns. We've got Castleton, Leake, Donhampton, Milton and Sandcliffe. And the question says, what direction is Milton from Sandcliffe? So we're at Sandcliffe because it says from Sandcliffe. And we're asked which direction is Milton? So Milton is in this direction, so it's going to the left here. Now we've got north is to going upwards, so going to the left would be west. So the answer would be west. Because if you were at Sandcliffe, and if upwards is north, then it would be north, east, south, and west. And west would be Milton. Okay, next question. Our next question says, what direction is Sandcliffe from Leek? So it says from Leek, so we're going to go to Leek. So this little X is Leek, so we're here. And we want to know what direction Sandcliffe is in. So we've got north going upwards, then we've got east, then we've got south. So as you can see, it's not one of our north, east, south, or west. So it's going to be something like north, east, or south, east, and so on. So if we're at Leek, and we've got north, east, south and west. So you can see the Sandcliffe is in the southeast direction. It's in the middle of south and east. So the answer would be southeast. South east. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is maps. So obviously we've got our scales and our compass directions. Now we're going to put them together in maps, and that's video 283 in Corbin Maps. And here we've got a map, and we've got the same scale. One centimeter it represents 30 miles. So as like two topics ago, whenever we looked at scales, and we've got these towns, Lee and Milton, and we're told that Red Town is 90 miles south of Milton. So Red Town is 90 miles south of Milton. So we've got Milton. We've got 90 miles. Now every centimeter is 30 miles. And so 90 divided by 30. Well, 30. Would we're going to 93 times, so that would be three centimeters. And we're told to show Red Town on the map. So we've got this map, and we need to show where Red Town is. So we've got Milton. North is going upwards. East is going to the right. South is going down, so it's going to be south. And it's three centimeters. So we would get a ruler and a pencil, and we'd measure three centimeters downwards. We'd find where that is, and we'd put a little cross, and then we'd write beside it Red Town. 
and that's it, bearings. And here's a typical bearings question, and bearings is video 26 on Corbett Mavs, so if you do want that full video talking through bearings, if you watch that video 26 on Corbett Mavs, it'll go through bearings in a bit more detail. But as I said, at the end of this video, so spend about three or four minutes in each topic to make sure you're familiar with the topics. So here we've got two towns, we've got Antrim and we've got Belfast, and the question says, write down the three-figure bearing off Belfast from Antrim. So bearings are a direction of travel, and they're measured clockwise from north. So in this question, we've been asked to write down the three-figure bearing off Belfast from Antrim. So if I was asked to do that, the first thing I would do is get a ruler and pencil and join up the two towns. So I'd join up Antrim and Belfast like so. Then next I would draw a north line at Antrim. So I just get a ruler and pencil and I would draw a north line going upwards from Antrim like so because that's where we're measuring the bearing from. It's the bearing off Belfast from Antrim. So there's our north line and I'm just going to put a little n beside it just to show that it's north. Next, we want to mark in the angle that we want to measure. Now, bearings are measured clockwise from north. So the bearing will be this clockwise angle going around from the north line to the line joining Antrim and Belfast. And we're going to get our protractor. So we're going to get our protractor and we're just going to rotate it. So we've got our protractor and we're just going to put it on top of Antrim. So we've got the cross of it on top of Antrim. And we've got the zero going along the north line and we've got zero on the top. Now the bearing is measured clockwise from north, so we just need to measure this angle. So we've got zero at the top, so we're looking at these outside angles, and we're going to start from 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, and then we've got 101, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that is 105 degrees. So if I move my protractor, a 105 degree angle, and the question said, write down the three-figure bearing off Belfast from Antrim. So that would be 105 degrees. Okay, let's have a look at another one. So we've got two made-up towns here. We've got Castletown and Milton. And we've been asked to write down the three-figure bearing off Castletown from Milton. So again, our first step is to join up the two towns. So get your ruler and pencil and join up Milton and Castleton, like so. So we've joined up our two towns. Next, we want to just make sure we know where we're measuring the bearing from. So we want to measure the bearing off Castletown from Milton. So we're in Milton. So let's draw our north line at Milton. And we'll just put a little N at the top to show that it's north. Next, let's get our protractor. And we want to rotate it so that we've got the zero at the top. So we've rotated our protractor. And now let's just double check with the angle we want to measure. So we want to measure the angle going clockwise from north. So marking in the angle, it's clockwise from north. So that's the angle we want to measure. And we're going to get our protractor. And we're going to put the zero on the north line and the cross on Milton. So let's now measure our angle. So we're starting at zero. So it's 10, 20, 30, 40. And as you can see, we haven't reached 45, so we've actually got 44 degrees. So that angle is 44 degrees. So let's just move our protractor and mark in that it's 44 degrees. So 44 degrees. And we've been asked to write down the three-figure bearing off Castletown from Milton. But remember, the bearing has to have three figures, so it's going to be 0, 4, 4 degrees. We're just going to put a zero in front of that, so 0, 4, 4 degrees. And that's it. So the bearing off Castletown from Milton is 0, 4, 4 degrees. That's it. Okay, our next question. Okay, this time we've been asked to write down the three-figure bearing off Portrush from Larn. So this time, we're going to join up the towns as before. So we've joined them up. Now we're going to make sure we know which way north is. So north is going upwards, and we want to just check where we're starting from. So it's writing down the three-figure bearing off Portrush from Larn. So we're in Larn, and we're going to do our north line at Larn. So there's our north line, and let's just mark it with a little n. Now we've got a mark on the angle we want to measure. So remember, bearings are measured clockwise from north. So we want to go clockwise from north all the way around to the line joining Port Rush and Larne. So we need to measure this angle here. It's a reflex angle, so it's going to be bigger than 180 degrees, but less than 360. So we want to measure that angle. Now there's three different ways we can measure this angle. The first way is my favorite way. It's actually getting a 360 degree protractor. So this protractor only goes up to 180 degrees. So if you've got a 360 degree protractor, they're actually really, really fantastic because you can put the zero on the north line and you can just go around and read off even reflex angles like this one. Um, if you're measuring this one, what you could do is one approach is you could actually turn it the other way. So we can measure this small angle here. So we could actually get a protractor and measure the angle anti-clockwise. So it's starting at zero on the inside, zero, 10, 20, 30 and we're in the middle here between 30 and 40 so that's 35 degrees so one approach is actually to measure this angle which is 35 degrees and because we know the angles in a full turn add up to 360 we could take the 35 away from 360 and do 360 subtract 35 which is equal to 325 degrees so that means that this angle is 325 degrees and then that would be our bearing because it's the angle measured clockwise from north all the way around to the line joining the towns. So our answer would be 325 degrees. 
So that's one approach. Another approach is actually is to measure that reflex angle. And what we could do is, so answer is 325. We can just go back to the beginning. And we want to measure this reflex angle. So what we could actually do is draw a line straight down, like so. And we know that a straight line, the angle is up to 180 degrees. So we do know this is 180 degrees on the right-hand side. So we're just drawing the line straight down, our, I suppose our south line, which would be 180 degrees there. And then we could just get our protractor and we could turn it around so that we've got zero at the bottom this time. And we want to go from zero around to where the line is. And as you can see, if we start at zero, which is at the bottom here, we've got zero, 10, 20, 30, all the way around to in between 140 and 115. It's in exactly the middle. So that means that's a 145 degrees. So if we want to measure this clockwise angle, this reflex angle, we know that we've got 180 degrees and another 145 degrees. And if we add those two together, we also get 325 degrees. So that's it. So the bearing measured clockwise from north from Larne to Portrush would be 325 degrees. Okay. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. And that's actually bearings as well. It's working out back bearings. So in other words, here's an example. If we know the bearing off Nottingham from Dublin as 0, 0,98 degrees, what's the bearing off Dublin from Nottingham? So going the other way around. So there's two different ways you can actually approach this. The first way is actually just a little sketch. So the bearing off Nottingham from Dublin. So let's do a little X for Dublin. So let's just label that Dublin. And then we've got Nottingham and it's on a bearing of 0, 0,98 degrees. So let's put our north line in. And 0, 0,98 degrees or 98 degrees, if we started at the top and we went around 98 degrees, it would be go past east and just a little bit beyond it. So it means that it wouldn't be here, it would just be a little bit further. So let's put a little cross there and say that's Nottingham. So we've got Dublin and we've got Nottingham. Let's join them up with a straight line. Now let's mark in the angle so we know that angle is 98 degrees because the bearing is 0, 0,98. So that's 98 degrees there. Now let's also draw another north line at Nottingham. So we're drawing our north line with the little n at Nottingham, and we want to measure the bearing off Dublin from Nottingham. So we want to measure the angle going clockwise from the north line at Nottingham, going around to the line joining Dublin and Nottingham, like so. So we want to find the size of that angle. Now here we've got two north lines, and they are parallel lines. I remember with parallel lines, the two interior angles are called co-interior. These two angles add up to 180 degrees. And actually, if we go back to our revision card here, we've got co-interior angles, two angles inside of parallel lines add up to 180 degrees. So if this angle was 60, that angle is 120. So that's quite important. So if we go back to our bearings, we've got, this is 98 degrees. So this angle and this angle here will add up together to give us 180 degrees. So if we do 180, subtract 98, we get that's equal to 82 degrees. That means this angle here is 82 degrees. Next, we want to find the size of this reflex angle. Now, we know the angles in a full turn add up to 360 degrees. So if we take 82 away from 360, we can find the size of this angle. So we can do 360, take away 82. And that's equal to 278 degrees. And that's it. So that means that this angle would be 278 degrees. And that would be the bearing off Dublin from Nottingham. And that's it. Well, another way to do it is to actually n notice a bit of a pattern. So if you're doing a back bearings question and the bearing that you're given in the question is less than 180 degrees, to get the bearing going the other way, you could just add on 180 degrees and that would give you your answer. And if the bearing you're given in the question was more than 180 degrees, if you take away 180 degrees, you can get your answer. And that's a bit of a shortcut. Now, the way I do that is I visualize it. If I was traveling from Dublin to Nottingham, and then I wanted to go the other way, I would rotate through 180 degrees to go the other way. If you want to watch that in more detail, you can watch video 27A and Corp Mavs, and there's questions there on it as well. Our next topic is perimeter on the grid. And here we've got a centimeter grid, and we've been asked to find the perimeter of this ship. So it's drawn on the center grid that means that each of the lines is one centimeter so we've got one two three centimeters at the top there three centimeters then another one two three centimeters going down and then another one two three centimeters going across and then another one going up one going across one going up one going across and one going up and we're back to the starting point so remember the perimeter of a ship is that distance around the outside of the ship so we just need to count those so you could just go one two three four five six and so on or you could add them up three plus three is six plus three is nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen so the perimeter of the ship is 14 centimeters okay our next topic our next topic is perimeter so here we've got our rectangle and we've been asked to find the perimeter of this rectangle now, as we've seen earlier with a rectangle, the opposite sides are the same length. So if the top is equal to six centimeters, the bottom will be equal to six centimeters. And if the right-hand side of the rectangle is 20 centimeters, the left-hand side would also be 20 centimeters. And we've been asked to find the perimeter of the ship. So we just need to add up those distances. So if we do 20 plus six plus 20 plus six 
that will tell us the perimeter. So 20 plus 6 is 26, plus 20 would be 46, plus 6 would be 52. So the perimeter of this shape is 52, and the units are centimetres, so 52 centimetres. Our next question says, find the perimeter of this isosceles triangle. So we have an isosceles triangle, two of the sides are the same length. So as you can see, we've got two sides with the little dashes. That means that they're the same length. So that means that the left-hand side here, 7, would be also the same as the right-hand side here, 7 centimetres. We've been asked to find the perimeter, so we just need to add together 7, 10, and 7. So 10 plus 7 is 17, plus 7 is equal to 24. So the perimeter of this triangle would be 24 centimetres. Okay, so our next topic is area on a grid. So we've looked at perimeter of a shape on a grid, now we're going to look at the area of a shape on a grid. So here we've got a shape drawn on a centimetre grid. That means each of these squares has got an area of one centimetre squared. So all we need to do to find the area of the shape is count the number of squares. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And because it's eight squares and each one has an area of one centimetre squared, the area would be eight centimetres squared. And that's it. Okay, our next topic. So now we're going to look at finding the area of a rectangle. So to find the area of a rectangle, we multiply its length by its width. So here we've got a rectangle, its length is 9 and its width is 5. So we just do area is equal to length times width. So it's going to be the length, which is 9, multiplied by the width, which is 5. And 9 times 5 is equal to 45. Now make sure we put the right units on, it's centimetres, so it's going to be 45 centimetres squared. And our next question is to find the area of a square. So here we've got a square, and it's got a side length of 7 centimetres. And because it's a square, that means that all sides are 7 centimetres. So that means that if the length is 7, the width is 7. So to find the area, we're just going to do 7 multiplied by 7. And 7 times 7 is 49 centimetres squared. And if you want to watch the Corp Mouse video on area of a rectangle, watch video 45. Okay, our next topic. So our next topic is finding the area of a triangle. And this is the part of the Corp Mouse revision card that, that tells us the area of a triangle. So the area of a triangle is half the base times the height. Now we can do this in two different ways. We can either half the base and then multiply by the height, or we can times the base and the height first of all and then divide by two or then half it. So here we've got a triangle, and it's got a base of 7 centimetres and a height of 4 centimetres. So if we want to find the area of this, we can either half the 7, which is 3.5, and then multiply that by 4, and then that's whatever 4 times 3.5 is, or we could times the base and the height together first of all, so 7 times 4, so 7 times 4 is equal to 28, and then do 28 divided by 2, and that's equal to 14. So the area for this triangle is 14 centimetres squared. So to find the area of a triangle, you can either do the base times the height and then half it, or half the base times the height. Now here we've got another triangle, and it's got a base of 14 centimetres and a height of 5. This time I'm actually going to half the base to begin with, so I'm going to find the area, which is equal to half the base, so half of 14, and then I'm going to multiply that by the height, which is equal to 5. So half of 14 is 7, and then we're going to multiply that by 5. 7 times 5 is 35, so the area of this triangle would be 35 centimetres squared. So to find the area of a triangle, just do half the base times the height, and then that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is video 44, which is the area of a parallelogram. So here's a parallelogram, and it's got a base of 11 centimetres and a height of 5 centimetres. And the area of a parallelogram is found by the base times the height. Because if you were to chop this part of the parallelogram off and move it across and put it here, we would now have a rectangle, and the base would still be 11 centimetres, because this bit has moved to here, so the base would still be 11, and the height is still 5. So to find the area of a parallelogram, you just do the base times the height. So for this parallelogram, the base is 11, multiplied by the height, and that is the distance between the two parallel lines, which is 5, and 11 times 5 is 55 centimetres squared. If you do have any diagonals labelled, such as this one, you just ignore those, because you just need the height. That's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So the next topic is the area of a trapezium. And this is part of the Corp Miles revision card. I've actually cut it into little pieces. So you've got the area for a tra uh, trapezium. It's given by the formula, a half bracket A plus B. So A and B are the two parallel sides of the trapezium. So we're going to add those two together, divide that answer by 2, and then times it by the height. And that will give you the area of a trapezium. So here's a trapezium. So the area would be equal to a half. A plus B, they're the two parallel lines. So that's 7 plus 11. And then we'll get that answer, and we'll multiply it by the distance between the parallel lines, which is 5. So when we do that, we get a half, and then 7 plus 11 is equal to 18. So a half of 18, multiply by 5. A half of 18 is 9, so we've got 9 times 5. That's equal to 45 centimetres squared. And that's it. So to find the area for trapezium, you add together the two parallel sides, you divide by 2, and then you times by the height, the distance between the two parallel lines. And that's it. And if you want more practice on that, that's video 48 in Corporate Maths. 
Okay, our next topic is to find the area of compound shapes. So that's whenever shapes have been put together. Now those shapes could be rectangles, triangles, semicircles, quarter circles, six of circles, parallelograms, um, trapezia, trapeziums. Um, it, could be, it could be loads of different shapes and they've just been put together and you need to find the area of them. So if you have a look here, we've got this shape, it looks like an arrow, but if we divide it into two, we can see that there's two parallelograms. So we've got two parallelograms, and each of them has a length of 35 centimeters for the base. And the height of them, with the distance between the two parallel lines, as you can see, the whole thing is 52. When you divide that by two, we get 26. That means the height of this parallelogram is 26 centimeters, and the height of this parallelogram is 26 centimeters. So all we need to do is work out the area of this parallelogram, and the area of this parallelogram, and then add them together. The area of a parallelogram is the base times the height, so that's 35 multiplied by 26. And when we do that, we get 910 centimeters squared. Now, these two parallelograms are identical or congruent. So that means that they both have the same area. So it's going to be 910 plus 910, and that's equal to 1,820 centimeters squared. And that's it. Our next topic is units, and it's very important to be able to convert metric units. So here we've got some metric units, and I would write these down. These are the conversion facts on the revision card. Again, if you've got the revision card, pin it on the wall, revise them, bring it with you on the bus, whatever, make sure you learn these facts. And there are videos 347 or 349 in Corbett Maths also, but these are really important. One kilometer is a thousand meters. One meter is 100 centimeters and one centimeter is 10 millimeters. It's important to learn those facts off by heart. In terms of capacity, one liter is a thousand milliliters, and one liter is equal to 1,000 centimeters cubed. They're both quite important. And in terms of mass, one metric ton is a thousand kilograms, and one kilogram is equal to 1,000 grams. And these are all important unit facts to learn off by heart. Okay, and our next topic. Our next topic is sensible estimates, and it's important to be able to make sensible estimates for maybe the height of a building, or the height of a door, or the length of a bus, or the amount of liquid in a glass, or so on. And what I would do is I'd consider the items around you and make sure that you're aware of maybe some of the lengths of them, or heights of them, or maybe how much liquid or something contains, or the mass of certain objects. So for instance, the height of a person, roughly 1.8 meters. The length of a swimming pool, my local swimming pool is 25 meters long, so I remember that. Um, here we've got a large bottle of fizzy drink. It would hold two litres. You can get sort of smaller ones, which might be maybe 1.5 litres, or you've got the little ones that you could be 500 millilitres or, you know, so on. Uh, a can of uh, fizzy drink might be 330 millilitres. Things like that might help you estimate uh, the capacities of different objects. So in terms of the mass of objects, well, a bag of sugar is one kilogram. I've got some weights as well. So I know in terms of, you know, like a 10 kilogram dumbbell, a 20 kilogram dumbbell and so on, 30, 40, 50 kilogram dumbbells and so on, of course. Um, so in terms of the sensible estimates, there are some sort of everyday items which might be useful for you. So we're now going to look at imperial units. So that's videos 347 and 348 in Corbin Math. So we have our metric units, which are centimeters, meters, grams, kilograms, milliliters, liters, and so on, um, the, the modern units. We've then got our imperial or older fashioned units. I um, hope I'm not causing any offense to anyone there, but you've got your older fashioned, your imperial units, such as pounds, ounces, inches, feet, miles, and so on. And we're going to need to be able to convert between them. And here's a typical question where we're told the length of a table is 35 inches. So we've been given it in inches, which is going to be in imperial, and we're told that one inch is 2.54 centimeters. So every inch is 2.54 centimeters. And the question says, how long is the table in centimeters? So we want to convert this 35 inches into centimeters, and we're told that every single inch is 2.54 centimeters. So in other words, we've got 35 lots off 2.54 centimeters. So if we do 35 multiplied by 2.54, that will tell us then how many centimeters long the table is. So we'll do 35 multiplied by 2.54. And when we do that, we get that's equal to 88.9 centimeters. And that's it. And this is a calculator question. So you can just type in 35 multiplied by 2.54, and then just make sure we're putting centimeters on the end. Okay, let's look at our next question. Now, before I do that, I'm just going to go through some of the key facts. So, one kilogram is roughly 2.2 pounds. Okay, another one. Another one would be five miles is roughly eight kilometers. So, if you've got five miles, that's roughly eight kilometers. And dividing both of these by five will give you one mile is roughly 1.6 kilometers. Okay, let's have a look at our question. So, our question says the distance between Newry and Downpatrick is 30 miles. Write this distance in kilometers. So, here we've got the distance between Newry and Downpatrick is 30 miles. Five miles is roughly eight kilometers. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take our 30 and we're going to divide it by 5 because that will tell us how many lots of 5 miles there are in this distance. So 30 divided by 5 is 6. That means there's 6 lots of 5 miles. And every time we've got 5 miles, that's roughly 8 kilometres. We know there's 6 lots of 8 kilometres. So if we do 6 times 8, that's equal to 48 kilometres. And that's it. So our next topic is line symmetry, which is video 316 in CobraMiles.com. So an isosceles triangle has one line of symmetry. Then we've got a rectangle. A rectangle has got two lines of symmetry, a vertical one and a horizontal one. It doesn't have a diagonal one because if you tried to fold it over, the corners wouldn't go to the right place. So a rectangle's only got two lines of symmetry, whereas a square's got four lines of symmetry. So a vertical, horizontal, and the two diagonals. So a parallelogram, it has no lines of symmetry. An equilateral triangle has three lines of symmetry, and a regular hexagon has six lines of symmetry. So it's important to be able to tell if a shape has got lines of symmetry or not. Okay, our next topic, our next topic is rotational symmetry. And to find the order of rotational symmetry of a shape, whenever we spin it through 360 degrees, we count how many times it lands on itself. So here we've got a rhombus, and as we spin it through 360 degrees, as you can see, it lands on itself once when it's upside down, and twice when it gets back to its original position. So a rhombus has order of rotational symmetry 2. Now our question says, circle the shape which has order of rotational symmetry 4, or rotational symmetry order 4. So we've got a heart, it would have order 1, it would only have its final position. We've got a square, as you turn that for a full circle, it lands on itself 4 times, so that will be our shape, that will be the shape which has order of rotational symmetry 4. This 5-pointed star, it would have order of rotational symmetry 5. And this isosceles triangle would only have order rotational symmetry 1. As you turn it around for a full circle, it would only land on itself once. So a shape has got rotational symmetry whenever it lands on itself more than once, whenever you turn it through a full circle. And to find the order of rotational symmetry, you just count how many times it lands on itself whenever you spin it through a full circle. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. And our next topic is constructions, and they are video 78, 72, and 79 on Corporate Mavs. And if you want to watch me do these constructions where I'm filming myself actually doing the constructions, those videos will actually show that. But here what I'm going to do is show you step by step and how I would do the constructions. So first of all, our first question says construct the perpendicular bisector of AB. So first of all, what is a perpendicular bisector? So perpendicular, perpendicular means 90 degrees and bisector means to cut in half. So if we were asked to construct the perpendicular bisector of AB, it would be a straight line that cuts AB in half going through the middle at 90 degrees. So it would be cutting this line AB in half at 90 degrees. And to do that, by using a pair of compasses and a pencil, what you would do is first of all, you would get your pair of compasses and you would put the point of the compass on A and you put the pencil on the compass and you would set it over halfway of the line. So I've just chosen this point. It's definitely over halfway of the line. And I've drawn this semicircle starting at A and I've drawn the semicircle around. So keeping the point here and making sure I draw a nice semicircle going around. Now lifting up your compass and your pencil and making sure it doesn't change size, put the point of the compass on B and then what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing. So we're going to do another arc we're going to put a point of the compass on B and we're going to do another arc and making sure it's the same size as the arc we've done at A. And then finally, what we're going to do is get a ruler and pencil and draw a nice straight line through those. And this line will be our perpendicular bisector. So that line will cross our line AB at 90 degrees. So it's perpendicular and it's a bisector because it cuts the line AB exactly in half. So if that line AB was 10 centimeters, you would have five centimeters to the left here and you'd have five centimeters to the right. So that's it. Okay, next we're going to construct the angle bisector. So here's an angle ABC and we're going to cut this angle in half by using a compass, a pencil and a ruler. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to put our point of our compass on B. So we're going to put the point of our compass here and we're going to do an arc on the line AB here and an arc on the line BC here. And it's important that you keep the compass the same size for both of those arcs. So you put the point here and you just move it so you've got an arc there on the line AB and an arc here on the line BC. Okay, so next we're going to lift up our compass and we're going to put the point of the compass here. So we're going to put the point of the compass where the arc and the line AB meet. And we're now going to do an arc in this direction. So we're going to get our compass and we're going to do an arc in this direction. And it looks something like this. So that's where the point of the compass is. And we do this arc looking like that. Now we're going to lift it up and we're now going to put the point of the compass here. And we're going to do another arc in that direction. And it would look something like this. And then finally, what we're going to do is get a ruler and a pencil. And we're going to join up the center of the angle ABC to where those two arcs meet. And that will be our angle bisector. That line will cut this angle exactly in half. So if this was a 60 degree angle, you would now have 30 degrees above it 
and 30 degrees below. So that line is called the angle bisector. And that's a very important construction. So we've constructed the perpendicular bisector and we've now constructed the angle bisector. Okay, our next construction is to construct a line perpendicular to AB. So it's going to be a line that's at a right angles to AB and that passes through the point C. So it's going to be a line that passes through C and is at right angles to AB. And we're going to do that again with our compass, our pencil and our ruler. So first of all, what we're going to do is get our compass and we're going to put the point of the compass on C and we're going to set it so that it's longer than the distance between C and the line. So it's a bit further than that. So it's not just going to reach the line. It's going to be a bit further, but it also needs to make sure that it reaches the line on two different places. So if I set it too large, so if I set it over here, it would cross somewhere over here, but it wouldn't actually meet the line. So I've set it about here. So it's a bit longer than the distance to the line. And we're going to do two arcs, one here to the left and one arc to the right. And again, it's very important that you keep your compass the same size the whole way through. Next, what we're going to do is keeping the compass the same size, we're going to now lift it up and we're going to put it on the point here. Okay, so putting the compass here, what we're doing is an arc below the line and it's going to be below C, so it's going to be an arc in this direction. And then we're going to lift it up and we're going to repeat it here. So we're going to put our point of our compass here and we're going to do another arc below. And if you get your ruler and pencil and join up from C to where those two arcs meet at the bottom here, that line will be perpendicular to the line AB and it will obviously pass through C. And that's it. So we've constructed the perpendicular to the line AB that passes through the point C. We're now going to construct a perpendicular to the line AB that passes through the point C, which is on the line. So in other words, we're going to make a perpendicular line using our ruler, our compass and our pencil. And it's going to be a perpendicular line to AB. So it's going to be at right angles and it's going to pass through the point C. So our first step is to put the point of the compass on C and we're going to set the compass so that it's getting close to the distance between C and B. So I'm going to put it about this distance here and we're going to do an arc on this side and we're going to keep it the same size and do an arc on the other side. So it would look something like this. So we've put the point of the compass there and we've done an arc on this side and on that side and it's the same distance. OK, so now what we're going to do is we're actually going to look at this line going from here to here and we're now going to construct the perpendicular bisector of that. So using the same steps as before. So our first step is to put the point of the compass here and set the pencil so it's past C and then we're going to do an arc above C and below C and keeping the compass the same size we're then going to swap over and we're going to put the point of the compass here and again keeping it the same size we're going to do an arc above and below. And then finally if we join up these two points there and there that line will pass through C at 90 degrees. So that is a line that is perpendicular to AB and passing through C. And that's it. Our last construction that we're going to look at is constructing an equilateral triangle. And remember, an equilateral triangle, all the sides have the same length. So this is quite a nice one that if you put your point of your compass here and you put your pencil of your compass on the end of the line, that'll be five centimeters. And then if you do an arc above, it would look something like that. So all of these points are five centimeters away from here. Now keeping the compass the same size and point, putting the point of the compass on this side and putting the pencil here, now doing the same thing. And then we'd end up with something that looks like this. And this point here would be five centimeters away from this end of the line and would also be five centimeters away from this end of the line. So if we get a ruler and pencil and join them up like so, so there and there, that will be an equilateral triangle. So it'll be a triangle where the sides are five centimeters. So that's five centimeters, that's five centimeters, and that's five centimeters. And also the angles will be 60 degrees. So that'll be 60 degrees, that'll be 60 degrees, that'll be 60 degrees, and that's it. Okay, so they were our constructions. If you do want to watch full videos on them and me showing you how to do each one of them really clearly using a compass, a ruler, and a pencil, watch the videos above there. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is loci, and that's video 75, 76, and 77 on corporate maps. And our question says to draw the locus of all the possible points that are two centimeters away from the line below. So in other words, we've been given a rule and we've got to draw on all the possible positions that points can be that follow that rule. So we want to draw all the points that are two centimeters away from this line. So the points above the line would be quite straightforward. You could be two centimeters just above the end. You could be two centimeters above there. You could be two centimeters above here. And you could be anywhere that's two centimeters above the line, like so. Alternatively, it could be two centimeters below the line. So it could be two centimeters there, two centimeters there. And you get your ruler and pencil, you make sure all the points are two centimeters below the line. So it looks something like this, where you've got all the possible points above the line and all the possible points below the line. And then what you do is get your ruler and join and go through the points. They're all two centimeters above and below. Now, obviously, if you were using a ruler and pencil, they would all be in a nice straight line. So this point here wouldn't be there. It would be actually up there, okay? And so these points above here and below here are all two centimeters away from the line. 
But what about the end of the line? So if we're at the end of the line here, we could have two centimeters to the right, so that would be there. And then we could be two centimeters here, or two centimeters here, or two centimeters here. And as you can see, we're forming this semicircle where they're all two centimeters away from the end of the line. So it looks something like this. And with a compass and a pencil, you'd put the point of your compass here and your pencil here, and you draw a nice semicircle going around like so. And that would join up perfectly. Uh, excuse my freehand one, but that's just a little sketch there. And likewise, if we're in the end of this line here, we could have two centimeters here. And if we measured the points that are all two centimeters away from the end of the line, again, it would be another semicircle. And all of these points would be two centimeters away from this end of the line. So what we would do is again, get the point of our compass and put it there and then put the pencil two centimeters away and then draw a nice semicircle going around through those points. So that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So this time we've got a diagram and we've got the points A and B and we've got a scale that one centimeter is one mile and we've got land and we've got sea. And the question says a boat is within eight miles of A, so it's within eight miles of A and it's within five miles of B. Shade the possible positions off the boat. And one thing I should have said in this question is the boat's at sea. So it's not on land, it's at sea. So we know that it's within eight miles of A, and we know that one centimeter is one mile. So what I would do is I would measure eight centimeters, and I would set my compass so that it is eight centimeters. So I put the point of the compass on A, and I would put the point my pencil so it's eight centimeters away. So I put my pencil where the sea and the land meet, and I would draw a circle. And this circle has got a radius of eight centimeters, and it would look something like this. It's a freehand sketch, sorry. It's got a radius of eight centimeters, and it's a circle that looks something like that. Okay, next, we're now told that the boat is within five miles of B. So within five miles of B, and that's five centimeters. We'd get our compass, we'd measure it, so the distance between the point and the pencil is five centimeters, and we'd put the point here, and it would be over here somewhere. So we'd put the pencil where the sea and the land meet, and we'd draw another circle. And this circle's a bit smaller, so only got a radius of five centimeters this time, and it would look something like that. And again, sorry, excuse my diagram. So this circle has got a radius of five centimeters, and this circle has a radius of eight centimeters. And we were told that the boat's within eight miles of sea, so in other words, it's in here somewhere, but it's also within this circle as well. So that means the possible positions of the boat would be in this region here. And that's it. If you want more practice on loci, videos 75, 76, and 77 will go through more examples. Also, there's some fantastic practice questions that you can do on Corporate Mavs. So if you go to Corporate Mavs and go down to Worksheets and click on it and go down to those video numbers, beside that you'll see practice questions and they'll be ideal to practice as well. So this is video number one, which is names of 2D shapes. It's very important to know the names of the different 2D shapes. So let's start off with our polygons. We've got our triangle, which is a three-sided shape, quadrilateral, four sides. Pentagon, that's five sides. If it's got six sides, it's a hexagon. Seven sides, a heptagon. Eight sides, octagon. Nine sides, nonagon. And ten sides, decagon. Also, make sure you know your circle, semicircle, and so on. Okay, our next topic. And it's also important to know the difference between your irregular polygons and your irregular polygons. So a polygon is a straight-sided shape. Regular polygons are where all the sides are the same length. So your square, equilateral triangle, here's a regular pentagon, a regular hexagon, and so on. Also, as well as the sides all being the same length, the angles are all the same size. So for instance, in your square, all the angles are 90 degrees. In an equilateral triangle, all of the angles are 60 degrees each, and so on. Irregular polygons are where the sides and the angles aren't all the same, so the sides could vary in length and the angles can vary. So the next topic is going through types of triangles. So it's important to know that you've got your right angle triangle, so that's a triangle with a right angle. Our next type of triangle is the isosceles triangle. The isosceles triangle has two equal length sides. So for instance, this side on the left and the side on the right for this one. So for instance, if this was 10 centimeters on this side, this side here would also be 10 centimeters. Also, as well as having two sides the same length, we've got two angles the same size, this angle and this angle would be the same. You've got your equilateral triangle, all the sides are the same length and all the angles are the same. They're all 60 degrees each. And finally, we've got a scalene triangle, and a scalene triangle is a triangle where none of the sides are the same length and none of the angles are the same. And if you want to go through that in more detail, video 327 on Corbett Mavs goes through the types of triangle. Our next topic is quadrilaterals, and that's video 2 on Corbett Mavs. Here are some quadrilaterals. We've got our square, rectangle, rhombus, trapezium, parallelogram, and kite. Now, in terms of their properties, a square, all sides are the same length. It's got four right angles. It's got four lines of symmetry, down through the middle, across, and diagonally as well. It's got an order of rotational symmetry, four. Then we've got a rectangle. For the rectangle, the opposite sides are the same length, so the top and the bottom will be the same length, and the left and the right-hand side of this rectangle would have the same length. Each of the angles are 90 degrees. It would have two lines of symmetry, an order of rotational symmetry, two. 
Now we've got a rhombus. With a rhombus, all the sides are the same length. It's got two lines of symmetry, so down through the middle and across. It's got an order of rotational symmetry two, and in terms of the angles, the opposite angles are the same size. Our next shape, so we've got a trapezium, and the trapezium has one pair of parallel lines, so the top and the bottom of this trapezium are parallel to each other. Also, sometimes it has a line of symmetry, so this trapezium does have a line of symmetry, a lot of the time it doesn't. It would have order of rotational symmetry one, and yeah. Okay, our next shape, our next shape is a parallelogram. A parallelogram has two pairs of parallel lines, so the top line is parallel to the bottom, and also the right-hand side is parallel to the left-hand side. The opposite angles are the same as each other, so the top left angle here would be the same as the bottom right, and the top right would be equal to the bottom left. Um, it would have order of rotational symmetry two, and this parallelogram would have no lines of symmetry. And finally, we've got a kite. A kite would have one line of symmetry going down through the middle. Uh, the angle on the left and the right of this kite would be equal to each other, and yeah. Okay, and if you want more details in terms of quadrilaterals, watch video to incorporate maths. Okay, our next topic. Our next topic is 3D shapes. Here are some common 3D shapes you need to know the name of. So you've got your cube, cuboid, sphere, cone, cylinder, triangular prism, square base pyramid, and pentagonal prism. That's just an example of a prism. Um, so we've got these different 3D shapes. You're going to need to know the names of them. Also, you're going to need to know what edges are, vertices are, and faces are. And let's have a look at those now. So here we've got a vertex. So a vertex is a corner. So with this cube, it would have eight vertices. Vertex means one of them. When you've got more than one, it's vertices. So it would have eight vertices. That's eight corners, four in the top, one, two, three and four and four in the bottom as well so it would have eight vertices the cube would have six faces so here's a face at the front a face on the top a face on the right there'd be a face on the left the back and the bottom as well and just think of a dice it's got six faces and in terms of edges edges join the vertices it would have 12 edges so it would have one going along the top here one two three four and then it would have four going downwards one two three and one at the back and then it'd have four in the bottom so it'd have 12 edges okay it's also important to know what nets are and this is the court mouse revision card on nets so here are the nets of six 3d shapes so you've got your cube the net of the cube so it would fold round and then the two sides would fold up so that would be the net of a cube so here's the net of a cuboid the net of a square base pyramid so this square would be the base and then the four triangles would fold up to meet at a point then you've got a triangular prism so this would be the base and then the two sides would fold up and then the two triangles would fold up to fill in those spaces so that would be the, the net of a triangular prism here we've got the net of a cone and the net of a cylinder and it's important to know what nets are if you want more practice on nets watch video four and corporate maths Okay, so our next topic is parallel and perpendicular lines. So two lines that are always the same distance apart are parallel lines. So the two lines will never meet. So here we've got an example of parallel lines. People often think of railway tracks whenever they think of parallel lines. And so it's a good one to think of. In terms of perpendicular lines, perpendicular lines are lines that cross at 90 degrees. So if you've got two lines that are perpendicular to each other, the angle between them will be 90 degrees. And that's it. So parallel lines are lines that are always the same distance apart, they never meet, and lines that cross at 90 degrees are perpendicular. So our next topic is views and elevations. So views and elevations are whenever you're looking at 3D shapes, looking at it from different perspectives and considering how the shape will look if you look at it from those angles or those perspectives. So here we've got a shape, it's a load of multi-link cubes stuck together, and I'm gonna look at it from different angles. We've been asked to draw what the front elevation would look like. So if I was standing here, if I was small and I was looking at it from here, and this was the front of the shape, I would just see this, these four blocks, this one, this one, this one, and this one. So I would see this shape here, and I could get my pencil and ruler and draw these really tidily, excuse this, and that's what I would see. I would see a rectangle that was one, two, three, four blocks across. Some people like to put in the lines as well in between because you might see those lines joining the blocks, uh, but that's what I would see. I would see that rectangle, which is four rectangles wide. And if you do want more practice on views and elevations, look at 354, video 354 on corporatemaps.com. Okay, let's look at it from a different perspective. So again, that's the front again. Now I'm gonna draw the side elevation. Now there's two different side elevations here. I could draw it from the left-hand side, or I could draw it from the right-hand side, and I'm actually gonna draw both. So let's start off with the left-hand side. So if I was here at the side, and I was looking at it that way, I would again see a rectangle, and it would be one, two, three, four blocks across. So it would be four blocks across, like so. And I would draw it like that, but you could put the lines in if you wanted to, going down. You might see where the blocks join, so some people would draw the lines in. So, But I would just draw it like that. Alternatively, I could draw it from the other side. So I could be standing over here, and I could be looking at it from this side here. And again, I would see one, two, three, four blocks. 
Now, they're not all level with each other, but that's what I would see. I would see the block on the left, the block in the middle, the next one back, and the back one there. So I would see, again, four blocks. Now, this time, if I was drawing, I would draw the lines in, like so, just to show that I would see the one on the left-hand side, that one being further forward, and then I might see that one a bit further back, and that one a bit further back, and that one a bit further back. But again, it would just be a rectangle, four blocks across. Okay, and finally, we've been asked to draw the plan view. The plan view is from above. It's the bird's eye view as such. So we're going to pretend that we're above the ship and we're looking down on it. So if we were looking down at it from above, we would see our four blocks at the bottom. So our four blocks would be going along the bottom, like so, one, two, three, four. And I'm looking straight down. So then on the left-hand side, it would go up. So it would go like one, two, three, four, like so, if I'm looking down from the top. Then it would go across and down, across and down, across and down, and across and down. So it would look something like this from above the ship. And that's what I would draw. Um, again, some people put the joints in, but because they're all sort of flat, I would tend to draw it like so. And that would be the plan view, the view from above. So whenever you're drawing shapes from different perspectives, you've got the front elevation, which is the view from the front. You've got your side elevations, which are the views from the sides. And you've got your plan view, which is the view from above. Okay, the next topic we're going to look at is time calculations. And before we look at an example, let's look at some of the key information we need to know whenever we're dealing with time. So one minute is 60 seconds. One hour is 60 minutes, one day is 24 hours, one week is seven days. Then you've got your months of the year, and in a year there's 12 months, and one year consists of either 365 days or 366 days if it's a leap year. It's important to be able to work out time calculations as well. So knowing the difference between 12 hour clock, AM, PM, 24 hour clock, uh, video 322 goes through that. So this is a typical question, and the question says, Ella finishes school usually at 3 p.m. And the time on her watch is 13.14. So that's a 24-hour clock. And let's change it to p.m. So it's obviously in the afternoon because it's past 12, so it's 13, so it's p.m. And to find the time here, well, we've got 13. Well, if you take away 12, you're left with 1. So that'd be 1.14 p.m. And Ella's looking at her watch and seeing how long it's left until she finishes school. Um, not sure why she's looking forward to the end of school. And the question is, how many minutes is it until Ella finishes school? So Ella's got, well, it's 1.14 p.m. We've got 1.14 p.m. And we want to get to 3 p.m. So first of all, let's get to 2 p.m. Well, this is 14 minutes, and there's 60 minutes in an hour. So if we add 6 minutes to begin with, so add 6 minutes, it brings us to 1.20 p.m. And then if we add another 40 minutes, that will bring us to 2 p.m. And then we've got another hour. Now we've been asked how many minutes it is until Ella finishes school. So instead of writing one hour here, I'm going to write add another 60 minutes. So let's find out how many minutes it is until Ella finishes school. So she's got six minutes and then 40 and then another 60. Well, 60 plus 40 is 100 plus 6 is 106. So 106 minutes. And that's it. So it's very important to be able to calculate questions involving time. So remember in the 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, being able to deal with the 12 hour clock, 24 hour clock and so on. So our next topic is timetables. So here we've got a bus timetable and we've got our stops, Southville, Leak, Milton, Newtown, Red Island, Sandville and Bakerstown. And here are three buses. Each column represents a bus. So the first bus goes starts at Southville at 9.18. It arrives at Leak at 9.28 and leaves at 9.28 gets to Milton at 9.41 and leaves at 9.41 and so on. So this is the timetable. This bus stops at every single stop. This bus, the second bus stops at every single stop. And the last bus, you can see some of them have got dashes in. That means it's maybe an express bus, so it skips out some stops. So this bus goes from Southville to Red Island to Bakerstown. So the question says, Dara's traveling to Sandville. So we've got Sandville here. That's where Dara's going. And he arrives at Milton bus station. So Milton bus station at 10.45. And the question says, at what time should he arrive at Sandville? So he arrives at 10.45. Now, if he arrives at Milton bus station, he's already missed that first bus. He's because it left at 9.41. So he's not going to get this bus. So that bus is out of the question. And then we've got the second bus and it's going to leave Milton at 11.01. Now he's arrived at 10.45, so that's great. So he is going to get this bus. And the question says, it says, what time should he arrive at Sandville? So he should arrive at Sandville at 11.33, depending obviously if the bus is on time. So the answer would be 11.33. So we could have been asked different questions here. We could have been asked, how long is that journey? Well, if it leaves at 11.01 and it arrives at 11.33, that would take 32 minutes. It could be, how long does he need to wait until he can get the bus? And so on. But that's it. We've answered our question. What time should he arrive at Sandville? 11.33. Okay, our next topic is distance charts. So here's the distance chart, and you've got your towns, Bilton, Newtown, 
Portsville, Leek and Castleton. I actually saw one of these the other day in an Apple Green service station where it had all the different towns and cities and I had the distance between them. And here we've got some towns that I've just made up and the distance between them in kilometers. And we've got Bilton. And if you wanted to find, for instance, the distance between Bilton and Leek, you would just go to Bilton and you would go down until you got to the road that Leek was in. And you can see that's 95 kilometers. You could have started at Leek and went across until you got to Bilton, which again would be 95. Okay, so the question says, Jessica travels from Bilton, so here, to Portsville, which is here. So if we look at it, that's going to be 12 kilometers. Then she travels from Portsville to Castleton. So she's at Portsville and she's going to travel to Castleton. So that's 63 kilometers, 63 kilometers. And the question says, how far does Jessica travel? So she's traveled 12 kilometers to get from Bilton to Portsville and then from Portsville to Castleton, 63. So if we add them together, 12 plus 63 is equal to 75 kilometers. And that's it. Okay, our next topic. Okay, our next topic is speed, distance, and time. So this is a very important topic. It's video 299, and I'm gonna look at this topic in two different ways. First of all, just by considering a speed. So for instance, 30 miles per hour and what that means. And then I'm gonna consider the formula that we use for it. Okay, so if I had a speed such as 30 miles per hour, that means 30 miles each hour. So if I had one hour and I was traveling at 30 miles per hour, I would go a distance of 30 miles. If I was traveling for two hours, well, that'll be two, it's 30 miles an hour, so that's two lots of 30, so I would travel 60 miles. If I travel for three hours, well, that's three hours at 30 miles each hour, so that's 90 miles, and so on. So that means that if I know the speed of 30 miles per hour, if I wanted to find out how far I've traveled, I would just multiply the speed, 30 miles per hour, by the time that I was traveling. So 30 times one is 30 miles, 30 times two is 60 miles, and so on. Likewise, if I knew the distance I traveled, so for instance, 300 miles, and I knew it took 10 hours, if I divided the distance by the time, so 300 divided by 10, that gives me 30. 120 divided by four is 30. 30 divided by one is 30. So if you divide the distance by the time, you get the speed. And finally, if you know the distance you travel and the speed you're traveling, well, 300 divided by 30 is 10. 120 divided by 30 is four. 90 divided by 30 is three. So if you divide the distance by the speed, you get the time taken. So as we've seen, speed is equal to distance divided by time. Distance is equal to speed times time, and time is equal to distance divided by speed. So our question says a car drives 180 miles in four hours. Calculate the average speed in miles per hour of the car. So we want to find the average speed of the car. So speed is equal to distance divided by time. So if we divide the distance by the time, we'll find the speed. So we're going to do the distance, which is equal to 180 miles, and we're going to divide that by the time, which is four hours. And if we divide 180 by four, we'll find the speed. So 180 divided by four is equal to 45. So the speed of the car, the average speed of the car, would be 45 miles per hour. And that's it. So it's very important to know that speed is equal to distance divided by time, distance is equal to speed times time, and time is equal to distance divided by speed. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is called distance time graphs, and that's video 171 on Corbin Maths. So here we've got a distance time graph, and we've got the distance from home, so it starts at zero, so that means they're at home, and it goes up in two, so it goes two kilometers, four, six, eight, ten, and so on. And horizontally, we've got the time, so it starts at 8 a.m., and we've got 9 a.m., 10 a.m., and so on. And we're given some information. We're told Rosie jogged to her friend's house, so Rosie starts at home, and she jogs to her friend's house, and after having a short rest, Rosie then jogged home, arriving at half past ten. And we were told to complete the distance time graph. So let's find out where half past ten would be. So if we look at 8 a.m. and 9 a.m., let's find out where half past would be. So half past is one, two, three, four blocks going from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. And after two of them would be half past eight. So if we look at 10 a.m., we've got one, two blocks. So that would be half past ten there. So that is 10.30. And we've been asked to complete the distance time graph. Well, she jogs home, so we now need to draw a line, a straight line going from here down to half past 10. And it would look something like this. Okay, part B. So part B says, how long did Rosie rest for? So as you can see, she rested for one block. And when I say block, that's a collection of five of the little small squares, one, two, three, four, five. It's where the line is slightly thicker. So she rests for one block. So as we spotted earlier, we knew that two of them was half past. So this should be quarter past. Let's check. So we've got eight o'clock, 8 a.m., quarter past eight, half past eight, quarter to nine, nine o'clock. So each one of the smaller blocks of those collection of five squares is 15 minutes. So Rosie rested for 15 minutes. Okay, and part C says, when did Rosie jog at the fastest speed? So in other words, did she jog to her friend's house at a faster speed than whenever she jogged home? 
If it's steeper on a distance time graph, it means it's a faster speed. And as you can see, the line going to her friend's house is slightly steeper than the line coming back. This is a steeper line than this one. So the jog to her friend's house is faster than the jog home because the line is steeper. And I've just written that down, going to her friend's house because the line is steeper. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic, our next compound measures topic is density. And that's video 384 in corporate maths. So here's part of the corporate maths revision card. And density is equal to mass divided by volume. So if you want to find the density of something, you do its mass divided by its volume. But we can rearrange this. We can multiply both sides of this formula by volume. So if you multiply both sides of this formula by volume, you'll get density times volume is equal to the mass. So if you want to find the mass of something, you can multiply its density by the volume. And finally, if you divide both sides of this formula by density, you get mass divided by density is equal to volume. So if you want to find the volume of a material, you can divide its mass by its density, and that'll give you its volume. So let's have a look at some questions now. So first of all, we've been given a piece of metal has a volume of 50 centimetres cubed and a mass of 900 grams. Calculate the density of the metal. So we want to find the density of the metal. So the density is equal to mass divided by volume. So if we want to find density, we do mass divided by volume. So the mass of the metal is 900 grams. So we've got a new 900 divided by the volume of the metal, which is 50. And if we do 900 divided by 50, we'll find the density of the metal. So 900 divided by 50 is equal to 18. So it's going to be 18. Now we're dividing mass, which is grams by the volume, which is centimeters cubed. So the units for density will be 18 grams per centimeter cubed. So that means the density of this metal is 18 grams per centimeter cubed. Okay, let's have a look at our next example. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So our next question says a glass paperweight has got a mass of 420 grams, and the density of the glass used is 2.5 grams per centimeter cubed. Find the volume of the paperweight. So the volume is equal to mass divided by density. So what we want to do is we want to find the volume of the paperweight. So we want to do its mass divided by its density. So the volume is equal to the mass, which is equal to 420, divided by the density, which is 2.5. And when we do 420 divided by 2.5, we will find the volume of this paperweight. So 420 divided by 2.5 is equal to 168. And our units will be centimeters cubed. And that's it. OK, and let's have a look at one more example. So this time we've been told Kylie has a solid glass cube. So she's got a solid glass cube. The length of each side of the cube is three centimeters. So the cube's got a side length of three centimeters. The density of the glass used is 2.5 grams per centimeter cubed. And it says find the mass of the cube. So mass is equal to density multiplied by volume. So we want to find the mass of this cube. So we know its density. Its density is equal to 2.5. And we want to multiply that by the volume. So to find the mass, we're going to do 2.5, the density, multiplied by the volume. But in this question, it's not obvious what the volume volume of the cube is. We're told the side length of the cube is three centimeters, but we don't know its volume. But we know enough information to work it out. The volume of a cube is the length multiplied by the width multiplied by the height. And because there's a cube, all of the side lengths are the same, so it's going to be three multiplied by three multiplied by three. And three times three is nine times three is 27. So the volume of the cube is 27 centimeters cubed. So to find the mass of the cube, we're going to do the mass is equal to the density multiplied by the volume. So we're going to do the density 2.5 multiplied by 27. So 2.5 multiplied by 27 equals 67.5 grams. And that's it. So the mass of this cube will be 67.5 grams. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is pressure. And that's video 385 in corporate maths. So pressure is equal to force divided by area. So this is part of the corporate maths revision card. And pressure is equal to force divided by area. So if we divide the force by the area, we'll find the pressure. And if we rearrange this, if we multiply both sides of this formula by area, we would get the pressure times area equals force. So that means that the force is equal to the pressure times the area. And if we divide both sides of this equation by the pressure, we'd find that force divided by pressure is equal to area. So it's very important to remember that pressure is equal to force divided by area. So here we've got our question, and it says a box exerts a force of 4,000 newtons on a table. So a box has been placed on a table, and it exerts a force of 4,000 newtons on that table. And the area of the base of the box is 250 centimeters squared. Work out the pressure on the table in newtons per centimeter squared. So you want to find the pressure on the table. So pressure is equal to force divided by area. Pressure is equal to force divided by area. So if we divide the force, which is 4,000 newtons, by the area, which is 250 centimeters squared, that would tell us the pressure. So 4,000 divided by 250 is equal to 16. And that's measured in newtons, because we had 4,000 newtons, and we were divided by 250 centimeters squared. So it's going to be newtons per centimeter squared. And that's it. So the pressure on the table is 16 newtons per centimeter squared. And that's it. So if you want any extra practice on pressure, if you go to that ultimate GCSE Foundation practice booklet, there's a question out on pressure for you. OK, let's have a look at our next topic.
Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is translations. So we were given a triangle, translate B, the shape B, five squares to the right and two squares down. So in other words, we just need to slide the shape five squares to the right and two squares down. And whenever I'm doing a question like this, I just do one corner at a time. So looking at the corner at the top of this triangle here, I'm gonna go five squares to the right. So one, two, three, four, five would be here. And then two down would be one, two. So it'd be moved to here. This corner, the bottom right corner, we're gonna move it five to the right, one, two, three, four, five, and two down, one, two, so it's gonna to move to here. And finally, this corner of the triangle, this corner of B, we're gonna go five to the right, so one, two, three, four, five, and two down, one, two, we move it to here. And then we just get a ruler and a pencil and we join those up. And that's it, so we've translated triangle B, five squares to the right and two squares down. Okay, so our next topic is translations, and that's video 325 in Corbin Maths. And a vector looks something like this, where we're gonna have a number on the top and a number beneath and some brackets around it. The number on the top will tell you how to move the shape horizontally, and it'll tell you how many squares to the right to move it. So for instance, if it's an eight, you'll move it eight squares to the right. If it's a five, it'll be five squares to the right. If it's a zero, you won't move it any squares to the right, it'll stay where it is horizontally. If it's a negative, so for instance, if it was negative three, you would move it three squares to the left. If it was negative nine, it'd be nine squares to the left. So the top number tells you how to move the shape horizontally. And if it's positive, it'll be to the right. If it's negative, it's to the left. The number beneath that will tell you how to move the shape vertically. So if it's positive here, it's a one, so that's gonna mean move the shape one square upwards. If it's a four, you move it four squares upwards. And if it's a negative, you move it downwards. So if it's negative three, you'd move it three squares downwards. So here we've got a typical question and we've got a little shape, it's a little T-shape and the shape's called C. And we've been asked to translate shape C by, and we've got minus one, five. That would mean one square to the left, so one left, because it's negative, it's gonna to go to the left, so one left. And then we've got a five, that's gonna mean five up. So we're gonna move the shape one square left and five squares up, and that's it. So next up is rotations. So here we've got rotate shape A 90 degrees anti-clockwise about the point two minus one. So let's mark on the point two minus one. So this is gonna be our center of rotation. And we're gonna rotate shape A 90 degrees anti-clockwise, so going this way, anti-clockwise, about that point. So get your tracing paper and put it on top of the center of rotation and the shape like so. And make sure your tracing paper is straight. So it's straight and it's not diagonal like something like that. So make sure in this case I put it landscape. So going that way. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw over the center of rotation and we're gonna draw over the shape A. So we've drawn over the center of rotation and we've drawn over shape A. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna put our pencil on the center of rotation and we're gonna rotate the tracing paper 90 degrees anti-clockwise. So when we do that, we turn it and it's important to keep the center of rotation on that point. We're turning it like so. Until we've rotated the tracing paper 90 degrees anti-clockwise. And we can now see the position of where A would go after we rotated it 90 degrees anti-clockwise about two negative one. So now what I would do is I would just draw over this rectangle a couple of times just to make sure that whenever I move my tracing paper, that there's a sort of a light impression on the paper. So it would look something like this. And that's it. So we've rotated A 90 degrees anti-clockwise about the point two negative one. Let's have a look at our next question. So this time we've been given a triangle and we've got a set of coordinate axes. We've got our X axis and we've got our Y axis. And the question says reflect triangle A. So we've got this triangle A and we've been asked to reflect it in the Y axis. In other words, this is where the mirror is. Okay, so we've got this Y axis and this is where the mirror is. And we wanna reflect this triangle across to the other side. So let's do each point at a time. So this top point of the triangle, it's one line away from the Y axis. So we need to go another one to the other side there. The point down here, it's one away from the y-axis, so we need to go one the other way. And the bottom right-hand point of the triangle, it's one, two, three, four away from the mirror line, so we need to go another four, one, two, three, four, so it'll be there. And if we get a ruler and a pencil and join those up, we'll have reflected triangle A in the y-axis. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So we've got the same triangle and we've been told this time to reflect triangle A in the x-axis. So we've got this x-axis, so this is where the mirror line is this time, and we're gonna reflect the triangle downwards. So it's gonna move down here somewhere. So again, let's look at each corner of the triangle. So let's start off with this corner, and it's one, two away from the x-axis. So we go down another two, one, two to here. This corner is one, two away from the x-axis. So we go another two, one, two to there. And this point up here, it's one, two, three, four away from the x-axis, so we need to go down four, one, two, three, four down to there. And if we get a ruler and a pencil and join those up, that'll be answer for reflecting triangle A and the x-axis.
and that's it. So we've been asked to reflect this shape, this shape C, in the line x equals negative 1. So this line x equals negative 1 is going to be a line going straight through negative 1 on the x-axis. So if we go to the x-axis and go to negative 1 here, it's going to be a vertical line going straight through that negative 1. So that's where our mirror line is going to be. So an x equals line will be a vertical line going through whatever number that is on the x-axis. Now we have to reflect the shape C in that mirror line. So let's start off with this corner. So this corner is 1, 2 to the mirror line. So we need to go in over 2, 1, 2. So it's going to move to here. The bottom right hand corner of C, well it's 1, 2, 3, 4 to the mirror line. So we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4 to here. And the top of triangle C is here, so it's 1, 2, 3, 4 to the mirror line. So we need to go another 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's going to be there. And we get a ruler and pencil and we just join up that shape. And we have reflected C in the line x equals negative 1. Next, we're going to reflect the shape C in the line y equals 1. So let's just rub out what we've done. So we've got our shape C again, and we're going to reflect it this time in the line y equals 1. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the y-axis and the point 1, so the y-axis and the point 1, and we're going to draw a horizontal line going through that point. So going through 1 on the y-axis. So if you've got a y equals and a number, it'll be a horizontal line passing through that number on the y-axis. And we have to reflect this shape, this triangle, in that mirror line. So let's start with this bottom left-hand corner of C. It's 1 above the mirror line, so let's reflect it to 1 below. This point is 1 above the mirror line, so we're going to go another 1 downwards, so there. And finally, this point, to get to the mirror line, we go 1, 2, 3 down, so let's go number 3, 1, 2, 3 to there. And let's join up those points, and that's it. We need to be able to reflect shapes in the lines y equals x, so the diagonal line going upwards this way, and the line y equals negative x, the line going down this way here, okay? And it would look something like this. So it's very important to know what the lines y equals x and y equals negative x look like so that whenever you're doing reflections you can then draw them really quickly and easily. Now to reflect the shape in that line it's quite easy we just count the diagonals. So let's look at each corner. So let's start off by looking at this corner, the bottom left hand corner of B. And as you can see if we go diagonally to our mirror line it's one diagonal. So we need to go another diagonal the other way so it'll move to here. This point, the bottom right-hand corner, if we count the diagonals, it's one diagonal, and then we've got half a diagonal. So if we go another one and a half, so a half and then one would be here. So we've reflected these two points. Now let's look at the points at the top of the rectangle. So let's look at the top left-hand corner. That would be one diagonal, two diagonals. So we need to go another two diagonals, so that'd be one diagonal, two diagonals would be there. And finally, the top right-hand corner of B would be up here. So if we count the diagonals, that'd be one diagonal, two diagonals, and a half. So we go a half, one and two and as you can see we've got a rectangle shape now we just need to get a ruler and pencil draw a nice rectangle and that's it so we reflected shape b or rectangle b in the line y equals negative x okay so let's have a look at our next question so this time we've been asked to enlarge b this rectangle by scale factor two using the origin as the center of enlargement so sometimes you could be given a grid like this a set of axes and you could be given a center of enlargement as the origin so that's the point zero zero and asked to enlarge a shape so we've got the shape B, and we've been asked to enlarge it by scale factor 2. That means it's going to become twice as big, but also twice as far away from the center of enlargement, this origin. So let's start off with each corner. So let's start off with the bottom left-hand corner of the rectangle here. And it was one square to the right and one square up. But whenever we enlarge it by scale factor 2, it's instead of being one across and one up, it's going to become two across and two up. So two to the right and two up. So it's going to move to here. Next, let's look at the bottom right-hand corner of the shape, this corner, and it was two squares to the right and one square up. But whenever we enlarge by scale factor two, it'll become four squares to the right and two squares up. So instead of being two across and one up, it'll be four across and two up. So it's going to move to here. Next, the top left-hand corner of the rectangle, here, it was one square to the right and three squares up. But whenever we enlarge by scale factor two, it's going to move two squares to the right and six squares up, doubling it. So instead of being one to the right and three up, it'll be two to the right and six up. So that'll be 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it's going to move to here. And finally, the top right-hand corner of the rectangle, it was 2 squares to the right and 3 squares up. And whenever we enlarge by scale factor 2, it becomes twice as far away. So that'll be 4 squares to the right and 6 squares up. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 6 up. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it's going to move to here. So let's get our ruler and pencil and join those points up. And that's it. So we've enlarged B by scale factor 2 using the origin as the center of enlargement. So it's become twice as big, but it's also twice as far away from this center of enlargement. So here's a typical question. It says enlarge by scale factor a half using negative 5, negative 5 as the center of enlargement. So we've got a fractional scale factor. 
Okay, so let's have a go at this question. So it says enlarge by scale factor half using negative five, negative five as the center of enlargement. So let's find negative five, negative five. So that's our center of enlargement there. And we've got our original shape, our object, and we're gonna enlarge it by scale factor of half. That means that all the points in the image will be half the distance away from the center of enlargement. So for instance, we looked at this point at the top of the kite. This point at the top of the kite is one, two, three, four, five, six squares to the right and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight squares upwards. So because we're using scale factor of a half, we're gonna half those distances. So instead of going six to the right, we're gonna go three to the right, one, two, three. And instead of going eight up, we're gonna go four up. So one, two, three, four. So the top of our kite will move to here. Okay, now let's look at the left-hand side of the kite here. So this point is one, two, three, four squares to the right and one, two, three, four, five, six squares upwards. So we're gonna half those distances. So instead of going four squares to the right, we're gonna go two squares to the right, one, two. And instead of going six up, we're gonna go three up, one, two, three. So that means that the left-hand side of the kite will move to here. The right-hand side of the kite, so we can kind of guess it's gonna to move to this point here, but let's check it. So going back to our center of enlargement, it is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight squares to the right, and one, two, three, four, five, six squares upwards. We're gonna half those, so that'll be four to the right and three up, so one, two, three, four, and one, two, three. So that's the right-hand side of the kite. And let's be careful with the bottom of the kite because we need to make sure we get the right height here. So it is, whenever we look at our bottom of our kite, going back to the center of enlargement, it's one, two, three, four, five, six squares to the right and one up. So we're gonna half our distances. So instead of going six to the right, we're gonna go three to the right, one, two, three. And instead of going one square up, we're gonna go half a square up. So it's gonna be there. And then we'll get our ruler and our pencil and we'll join those up. And that's it, so we've enlarged this shape by a scale factor of a half, so it's got smaller, using the center of enlargement, negative five, negative five. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So this time we've been given a smaller rectangle and it's been enlarged to get this larger rectangle and we've been asked to find the scale factor of enlargement. In other words, how many times larger have we made the shape? So if we look at the dimensions of this smaller rectangle, it's got a width of two and it's got a height of one, two, three. Whereas the larger one, it's got a width of one, two, three, four, five, six, and it's got a height of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So if we want to find the scale factor of enlargement, we just need to see how many times bigger the sides have become. So the width has gone from two to six, that's three times bigger. And also, in terms of the heights, the height has gone from three to nine, that's also three times bigger. So the scale factor of enlargement would be three. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is parts of the circle. So here we've got some parts of the circle that you need to know off by heart. We've got the radius, and the radius is the distance from the center to the edge of the circle. We've got the diameter, that's the distance across the middle of the circle, so through the center. You've got the circumference, that's the distance around the outside of the circle. And you've got the chord, the chord's a line that joins one part of the circle to another part of the circle. Now let's look at some more parts of the circle. So we've got the arc, which is part of the circumference. We've got a tangent, which is a straight line that touches the circle once and carries on. We've got a sector, which is part of the circle, this green region here, or I like to think about it in terms of a slice of pizza. And then we've got a segment. And so a segment is if you've got that chord that goes from one part of the circle to the other part of the circle, and um, the segment is one of those regions such as this, okay? So it's very important to know these parts of the circles as well. And if you've got the chord mouse revision card on that, that's very useful. The next topic we're going to look at is finding the circumference of the circle. So the circumference is a fancy name for the perimeter of the circle. It's the distance around the outside of the circle. And the circumference of a circle is found by working out pi times diameter. So if you multiply pi by the diameter, the distance across the circle going through the center, that will tell you the circumference of a circle. So it's very important to know where pi is on your calculator. And as if you look down here on my calculator, I've got a yellow pi there. So because it's in yellow, that means I need to press the shift button first of all, and then press the button here just beneath the pi symbol and that then will bring up pi in the calculator. So in this question we've been asked to find the circumference of a circle that has got a diameter the whole way across of 14 centimeters. So the circumference of the circle is pi times diameter. So it's going to be pi times the distance across the circle which is 14. So that's going to be pi times 14. So we on our calculator we press shift and then the pi button this one here it'll bring up pi. Then you'll do times 14 and then press equals, and it will tell us the circumference of a circle. Now sometimes it will come up like this, 14 pi, depending on the mode of your calculator. So you'd press the SD button there, and then it will tell you the circumference of a circle, 
And here we've got the circumference of this circle will be equal to 43.98229 and so on centimeters. Um, I'm going to run this to two decimal places, so I'm going to write 43.98 centimeters. So the circumference of this circle will be 43.98 centimeters. And always remember your units. The circumference is the perimeter, it's the distance around the outside of the circle. So if the diameter is 14 centimeters, the circumference will be measured in centimeters also. Okay, and also we might give, be given a circle like this where we've got the radius is five centimeters. So remember the circumference is pi times diameter. So the diameter is the whole way across the circle. So if the radius is five, that means the diameter of this circle would be 10. So we would do circumference is pi times diameter. So we would do pi times 10, and then you would just work out what that is. Okay, our next topic is the perimeter of a semicircle. So here we've got a semicircle. You can see it's got a radius, the distance from the center of the circle, if it was a full circle, to the edge is three centimeters. So the whole way across would be six centimeters. And we've got this arc at the top. And we want to find this distance from here around to here. And that will be half of a full circle because it's a semicircle. So if I treat this as a full circle to begin with, and I do pi times diameter, I get the circumference of the whole circle. And then if we half, and you'll get just this distance here, just the length of this arc at the top. So we can then do six plus whatever that is. So we're going to need to use the circumference formula. So that circumference is equal to pi times diameter. So we're going to do pi on our calculator times by the diameter of the circle. And the diameter is six here, the whole way across. So we're going to do pi times six. That's equal to 18.8495. Five, five, nine, two, and so on. And it's important not to round this because we're going to be doing more calculations with this. Um, so you may just want to keep it on your calculator display so then we can do the next stage. So whenever you do pi times six and press equals, keep that on your calculator display. So that's the circumference of the whole circle. Now we're dealing with a semicircle, which is half of a circle. So if we take that 18.849 and so on, I'm just going to do some dots so that I don't have to write the whole thing down. And if I divide that by two, so my calculator, I've already got that on my calculator. If I press divided by two, so it comes up with answer ANS divided by two on my display and press equals. I get it says three pi to begin with, and then I press the SD button, and that gives me 9.42477961 and so on. So that 9.424 so on centimeters would be the distance from here all the way around the semicircle to here. So that distance from here around to here would be 9.42477 and so on centimeters. Now we want to find the perimeter of the semicircle. So that's going to be the length of all the sides. So we've got the base and this arc. So we're going to do 9.42477 and so on. And just keep it on your calculator display plus. And we've got the base. Now the base of the shape is six centimeters. We've got our three and another three. So plus six gives us 15.42477 and so on. Now I'm going to round this to two decimal places. So whenever I round this to two decimal places, that would give me 15.42 centimeters. Now it's perimeter and we're dealing in centimeters, so our units were centimeters, and that's why I use centimeters, and that's it. So our next topic is arc length. And the formula to find the arc length, so the length from here round to here, is given by Vita, the angle over 360, multiply by pi, multiply by the diameter. And this is video 58 in Cobra Maths, and this is part of the Cobra Maths revision card. And our question asks us to find the perimeter of this sector. So here we've got a sector. It's got a radius of eight, so the distance from the center to the edge of the circle is eight centimeters, and we want to find its perimeter. So we're going to do eight plus eight plus whatever this arc length is. So the arc length is Vita, so the angle is 14 degrees, divided by 360 multiply by pi, and now we're going to multiply by the diameter of the whole circle. So if we did have a whole circle here, the diameter would be 16 the whole way across. So multiply by 16. And that gives us 1.9547 and so on centimeters. So we've been asked to find the perimeter of this sector. So we're going to do 8 plus 8 plus 1.9547 and so on. And we're going to get our answer. So I've already got this on my calculator display. So I'm just going to press plus 8 plus 8. And that gives me 17.9547 and so on centimeters. Or if I round it to two decimal places, the answer would be 17.95 centimeters to two decimal places. And that's it. Our next topic is the area of a circle. And if you want to revise this topic in Corbin Miles and watch the full video, it's video 59. So the area of a circle is given by the formula pi r squared. I remember our order of operations, you square, you do any orders before you do any multiplications. So what it means is we're going to square the radius and multiply it by pi. 
So here we've got a circle and we want to find the area of this circle. And it's got a radius of six centimeters. The distance from the center to the edge is six centimeters. So the area is equal to pi r squared. So it's going to be area is equal to pi times the radius six squared. So what we could do is on our calculator, we're just going to type this in, pi times 6 squared. The great thing is your calculator will know the order of operations whenever you type in pi times 6 squared, and it will work it out for you. Um, alternatively, you could do 6 squared, which is 36, and then do pi times 36, and you get the same answer. But I'm just going to type this in. I'm going to type in pi, so shift, and then the pi button here, and then that will bring up pi, and then times by, so multiplied by 6, and then squared, pressing the squared button, and then I'm going to press equals, my answer would be 113.0973355. So the area for the circle would be 113.0973355. Well, I'm going to run this to one decimal place, so 113.1 centimeters, and it's squared because it's area. That's it. Now, if we were given the circle like this, where we knew the diameter being 20 centimeters, well, it was pi r squared, so it's pi times the radius squared. So if you know the diameter, you might need to half it. So in this case, the radius would be 10. So I would do pi times 10 squared. Okay, so let's have a look at finding the area of a semicircle. So that's video number 47 on corporate maths. So here we've got a semicircle, and using a similar approach to finding the perimeter of a semicircle, we're going to consider the whole circle. So here's a whole circle. Um, Yep, yeah, there we go. So there's a filled circle, and you can see the radius of the whole circle is 3 centimeters. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the area of the whole circle and then divide it by 2. So we're going to do pi times 3 squared, because that will give us the area of the whole circle. And when we do that, we get 28.27433, so on. And then what we're going to do is we're going to divide the area of the whole circle by 2. So we'll take our 28.27433, so on, and we'll divide that by 2, and we find that that's equal to 14.137166, so on, or 14.1 to one decimal place. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So the next topic is the area of a sector, which is video 48 in Corbett Maths. And just remember, you do have those practice questions in the link below. So if you do want to practice any of these questions as we're going through, there's questions there for you to try. Okay, so for the area of a sector, here's part of the Corbett Maths revision card. So we've got the area of the sector is Vita over 360, so the fraction of the circle, times by pi, times by the radius squared. So here we've got a sector, and again, it's got an angle, which isn't necessarily a nice angle. Uh, we've got an angle of 109 degrees, so we're going to have 109 over 360 times by pi, multiplied by the radius of the circle. So if we had a whole circle here, the radius would be 0 0.7 centimeters, so 0 0.7 squared. And when we do that, we get that's equal to 0 0.46609 and so on centimeters squared. I'm going to round this to three decimal places, so I'm going to write 0 0.466 centimetres squared to three decimal places. And that's it. Okay, so our next topic is Pythagoras, and here's part of the Corbin Maths revision card on Pythagoras' theorem, which is a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where a and b are the two shorter sides, and c is the length of the longer side, with the hypotenuse of the right angle triangle. So here's a right angle triangle, and we've been asked to find x, the length of the hypotenuse, the longer side. So I label the sides first of all, so I label the shorter side a, the next shortest B and the longest side C. Now in terms of A and B, it doesn't actually matter which way around you label those as long as A and B are the two shorter sides. And we're going to substitute those values into Pythagoras' theorem. So Pythagoras' theorem is A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So if we substitute these values in, well, instead of A squared, we're going to write 5 squared. Instead of B squared, we're going to write 12 squared. And instead of C squared, we're going to write X squared. So we know that 5 squared plus 12 squared equals X squared. So now we're going to work out 5 squared and 12 squared. So 5 times 5 is 25. And remember, this is a calculator paper, so you can just write 5 squared plus 12 squared and press equals on your calculator, plus. And 12 squared is 144, and that equals x squared. Now, 25 plus 144 is 169. So that gives us 169 equals x squared. So we've got 169 equals x squared. Now, obviously, x is the length of the side here, so we can square root both sides. So that gives us the square root of 169 equals x, and the square root of 169 is 13. So 13 equals x. That means that x equals 13 centimeters, and that's it. 
So that means that x equals 13 centimeters. Okay, let's have a look at a right angle triangle where we're trying to find the length of one of the shorter sides. So here's a right angle triangle. And again, Pythagoras' theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So let's label our sides. Now we don't actually know which one's the shortest here. So I'm just gonna label this side, the x a. I'm gonna label the five centimeters b. And obviously the longest side will be the hypotenuse, the side opposite the right angle, so that will be c. So we write down Pythagoras' theorem, that's a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And so a squared, well, that's going to be x squared plus, and instead of b squared, that will be 5 squared, and that equals c squared, which is 8 squared. So x squared, that's x squared plus, and working out 5 squared, well, 5 times 5 is 25, so that's 25, equals 8 squared, which is 64. Now here we've got x squared plus 25 equals 64. So we want to get the x squared on its own, so let's take away 25 from both sides. So that gives us x squared equals, and 64 take away 25 equals 39. So we've got x squared, and to find x we're going to square root 39. So we'll work out the square root of 39, and that equals 6.2449979. Eight and so on centimeters. So let's round this to two decimal places. So that means that x equals 6.24 centimeters. And that's it. So Pythagoras' theorem is really useful for right angle triangles to find the length of missing sides if you know two of them. And Pythagoras' theorem is also useful in situations where you've got shapes that are made up of right angle triangles. So for instance, if there was a rectangle and it's cut across diagonally, you may need to use Pythagoras' theorem to work out the lengths of the sides there and so on. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So with Pythagoras, we were dealing with right angle triangles and we're using the length of two sides to find the length of the third side. With trigonometry, we're going to be dealing with right angle triangles again, but this time we're going to be involving angles. We're either going to be using two sides to work out the size of one of the angles. Alternatively, we'll be using an angle and one of the sides to work out the length of another side. And it's very important whenever you're dealing with trigonometry to know the trigonometric ratios or the trig ratios, and they are sine is equal to opposite divided by hypotenuse, the cos is equal to the adjacent divided by hypotenuse, and that the tan is equal to the opposite divided by adjacent. And some students remember saying such as so ka Toa, or I like to remember, two old angels skipped over heaven carrying a harp. So it's very important you remember these trig ratios whenever you're answering a trigonometry question. So let's have a look at one now. So here we've been given a right angle triangle, and we've been asked to find the sides of this angle x. And it's a right angle triangle, and we know that because it's been marked on, and we've been given the length of the hypotenuse is 10 centimeters, and we've been given the length of this side is 8 centimeters, and we've been asked to find the sides of this angle. So the first thing I do on a trigonometry question is to write down the trig ratios, and they are two old angels, skipped over heaven carrying a harp. So two old angels skipped over heaven carrying a harp or so ka toa. And they are that tan is equal to the opposite divided by adjacent, sine is equal to the opposite divided by hypotenuse, and that the cos is equal to the adjacent divided by hypotenuse. Now let's have a look at our triangle and figure out which trig ratio we're gonna use in this question. And I do that by labeling the sides as the opposite hypotenuse and adjacent. So let's start off with the opposite. So the opposite is the side opposite the angle we're using or trying to find in the question. So we're trying to find this angle, so the side opposite that is this one. So this is the opposite. Then let's label the hypotenuse. So that is the longer side of a right angle triangle and it's the side opposite the right angle. So this is the hypotenuse. And that means the side that we've got left is the adjacent. And it's adjacent to the angle we're trying to find, but it's not the hypotenuse, so that's the adjacent. So that is our opposite hypotenuse and adjacent. So we've labeled the three sides of the right angle triangle. So now we've labeled the triangle as the opposite hypotenuse and adjacent. Now we need to figure out which trigger ratio we're gonna use in the question. So here we've been given the hypotenuse is 10 centimeters. We've been given the adjacent is eight centimeters. So we're gonna use those two. And the opposite, we're not been given and we're not trying to find out, so we're just gonna cross it off. We're not gonna be using any trigger ratio that's involving the opposite. So we're not gonna be using the tan and we're not gonna be using the sine. We're gonna be using the cos in this question. The cos x is equal to the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse. That's the trig ratio we're gonna use in this question. So let's substitute in the values for the adjacent and the hypotenuse into our trig ratio. So we've got the cos x is equal to the adjacent, which is eight, so eight, divided by the hypotenuse, which is 10. So we've got the cos of the angle, x, is equal to eight temps. So we know that the cos of the angle is equal to eight over 10, or 0 0.8. 
but this angle obviously isn't 0.8 degrees. This angle is much bigger. So what we want to do is we want to find out what x is. So we want to get rid of this cos. So we're going to do the inverse cos, so the opposite of cos, to both sides of the equation. So whenever we do the inverse cos to both sides, on the left-hand side, we'll just be given x, the angle we're trying to find. And then we want to do the inverse cos of 8 temps. Now on your calculator, just above the cos in yellow, you've got a cos with a little minus 1. That's the inverse cos. So we would then press shift and then the cos button, and it will come up as cos with the little minus 1. And then you just type in 8 over 10 or 0.8 and then close brackets and press equals and that will give you the size of the angle and we find that x is equal to 36.86989 and so on degrees and let's just run that to two decimal places so that'll be that x is equal to 36.87 degrees and that's it. So in this question, we're asked to find the size of this angle x. So my steps were, first of all, I wrote down the trig ratios. Then what I done was I looked at my right angle triangle and I labeled the side. So I labeled the side opposite the angle as the opposite, the hypotenuse as the hypotenuse h, and the adjacent as a. Then we knew we weren't dealing with the opposite in this question, so we crossed off any of the trig ratios involving the opposite. So we knew it was a cos question. We knew that the cos of x, the cos of this angle, is equal to the adjacent divided by the hypotenuse. So we found that cos x was equal to 8 temps. This this angle obviously isn't 8 temps, so we need to do the inverse cos of that. So we press shift cos and then type in 8 temps and press equals, and we get the size of this angle, which is 36.87 degrees. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So this time we're going to find the lengths of one of the sides. So we've got this right angle triangle, and we know that the hypotenuse of this right angle triangle is 4 kilometers, and the size of this angle is 60 degrees. And we've been asked to find the size of x. So again, let's write down our trig ratio. So we've got two old angels skipped over heaven carrying a harp. So here we've got a right angle triangle, let's label the sides. So we have got the opposite, so in the question we've been given the 60 degrees, so the side opposite it is x, so that's our opposite. Then we've got our hypotenuse, which is the side opposite the right angle, so our four kilometers is the hypotenuse, and the side left is the adjacent, so this side is our adjacent. Next, we cross off any side that has not been given or looked for in the question. So in this question, we're looking to find the opposite. We've been given the hypotenuse, and we don't need the adjacent, or we're given the adjacent, so we can cross it off. So we then look at our trig ratios, and we cross off any trig ratio that involves the adjacent. So we're not using tan, and we're not using the cos. So in this question, it's a sine question, that sine x is equal to the opposite over hypotenuse. So let's substitute in our values. So we've got the sine of our angle, so that's going to be sine 60, so sine 60, is equal to the opposite, which is equal to x in this question, divided by the hypotenuse, which is 4. So we've got sine 60 is equal to x divided by 4. So we want to find out what x is. So we don't want this to divide by 4 in this right-hand side of this equation. So let's multiply both sides of the equation by 4. So we've got sine 60 times 4, so that's going to be sine 60 times 4, and that's going to be equal to, and on our right-hand side of the equation, we had x divided by 4. We times by 4 to get rid of the divide by 4, so we're just going to be left with x. So we've got that x is equal to sine 60 times 4. So let's work that out. So on our calculator, press sine 60. Now make sure you close brackets, so close brackets. Multiplied by 4 is equal to 3.4641 and so on kilometers, and that's equal to x. So x is equal to 3.464 kilometers to three decimal places. And that's it. So x is equal to 3.464 kilometers to three decimal places. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is exact trig values. And it can be useful at GCSE Foundation to remember some of your exact trig values. So in other words, if you were to work out the sine of zero degrees, that's equal to zero. The sine of 30 degrees, that's equal to a half. That's one I remember off by heart. The sine of 30 degrees is equal to a half. The sine of 45 degrees, that's equal to root 2, the square root of 2 divided by 2. The sine of 60 degrees is equal to the square root of 3 divided by 2. And the sine of 90 degrees is equal to 1. So it can be useful to remember those. The cos of 0 degrees is equal to 1. The cos of 30 degrees is equal to the square root of 3 divided by 2. So the cos of 30 degrees is equal to the sine of 60 degrees. They're the same as each other. The cos of 45 degrees is equal to the square root of 2 divided by 2. The same as the sine of 45 degrees. And the cos of 60 degrees is equal to a half. And I always remember that one as well. I always remember the sine of 30 degrees is equal to a half. And the cos of 60 degrees is equal to a half. And the cos of 90 degrees is equal to 0. And finally, tan. The tan of 0 is equal to 0. The tan of 30 degrees is equal to the square root of 3 divided by 3. The tan of 45 degrees is equal to 1. And the tan of 60 degrees is equal to the square root of 3. And the tan of 90 degrees is undefined. There's no answer for that. Okay, so we want to write down the values of these. So the sine of 30 degrees would be equal to a half. The tan of 45 degrees would be equal to 1. And the cos of 30 degrees, well, the cos of 30 degrees is equal to the square root of 3 divided by 2. 
and that's it. Okay, our next topic is congruent, and you need to know what the word congruent means. Congruent. And congruent means exactly the same shape and size. So on this grid, we've got some shapes that are congruent to each other. So shape A is congruent to I. So A and I are congruent to each other. We've got some more shapes that are congruent. We've got B and D. B and D are congruent, so B and D. F and H would be congruent because they're right angle triangles and they've both got a height of two and they've both got a base of two. So H, so F and H are congruent as well. So congruent means exactly the same shape and size. So it means all the sides are the same length, but also all the angles are the same size as well. So we've looked at congruent shapes. Now let's have a look at similar shapes. So similar shapes are where one shape is an enlargement of another. So if you have got one shape and another shape that's similar to it, then it's an enlargement of it. So whenever you've got shapes that are similar, such as this rectangle, rectangle A and this rectangle B, we know that to find the lengths we multiply by a certain scale factor. Now notice that the sides will become so many times bigger or smaller, but the angles will all stay the same because obviously the shape is staying the same shape. So here we've got the Quartermaster Revision card, part of it, and we've got here are two similar rectangles. So we've got this rectangle, rectangle A, which is six centimeters long and four centimeters wide. And we've got this rectangle B, which is similar to it, so it's an enlargement, and it's got a width of 12 centimeters and a length of well, we need to find that. We've been asked to find the length of rectangle B. So let's look at the sides. So let's look at the widths of these rectangles. We've gone from four centimeters to 12 centimeters. So to find the scale factor of enlargement, if we divide 12 by four, we will find the scale factor of enlargement. So if we do 12 divided by four, 12 divided by four is equal to three. So that means that this width is three times larger than this width, so multiply by three. So if we multiply the width of rectangle A by three, that means we're gonna multiply the length of rectangle A by three as well, and that will give us the length of rectangle B. So if we do six multiplied by three, that's gonna be equal to 18 centimeters. So the length of rectangle B would be 18 centimeters. So similar shapes are where one shape is enlargement of another. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is congruent triangles, and that's video number 67 on corporate maths. So congruent in maths, we've looked at that previously, at congruent shapes. So congruent means identical. It means the same shape and the same size. So it means that if you've got two shapes that are congruent, it'll mean that the angles are the same and the sides are the same length as well. Now, whenever we're dealing with triangles, in a triangle, we've got three angles and there's three sides. Now, if you've got two triangles, if you want to see if they're congruent to each other, you don't actually need to know all six angles in both triangles and the lengths of all six sides. What you can actually do is know if they're congruent by just knowing some of that information. And these are the conditions to know if triangles are congruent or not. So the first condition is what we call side, 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 or SSS. And what that means is that the sides are the same size. So here we've got five centimeters and five centimeters. Then we've got seven centimeters and seven centimeters and nine centimeters and nine centimeters. So if you've got two triangles that both have the same lengths of the sides, so side, side, and side, those two triangles will have to be congruent to each other. So they will be the same shape and size. Okay, let's look at the next condition. So the next condition is what we call angle side angle or ASA. And what that means is if you've got two angles and you know the side in between them, for two triangles, those two triangles will be congruent to each other. So for instance, here we've got 70 degrees, 30 degrees, and in between those is four centimeters. So if you draw that triangle, and then if you've got another triangle where you've got 30 degrees and 70 degrees, so the same two angles and four centimeters in between them, those two triangles will have to be congruent to each other because there's only one possible triangle that will have 70 degrees, 30 degrees, and four centimeters in between them. So it's called angle side angle or angle side angle. Okay, let's look at the next condition. The next condition is SAS, or side angle side. So that means if you've got two sides and you know the angle in between them, and they're the same for two triangles, those triangles will be congruent. So as you can see here, we've got 12 centimeters and 14 centimeters and 30 degrees in between them. And then this, this triangle here, we've got 12 centimeters and 14 centimeters and 30 degrees in between them. So these two triangles will have to be congruent to each other because there's only one possible triangle you can draw, which has 12 centimeters and 14 centimeters and 30 degrees in between them. So those two triangles will be congruent. Okay, and another condition is what we call RHS, which stands for right angle hypotenuse side. So if you've got two right angle triangles and you know the hypotenuse and one of the shorter sides, those two triangles will have to be congruent to each other. Because if you use Pythagoras' theorem, you can find the length for the third side and then it would be side, side, side. So these two triangles will have to be congruent to each other. So this is the Corp Master Revision card and it's very useful to remember the conditions for congruent triangles, whether it's side, 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 angle, side, angle, side, angle, side, or RHS. And that's it. 
Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, our next topic is to find the volume of a cuboid. So here's a cuboid, and we may need to find the volume of it. And the volume of a cuboid, this is from the Corpus Revision card, the volume is equal to length times width times height. So if we look at this cuboid, the length and the width and the height are given to us, um, which is seven, two, and three. And because we're just multiplying them together, you don't need to be really strict and saying, well, this one's definitely the length and this one's the width and this one's the height, because if we're just multiplying the three numbers, it will give us the volume anyway. So the volume is equal to the length, which I'm just gonna call seven, multiply by the width, I'm going to call 2 and multiply by the height, that's 3. And 7 times 2 times 3 would be equal to 42. So our volume is 42 centimetres. Now it's volume, so we measure that in centimetres cubed. So the volume of this cuboid would be 42 centimetres cubed. Okay, so let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is the volume of a prism. So to find the volume of a prism, we find the cross-sectional area. So whenever you've got a prism, it's got that constant cross-section. So it's got that shape that's the same the whole way through it. So for instance, this triangular prism has a triangle as the cross-section, and it just sits the same the whole way through it. So you get the area of that shape, and you multiply it by how long it is. So to find the volume of this triangular prism, we're going to find the area of the triangle at the front, and then just multiply it by 4. So to do that, let's work out the area of the triangle. So the area of a triangle is half the base times the height. So the area of this triangle would be half the base, so half times 7 multiplied by the height, 5. So whenever we do that, we get 7 times 5 is 35, and multiply by half or dividing it by 2 would give us 17.5 meters squared. So the area of this triangle at the front is 17.5 meters squared. Now we just need to multiply by how long the shape is, and the shape is 4 meters long. So if we do 17.5 multiplied by 4, that gives us the volume of this triangular prism. So multiplied by 4 equals 70 meters, and the units would be cubed because it's the volume. So 70 meters cubed. So to find the volume of a prism, you get the area of the cross section and then multiply by how long it is, or alternatively, it's standing upright, you multiply by how tall it is. Our next topic is the volume of a cylinder. And as you can see, this cylinder is standing upright, so we're going to find the area of the circle and then multiply by how tall it is. So the area of a circle, area equals pi r squared. So that's equal to pi times the radius. So this is the radius, 8, so pi times 8 squared. And when we do pi times 8 squared, we get that's equal to 201.061928 and so on centimeters squared. So that's the area of the top. Now we're going to multiply that by how tall it is. Don't round this answer because we're multiplying it by 30. So if you round it, that multiplying by 30 can you know mean that you're somewhere from the actual answer. So we're going to take our 201. 0.0619 and so on. If you've got a new calculator display, just leave it there and press multiply by 30. And whenever you do that, you get times by 30, 6,031.857 and so on. And to one decimal place, that would be 6,031.9. And our units would be centimeters cubed. And that's it. Okay, so the next topic is looking at giving our answers in terms of pi. Now, we've previously looked at topics such as circumference and area of a circle, volume of a cylinder, and so on. And in all of those questions so far, we've been giving our answers as decimals. Now, I've actually hinted in previous videos that we could actually give our answer in terms of pi. And that's working exactly. So rather than giving a decimal, we're giving an exact answer in terms of pi. So let's have a look at a typical question. So we've got a cylinder has got a diameter of 8 centimetres. So we've got a cylinder. So if by magic, we've got a cylinder and it's got a diameter of 8 centimetres. So that means that the width of it is 8 8 centimeters. So the whole way across the circle at the top or the bottom is 8 centimeters. And the height of the cylinder is 15 centimeters. So the height is 15 centimeters. So we've now got our sketch. Now what we need to do is work out the volume of the cylinder in terms of pi. And what that means is rather than giving our answer as a decimal number, we're going to give it as perhaps something like 100 pi or 75 pi. And that means we've got an exact answer. So rather than actually having to work it out and then rounding it, we can actually just give it in terms of pi. So the volume of a cylinder, so we would find the area of the cross section, so in this case a circle, and then multiply by how tall the shape is. So let's get the area of the circle. So the circle has got a diameter of 8, so the radius of the circle is 4 centimetres, and the area of a circle is pi r squared, so pi times 4 squared. Now 4 squared is 16, so that means that we would have pi times 16, and then if we just put them together, like in algebra, where we'd maybe write 16y or 16x, we're just going to write that's equal to 16 pi. We're just going to put the number in front of pi. So that means the area of the circle is 16 pi centimeters squared. So that's the area of the circle. 
And rather than rounding that as a decimal number and then multiplying it by 15 and so on, what we're just going to do is use that 16 pi. So to find the volume of a cylinder, we've found the area of the circle. Now we need to times it by how tall or how long the shape is. So the height of the cylinder is 15 centimeters. So to get the volume, we're going to do 16 pi, the area of the circle, times by how tall the shape is, which is 15. So what we're going to do is we're going to do 16 times 15 and then get our answer and just put pi after it. So 16 times 15 is equal to 240 and then pi. So answer would be 240 pi centimeters cubed. And that's it. So we've left our answer in terms of pi. And our answer would be 240 pi centimeters cubed. So we're not actually having to work out what 240 times pi is and then write that as a decimal number. We can actually just give it in terms of pi. And this is particularly useful on non-calculator papers. Our next topic now is to find the volume of a cone. The volume of a cone is one third pi r squared h. That means we're going to find a third of pi times the radius squared multiplied by the height of the cone. So in this cone, we've got a radius of 20 and we've got a height of 21. So we're going to do one third multiplied by pi, multiplied by the radius, which is 20 squared, and then multiplied by 21, the height of the cone. And when we do that, we get an answer of 2,800 pi, which would be 8,796.46 centimeters cubed to two decimal places. And that's video 359 in Corbin Math. So the volume of a cone is one third pi r squared h. Here's a pyramid, and if you've been given a pyramid and you've asked to find the volume of it, again, the volume is equal to third the area of the base times the height. So it's going to be the volume is equal to third times the area of the base. Well, that's going to be nine times six. So nine times six is equal to 54. So if times 54 times its perpendicular height. So that's going to be from the base straight up to the top, which is seven centimeters. And whenever we work that out, we get that's equal to 126 centimeters cubed. Our next topic is the volume of a sphere. So the volume of a sphere is four thirds pi r cubed. And this is part of the Code Maz revision card here. And on Code Maz's video 361. And here we've got a sphere and it's got a radius of 14 centimeters. So to find its volume, we will do four thirds multiplied by pi multiplied by the radius, which is 14 cubed. So I'm gonna press the fraction button on my calculator, type in four thirds, I'm then going to press multiply by and then pi times by 14 and then the cubed button 11,494.04 centimeters cubed to two decimal places and that's it. This time we've been asked to find the surface area and here's a cuboid and we've been asked to find the surface area of a cuboid and the surface area is the area of all the faces of that particular shape. So this is a cuboid so it'll have six faces. You've got the top which is green. You've then got the bottom which would be the same size, it would have the same area. You've then got the rectangle on the right hand side here in blue and that would be the same as the rectangle on the left hand side. And you've got the rectangle at the front, the face at the front, this red one, and that would be the same as the back. So what we've got is we've got six rectangles we need to find the area of and we need to add them all up. Now the great thing is that you've got pairs of them that are the same, the top and the bottom, the right and the left and the front and the back are the same. So if we work out the area of each of these ones, so what we can do is then we consider two of them and then add them all up. Let's call the front one, the right hand side two, and the top three. Let's consider the front to begin with. So for face one, we've got the width of the rectangle is eight, multiplied by the height of the rectangle, which would be five, because here we've got a height of five, so that means that the height here of this rectangle is five. So we've got eight times five, and eight times five is equal to 40 centimeters squared. So the area of the front is 40. That means the area of the back would also be 40 as well, so I'm just gonna write it there as well. And then two, we've got the right hand side here. If we look at this rectangle, it's got a length of seven and a height of five. So we're going to do seven multiplied by five and seven times five is 35. So that's 35 centimeters squared. So that means the area of this rectangle on the right hand side is 35. And that would be the same as the rectangle on the left hand side. So there's another 35 centimeters squared. And then the top, which is face three, we've got three that has a width of eight and a length of seven because you've got eight here. So that's going to be eight there and the seven here will be there. So we've got eight times seven and eight times seven is 56 centimeters squared and the top would be the same as the bottom so we've got another 56 centimeters squared so to find the total surface area of this cuboid we're going to do 40 plus 40 plus 35 plus 35 plus 56 plus 56 and that will tell us the total surface area of this cuboid and when we do that, we get a total surface area of 262 centimeters squared. So the surface area is the area of all the faces of that 3D shape. 
Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is the surface area of a cylinder, and that's video 315 on Cobra Maths. Now here we've got a cylinder, and we've been asked to find the surface area of the cylinder. Now this cylinder has three faces. It's got a circle on the top, a circle on the bottom, and it's got this curved face going around the outside. Now the area of the circles will be straightforward. We'll do pi r squared for the top, and then we'll do pi r squared for the bottom, and they'll also be the same area, so you could just do pi r squared for the top and multiply it by two or add it to itself. Now for this curved face going around the outside, if we were to straighten that out, that would be a rectangle. And the height of the rectangle would be six meters, and the length of the rectangle, that would be the circumference of the circle. So we're gonna get the circumference of the circle and multiply it by six, the height of the cylinder, and that would give us the area of the curved face. And then we'll add together the two circles circles and the curved face. So let's do that now. So let's start off by getting the area of the circle. So that would be pi times 5 squared. And that will give us the area of the circle, which is 78.53981 and so on. Then we've got the circle at the bottom and that'll have the same area. So we'll have a circle beneath and that'll have the same area. And then finally, we need to find the area of this curved face going around the outside of the cylinder. And to find that, we're going to find the circumference of the circle. So we'll do pi times diameter. So we'll do pi times 10 because the diameter of the circle will be 10. So pi times 10 will be 31.4159 and so on. And then we'll take the circumference of the circle and multiply it by the height of the cylinder. And that will tell us the area of the curved face. So we're going to do 31.4159 and so on. And I've got that in my calculator display. So I'll just press times six. And that will give me 188. 0.4955 and so on. So I'm gonna to add together now the area of the circle on the top, the 78.53981 and so on. I'll add another circle, so 78.53981 and so on. And I'll also add the area of this face, the curved face, which was 188.4955 and so on. And when I do that, I get that's equal to 345 point five seven five to three decimal places and then the units because it's surface area and it's meters will be meters squared and that's it okay let's have a look at our next topic so the next topic is a surface area of a cone so here we've got a cone and to find the surface area of a cone we have to get the area of the two faces and that's the area of the circle at the bottom which will be pi r squared so that's straightforward and then we need to find the curved surface area, so the area of the top of the cone. And that's given by the formula, curved surface area is pi rl, where pi is obviously pi. r is the radius of the base of the cone, so that will be 6. And then l is what we call the slant height, so this diagonal length here of 11 centimeters. So let's find the surface area of this cone. So for this cone, we would do pi r squared, so pi times 6 squared for the base. And when we do pi times 6 squared, we get... That's equal to 113.097355 and so on. And then, so that's the area of the base. Now we need to find the curved surface area. So it's going to be pi times the radius, 6, times the slant height, which is 11. And when we do that, we get that's equal to 66 pi or 207.3451151 and so on. And when we add those together, we'll find the surface area of this cone which would be 320.44 centimeters squared to two decimal places, and that's it. Okay, our next topic. Our next topic is the surface area of a sphere, so the surface area is four pi r squared. So here we've got a sphere, and we're gonna find its surface area. So we're gonna do four multiplied by pi, multiplied by the radius, which is five squared. So we're now just gonna work this out in our calculator. So we're gonna do four multiplied by pi multiplied by five squared. And that gives us 100 pi, which is equal to 314.16 centimeters squared to two decimal places. And that's it. So our next topic is convert metric units for area and volume. So earlier on in the video, we've converted metric units for length. Now let's look at what happens whenever we convert the metric units for area and volume. So let's start off with converting metric units for area. So here we've got a rectangle and it measures three meters by two meters. So it's three meters long and two meters wide. And here's the exact same rectangle. And instead of writing three meters, I've written 300 centimeters because it's 100 centimeters in a meter. So three meters would be 300 centimeters. And instead of writing two meters, I've written 200 centimeters because obviously two times 100 would be 200 centimeters.
Now let's find the areas of these rectangles. Because they're identical, the areas will be the same. So to find the area for this rectangle, we multiply the length and the width together. So we're going to do 3 times 2. And 3 times 2 is equal to 6 meters squared. So the area for this rectangle is 6 meters squared. Now if we look at this rectangle, this rectangle is 300 centimeters long and 200 centimeters wide. So to find this area, we're going to multiply these together. So 300 times 200, well 3 times 2 is 6. And then add 1, 2, 3, 4 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4 zeros and then that's measured in centimetres squared. So we've got the same rectangle and its area will be 6 metres squared or 60,000 centimetres squared. So that means that 6 metres squared is equal to 60,000 centimetres squared. Or if we divide both of these by 6, we get 1 metre squared is equal to 10,000 centimetres squared. So in one square metre, there'd be 10,000 square centimetres. And that makes sense because if you had a square which was one metre by one metre, that would be 100 centimetres by 100 centimetres, so that'd be 100 rows of 100, which would be 10,000 little smaller centimetre squares in there. And that's it. So if we want to convert between metre squared and centimetre squared, we can multiply by 10,000. Or I like to multiply by 100. I multiply by 100 again because it's squared, so I know to multiply by 100 twice. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next one, converting metric units for volume. So here we've got two cubes. One of them's got a side length of two meters and one's got a side length of 200 centimeters. So these cubes are identical. So if we know the side length is two meters, we can write two meters for the length, two meters for the width, and two meters for the height. So to get the volume of this cube, we're going to do the length times the width times the height. So we're going to do two times two times two, which is equal to eight meters cubed. So the volume of this cube is eight meters cubed. So this cube's identical, so it will have a length of 200 centimetres, a width of 200 centimetres, and a height of 200 centimetres. So if we do 200 multiplied by 200, multiplied by 200, that will give us the volume of this cube. And the volume of this cube is equal to 2 times 2 times 2 is equal to 8, and then we're going to add on 6 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 8 million centimetres cubed. So 8 metres cubed would be equal to 8 million centimetres cubed. And if we divide both of these by 8, we get 1 metre cubed is equal to 1 million centimetres cubed. And that's it. So that's going to be really useful for convert between metres cubed and centimetres cubed. So you can multiply by a million to convert between metres cubed and centimetres cubed. And likewise, to convert back from centimetres cubed to metres cubed, you can divide by a million. I like to multiply by 100 and by 100 and by 100 again, and divide by 100, 100 and 100 again if I want to convert between them. And that will give me the same answer. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is vectors. Now, a vector is something that's got a direction and it has got a size, or another name for size is a magnitude. So it's got a direction, so it's got a certain way, and it has got a magnitude or a size, so it's got a certain length. So these lines are all vectors. They've all got a, they're all going in a certain direction, shown by their arrows, and they've all got a certain magnitude or size. So that's its length. And we've already looked at vectors whenever we're dealing with translations because we moved the shapes. We slid the shapes and we used the column vector and it showed us how many squares to the left or the right and how many squares up or down. And what we're going to do is we're going to represent these vectors as column vectors and we're going to use the same approach where the number on the top will be how many squares left or right and the number on the bottom will be how many squares up or down and if the top number is positive it's to the right and if it's negative it's to the left and the number beneath if it's positive it's up and if it's negative it's down so let's start off with looking at this vector here so this vector here we can see the starting point and the arrow shows us which way we're going and we're starting here and we're going one square to the right so let's write that as a one and then we're going two squares up one two so that would be represented, so this vector would be represented by the column vector 1, 2. 1 to the right and 2 up. Okay, now let's have a look at this column vector. So this column vector starts here and it goes in this direction. And if we count the squares to the right, it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 to the right, and then 1, 2 down. So because it's 5 to the right, we're going to write 5. And then because it's 2 down, we're going to write negative 2. So this vector would be represented by the column vector 5, negative 2. Okay, our next vector is this one, and we start here, and as you can see from the arrow, we're going in this direction here. And we're going three squares to the left, one, two, three, and one square up. So because it's three squares to the left, we're going to write negative three, because if we go to the left, it's negative, and then it's one square up, so we then write one. So this vector would be negative three, one. Okay, next column vector is this one. We're starting here and we're going up two squares, one, two. So to the left or right, well, it doesn't go to the left or right, so we're going to write zero. And then it goes two up, one, two, so then it would be two. So this is the vector, zero, two. 
And finally, our last vector, this one, we're starting here and we're going down to this point here. So we're going 1, 2 to the left, so it's going to be negative 2, and then 1, 2, 3 down, so that's negative 3. So this would be the vector negative 2, negative 3, which means 2 to the left and 3 down. Okay, so that's how you represent vectors as column vectors. Now let's have a look and see what happens whenever we add and subtract and multiply these column vectors. So here are some column vectors. We've got A, the vector A is 3, negative 1, so the vector A is 3 to the the right and one down and the vector b is four six which means four to the right and six up now these letters a and b they're the vectors and they're in bold which means that they've been typed in a thicker ink obviously now whenever we're writing we can't write a in bold we can't just sort of write it over and over and over what we could do is to show that a is bold show to show that something is a vector we write it and then put a line underneath it so instead of writing a bold a which is very difficult we can just write a with a line underneath it so our first question says, find the vector 2a. So we've got the vector a, which is 3 to the right and 1 down. So the vector 2a would be double that. So instead of being 3 to the right, it'll be, so that's right, 2a is equal to. And instead of being 3 to the right, it's going to be 6 to the right. And instead of being 1 down, we're going to double it, so it's going to be 2 down. So the vector 2a will be double the vector a, so it would be 6, negative 2. If we were asked to find the vector 3a, we would multiply both these numbers by 3. If we were asked to find the vector 10a, we would multiply both these numbers by 10. If we were asked to find the vector negative 4a, we would multiply both these numbers by negative 4, and so on. Okay, let's have a look at our next one. So this time we've been asked to find the vector a plus b. So here's the vector a, which is 3 to the right and 1 down, and here's the vector b, which is 4 to the right and 6 down. So to find the vector a, b, we would just add these vectors together. So the vector a plus b would be equal to, and if we add them together, 3 plus 4 is equal to 7, and then negative 1 plus 6, well negative 1 plus 6 is equal to 5. So the vector a plus b would be 7, 5. And that makes sense because if we start off at a certain point and we go 3 to the right and 1 down, so 3 to the right and 1 down, and then we go 4 to the right and 6 up, all together we have gone 7 to the right and 5 up. And that's, and that's what the vector a plus b is. Okay, and finally, we've been asked to find the vector b subtract 2a. So we've got the vector b, which is 4, 6, and the vector 2a is 6, negative 2. So we've got the vector b, and we've got the vector 2a. So now we just need to do b subtract 2a. So that's going to be equal to, b subtract 2a would be equal to, well, 4 subtract 6 would be negative 2. And then 6 subtract negative 2. Well, 6 subtract negative 2 would be 6 plus 2, which would be 8. So the vector b subtract 2a, if you get b and 2a and you subtract 2a from b, would give you negative 2, 8. And that's it. Okay, so that's column vectors. Now that's video 353a in corporate maths. Right, so we've looked at column vectors. Now let's look at vectors on diagrams. So here we've got a diagram, and as you can see, it is a large parallelogram. And there are nine smaller congruent parallelograms. And we're told that the vector going from O to A is equal to little a. So from O to A is equal to little a. So, so let's show that. So here we've got O and A. So to go from O to A, that's that way. That's equal to little a. And going from O to D, so going from O to D is little b. So from O to D, that way is equal to little b. And we've been asked to find the vector OG. So going from O to G. Now on this diagram, we've got nine smaller congruent parallelograms. So that means from A to B would be little a as well, because each one of these horizontal lines is little a, so going from B to C would be little a as well. And then each one of these diagonal lines going upwards from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, and from here to here, each one of them is little b. Each one of these diagonal lines would be little b. So we want to find the vector from O to G. So to get from O to G, we're going to do an A, and another a and another a that would be three a and then to go from c to g well that would be a little b so to go from o to g it would be three a plus b so three a plus b and that's it okay so we're now going to look at our algebra topics so that's the blue topics on your revision checklist and we're going to start off by looking at some algebraic notation so that's video 19 in corporate maths so let's have a look and make sure we know what each of these algebraic expressions mean so we've got x plus three that means a number plus three if we've got x take away 4, that means a number take away 4, or 4 less than a number. If we've got 10 subtract x, that means that it's 10 take away whatever x is, or x less than 10. We've got 4x, now that means 4 times x, because in algebra we don't write the multiplication sign, so 4x means 4 times x, so if we knew what x is, you just multiply by 4. Next, we've got this x and then the line 2. So remember in a fraction, the line means divided by, so we've got x divided by 2. And we sometimes call this x over 2 or x divided by 2. So this is x over 2, which means x divided by 2. And finally, we've got x squared, and that just means x squared. So if we knew what x is, we'd multiply it by itself, because 
to square something means to multiply it by itself. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is writing expressions or forming expressions, and that's video 16 on corporate maths. So we've been told that Jake is X years old. So he's X years old. We don't know how old he is. He could be 10, he could be 50, he could be 100, he could be 67, we don't know. Anna's nine years older than Jake. So whatever age he is, she's nine years older. And Beth is twice as old as Jake, so she's twice his age. And the first question says, write an expression for Anna's age. So if we knew how old Jake was, we would add nine onto it to find Anna's age. But we don't know it, so we're just going to write down he's x, and we would add on 9, so an expression for her age is x plus 9. The next question says write an expression for Beth's age. Now, she's twice as old as Jake, so whatever age he is, you'd multiply it by 2. So we want to times his age, x, by 2. Now, remember in algebra, we don't write the multiplication sign, so we just write 2x, and that means 2 times x, 2 times his age. Okay, our next topic. Okay, our next topic is on collecting like terms. And so that means we're going to simplify expressions such as this one, such as 7x plus y, take away x plus 5y. And that's video 9 in corporate maths. So if you do want to recap this, watch video 9 in corporate maths. Okay, so we've got 7x plus y, take away x plus 5y. So when we're collecting like terms, we collect the like terms. So let's start off with our x's. We've got 7x's. So here we've got 7x's. And we've got subtract an x. So if you get 7x's and you take away an x or 1x, you'll be left with 6x's. So let's write that down, 6x. Now let's deal with our y's. We've got plus y, so that's positive y or 1y. And we're going to add another 5y's. So if we added 1y and another 5y's all together, that's adding 6y's. So that would be 6x plus 6y. And that's it. So we've simplified an expression by collecting the like terms. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is multiplying terms, which is video 18. And here we've been given nine times y. Now remember in algebra, we don't write the multiplication sign. So if we were doing nine times y, we would just write nine y. Here we've got four x multiplied by five. So that's four lots of x, but we've got five lots of it. So we've got a four x, a four x, a four x, a four x, and a four x. If you added all those four x's up, you would have five lots of four, that'd be 20 x's altogether. Now, if I was multiplying 4x by 5, I would just take the 4 and times it by 5, so that's 20. And then it's 20 lots of x, so just 20x, like so. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is laws of indices, and that's video 174 in corporate maths. And now what we're going to do is we're going to look at laws of indices whenever we're using algebra as opposed to using numbers. But the same rules apply. So for instance, if we had m to the power of 3 multiplied by m to the power of 4, we just add the powers, so it'd be m to the power of 7. If we had m to the power of 8 divided by m to the power of 2, we take away the powers if we're dividing, so that'd be m to the power of 6. And then finally, if we had a power to a power, so we've got some, a power and then a bracket and then a power outside, we'd multiply the powers together. So if we had m cubed squared, we then have m to the power of 6 by multiplying the powers together. Okay, and this is the corporate maths revision card on laws of indices, so this might be quite useful if you've got the revision cards as well. So let's have a look at our examples. We've got y to the power of 8 multiplied by y to the power of 3. So we've got y times y times y times y 8 times, and then we're multiplying that by another y times y times y, so that all together there'll be 11 y's multiplied together, so that'll be y to the power of 11. In other words, adding the powers together, 8 plus 3 is 11, so it'll be y to the power of 11. Next, we've got y to the power of 15 divided by y to the power of 5. Well, if we're dividing and we've got the same base, so they've both got a base of y, we just take away the powers. So we've got 15, take away 5 is 10, so it'll be y to the power of 10. And finally, if we had y to the power of 6 squared, we've got a power of a power, so we multiply the powers together, 6 times 2 is 12. So it'd be y to the power of 12. Or another way to look at this one is we've got y to the power of 6 multiplied by itself. So we could then add the powers and that would give us 12 as well. That's it. Okay, now we're going to look at expanding brackets. So sometimes we're asked to expand or to multiply out a bracket. And that's video 13 on corporate maths. So here we've got our first question. We've been told to expand 6 bracket y plus 7. That means we've got six lots of the bracket y plus 7. So we've got y plus 7, y plus 7, y plus 7, y plus 7. You know, we've got six of them. And we want to find out what we've got all together. Now, if you had y plus 7, y plus 7 all six times, you would have six y's all together. And a quick way to do that is just to do six times y. So six times y is six y. 
And then if you had y plus 7, y plus 7, y plus 7, y plus 7, you had 6 of them, that would be you'd be adding 7 6 times. And 6 times 7 is 42, so we'll be adding 42. So it'd be plus 42. And a quick way to do that is to just multiply whatever's in the bracket by the number outside. So you just do 6 times y is 6y, and then you do 6 times 7, and 6 times 7 is 42. So to multiply a bracket or to expand the bracket, you just multiply what's inside by the number outside. Okay, and our next one, we've got 2 bracket 1 minus 3x. So we're going to multiply what's inside by 2. So 1 times 2 is 2. And then we've got a minus answer minus. And then we're going to do 2 times 3x is 6x. So our answer would be 2 minus 6x, just like that. Is expand x bracket 3x plus 4. So remember, to expand our brackets, we multiply what's inside by the term outside. So we're going to do 3x multiplied by x, and we're going to do 4 multiplied by x. So 3x multiplied by x, well, that would be 3x squared, because we're multiplying the x by x, would give us the x squared, and we've got a 3. So 3x multiplied by x is 3x squared. Then we've got our plus sign, and then we've got 4 multiplied by x, so that's just going to be 4x, and that's it. Okay, our next question. So here we've got our term outside, 2y, and we're going to expand our brackets, y minus 3. So we're going to multiply what's inside by the term outside. So we're going to do y multiplied by 2y. Well, that would be 2y squared, because we've got y times y is y squared. And then we've got the 2 as well, so that's 2y squared. Then we've got our minus sign. And then we're going to do 3 multiplied by 2y. Well, 3 times 2y would be 6y. So the answer would be 2y squared minus 6y. And if you want more practice on this, remember you can go to video 13 on Corporate Mavs. You can watch that video. Beside that, there's the practice questions and also the textbook exercises. And then also remember there's that bumper booklet of questions and there'll be questions there that involve expanding brackets. Okay, our next topic. Okay, so let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is expanding two brackets. So as you can see here, we've got two brackets, x plus 6 and x minus 2. And we've been asked to expand and simplify them. So to expand two brackets, I use this approach. I take my first term, my x, and I do x times x. So x times x is x squared. Then I do my x times minus 2. And x times minus 2 is equal to minus 2x. So 6 times x is 6x, so plus 6x. And then we've got 6 times minus 2, and 6 times minus 2 is equal to minus 12. So whenever we expand these brackets, we get x squared minus 2x plus 6x minus 12. Now, as you can see, we've been asked to expand and simplify. And if you look at these two middle terms, we've got minus 2x plus 6x. Now, minus 2x plus 6x is 4x. So our final answer would be x squared plus 4x minus 12. And that's it. And another approach to expanding two brackets is to use a grid. So here we've got x plus 6. We write x and then plus 6. And then we've got x subtract 2. So we write x and negative 2. And what we're going to do is we're going to multiply each of these terms and put the answers inside of our grid. So we've got x times x. Well, that's x squared. We've got x times 6 or x times positive 6. That's going to be plus 6x. Then we've got negative 2 times x, so it's going to be negative 2x. And finally, we've got negative 2 times 6. Well, negative 2 times positive 6, well, a negative times a positive is a negative, And 6 times 2 is equal to 12. So we've got x squared plus 6x, subtract 2x, subtract 12. So let's write that down. x squared plus 6x, subtract 2x, subtract 12. And then we need to simplify. So let's collect our like terms. We've got 6x, take away 2x. Well, 6x take away 2x is 4x. So that would be x squared plus 4x subtract 12. So that's another approach we can use to expand in two brackets is to use a grid. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So our next question says expand and simplify 2x plus 1, x plus 4. So again, we're going to multiply both of these terms by the 2x, and then we're going to multiply both of these terms by the 1. So 2x times x. Well, 2x times x would be 2x squared. So 2x squared. Then we've got 2x times 4. Well, 2x times 4 would be 8x, so plus 8x. Now we're going to multiply both of these terms by the 1. So 1 times x is equal to x, or 1x, so that's x plus x. And then we've got 1 times 4. Well, 1 times 4 is equal to 4. So what we're going to do now is we're going to simplify these two middle terms. 8x plus x is equal to 9x. So our final answer would be 2x squared plus 9x plus 4. And that's it. And again, we can use the grid to expand these brackets. So we've got 2x plus 1 and x plus 4. Well, x times 2x. Well, x times x is x squared. And then we've got times by 2, so that's 2x squared. Then we've got x times 1. Well, it's going to be plus 1x or plus x. We've then got 2x times 4. Well, 2x times 4 would be 8x, so plus 8x. And then we've got 4 times 1. Well, 4 times 1 is equal to 4, so plus 4. And then we can just write it all out. 2x squared 
plus x plus 8x plus 4. And then collecting our like terms, x plus 8x is 9x. So we've got 2x squared plus 9x plus 4. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic, which is factorizing, which is video 117. So to factorize an expression, what we do is we want to put the brackets back in. So we wanted to figure out what was expanded or what we had multiplied out. It's the opposite of expanding. So to factorize, if you've got 15x plus 20 here, to factorize it, you think, what's the biggest thing that you can divide both of these by? What's the highest common factor of 15x and 20? So if I've got 15 and 20, well, the biggest thing I can divide these by is 5. So I'm going to put 5 outside the brackets and then open the brackets and then I'm going to divide both of these by 5. So 15x divided by 5, well, that would be 3x. And then 20 divided by 5 is 4. So it'd be 4, and it's plus. Next, we've got factorized 12y minus 36. So if I've got 12y and 36, the biggest thing you can divide these by is 12, because 12y is obviously divisible by 12, and 36 is divisible by 12 as well. So we put 12 and then brackets. Now 12y divided by 12, well, that should be 1y, or we would just write y. And then we've got minus, and then we've got 36 divided by 12, and 36 divided by 12 is 3. And let's just check it, 12 times y is 12y, and 12 times 3 is 36, and we had a minus sign, so 12 times minus 3 is minus 36, and that's it. Factorize w squared plus 8w. Now as you can see, both terms have w's, so let's take w out. So w squared divided by w, well, that would just leave you with w, and then we've got our plus sign. And then 8w divided by w would just be 8. So our answer would be w bracket w plus 8. And you can test it by expanding the brackets. So w times w is w squared, and w times 8 is 8w. Okay, next one, we've been asked to factorize 4y squared plus 6y. So we're looking for common factors of 4y squared and 6y. Now in terms of the numbers, I can see I can divide 4 and 6 by 2. So I'm going to take a 2 out as a common factor. And also in terms of the letters, we've got y squared and y, so we can divide both of those by y. So we're going to factorize this by taking out 2y. So we're going to divide both of these terms by 2y and see what we get. Well, 4y squared divided by 2y, well, that will leave me with 2y, because 2y times 2y is 4y squared, and then plus. And if we had 6y divided by 2y, that would just leave us with 3. So the answer would be 2y bracket 2y plus 3. Okay, our next topic. Okay, so our next topic is factorizing quadratics, and that's video 118 on corporate maths. So we're going to be factorizing quadratics, that's expressions with an x squared term, where it is just an x squared term, so it's not going to be 2x squared or 3x squared, it would just be x squared or 1x squared. And whenever we factorize these quadratics, what we need to do is figure out what the two brackets were that we expanded to get that. So we want to figure out what two brackets we have multiplied together or expanded to get x squared plus 8x plus 15. What I'm actually going to do is I'm actually going to just pick two brackets to begin with, okay? And I'm going to call it x plus 4 and x plus 3. And I'm going to expand these brackets, so x times x would be x squared. x times 3 would be plus 3x. 4 times x would be plus 4x. And 4 times 3 is equal to 12. So whenever we expand these brackets, we would get x squared, and then we'd have 3x plus 4x would be plus 7x, and then we've got our plus 12 on the end. So if we had the pair of brackets, x plus 4 and x plus 3, and we expanded them, we would get x squared plus 7x plus 12. Now one thing that I notice is that the 4 multiplied by the 3 gives us the number on the end, the 12. So the two numbers in the brackets at the end, the 3 and the 4, were multiplied together to give you the number at the end of the quadratic. So here, where we've got our x squared plus 8x plus 15, the number here and the number here were times together to give us 15. Another thing to notice about these two numbers, the 4 and the 3, 4 plus 3 is equal to 7. They add together to give you the term in the middle. So whenever we're factorizing this quadratic, x squared plus 8x plus 15, well, because it's x squared, we know there's an x at the front of both brackets, because x times x is x squared. And in terms of the two numbers that follow the x's, they will times together to give you the 15 on the end, and they're going to add together to give you the 8 in the middle. So we want to find two numbers that will multiply together to give you 15, and add together to give you 8. Now, first of all, I'm thinking here is going to be 3 and 5. Because if you had 3 and 5, 3 times 5 is equal to 15, and 3 plus 5 is equal to 8. So let's just check it. If we had x plus 3 and x plus 5, if we expanded these brackets, we would get x squared plus 5x plus 3x plus 15. And the 5x and the 3x would add together to give you the 8x. So that's it. So to factorize quadratic, where it's just an x squared term at the front, you're going to factorize and put your two brackets down. You're going to put x's in the front of them. And you're going to think of the two numbers that will times together to give you the number at the end. And they will add together to give you the number in front of the x, the coefficient of x. OK, let's have a look at another example. So this time we've been asked to factorize x squared 
plus x minus 6. So we're going to have two brackets, and we're going to put x at the front of both of them. And we want to find two numbers in these brackets that will times together to give you minus 6, and they will add together to give you the number in front of the x. And as you can see here, it's just x, that means it's 1. So they're going to add together to give you 1. So we want to find two numbers that will times together to give you minus 6, and add together to give you 1. So let's think of numbers that times together to give you minus 6. So minus 6. We could have minus 6 times 1. We could have 6 times minus 1. We get a 3 times minus 2, or we could have minus 3 times 2. So these are all our options, which were times together to give you minus 6. But we want the one that will add together to give you 1, because it was plus x or plus 1x. So as you can see here, we've got minus 6 plus 1, or well, minus 6 plus 1 is minus 5, that's not going to be our right answer. We've got 6 plus minus 1, well, that's going to be 5, that's not going to work. You've got minus 2 plus 3, well minus 2 plus 3 is 1, so that's going to be our correct option. We're going to have x plus 3 and x minus 2. So that means our answer must be x plus 3 and x minus 2, because the two numbers, our 3 and our minus 2, will times together to give us our minus 6, and they will add together to give us 1. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So our next question says factorise x squared minus 8x plus 7. So we've got our quadratic, and we're going to start off by putting our brackets down, because we know that we're going to have brackets with x's at the front of both of them. And we want to find two numbers that will times together to give us 7, and they will add together to give us negative 8. So let's start off by thinking of numbers that were times together to give us 7. So it could be 1 and 7, because 1 times 7 is equal to 7. But it could also be negative 1 and negative 7, because negative 1 times negative 7 is 7. Now we want the option where they will add together to give us negative 8. So first of all, I know it's not going to be the top option, because they will add together to give us 8. Let's check our other option. Well, negative 1 plus negative 7. Well, negative 1 going down another 7 would be negative 8. So this will be our correct option. So in their brackets, we will have x minus 1 and x minus 7, and that's it. Okay, so our next topic, we're going to look at solving quadratic equations, and that's video 266 in Corporate Maths. So to solve this equation, we're going to use the technique we just looked at, that factorization. So if you have a quadratic equation where equals 0, you can try to factorize the left-hand side, and if it factorizes, then you can solve it really quickly and easily. So let's factorize x squared plus 14x plus 45. So we'll put our brackets down, bracket, 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 and we're going to put x's at the front of both of them, and we're going to look for two numbers that will multiply together to give us 45, and we'll add together to give us 14. We could do 5 times 9, 5 times 9 is 45, and they add together to be 14. Fantastic. So we've got x plus 5, and then we've got x plus 9 equals 0. So we've factorised this quadratic, and we've got in brackets x plus 5, and then x plus 9 equals 0. Now, whenever you've got two things that multiply together to give you 0, one of them has to be equal to 0. So that means that either this bracket's equal to 0, or this bracket's equal to 0. So let's look at this bracket. So you have a number, plus 5, x plus 5 equals 0. So x plus 5 equals 0. Or x plus 9 is equal to 0, either that bracket's equal to 0. So let's solve this equation. If you had x plus 5 equals 0, well, you could subtract 5 from both sides, and you'd get x equals negative 5. And in this case, you had x plus 9 is equal to 0. So if you subtracted 9 and subtracted 9, you'd get x equals negative 9. So if you had this equation, x squared plus 14x plus 45 equals 0, we've got two possible answers, and they are x equals negative 5 or x equals negative 9. And one other thing to notice, sometimes I take a little bit of a shortcut whenever I'm doing these questions. So if I had x plus 5, and I'm trying to find when that bracket's equal to 0, I just know it's negative 5, because negative 5 plus 5 is 0. So I would often take a bit of a shortcut. So whenever I'd be doing these questions, I would often just go straight to this point here. So I would say, well, x plus 5 is 0, so x equals negative 5. Or, and in this case, I know that it'd be negative 9 plus 9 is 0, so I just jump to x equals negative 9. And that's it. Okay, so let's have a look at our next question. So our next question is to solve x squared minus 4x minus 12 equals 0. And that's great because the equation, the quadratic, equals 0. If it's not equal to 0, you'd want to make it equal to 0. And then let's try and factorize this left-hand side. So let's put our brackets down and put equals 0. So we'll put our x's at the front of both brackets, and we're trying to find two numbers that will multiply together to give us negative 12, and they'll add together to give us negative 4. And 2 and minus 6, well, negative 6 plus 2 would be negative 4, so that's going to be our option. So our brackets will be x plus 2 and x minus 6. Now, we're trying to find when each of these brackets could be 0. We know this bracket would be equal to 0 whenever x is equal to negative 2, because negative 2 plus 2 is 0. And for this bracket, we know it will be whenever x is equal to 6. So it would be x equals 6, and that's it. So x equals negative 2, or x equals 6. 
Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Now, this, this is actually isn't really a different topic. This is really a special case. So this is the difference between two squares, and this is video 120 on Corbin Maths. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to expand these brackets where I've got x minus 7 and x plus 7. Now, I've just chosen these brackets where we've got a x minus and an x plus, and then the same number. And I just want to show you what happens whenever you have this, this case. x times x is x squared. x times positive 7 will be plus 7x. Then we've got minus 7 times x, that's minus 7x. And then we've got minus 7 times 7. Well, a negative times a positive is a negative, and 7 times 7 is 49, so it's going to be minus 49. And whenever we look at our two middle terms here, we've got 7x minus 7x. Now, they will give you 0 whenever you do 7x take away 7x, that's 0. So we will be left here with x squared. This and this cancels out, and we're just left with minus 49. So if you expand in brackets where you've got an x and an x and then the same number, but then one with a plus sign and one with a minus sign, the two middle terms will cancel out. Now that's very useful because this, we can factorize expressions like this. And it's called difference between two squareds because whenever we expand these brackets, the answer will always have a squared term, so x squared and a square number. And then you'd have a takeaway in the middle. So that's your difference. You're taking away the difference between two squares. Okay, let's have a look at some factorizing using this then. Okay, so our first question says factorize x squared minus 49. Okay, so we've just done that one actually. So we know whenever we expanded x minus 7, x plus 7, we got x squared minus 49. So if we were asked to factorize this, our answer would be x minus 7 and x plus 7. And the shortcut would be, well, we had x squared, so the square root of x squared is just x, so that goes at the front of both of them. And then we've got 49, so you square root 49, that's 7, so you know that it's going to be 7 at the end of both brackets. And then you put 1 with a plus sign and 1 with a minus sign, and that's it. So if I wanted to factorize x squared minus 9x, I would put two brackets down. I would square root both terms because they're both squares. So square root of x squared is just x and x. The square root of 9 is 3 and 3. And we put 1 with a plus sign and 1 with a minus sign. And it doesn't matter which way around they go. And that's it. So if we were to factorize x squared minus 9, the answer would be x plus 3, x minus 3. Okay, next, we've been asked to factorize x squared minus 36. So again, bracket, 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 x, x because the square root of x squared is x. And then 36, well, the square root of 36 would be 6, so 6 and 6, 1 over minus sign and 1 over plus sign. That's it. Okay, and our last one. Our last one is to factorize 64 minus x squared. And this is just to show you that it's the difference between two squared, so it doesn't have to be x squared at the beginning. It could be the other way around. So let's factorize, and we'd get the square root of 64 is 8, so 8 is going to be at the front of both brackets. We've got our two squares, so one's going to have a plus sign and one's going to have a minus sign. And the square root of x squared is x. So it's going to be 8 plus x and 8 minus x, and that's it. So our next topic is substitution. So that's video 20 on Corbin Maths. And we've been given the question, given that w equals 9 and y equals 5, find the value of 8w minus 3y. So remember in algebra, we don't write the multiplication sign. So 8w means 8 times w or 8 times whatever value w is. In this case, it's 9. And then subtract 3 times y. So that's 3 times whatever value y is, and that's 5. So let's work out what 8w is. So that's 8 times w, so that's 8 times 9, and that's equal to 72. So 8w is 72, and we're going to take away whatever 3 times y is. So 3 times 5 is equal to 15. So 3y is 15. And then we're going to do 72, take away 15, and that's equal to 57. So 8w subtract 3y, if w is equal to 9 and y is equal to 5, then that would be equal to 57. And that's it. Okay, our next question. Now with substitution, sometimes it's just substituting the values into an algebraic expression such as this. Sometimes we've got a formula which involves words and we've got to substitute values into that. So here we've got Aaron uses this formula to work out how long it should take to cook a turkey. Now I've just made this up so please don't be cooking turkeys using this formula. So we've got the cooking time in minutes is equal to 90 plus the weight of the turkey in kilograms times 20. And the question says how long should it take to cook a 7 kilogram turkey? So it's the weight of the turkey in kilograms, that's 7 times 20. And then we're going to do 90 plus whatever that is. So remember our order of operations, we've got to do the multiplication before we do the addition. So we're going to do 7 times 20. So 7 times 20 is equal to 140. And then we've got 90 plus 140. So 90 plus 140 is equal to 230 minutes. 
And that's it. So we've looked at how to substitute into expressions, and we've looked at dealing with wordy substitution questions. Sometimes you give them substitution questions that involve odd and even numbers or positive and negative numbers. And I want to look at one of these now. So here we've got x is a positive number and y is a negative number. And we've been asked to state if the following expressions are positive or negative. So we've got 5x. So that means 5 times x. And x is a positive number, so it could be numbers such as 10. And 5 times 10 would be 50. But remember, x is a positive number, any positive number. So 5 is a positive, so positive times a positive would always be a positive. So 5x would be positive. So our next expression, xy, that means x times y. Now x is a positive and y is a negative. Well, a positive times a negative is a negative. For instance, if we had 10 and negative 2, 10 times a negative 2 is a negative 20. So this would be a negative. And finally, we've got y squared. So y squared means multiply y by itself. So y is a negative number, so we're going to multiply the negative number by itself. And a negative times a negative is a positive. So that means that y squared would be a positive. And that's it. So sometimes you're asked to do substitution questions where you're asked to find if things are positive or negative or odd and even. And if you have a look at that bumper pack of questions, there's another one there for you to practice now. So our next topic is solving equations, and that's video 110 on corporate maths. So we've got some equations here we're going to solve. We've got w plus 9 is equal to 24. Now whenever we're solving an equation, what we want to do is we want to work out what value w is. So we want to get the w on its own. We want w equals and then a number. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of this plus 9. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the inverse. So the opposite of add 9 is take away 9 from both sides of this equation. So w plus 9, take away 9. So that gets rid of the plus 9, so we're just left with w. And on the right-hand side, we've got 24, take away 9, that's equal to 15. So that means our answer is w equals 15. So our next equation, our next equation is x minus 7 equals 8. So you want to get the x on its own, so you want to get rid of this take away 7. So the opposite of take away 7 is add 7, so add 7 to both sides of this equation. So we've added 7 to get rid of the minus 7, so we're just going to be left with x. And on the right-hand side of this equation, we've got 8 plus 7, and 8 plus 7 is equal to 15. So x is equal to 15. Okay, our next equation, so we've got 3x equals 24. So that's 3 times x equals 24. So we want to get the x on its own, so we want to get rid of this multiply by 3. And the opposite of multiplying by 3 is divide by 3, so we're going to divide both sides of this equation by 3. So we've got 3x, and we're going to divide that by 3, so that's 1x, or just x. And then on the right-hand side, we've got 24 divided by 3, that's equal to 8. And finally, we've got c divided by 2 is equal to 7. Now we want to get rid of this divide by 2, so we're going to do the opposite, which is times by 2 and times by 2. We're timesing by 2 to get rid of the divide by 2, so we're just left with c, so c equals, and 7 times 2 is 14. So that would be 14. So that's how we solve these equations. Okay, next. Okay, now we've got some more equations, and these ones have got two steps. So we've got 4w minus 7 equals 9. So we want to get the w on its own. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of this minus 7 to begin with. So we're going to do the opposite of minus 7, which is add 7 to this side and to the other side. So we've added 7 to get rid of the minus 7. That's just going to leave us with 4w. So we've got 4w equals. And on the right-hand side of the equation, we've got 9 plus 7. And 9 plus 7 is equal to 16. So we've got 4w equals 16. Now we want the w on its own. So this is 4 times w. So we're going to divide by 4 and divide by 4. We've divided by 4 to get rid of the times by 4. So we're just left with w. And on the right-hand side of the equation, we've got 16 divided by 4. And 16 divided by 4 is 4. Now it's very important to practice this topic of solving equations. So please make sure you're doing the questions in the practice booklet, the booklet that accompanies this video. But also have a look at video 110. And then there's practice questions and textbook exercises beside that. And it's a good idea to practice this. Okay, our next equation is c divided by 2 plus 1 equals 6. So what we want to do is we want to get the c on its own, so let's get rid of this plus 1. So we're going to minus 1 and minus 1 from both sides of the equation. So on the left-hand side, we had c divided by 2 plus 1, but we've, so we've taken away 1, so this is going to leave us with c divided by 2. And on the right-hand side of the equation, we had 6, we took away 1, so that's 5. Now we've got c divided by 2, so we're going to want to get rid of this divide by 2, so we're going to times by 2 and times by 2. So on the left hand side, we had c divided by 2, we times by 2 to get rid of the divide by 2, so that's going to leave us with c. And on the right hand side, we had 5 times 2, and 5 times 2 is equal to 10. So c is equal to 10, and that's it.
Okay, we're now going to look at equations, and we're going to deal with equations with letters on both sides. So here's an equation with letters on both sides. And we've got 5x plus 1 equals 3x plus 19. Now, whenever I'm solving equations with letters on both sides, I want to get rid of the lowest number of x's. Now, if you look at this, the lowest number of x's would be the 3x. So I'm going to get rid of this 3x. And remember, we do the inverse to both sides. So if I want to get rid of 3x, I'm going to take away 3x. So minus 3x and minus 3x. So if we had 5x plus 1 and we take away 3x, that leaves us with 2x. We've still got our plus 1. And on the right-hand side of the equation, we had 3x plus 19. We're taking away the 3x's, so that just leaves us with 19. So we can solve this by taking away 1 and taking away 1. So that would leave us with 2x equals 18. And then we can divide by 2 and divide by 2 and see that x is equal to 9. And again, we can check our answer. 5 times 9 is 45, plus 1 is 46, and 3 times 9 is equal to 27, plus 19 is 46, so that's right. Okay, our next question. So our equation this time says 4x plus 5 equals 20 subtract x. Now whenever I'm solving equations with letters on both sides, I always want to get rid of the lowest number of x's. Now minus x is lower than 4x, so I'm going to get rid of the minus x. Now if I want to get rid of minus x, I'm going to do the opposite, which is add x to both sides of the equation. So I'm going to add an x and add an x. So on the left hand side, I had 4x's and I add an x, or one more x, so it's going to be 5x plus 5, the numbers will stay the same, equals. And on the right-hand side of the equation, I had 20 minus x. I added x, so the minus x and x will add together to give you 0, so they're just going to disappear, so you're just going to be left with 20. So we've got 5x plus 5 equals 20. And this is just like the equations you will have seen in the M1 video. So we're going to minus 5 and minus 5, so that will give us 5x equals 15. And then finally, we're going to divide by 5, and we're going to divide by 5, and that gives us x equals 3. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is forming equations. So here we've got some information, and we're going to form an equation out of it. So we've got Daniel is x years old. Daisy is 5 years older than Daniel, so she's 5 years older than him. So he's x. So to find her age, you would do x plus 5. So we'd write x plus 5. That's Daisy's age. And Chris is twice Daniel's age. So Daniel is x, and we're going to times it by 2 to get Chris's age. So that would be 2x. And the sum of their ages is 53. And our first question says, A, form an equation using the information given. So we've got the sum of their ages is 53. Remember the word sum means to add up. So if we add up our x, our x plus 5, and our 2x, we will get the sum of their ages, and we know that's equal to 53. So x plus x plus 5 plus 2x, so the sum of their ages equals 53. So let's collect our like terms. Let's do x plus x plus 2x's. So x plus x is 2x plus another 2x's is 4x's. And we've still got our plus 5, and that's equal to 53. So that is our equation. We've got an equation 4x plus 5 is equal to 53. And part B says solve the equation to find Daniel's age. So we're going to solve this equation. So let's then get rid of this plus 5 by take away 5 and take away 5. So that will leave us on the left-hand side with 4x because we took away 5 to get rid of the plus 5. On the right-hand side of the equation, we had 53. Take away 5 is equal to 48. Now, we've got 4 times x is equal to 48. Well, we don't want this multiplied by 4, so let's divide by 4 and divide by 4. So 4x divided by 4 is just x. And on the right-hand side, we had 48 divided by 4. That's equal to 12. So Daniel was x years old, so we know that x is equal to 12. So Daniel is 12. So our next topic is forming equations, and that's videos 114 and 115 on corporate maths. So here we've got an isosceles triangle, and we've been told the angle at the top is 2x, and we've been told the angle at the bottom left is x plus 20. Now from where the sides of the mark are the same, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, I can see that this angle is equal to this angle. So this is going to be x plus 20 as well. Now the angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. So if we add up all these terms for the angles, the 2x, the x plus 20, and the x plus 20, we'll find that's equal to 180 degrees. So let's do that. So let's, so let's take our 2x and add our x plus 20, and add another x plus 20, and that will be equal to 180 degrees. So let's add up our x's. We've got 2x plus x plus x, that's 4x's. And then we've got 20 plus 20, so that's going to be plus 40, and that equals 180. Now, we've got 4x plus 40 equals 180, so let's take away 40 and take away 40. So take away 40 and take away 40 leaves us with 4x equals 140. 
and then we want to get x on its own so we're going to divide by 4 and divide by 4 and that gives us x equals and 140 divided by 4 would be 35. If the question asks us to find the size of the angles, then you would substitute the 35 into these expressions. So 2 times x would be 2 times 35. So this angle would be 70. And if we took our 35 and added 20, this angle would be 55 and this angle would be 55. So our angles would be 70, 55 and 55. But the question didn't ask us to do that. It just asked us to find x and that's what we've done. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is solving inequalities, and that's video 178 in Corbin Maths. So our first question says solve 5x is bigger than 30. Now, whenever I'm solving inequalities, I use a similar approach to I would use for solving equations. So here we've got 5x is bigger than 30. Now, we don't want 5x, we want just x. So we want to get rid of this multiplied by 5. So to get rid of this 5, we're going to do the opposite, which is divide by 5. So we're going to divide both sides by 5. So if we divide both sides by 5, well, 5x divided by 5 would be 1x, or x, and that would be bigger than, and if we done 30 divided by 5, that would be 6. So the answer would be x is bigger than 6. Okay, this time we've been asked to solve 3x plus 4 is smaller than or equal to 31. So if this was an equation, the first thing I would want to do is get rid of this plus 4. So let's take away 4 and take away 4 from both sides of the inequality. So we've got 3x plus 4. We're taking away 4, so that leaves us with 3x. And then we've got our less than or equal to sign. And then we're taking away 4. 31 take away 4 is 27. So we've got 3x is smaller than or equal to 27. Now we don't want 3 times x, we just want x, so let's divide both sides by 3. So dividing by 3 and dividing by 3 would give us, well on our left hand side, we're dividing by 3 to get rid of this times by 3, so we're just left with x, and then we've got smaller than or equal to, and then if we do 27 divided by 3, well 27 divided by 3 is 9. So if we've been given the question 3x plus 4 is smaller than or equal to 31, well we know that x will have to be smaller than or equal to 9, that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So this time we've got an inequality with letters on both sides. So remember, whenever we're solving equations with letters on both sides, we want to get rid of the lowest number of x's. So here we've got 8x plus 1 is smaller than 10x subtract 6. So with this inequality, I'm going to get rid of the lowest number of x's, which is our 8x. So let's take away 8x from both sides of this inequality. So when we do that, we had 8x plus 1. We took away the 8x, so we're just going to be left with plus 1 or 1. And that's smaller than... Well, we have 10x take away 6, and we're taking away 8x, so that's going to leave us with 2x. So we've got 2x take away 6. Okay, now I like an equation. I would want to get rid of this take away 6, so let's add 6 to both sides of this inequality. So 1 plus 6 is 7, so we've got 7 is less than 2x. And we added 6 to get rid of the minus 6, so we're just left with 2x. And finally, we want the x on its own, so we want to get rid of this multiply by 2, so let's divide by 2 and divide by 2. And whenever we divide 7 by 2, we get 3.5, so that's 3.5 is less than x, and that's it. So we've got 3.5 is less than x. Now we might want to write this the other way around, so we've got the x at the front. So if we write this the other way around, just be aware whenever we write it the other way around, we've got x. Now we've got 3.5 is less than x, or if we read it the other way around, we've got x is bigger than 3.5. So we need to flip that inequality sign around whenever we're writing it the other way around, because x is bigger than 3.5, and that's it. So whenever you're solving inequalities, it's similar to solving equations, but you just need to be aware of whenever you are wanting to flip it around. So in other words, whenever you want the x at the front rather than the number at the front, whenever you flip it around, that you need to be aware of that inequality sign. Okay, let's have a look at our next example. So our next question says, solve 9 minus x is bigger than 11. Now the first thing I notice whenever I look at this inequality is we've got a minus x. What I'm actually going to do is I'm going to add x to both sides of this inequality. So when I add x and add x, that would give me, well, on the left-hand side I had 9 take away x, and then I added x. Well, I added x to get rid of the minus x, that would just leave me with 9 on the left-hand side. Then we've got our bigger than sign, our greater than sign, and then we've got 11 plus x, that will just be 11 plus x, like so. Next, well, we want x on its own. We don't want this 11 here, so let's take away 11 from both sides of the inequality sign. So let's take away 11 and take away 11. Well, 9 take away 11 is minus 2, so we're going to have minus 2 on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we had 11 plus x. We took away 11. Well, 11 take away 11 is 0, so we would just be left with the plus x, or the x. So we've got here, negative 2 is greater than x. If we wanted the right of the way around, we can turn it around, but we have to turn that inequality sign around as well. So we'd write x, and instead of writing a bigger than, we'd write a smaller than, and then we've got negative 2. So that means that our answer is x is smaller than negative 2, and that's the same as negative 2 is bigger than x. So that's our answer. 
Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is inequalities, but this time we're dealing with number lines. So it's representing inequalities on a number line, and it's also looking at how to solve inequalities and then represent the answer on a number line. And this would be video 177 on corporate maths. So let's look at how we'd represent some inequalities on a number line. So here's a number line, and our first inequality is x is greater than negative 1. So x is bigger than negative 1. So first of all, what we do is we go to negative 1, and because x is greater than negative 1, it can't actually be negative negative 1. So what we do is we put a hollow circle at negative 1. So we put a hollow circle at negative 1. And because x can be bigger than negative 1, what we do is we put an arrow to the right like so. And we just do an arrow. And that tells us that x can be any value that is bigger than negative 1. And because the circle is hollow, it shows us that it can't actually be negative 1. So it's any number greater than negative 1. So if we wanted to show that x was greater than negative 1 on a number line, we do a hollow circle at negative 1, and then an arrow pointing to the right, the numbers that are bigger than negative 1. If our inequality was x is greater than 2, we would do a hollow circle at 2, and then an arrow to the right. And that's it. It just says x is bigger than 2. OK, let's have a look at our next inequality. OK, this time our inequality says x is greater than or equal to 2. Now this time we've got x is greater than or equal to 2. So that means it can actually be 2 and any number that's bigger than 2. So instead of doing a hollow circle, what we do is we actually do a circle and colour it in. So a shaded in circle and then a narrow to the right like so. And what that means is that x can be 2 or any number bigger than 2. If our inequality was x is greater than or equal to 0, we would do a shaded in circle at 0. And then we would do an arrow to the right, and that would mean that x is bigger than or equal to 0. And that's it. Let's have a look at our next inequality. So our next inequality is x is smaller than negative 2. So this time what we're going to do is, because it's smaller than, so it's not equal to, we do a hollow circle, and the arrow points to the left because it's smaller than negative 2. And that's it. So if we had an inequality such as x is smaller than 4, what we would do is we would do a hollow circle of 4, an arrow to all the numbers that are smaller than 4. And an arrow just says that it goes on forever. OK, and our next inequality. So our next inequality is x is smaller than or equal to 3. So because it's smaller than or equal to, instead of doing a hollow circle, we do a shaded in circle at 3. And we do an arrow to the left, like so. And that's it. So that's how we represent inequalities where we've just got x is bigger than a number or bigger than or equal to a number or less than a number or less than or equal to a number. And if we had an inequality such as this, where x is bigger than 1, but less than or equal to 3, and I wanted to represent an inequality like that on the number line, because we know that x is bigger than 1, but we know it's bigger than 1, so it can't be equal to 1, so we do a hollow circle at 1. And because x is smaller than or equal to 3, because it can be 3, we do a shaded in circle at 3. And because x can take the values in between those numbers, we join them up like so. So if we wanted to represent an inequality such as x is bigger than 1 but less than or equal to 3, we would do a hollow circle at 1, a shaded in circle at 3, and that represents that inequality on a number line. OK, let's look at our next question. So this time we've been asked to solve 5x minus 6 is less than 4, and we've been asked a sure answer on a number line. So let's first of all start off by solving this inequality. So we have 5x minus 6 is less than 4. So like an equation, we want to solve this and get x on its own. So let's add 6 to both sides. So add 6 and add 6. So on the left-hand side, we had minus 6. We added 6 to get rid of it. So we're just going to be left with 5x. And on the right-hand side of our inequality, so we have our less than symbol. And then we've got 4 plus 6, and 4 plus 6 is 10. So we've got 5x is less than 10. We don't want 5x. We actually just want x on its own. So let's divide by 5 to get rid of this. Multiply by 5. So dividing by 5 and dividing by 5 gives us x is less than, and 10 divided by 5 is 2. So solving our inequality, our answer would be x is less than 2. And if we wanted to show that on a number line, because it's less than 2, we do a hollow circle. And then because it's less than 2, we do an arrow to the left for all the numbers that are less than 2. And that's it. OK, so let's have a look at another type of inequalities question. So we've been asked to list all the integers that satisfy the inequality 2n is greater than 7, but less than or equal to 14. So we're looking for integers, so numbers such as negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, that satisfy this inequality. Now, if we have a look at this inequality, we've got 7 is less than 2n that is less than or equal to 14. Now, we've got 2n here. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to divide this inequality by 2. I'm going to divide everything by 2. And that will give me n instead of 2n. So if I divide everything by 2, 7 divided by 2 is equal to 3.5. Is going to be less than, and then 2n divided by 2 would be n, and then we've got our less than or equal to symbol, and then we've got 14 divided by 2, that's 7. So we know that n is greater than 3.5, 
but less than or equal to 7. So we need to list all the integers that are greater than 3.5, but less than or equal to 7. So let's list our integers. So our first integer that is greater than 3.5 would be 4, and then we've got 5, and then we've got 6, and then it says less than or equal to 7, so 7 is going to be an integer that works. So our integers that satisfy this inequality would be 4, 5, 6, and 7, and that's it. Okay, our next topic is changing the subject. So here we've got a formula. We've got t is equal to a w take away c. And at the minute, the capital T is a subject because it's on its own. The t is on its own there, so t is a subject. But we want to make w the subject. So what that means is we want to get the w on its own. So we don't want this take away c, and we don't want this to multiply by a. So what we're going to do is, like an equation, we're going to get rid of this take away c and multiply by a. So let's write out our formula. We've got t equals a w take away c. Now we want to forget the w on its own. So let's get rid of this take away c to begin with. So if I wanted to get rid of take away c, I'm going to add c to both sides. So add c and add c. Well, t plus c well, is just t plus c. We just write it out. And then on the right hand side of our formula, where well, we had a w minus c, we added c to get rid of the minus c because minus c plus c is zero. So we would just be left with a w. Now we want to make w the subject, which means we want to have the w there on its own. This is a times w. We're multiplying the w by a. We don't want to multiply the w by a, so let's divide both sides by a. So let's divide by a and divide by a. On our right-hand side, we had a w. We divided by a to get rid of it, so we'd just be left with w. On the left-hand side of this formula, we had t plus c, and we're dividing that by a. So what we're going to do is write t plus c. Now remember in algebra, we don't write the divide by sign and we do over a, and that means we've got t plus c divided by a, and that's it, so we've got w on its own, so w is a subject, so our answer would be w equals t plus c over a, and that's it. And changing the subject is video 7 on corporate math, so if you want to watch more examples of changing the subject, starting off with some simple questions and building up to questions like this, video 7 will be really, really useful, and also remember there's the practice questions and the textbook exercise there as well. If you do have the revision cards, changing the subject is one of the revision cards. And as you can see here, we've got a typical change in the subject question where it says make W the subject. And it goes through step by step explaining how you would make W the subject with that formula. So changing the subject is a really important topic. It's video seven on corporate maths. And if you do have the revision cards, that revision card would be really useful for it. So we've been given a question and it says circle the identity. So here, first of all, we've got an equation. We've got 4x plus 1 equals 21. And we can solve this. We can take one away from both sides and we'll get an answer. And if you solve this, you would find x equals 5. Now, because that's just got an answer, that's an equation. So it's not an identity. Now, next, we've got 3x minus 7 is less than or equal to 50. That's what we call an inequality because we've got this inequality sign. We've got the less than or equal to sign. So if it's got a greater than sign, a greater than or equal to, a less than or less than or equal to sign, they're called inequalities. So that's an inequality. It's not an identity. Next, we've got 6x minus 8, and that's what we call an expression. We've got these terms, 6x and minus 8. So that's just what we call an expression. And finally, we've got an identity. And an identity is something that's always equal to each other. So we've got 5 bracket x plus 1, close brackets. And then we've got this symbol here with three lines. That's the equivalent to symbol. And then we've got 5x plus 5. And if you expand this set of brackets, you, so you get 5x plus 5. So 5 bracket x plus 1 is always equal to 5x plus 5. So that is an identity. It's always equal to it. So an identity is something that's always true. And that's it. So... Okay, our next topic. Our next topic is function machines. So here's a function machine, and we've got input, multiply by 3, subtract 8, and that gives us our output. So part A says work out the output when the input is equal to 7. So we've got the input's equal to 7. We're going to multiply that by 3. 7 times 3 is 21. And then we're going to subtract 8. So 21 take away 8 is 13. So if the input is 7, the output is 13. Okay, our next part says work out the input if the output is 22. So we've got the output. Well, let's get rid of this working out from our other part. So we've got the output is 22. And then we've got subtract 8. Well, we're going to do the inverse. So we're going the opposite way. So we're going to do 22 plus 8. And 22 plus 8 is 30. And then instead of multiplying by 3, we're going the opposite way. So we're going to divide by 3. And 30 divided by 3 is 10. So our input would be 10 whenever our output is 22. And we can check that if we had 10 times 3 is 30. Subtract 8 is 22. So we've done part A and part B, and part C says find an expression for the output when the input is x. So if the input is x, we're going to multiply by 3, well that's 3x, and then we're going to subtract 8, so that's 3x subtract 8. 
and that's it. So an expression for the output would be 3x subtract 8. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is coordinates. So that's video 84 on corporate maths. So here we've got a set of axes and we've got some coordinates. We've got A, B, C, and D. And we're going to write down the coordinates of these four points. And whenever we write down coordinates, uh, some people remember the saying along the corridor up the stairs. So I'm going to use that just to help us find these coordinates. So the coordinates of point A. So we've got A, and as you can see here, we've started at the origin. So that's this point here, the origin. And to get the A, we would go two along the corridor and four up the stairs. So the coordinates would be two, four. Next, the coordinates of the point B. So we'd start again at the origin. We're going to go two along the corridor. So that's going to be two. And then we go down to minus two. So we're going to go down two. So the coordinates of this point here is two minus two. Next, the coordinates of this point C. So again, we start at the origin. We're going to cross the minus five and up one. So it's going to be minus five, one. And finally, the coordinates of the point D, well, we're not going left or right, we're not going to cross anywhere, and we're just going to go straight down 4, so the coordinates would be 0, minus 4. So that's it. Okay, and our next topic. Our next topic is drawn linear graphs. So that is drawn a straight line graph. And we've been asked to draw the graph of y equals 2x plus 1. So we're going to plot the coordinates where the y value of the coordinate is twice the x coordinate plus 1. So to do that, sometimes in the question they give you a table, but occasionally they haven't given a table, so I'm going to show you how to do this without a table. But if they give you a table, it should look something like this. So it starts off with x and y, and then you've got some values of x at the top. So it could be something like minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2. And if they haven't drawn a table for you, you would just do something like this. And to find what y is, well, y is equal to 2 times x plus 1. So we're going to substitute in these values of x into this, and we're going to find what y is. So we've got 2x plus 1. So we're going to times all the x coordinates, all these numbers by 2, and add 1. So let's start off here with our 2. 2 times 2 is 4. Add 1 would be 5. This point is 1. So 2 times 1 is 2, plus 1 is 3. Next, if x is equal to 0, 2 times 0 is 0, plus 1 is 1. Now we've got some negative numbers, 2 times minus 1, well 2 times minus 1 or negative 1. Remember a positive times a negative is a negative, so 2 times 1 is 2, so it's going to be negative 2. Add 1 means going back up towards 0, so it will be minus 1. And finally, we're going to do 2 times negative 2, now 2 times negative 2 would be negative 4. Add 1, going back up towards 0, would be minus 3. And, and that's it, so we've got our coordinates, now we just need to plot them. This is a set of coordinates here, 2, 5, 1, 3, 0, 1, negative 1, negative 1, and negative 2, negative 3. So we'll plot these five points and then draw a nice straight line through them. So let's start off with 2, 5, so 2 across, 5 up, so it's going to be here. 1, 3, 1 across, 3 up, is going to be here. 0, 1, or 0 across, and then just 1 up, that's there. Minus 1, minus 1, so it's negative 1, negative 1, so it's going to be here. And finally, negative 2, negative 3, so it's going to be negative 2, negative 3 down there, and that's that point. And then get a ruler and a pencil and draw a nice straight line through those points, and it looks something like this. And that's it, so that's how you draw a straight line graph. Our next topic is to find the midpoint of a line. Now, the midpoint of a line, it can be done in two different ways. If it's drawn on a grid for you, sometimes you can do it just by inspection, just by having a look and seeing if you can spot where the midpoint is. So here we've got the line AB, and if I wanted to find the midpoint of this line, I can see straight away it's here. So that means that the coordinates of the midpoint would be 1 minus 2, because it's 1 across, 2 down, so it's 1 minus 2. So that would be the midpoint of the line. So if you've got it on a grid, you can just sometimes spot it. But sometimes you're given the coordinates. So the coordinates of B would be the point 3, 0. The coordinates of the point A here would be minus 1, minus 4, minus 1, minus 4. And if you were given the coordinates and you were asked to find the midpoint, what you do is just add the coordinates together and then divide by 2. And that will tell you the coordinates of the midpoint. So if we have minus 1 and 3, well, minus 1 plus 3 is 2 and divide by 2 is 1, so fantastic. And then in terms of the y-coordinate, if we add the y-coordinates together, the minus 4 and 0, or minus 4 plus 0 is minus 4, divided by 2 is minus 2. So if you add the coordinates together and divide by 2, you'll find the coordinates of the midpoint. Okay, our next topic. Okay, our next topic is to find the length of a line. Now, if you have a look at this line, you can see if we just go across and then go up, we can turn it into a right-angle triangle. 
And the great thing is then we can use Pythagoras' theorem to find the length of this line. So this is a right angle triangle. So let's mark on our length. So we've got this point here, which is the point one, one. In terms of horizontal, you can see we're going to cross one, two, three. So it's going to be three. And in terms of the heights, you can see here we're at one and we're going up to five. So that means the height of this triangle would be one, two, three, four. So we've got the lengths, three and four. Now, they're not centimeters, they're just three and four units. And we want to find the length of the line. So remember, Pythagoras' theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where a and b are the shorter sides and c is the longer side. So a and b, well, so a is going to be three, so three squared plus, and b, let's let b equal four, so four squared equals, and then we've got c squared, well, that's going to be a, b, so we could call it x if we wanted to, and just write x squared. Then let's work out three squared plus four squared. Well, three squared is nine, so we've got nine plus, and four squared is 16, so 16 equals x squared. So we've just squared three and squared four. Then we're gonna add our nine and 16 together. So nine plus 16 is 25, and that equals x squared. So we've got 25 equals x squared, or x squared equals 25. Now we wanna find the length of this line. So what we're going to do is we're going to square root the opposite of square, square root to find the length of this line. So we're going to do the square root of 25, and the square root of 25 is five. So that means that the length of this line is five units. And that's it. Our next topic is to work out the gradient, or the steepness of a line. So to work out how steep a line is, we use the formula gradient equals rise over run. So if we've got a straight line drawn on a grid, if we do the rise of the line divided by the run of the line, that will tell us the gradient or the steepness of the line. And this is video 189 on Corbett Maths. So let's have a look and see what rise and run are. So if you've been given a line drawn on a grid such as this one, and you've been asked to work out the gradient of it, choose two points on the line to begin with. Now in terms of the points here, we could choose this point here, minus one, minus two, or zero, zero, or one, two, or two, four, or three, six, or four, eight. They would be good points to choose. I'm just gonna choose this one here, one, two, and I'm gonna choose this point here, three, six. And I'm gonna turn it into a little right angle triangle. So I'm gonna go across, and then I'm gonna go up. So the rise is the rise here. So it's how far up you've gone. So whenever you draw your little right angle triangle, it's the rise, it's how much the line's gone up by. So if you can see, we've gone up and make sure you know what you're going up in. So we've gone up in ones here. So we've got by one, two, three, four. So the rise here would be four. And the run, and again, check what we're going to cross in. We're going to cross in ones. So the run would be, well, we're going to cross one, two. So the run would be two. So we've got our rise of four and we've got a run of two. So let's work out the gradient. The gradient is the rise, four, divided by the run, two, and that's equal to two. So the gradient of this line is two, and what that means is for every one unit you go across, the line's gone up two. And as you see, if we started at zero, zero, if we go across one, it goes up two. If you go across another one to two, you go up another two. If you go across another one to three, you go up another two, and so on. So the gradient of this line is two, and the gradient is found by doing the rise divided by the run. And you just draw a little right angle triangle, you just work out what the run would be and the rise would be, and then you do the rise divided by the run. So if you had a line going downwards, like this and you wanted to find the gradient of this line um, again you would draw a right angle triangle you would choose two points so I'm going to choose this point and I'm going to choose this point and as you can see we're going across one so going from five to six our run is one and in terms of our rise well we're going downwards this time so our rise is negative four because we're going down and you would do negative four the rise divided by one and that would be negative four and that means for every one you go across the line goes down four if you go across one, it goes down four, and so on. Okay, let's have a look at another gradient question. This time I've changed the scale, so the numbers are a bit bigger. And we've been asked to work out the gradient of this line. So here we've got a line, and we're going to choose two points on it. I'm going to choose this point, which is the point zero fifty. I'm going to choose another point, and another point I think looks quite good would be 25, 250 here. And let's draw our little right angle triangle. So we're going to go across, and then we're going to go up. Now in terms of the run, we're going from zero here, all the way across to 25. So the run here would be 25. We're going across 25. And the rise, well, we're going from here up to here. So we're going from 50 up to 250. So our rise would be 200. And then to find the gradient, we're going to do the rise divided by the run. So we're going to do the rise, 200, divided by 25, and that's equal to 8. So the gradient of this line is 8. And that what that means is for every one you go across, one unit you go across, you're going to be going up 8. So the gradient of this line would be 8. 
So our next topic is looking at the equation of a line. So the equation of a line is in the form y equals mx plus c. So for instance, something like this, y equals 4x plus 3. Now what we're going to do is we're going to look at this equation. So whenever you've got it in the form y equals mx plus c, the number in front of the x is the gradient. So if I had the line y equals 4x plus 3, the gradient of that line is 4. And you'll remember that means that for every one square you go across, or one unit you go across, the graph goes up four units. So you go across one, it goes up four, and so on. And then our plus c is the y-intercept. This shows you where the graph crosses the y-axis. So for this graph here, this graph would have y equals 4x plus 3, has a gradient of 4, and it crosses the y-axis at 0, 3. It has a y-intercept of 3. Now here's part of the code matter revision card on the equation of a line, and you've got y equals mx plus c, where m is the gradient, so this number is the gradient, and c is the y-intercept. And if we had this line here, if we wanted to find this equation, well, first of all, we would find the y-intercept. It crosses the y-axis, or meets the y-axis at 1, so that means that it's going to be plus 1 on the end. In terms of its gradient, well, we can make a little triangle, and we can do rise divided by run. And if the rise was 4 and the run was 2, well, 4 divided by 2 is 2. So that means the gradient of this line is 2. For every 1 you go across, it goes up 2. 1 you go across, it goes up 2. So the gradient of this line is 2. So the equation of this line would be y equals 2x plus 1. So let's find the equation of this line that's been drawn on the grid. So we know it's going to be in the format y equals mx plus c. We know that m is the gradient, so let's find the gradient to begin with. So let's make a little triangle. So let's choose two good points. I think that a good point would be this one here at minus 1, 1. And another good point would be this one here. Uh, you could have also chosen 0, 4. So I'm going to make a little triangle. So going across and up. And for my triangle, it's got a run of 2. It goes across 2 units. So it goes from minus 1 to 1. It's got a run of 2. And the height, it goes from 1 up to 7. So it's got a rise of 6. So for the gradient, we've got rise divided by run. So m equals rise over run. So it's going to be equal to the rise 6 divided by the run 2. And 6 divided by 2 is 3. So the gradient of this line is 3. So we know it's going to be y equals 3x. Now in terms of the y-intercept, it crosses at 4, positive 4. So it's going to be plus 4. If it crossed down here, minus 1, you would write minus 1 and so on. If it crossed through the origin, 0, you wouldn't write anything. You would just write y equals 3x. But this graph, it crossed, it had a y-intercept of 4. So we wrote y equals 3x plus 4. And that's it. Okay, next question says, a straight line with gradient minus 2 passes through the point 1, 5. Find the equation of the line. So we know, first of all, it's a straight line. So we know it's in the form y equals mx plus c. So we know that the answer is going to be y equals something x plus or minus something. And it says it's a straight line with gradient negative 2. So we know it's going to be y equals minus 2x and then something after it. And it passes through the point 1, 5. And it says find the equation of this line. So we need to find this y-intercept. And that's where the straight line meets the y-axis. And there's two ways which I would typically do this question. One is by looking at the gradient. The gradient's minus 2. So that means that this graph is actually going down. So we've got a x and y axis. It's got a gradient of minus 2. So it's coming downwards like so. And we know it goes through the point 1, 5. So it goes through the point 1, 5. So because we know the gradient is minus 2, that means for every 1 you go across, it comes down 2. You go across 1, it goes down 2. So we, for this point here, if we want to find where it crosses the y-axis here, so the y-axis, we know that it's gone across 1 and it's come down 2, and it's now got a height of 5. That means it must have had a height of 7 to begin with, because it must have had a height of 7 to go across 1 and come down 2 to now have the height of 5. So that means that our y-intercept would be 7. So the equation of our line is y equals minus 2x plus 7. So one approach is to know what the gradient means and to look at the point you've been given and to work out where it would have crossed the y-axis. Now there is another approach, and this is actually the approach that I would typically use, and that is whenever we had the whenever we knew it was y equals minus 2x plus something, I would just write plus c, which stands for the y-intercept. And I know that the point that they've given me is 1, 5. So I know that it has an x coordinate of 1 and a y coordinate of 5. And we can substitute these in to our equation. So we can instead of writing y equals, we could write 5 equals. So 5 equals. And then next we know we've got minus 2x, so that's minus 2 times whatever x is. And x is equal to 1. So minus 2 times 1 is equal to minus 2. And then we've got our plus c. And then we want to find what c is, our y-intercept. Well, we want the c on its own. So we want to get rid of this minus 2. So we'd add 2 to both sides of this equation. And you get 7 equals c. So c is equal to 7. So you get y equals minus 2x 
plus 7. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So this time we've been given a straight line passes through the points 3, 8 and 5, 20. And we've been asked to find the equation of the line that passes through those points. So again, we know it's going to be in the form y equals mx plus c. So we want to find the gradient of the line that passes through these points, and we want to find where it crosses the y-axis. So first of all, let's find the gradient. So, okay, so let's do a little sketch. So we've got our x and y-axis, and we've got our first point, which is 3, 8. So 3 across, 8 up, somewhere like that. And then we've got 5, 20, so a little bit across and much further up like that. So we've got 5, 20, and we've got 3, 8. And we want to find the gradient of that line, so the gradient of that straight line. And so what I do is, as before, I would draw a little right angle triangle, like so, and get our rise and our run. So our run, well, we're going from 3 across to 5, so our run is 2. And our rise, we're going from 8 up to 20, so our rise would be 12. So we've got a rise of 12 and a run of 2. So the M equals rise over run, so rise over run so that's going to be equal to rise 12 over 2 is equal to 6 so the gradient of this line is 6 so for every one we go across we go up 6 and let's just check it if we went across 1 we would get to 4 and then if we go up 6 we would get to 14 and then if we went across another one we get to 5 and up another 6 we get to 20 so yeah that's right Okay, so we know it's y equals 6x plus something, so plus c. Let's just choose one of our points because we know the line passes through both of these points, 3, 8, and 520. So let's choose one of these points. I'm going to choose 520. I could have chosen 3, 8. And I know x is equal to 5 and y is equal to 20. The x coordinate is 5 and the y coordinate is 20. So let's substitute those into our equation. So y, that's 20 equals 6 times x, so that's 6 times 5, 6 times 5 is 30, plus c. So to get c on its own, I'm going to want to take away 30 from both sides, so that will leave me with 20 take away 30 is negative 10, and then we've got 30 plus c, take away 30 just leaves us with c. So c is equal to negative 10, so our y-intercept is equal to negative 10, so our answer would be y equals 6x minus 10. And again, let's just check it. We knew the gradient of the line was equal to 6, so that meant that so for every 1 we go across, we go up 6. So if we're at this point, if we go across 1, we go down 6, that would then bring us to... 2, 2. If we go across 1 and down 6, that would bring us to 1 minus 4. And across 1 and down 6 would bring us to 0, negative 10. So yeah, the y-intercept would be negative 10. And that's it. Okay, so let's have a look at our next topic, and it's parallel lines, which is video 196 on corporate maths. And parallel lines, they're lines that go in the same direction, and they never meet each other. And because they are going in the same direction, they have the same gradient or the same steepness. So if we had y equals 2x plus 1, and y equals 2x minus 3, those lines would be parallel to each other because they've got the same gradients. And this is the corporate maths revision card on that. So if you do have the corporate maths revision cards, make sure you know this one and stick it up on your wall or bring it with you on the bus in the morning or whatever. Make sure you remember the parallel lines have the same gradient. And that's it. So that's a very useful bit of information that parallel lines have the same gradient. And you can use that in questions as well. We've got an example and the question says the graph below shows the cost of hiring a hot tub and this is video 171a in Corbett Mavs. So here we've got a graph that shows us the cost of hiring a hot tub and you've got the number of days going along horizontally and we've got the cost going up vertically. So going from zero up to 350. So the question says the graph intersects the vertical axis at 100. So as you can see here, it starts at 100. What does this represent? So as you can see here, this would be on zero days. So this is like a set fee. It's like a, a set charge that you're charged for hiring the hot tub. So no matter what, there's 100 pound to begin with. And then you're going to be charged so much per day. So what this represents, so this represents a fixed fee, a fixed cost of 100 pound. So that means that no matter how long you hire this hot tub for, there's a £100 fee to begin with. If this was the cost of a plumber, that might be a call-out fee. Or if this is a taxi, that whenever you go into a taxi, sometimes you see the meter starts at a particular number, like a set fee that you have to pay to begin with. So this is a fixed cost, this value of £100. The next question says, find the gradient of the graph. So we've got this graph, and we want to find its gradient. So let's choose two points. I'm going to choose the point here, 0, 100. And I'm going to choose this point up here, which is 10, 350. And let's make our little right angle triangle. So going across and going up. And let's work out the rise divided by the runs. So our gradient M, that's the letter for gradient M, is rise divided by run. So for our right angle triangle, the rise, well, it's gone from 100 up to 350. So that's a rise of 250. So that will be 250 divided by. And the run, if you look at how much we've gone across by, we've gone from 0 to 10. So the run would be 10. So we're going to do 250 divided by 10, and that's equal to 25. 
So it means the gradient of this line is equal to 25. And the question says, explain what the gradient represents. So remember the gradient, it means for every one you go across, how much the line goes up by. Now in terms of this context of hiring a hot tub, what that would mean is for every one more day you hire the hot tub, how much the price increases by. So that's what it means. It means the hot tub, it means the cost per day of hiring the hot tub is 25 pound. So that'd be the cost per day, 25 pound. So our next topic is to look at conversion graphs. And here we've got a conversion graph. And conversion graphs can be used to maybe compare distances, like in this graph here, where we've got miles and kilometers. Conversion graphs could be used to convert money. Perhaps you get them from currencies and you want to convert between one and the other. And a conversion graph can be quite useful for that. So here we've got a conversion graph. And horizontally, we've got miles going 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 10 miles. And vertically, we've got kilometers going 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And let's convert four miles into kilometers using our conversion graph. So it's important to be able to know how to use a conversion graph. So we get a ruler and a pencil, and we want to convert four miles. So we'll go to four miles on the horizontal axis here, four. And we'll get a ruler and a pencil, and we'll go up to the line. And it's just there. And then we go across from the line and do this with a pencil on the test paper, like so. So as you can see, we've got to the second box above the six. So let's find out what each one of those boxes is worth. So from naught to one, there's one, two, three, four, five boxes. That must mean we're going up in 0.2s. So it's 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, one. So that would be 6.2, 6.4. So four miles would be 6.4 kilometers using this conversion graph. Now, we've been asked to change eight kilometers into miles. So again, getting a ruler and a pencil. So getting your pencil and ruler and going from eight kilometers across to the line and then down from the line, we get to exactly five miles. So using this graph, eight kilometers would be equal to five miles. And that's it. Now, if you were asked to maybe change something like 80 kilometers into miles, I would go from eight across and get five and then say, well, if eight kilometers is five miles, 80 kilometers would be 50 miles and so on. So you can use conversion graphs to convert what's on the scales, but you can also use that information to work out other conversions as well that go beyond the scales. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. And our next topic is quadratic graphs, and that's video 264 on corporate maths. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw this quadratic graph. And whenever we draw quadratic graphs, what you'll find is instead of being straight lines, they'll either be this U-shape or a parabola, like so, this U-shaped parabola, or they could be an N-shaped parabola, like so. And so whenever you draw a quadratic graph, it will have either have this U-shape or this N-shape. And it depends on whether this X squared is positive or negative. So because this is a positive X squared, I can tell it's going to be a U-shape. If it was minus X squared, it would actually be an N-shape. Okay, so the question asks us to complete the table for y equals x squared plus x minus 4. So we've got this xy table, and we've got lots of points. The reason we've got lots of points is it's not a straight line anymore, it's a curve, so we're going to need more points so we can draw a nice curve through them. And we've got our x values of minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. And what we're going to do is we're going to work out our y values. And to find our y values, we're going to square x, add x, and take away 4. So let's start off with 3. So we're going to do 3 squared plus three, and then take away four. So three squared is nine, plus three is then gonna be 12, take away four is eight. So that means that would be eight. Now we've got two, so we're gonna do two squared, plus two, take away four. So two squared is four, plus two is equal to six, take away four is two, so that would be two. Now we've got one, so we're gonna do one squared, plus one, take away four. So one squared is one, plus one, well, one plus one is two, Take away four is negative two, so it's gonna be negative two. Now we've got zero, so we're gonna do zero squared plus zero, take away four. Well, zero squared is zero, plus zero is zero, take away four is minus four, so that'd be minus four. Next, we've got negative one, so we're gonna do negative one squared plus negative one, and then take away four. So remember when we square negative, we're doing a negative times a negative, which is a positive. So we're gonna do negative one squared, so that's negative one times negative one, which is one. We're then gonna add on negative one and then take away four. So then we've got one plus negative one. Well, if it was one, add one, it would be two, but we're adding negative one, which means it's gonna go down one. So one add negative one is actually zero. And then we're gonna take away four, which is minus four. So that'll be minus four. And then finally, negative two. So we're gonna do negative two squared plus negative two, and then take away four. And when we do negative two squared, that's a negative times a negative, so that's negative two times negative two, so that's a positive, so that's gonna be four. And then we're gonna add negative two, that means it's gonna go down two, so that'll be two, and then take away four will be negative two. So we've now found our coordinates, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna plot them. So we're gonna go three across and eight up, so three across and eight up. We've got two across and two up, so two across and two up. 
one across and two down, so one across and two down. Zero across and four down, so zero minus four. We've got negative one and negative four, so negative one, negative four. And finally, negative two, negative two would be negative two, and negative two would be there. So we've now got our points, and as you can see, they make a curve, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna draw a nice curve through them. So we're gonna do this on the computer, and it can actually be quite tricky on the computer, so um, please bear with me whenever I'm doing it. So it might not be absolutely fantastic, but I'll do the best I can. Hey, <laughs> that's pretty good. Um, so that's it. So we've drawn a quadratic graph and we've drawn a nice curve for our points. And if you want more practice, video 264 in Corbin Maps will give you more practice on that. And remember, you've got that bumper pack of questions. So um, ultimate video practice question booklet. And if you go to that in the description below and click on it, there'll be questions there on the quadratic graphs and it'll give you a chance to draw one yourself. Okay, so let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is solving quadratics graphically. So it could be something like this, where using your graph, estimate the values of x whenever y is equal to negative 3. So if we go back to our graph, we need to now draw the graph of y equals negative 3 because we're told to find the values of x whenever y is equal to negative 3. So if we draw that graph of y equals negative 3, that's going to be all the coordinates with a height of negative 3, such as 0, negative 3, 1, negative 3, 2, negative 3, 3, negative 3, and so on. The graph y equals negative 3 is a horizontal line that passes through 3 on the y-axis. So y equals a number graph will be a horizontal line, and it'll be horizontal going through whatever the number is. So if it was neg y equals negative 3, it'll be a horizontal line going through negative 3 on the y-axis, because all the coordinates on that line have a height of negative 3. If it was y equals 8, it would be a horizontal line going through 8, and so on. Okay, um, But in our question, we were asked to find an estimate of the values of x whenever y is equal to negative 3. So if you have a look at our parabola and our straight line, our y equals negative 3, you can see they actually meet each other twice. They meet here, and they meet here. And what we're actually going to do is we're going to go up to the x-axis, so just going up to here, there, and going up from this intersection point, the second intersection here, we're going to go up again to the x-axis there. And we're going to read off what those values would be. And there would be our two solutions. And it says estimate because, remember, you, we've drawn a curve and we've drawn it freehand. So it's not going to be perfect, this question. It's an estimate to our answers. So let's have a look and see what we've got. So let's start off with this one. We've got 0, we've got 1, and in the middle is 0 0.5. I think that's about 0 0.6. So I'm going to say x equals 0 0.6 would be one of our solutions. And this one over here, well, we've got 0, we've got negative 1, we've got negative 2. That's negative 1.5. I think that's about negative negative 1.6, so negative 1.6. So our two estimates would be x equals 0.6 or x equals negative 1.6. So would be our two estimates. So x equals 0.6 or x equals negative 1.6. Um, just to also point out that the question could be written in a slightly different way. Rather than saying find estimates of the value of x whenever y is equal to negative 3, it could have had the equation of the graph that we drew in the first question. It's x squared plus x minus 4. And it could have just written equals negative 3. And then what you do is you look at that value. You just draw the graph of y equals negative 3 like we did. So we just draw a horizontal line going through negative 3 and go up to the x-axis and find those values. And another thing you could be asked whenever you're dealing with quadratic graphs is to find the roots of the quadratic. So here we've got a quadratic graph, and it's y equals x squared minus x minus 2. And we've been asked to use this graph to find the roots of x squared minus x minus 2 equals 0. So when the quadratic equals 0. And that means where the quadratic has a height of 0. And that means where it crosses the x-axis. So if you have a look at where this quadratic crosses the x-axis, it crosses the x-axis at negative 1 and 2. So that means the roots of this equation will be x equals negative 1 or x equals 2. And that's it. So to find the roots of the quadratic, if you've been given the graph and then they've written the graph equals 0, just find where that graph crosses the x-axis. And another thing that they sometimes ask you is to write down the coordinates of the turning point, and that would be the coordinates of this point here. So you just write down the coordinates of that point, and that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is reciprocal graphs, and this video 346 on corporate maths. So a reciprocal graph is something in the form of y equals a number and then over x. So something like y equals 2 over x. And you will have heard of the term reciprocal before whenever you're dividing by fractions, because whenever you're dividing by fractions, instead of dividing by a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal. And that's what you get when you flip it over. And that's what we mean whenever we've got a graph in this format, y equals 2 over x. So we're going to draw a graph, and we've got an xy table, and we've got quite a lot of points because it's this curves involved, it's not nice straight lines. 
So we're going to substitute in these values of x into our equation to get our values for y. So let's start off with the positive values. So let's use x equals 5. So 2 divided by 5 is 0 0.4. Then we've got 2. Well, 2 divided by 2 is 1. Then we've got 1. 2 divided by 1 is 2. Then we've got 0 0.5. So we've got 2 divided by 0 0.5. Well, there's 4 halves in 2, so the answer would be 4. Now let's move on to our negative numbers. So we've got 2 divided by negative 5. Well, a positive divided by a negative is a negative, so it's going to be a negative answer. And 2 divided by 5 is 0 0.4, so it's going to be negative 0.4. If we then got 2 divided by negative 2, well, that's going to be, well, positive divided by a negative would be a negative, so negative 1. Now we've got 2 divided by negative 1, that would be negative 2. And finally, 2 divided by negative 0 0.5 would be negative 4. Okay, so we're not going to points now, let's plot them. So we've got 5 across and 0.4 up, so 5 across would be here. 0.4 up, well we've got 10 little squares for 2. 2 divided by 10 is 0.2, so it'll be 2 of them upwards, or 2 of them up, so it'll be like that, somewhere like that. Then we've got 2 on, so 2 across 1 up would be there. Then we've got 1 across 2 up, so 1 across 2 up. And then we've got 0.5 across 4 up, so 0.5 across would be halfway in between, and 4 up would be there. So we've now got our points, now what we're going to do is draw a nice curve through them. Now this is quite tricky on the computer, so just bear with me. Okay, this won't be perfect, but it's just going to be a nice curve that looks something like so. That's not too bad. And as you can see, the curve, it never actually reaches the y-axis. Because if you've done 2 divided by 0, well, that's undefined. You can't divide 2 by 0. So this curve, this curve will never actually reach the y-axis. And as you divide by smaller and smaller and smaller decimals, so, so 2 divided by 0 0.1 would actually be 20. So that's really hard. 2 divided by 0 0.0. 0.1 would be equal to 200. So what happens is the graph would just shoot off to infinity and it would never actually reach the y-axis. And similarly, whenever we're going across horizontally to the right here, uh, because we're doing 2 divided by something, even if we divide it by a million, there'll still be a tiny, tiny number there. It'll be 0 0.0000 and so on. So the graph will approach the x-axis but never actually reach it. They're what we call asymptotes. It's quite a fancy word, but that's just what they're called. Okay, and these points on our left-hand side of the table, we've got negative 0.5 and negative Four, so that would be there. Then we've got negative one, negative two, so negative one, negative two would be there. Negative two, negative one would be there. Negative five, negative 0.4 would be there. So we've got our points and we're going to draw a nice curve through them. So that would be the graph of y equals 2 over x. Um, if you had something like y equals 4 over x, it would have the same shape, but it would just be slightly further out. So it'd be slightly higher up and slightly further down and so on. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So the next topic is cubic graphs. So here we've got the graph y equals x cubed. So cubic is whenever we've got this cubed. And here we've got y equals x cubed. So here we've got our xy table. So let's cube all these values to get our y values. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. 1 times 1 times 1 is 1. 0 times 0 times 0 is 0. Negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1. Well, negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. And times that by negative 1 is negative 1. Because a negative times a negative times a negative is a negative. Then we've got negative 2. So negative 2 times negative 2 is 4. Times negative 2 is negative 8. And finally, negative 3 times negative 3 times negative 3 would be negative 27. And now let's put these points on our grid. So let's draw our curve. So it'll come upwards. So we'll go through the points. And then what will happen is it'll flatten out and come through zero and then curve back upwards and look something like that. And excuse my sketch, it is freehand on the computer, it's quite tricky. And now let's have a look at our y equals negative x cubed. So what this means is we're going to cube our value of x and then we're going to make it negative. So we're going to do 2 cubed. So 2 times 2 times 2 is 8, but we're going to make it negative, so it's going to be negative 8. Then we've got 1 times 1 times 1, which is 1, but we're going to make it negative, so negative 1. Then we've got 0 times 0 times 0, 0, well that's just 0. Then we've got negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1, that's negative 1. But we're going to make it negative, well that means then, because it's already negative, it means we're going to make it positive, so it's going to be 1. And then we've got negative 2, so negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 is negative 8. But then we're going to make it negative, but it's negative already, so it, makes, it means make it positive, we're going to change the sign, so that's 8. And then finally we've got negative 3 times negative 3 times negative 3, which is negative 27. We're going to make it negative, it's already negative, so it's going to be 27. And another way to consider this negative sign, do you remember if you have got something like x cubed, that means 1x cubed, or 1 lot of x cubed. If you've got negative x cubed, that's the same as negative 1x cubed, so really what we're doing is we're finding our value for x cubed, and then we're multiplying it by negative 1. So here we had 2 cubed, which is 8, multiplied by negative 1 is negative 8. Whenever we had our negative 1 cubed, that's equal to negative 1. When we times it by negative 1, that's 1, and so on. And it just, what it does is just, it just changes the signs whenever there's a negative sign in front of it. Now let's 
pull out our points. Okay, we're now plotted our points. Now let's try and draw a curve, and that's meant to be a curve. And what you'll find is it's the same as the XQ graph, but it's just flipped around the other way. So our next topic is sequences, and we're going to start off by finding the next terms in some sequences. So our first sequence goes 52, 50, 48, 46. So as you can see, the sequence is going down by two each time. We're taking away two, taking away two, taking away two. So that means if we take away another two, that would be 44. And if we take away another two, that would be 42. So we'll find the next two terms in that sequence. Okay, let's have a look at our next sequence. Now, you may recognize these numbers. Earlier on in this video, we looked for our square numbers. 1 times 1 is 1, 2 times 2 is 4, 3 times 3 is 9, and so on. So 4 times 4 is 16, 5 times 5 would be 25, and 6 times 6 is 36. So they would be our two missing numbers, because we've got 1 times 1, 2 times 2, 3 times 3, and they are square numbers. Another way, just in case you didn't spot they were your square numbers, you can see that we added 3, so add 3. Then we added 5. Then we added 7, so if we added 9, we would then get 25, and if we added 11, we would get 36. But hopefully you would spot that they are your square numbers. Okay, let's have a look at our next sequence. Well, this time we've got 8, 9, 11, 14. Well, we're adding 1 to go from 8 to 9. We're now adding 2 to go from 9 to 11. We're then adding 3 to go from 11 to 14. So if we add 4, so add 4, we would get 14 plus 4 is 18. And then if we added 5, well, 18 plus 5 would be 23. So the two missing numbers in this sequence would be 18 and 23. Okay, and the next sequence of numbers, well, I can see again that these are our special numbers. We've got our square numbers here. These are our cube numbers. 1 times 1 times 1 is 1. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. 3 times 3 times 3 is 27. 4 times 4 times 4 is 64. 5 times 5 times 5 is 125, and 6 times 6 times 6 is 216. So it's very important to know those are your cube numbers as well. Okay? Okay, next. So our next question says, find the difference between the second and the seventh triangular number. So here we've got a pattern of dots, and these are our triangular numbers where we start off with one dot, then we add a row of two dots beneath it, so one plus two is three. Then we add a row of three dots beneath that, so three plus three is six. Then we add a row of four dots, well, six plus four is 10. Then we add a row of five dots, which would be 15, and so on. So to get our triangular numbers, we start with one, and then we add two, add three, add four, add five, add six, and so on. And there are our triangular numbers. And they are 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, 28, 36, and so on. And that's it. So there are your triangular numbers. And let's just check. We need our second and our seventh triangular number. So our second one is 3, and our seventh one would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And the difference between those, where well, we've got 28, take away 3, would be 25. So the difference between the second and the seventh triangular number would be 25. So our next topic is to generate a sequence. And we're going to be given a rule to generate a sequence or to create a sequence. And this is video 290A in Corporate Maths. And we've been told a sequence is created by using this rule. So we add 40 and then divide by 2. So that's the rule. You just add 40, divide by 2, add 40, divide by 2, and so on. And we've been asked to find the next three numbers in the sequence. So we're given the first number, which is 80. So we're going to take our 80 and we're going to add 40. So 80 add 40 is equal to 120. Then we're going to divide by 2. So 120 divided by 2 is equal to 60. So that means our next number in the sequence is 60. Now we're going to take our next number, 60, and we're going to add 40. So add 40, and then that's equal to 100. And then we're going to take our 100 and we're going to divide it by 2. So 100 divided by 2 is equal to 50. So the next number in our sequence is 50. Next, we take our 50 and we follow the rule, add 40 and divide by 2. So we're going to take our 50 and we're going to add 40, and that's equal to 90. And then we're going to divide by 2. 90 divided by 2 is equal to 45. So that's equal to 45 and so on. Okay, so carrying on with sequences, our next topic in sequences is patterns. So we've got these patterns, and it's video 290 in Corporate Maths, and we've been asked to draw a pattern for it. So we've got pattern 1, which is this pattern of dots. Then we've got pattern 2, where we've added an extra dot above, an extra dot below, and an extra dot to the left. Then we've got pattern 3. We've added another one on the top, another one below, and another one to the left. So it just keeps on getting bigger by adding on another dot on the top, below, and to the left. Okay, so we've been asked to draw pattern 4, so we're just going to take pattern 3 and add another dot above, below, and to the left. So that would mean that it would have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So we'd have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And with the middle one, so one, two, three, four, five, this one, it would then have, instead of having one, two, three to the left of it, we're gonna have another one, which is four. So one, two, three, 
forward. So we just take what pattern three was and add on another dot above, below, and to the left, and that's it. And our next question says, how many dots will there be in pattern five? So in pattern one, there was four dots, one, two, three, four. In pattern two, well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're adding three each time, so this would then have 10. This would have 13. And in pattern five, there'd be 16 dots because we're adding three each time, we're adding one above, one below, and one to the left. And that's it. Okay, and another type of sequence that we should know for our GCSE Foundation Maths is our Fibonacci sequence. So a Fibonacci sequence, if we choose two numbers such as 1 and 1, we find the next term of a Fibonacci sequence by adding the two previous terms. So 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. Now we do 1 plus 2 is equal to 3. Now we do 2 plus 3 is equal to 5. Then we do 3 plus 5 is equal to 8. 5 plus 8 is equal to 13, and so on. And that's it. So a Fibonacci sequence is to find the next number, we add the two previous numbers. So here's an example. It says find the next three terms of this Fibonacci style sequence. So we've got 2, 7, 9, and 16. So to get the next number, we need to add the 9 and 16. So 9 plus 16 is 25. To get the next number, we're going to add 16 and 25. That's equal to 41. And finally, to get our next number, we're going to do 25 plus 41. And 25 plus 41 will be equal to 66. And that's it. So Fibonacci sequence is where we find the next term by adding the two previous terms. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is the nth term. So whenever we've got a sequence, there's often a rule or an nth term for it, which means that we can find out any term in the sequence by substituting which value we're looking for. So here we've got our sequence, 3, 8, 13, 18, and so on. As you can see, we're going up in fives because we're adding five, adding five, adding five, and so on. And we've been asked to find the nth term of this sequence, in other words, the rule for the sequence. So if we want to find the nth term, our first step is to consider the sequence and see what it's going up in or going down by. And this, as this sequence has gone up in fives, we're adding five, adding five, adding five. What we're going to do is we're going to write the five times tables beneath the sequence. So the five times tables are five, 10 are the multiples of 5, 5, 10, 15, 20, and so on. And because we're multiplying the numbers by 5, we're doing 5 times 1 is 5, 5 times 2 is 10, 5 times 3 is 15, and so on. We're going to write 5n, because that means 5 multiplied by n, because 5 times 1, 5 times 2, 5 times 3, and so on. So if the sequence has gone up in 5s, we write the 5 times table, so the multiples of 5 beneath it, and we write 5n in front. Now, our sequence is not... 5, 10, 15, 20. Our sequence is actually 3, 8, 13, and 18. And to get from 5 to 3, we take away 2. To get from 10 to 8, we take away 2. To get from 15 to 13, we take away 2. To get from 20 to 18, we take away 2. So if we took away 2 from all of these numbers, we would get our sequence. So that means if we had 5n minus 2, that would be 3, 8, 13, and 18. So that means our nth term is 5n minus 2. 5n minus 2. And let's just check it. Well, the first term in our sequence, well, if we do 5 times 1 is 5, take away 2 is 3. Great. The second term in our sequence is 8. Well, if we do 5 times 2, that's 10, take away 2 is 8. Fantastic. Our third term, 5 times 3, 15, take away 2 is 13, and so on. Let's work out another one. So if we had the sequence 7, 9, 11, 13, and so on. As this sequence is getting bigger by 2 each time, we write the multiples of 2 beneath the sequence. So that's 2, 4, 4, 6, 8, and so on, and that's 2n. Our sequence, though, isn't 2, 4, 6, 8. Our sequence is 7, 9, 11, and 13. So to get from the multiples of 2 to our sequence, we'd have to add 5, add 5, add 5, and add 5. So that means our nth term would be 2n plus 5. So that means the nth term of the sequence would be 2n plus 5. And let's just check it. 2 times 1 is 2, plus 5 is 7. 2 times 2 is 4, plus 5 is 9. Great. 2 times 3 is 6, plus 5 is 11, and so on. So to find the nth term of a sequence, you consider what the sequence is going up or down by. You write their multiples beneath it, and then you figure out what you would need to do to those multiples to get to the sequence. Now, because I said down by, let's just have a look at an example where a sequence is going down instead of up. So let's have a look at one of those now. So if we had the sequence 15, 12, 9, 6, and so on, and if we look at our sequence, we can see we're going down by 3 each time. We're taking away 3, taking away 3, taking away 3, and so on. So that means that what we're going to do is we're going to write down the negative 3 times tables. So that's going to be minus 3, minus 6, minus 9, minus 12, and so on. So that would be minus 3n, because it's minus 3 times 1, minus 3 times 2, and so on. But our sequence is not minus 3n, it's not minus 3, minus 6, minus 9, minus 12. Our sequence was 15, 12, 9, 6. To get from minus 3 to 15, we would have to add 18. To get from minus 6 to 12, we would have to add 18. To get from minus 9 to 9, we'd have to add 18, and so on. So that means our nth term for our sequence would be minus 3n plus 18. And let's just check it. Our first term is 15. 
minus 3 times 1 is minus 3, plus 18 is 15, and so on. So that is our nth term for our sequence that is going down. Now, the nth term is really, really useful because what we can actually do is we can use the nth term to work out terms in the sequence. If we had the sequence 3, 8, 13, 18, and so on, and someone asked me to find the 100th term in the sequence, rather than carrying on the sequence for 100 terms, I can use this nth term. So I can do, if I want the 100th term, I can do 5 times 100, which is 500, take away 2, which would be 498. So the 100th term in this sequence, without having to list them all down, would be 498. And that's great. So it saves us a lot of time and effort. Another reason why the nth term is quite useful is we can use it to work out if a term's in the sequence or not. So for instance, if somebody came along to me and said, is 200 in this sequence? Well, first of all, I can tell it's not because our sequence goes 3, 8, 13, 18, and so on. And as you can see, the numbers end in a 3 or an 8, a 3 or an 8. So because 200 ends in a 0, it's not going to be in the sequence. But we can actually use the nth term to show that. We can actually write 5n minus 2, the nth term, and write equals 200. So that's an equation. And if we solve this equation and we get a whole number, so we get n equals a whole number, it would mean that 200 is in the sequence, and whatever whole number that is tells us which term in the sequence it is. But if whenever we solve this equation we get a decimal number, it would mean that the number 200 wouldn't be in the sequence. So let's solve our equation and see what happens. So if we had 5n minus 2 equals 200, we would add 2 and add 2. Well, we add 2 to get rid of the minus 2, so we're left with 5n, and on the right-hand side we've got 200, add 2 is 202. Now, we've got 5n, we don't want 5n, so let's divide by 5 and divide by 5, so that would give us 5n divided by 5 is n, and 202 divided by 5 would be... 40.4. And as that's not a whole number, that means that 200 is not in the sequence. And because it's 40.4, it means it's not the 40th term and it's not the 41st term in the sequence. So that means that 200 is not a term in the sequence. Okay, let's look at our next topic within sequences. So we've now got arithmetic and geometric progressions, and that's video 375 in Corporate Maths. So an arithmetic progression is where we've got a sequence of numbers where there's a common difference. So in other words here, we've gone from 6 to 8, so we're adding 2. We're then going from 8 to 10, so we're adding 2. We're then going from 10 to 12, so we're adding 2, and so on. So because there's that common difference of adding 2, adding 2, adding 2, adding 2, that means that's an arithmetic progression. Here's an example of another arithmetic progression. So we could have 50, 60, 70, 80 and so on and as you can see there's a common difference we're adding 10 each time also we could have it going down so we could have 20 17 14 11 and so on and as you see there's a common difference we're going down by three each time so these are arithmetic progressions where we're adding or subtracting the same amount each time there's a common difference and a geometric progression is where we've got a sequence of numbers where we're multiplying by the same amount each time. There's a common ratio. So as you can see, from 3 to 6, we're multiplying by 2. From 6 to 12, we're multiplying by 2. 12 to 24, multiply by 2. 24 to 48, multiply by 2, and so on. So here are some more geometric progressions. We could have 1, 5, 125, 625, and so on. And here the common ratio is 5. We're multiplying by 5 each time. So that is a geometric progression. Now, geometric progressions can get smaller. So, for instance, if we started off with 100 and we multiplied by 0 0.5 and multiplied by 0 0.5 and multiplied by 0 0.5 and so on, if the common ratio was a 0 point number, the sequence of the geometric progression would get smaller rather than larger. And that's it. So these are arithmetic progressions in geometric progressions. So an arithmetic progression is where we've got a sequence of numbers where we're adding the same amount each time. If it's a positive number we're adding, it's getting bigger. If it's a negative number we're adding each time, we're taking away, it would get smaller. And if we had a geometric progression, that's where we're multiplying by the same number each time. And that's it. So our next topic is simultaneous equations. And here we've got a pair of simultaneous equations. We've got 3x minus y equals 23, and 2x plus 3y is equal to 8. So whenever we get simultaneous equations, what we want to do is cancel out one of the letters. We want to add or subtract the equations so that one of the letters disappears. So as you can see here, we've got minus y and we've got 3y. Now, if we had minus 3y and 3y, we could add them together to get 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply this top equation by 3 to begin with. So let's number them, 1 and 2. So we've got equation 1 and equation 2. We're going to do 3 times equation 1. So whenever we do 3 times equation 1, well, multiplying this by 3 gives us 3 times 3x is 9x. Then 3 times minus y, well, that's going to be minus 3y. And 3 times 23, well, 3 times 23 is 69. Then we've got equation 2, which is 2x plus 3y equals 8. 
We've got one equation with minus 3y and we've got one equation with 3y. So that's fantastic. What we can do now is we can add these two equations together and our minus 3y and our 3y will add together to give us 0. So we'll just be left with x's and that's fantastic. Okay, so let's add the two equations together. So let's write the word add. I tend to avoid putting a plus or minus symbol just in case if it was a subtract I put a minus here in front of the 2 and make it confused and think it's a minus 2x. So I write add or sub. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add these two equations together. So 9x plus 2x, well that would be 11x. Minus 3y plus 3y, well that's 0, so they cancel out. And finally we've got 69 plus 8, that's equal to 77. So we've got 11x equals 77. Now we can divide by 11 and divide by 11 and we get that x equals 7. So x equals 7. So that's fantastic. So we know x is equal to 7, so let's now find y. So let's substitute this x equals 7 into one of our equations. And I'm going to substitute it into equation 2 just because we have positive 3y. And let's write that down. So sub x equals 7 into 2, just to show what we're doing. So whenever we substitute x equals 7 into this equation, we get 2 times 7, so that's 14, plus 3y equals 8. Now we're going to solve this equation, so minus 14 and minus 14. Well, we had 14 plus 3y, and we took away the 14, so we're just left with 3y. And on the right-hand side, we've got 8 take away 14, that's going to be equal to negative 6. Now we're going to divide both sides by 3, and whenever we divide both sides by 3, well, 3y divided by 3 is just y, and negative 6 divided by 3 is equal to negative 2. So that means we've got our answers. We've got x equals 7, and y equals negative 2. And let's just check our answer. Now we substitute x into equation 2 to find our value of y. Let's now substitute both of them into equation 1. So let's check in 1. So check in 1. Well if we put these numbers, if we substitute these numbers into equation 1, we've got 3 times x, so that's 21. 3 times 7 is 21. Minus y. y is minus 2, so we're going to do minus minus 2. And that's meant to be equal to 23. So let's check it. 21 minus minus 2, that's 21 plus 2, and that's 23, so that's right. So we know we've got this question right, and that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. So our next question says, solve the simultaneous equations 2x plus 3y equals 1, and 7x plus 2y equals negative 22. And I've chosen these numbers on purpose because what we're going to have to do now is multiply both equations by certain numbers to get uh, the same number in front of either the x's or y's. So let's call our equations equation 1 and equation 2. Now we could cancel out our x's, so we could multiply the top equation by 7 to get 14x, and we could double equation 2 to get 14x, and we could cancel those. Or we could cancel our y's, so we could multiply, let's see if we've got 3 and 2, let's get 6, so we can multiply our top equation by 2 and our bottom equation by 3, and that would give us 6y and 6 6y. And because they're both 6y's, we would then take the equations away from each other to get 0. Let's actually do that. Let's cancel our y's. So let's multiply equation 1 by 2, because we want to get 6y. So we're going to do 2 times 1. And when we do 2 times equation 1, we get, well, multiplying this whole equation by 2 would be 4x plus 6y equals 2. Now, we've got equation 2. But we want to get 6y, so let's now multiply this whole equation by 3. So let's do 3 times equation 2. And when we do that, we get, multiplying these all by 3, we get 3 times 7x is 21x. 3 times 2y, well, that's going to be plus 6y. And 3 times minus 22, well, that's going to be minus 66. So this is great because we've now got two equations, both with 6y's in them. Now what we can do is we can now take away these equations from each other. Now, the only thing is that whenever we take these away, we're going to have 4x take away 21x, which would be negative 17x and so on. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to write this top equation again, just beneath this other one. So I'm going to write 4x plus 6y equals 2. Just so that whenever I take these equations away from each other, I'm going to get 17x rather than minus 17x. So now let's put a line beneath them, and let's say subtract. So we're going to subtract these equations from each other. So 21x take away 4x, that's 17x. 6y take away 6y, well that's 0, they cancel out. And then we've got minus 66 take away 2. So when we've got minus 66 take away 2, we're going to go down another 2, so it's going to be minus 68. So we've now got 17x equals minus 68. So let's divide both sides of this equation by 17. So divide by 17 and divide by 17, and we're going to get that x equals negative 4. So we now know that x is equal to negative 4. We can substitute that into either equation 1 or equation 2 to get our y. Let's substitute it into equation 1. So equation 1, so sub x equals negative 4 into 1. And when we do that, we get, well, 2 times x, so that's going to be 2 times negative 4, and 2 times negative 4 is negative 8, plus 3y equals 1. Now, if we want to solve this, we want to get rid of our negative 8, so let's add 8 to both sides, so add 8 
and add 8. So that would give us 3y equals, and 1 plus 8 is 9. And divide by 3, and divide by 3, and we get y is equal to 3. So our answers are x equals negative 4, and y equals 3. And again, we can check our answer in equation 2. Check in 2. And when we do that, we get, well, 7 times x, well, 7 times minus 4 will be minus 28. Then we've got plus 2y, well y is equal to 3, so 2 times 3 is 6, so we're going to add 6, and that should be equal to negative 22. And let's just check it, negative 28 plus 6 would be negative 22, so that is equal to negative 22, so we're right, we know that our answers would have to be x is equal to negative 4 and y is equal to 3. Okay, let's have a look at our next question. A wordy context maybe where you're buying so many of something and so many of something else and you're given the price and so on, and you've got to create your own simultaneous equations and solve them. So let's have a look at the typical question. So we've got five adult tickets and three child tickets cost £58, and two adult tickets and eight child tickets cost £47. Find the cost of each type of ticket. So we've got our two equations. We've got five adult tickets. Well, let's let an adult ticket be x pounds, and let's let a child ticket be y pounds. So let's make our equations. We've got 5x plus 3y is equal to 58 pound, so equals to 58. And then we've got 2x plus 8y, and that's equal to 47 pound. So we've got our two equations. Now what we want to do is either get the same numbers in front of our x's and y's, or the same but one being positive and one being negative, because if they're both the same, we can take them away from each other, or if they're both the same but one's positive and one's negative, we can add the two equations to get zero. We could cancel out our x's or we can cancel out our y's. Just for fun, I'm going to cancel out our x's this time. So I'm going to actually cancel out our x's. So I'm going to multiply our top equation, this equation 1, by 2 to get 10x. I'm going to multiply the second equation, equation 2, by 5 to get 10x as well. And then what I'm going to do is take the two equations away from each other. So let's do 2 times equation 1. And when we do 2 times equation 1, we get, well, multiplying these all by 2, we'd get 10x plus, multiplying 3y by 2 would be 6y equals, and multiplying 58 by 2 would be 116. And then multiplying equation 2 by 5, because we want to get 10x, so 5 times equation 2 would be, multiplying these all by 5, would give us 5 times 2x is 10x. 5 times 8y, well, that's going to be 40y. And then multiplying 47 by 5 would be 235. Now, we want to cancel out our 10x's. So if we've got 10x and 10x, we want to take them away to get 0. Now, because we're taking away, rather than 6y take away 40y, I'm actually going to write this top equation just beneath the other one again. So let's scroll down. And let's write 10x plus 6y equals 116. And let's write sub because we're going to subtract them from each other. So 10x take away 10x is 0. 40y take away 6y, well that's 34y. And then we've got 235 take away 116. And when we do that, we get an answer of 119 pounds or 119. So we now know that 34y equals 119. We can divide both sides by 34 to get y equals 119 divided by 34 is equal to 3.5 or 3.50. So we now know what y is, and that's the cost of a child ticket, which is 3.5 or 3.50. Let's find the cost of an adult ticket. So let's sub y equals 3.5, and we can choose either equation 1 or equation 2. I'm going to choose equation 2, so into 2. And when we substitute 3.5 in for the value of y into equation 2, we're going to get, we've got 2x plus, and then we've got 8 times 3.5. That's equal to 28, and that's equal to... 47. So we've got 2x plus 28 is equal to 47. So let's take away 28 from both sides. So that gives us 2x equals and 47 take away 28 was equal to 19. And then if we divide that by 2, we get x equals and dividing 19 by 2 is 9.5. So as the question says, find the cost of each type of ticket. So we've got an adult ticket, which is x. And that's going to be equal to 9.5 or 9.50. So let's write it as a price, 9.50. And a child ticket, which was equal to y, is equal to 3.50. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. And our next topic is solving simultaneous equations by using graphical approaches. In other words, drawing the graphs and finding out where the graphs meet and using that to find the answer to simultaneous equations. So here we've got a pair of simultaneous equations. So that's two equations at the same time. We've got y equals 3 minus x and y equals 2x minus 3. So to solve this, what we're going to do is we're going to draw suitable lines. In other words, we're going to draw the graph for y equals 3 minus x, and we're going to draw the graph for y equals 2x minus 3. And where those two straight lines meet will be our answer. 
So let's first of all draw the graph for y equals 3 minus x. So to draw this graph, I'm going to draw an xy table. So it's x and y, and I'm going to do a little table like so. And if you need a recap on this, if you go to corporatemaths.com and you go to linear graphs, there'll be a topic called drawing graphs using xy tables. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose some values for x, so 0, 1, 2, 3, and I'm going to work out the values for y. So y equals 3 take away x. So if I take away x from 3, I can find the value for y. So if x is equal to 0, well, 3 take away 0 is 3, so that means that y is 3. 3 minus x, well, if x is 1, it would be 3 minus 1, that's 2. If x is equal to 2, well, 3 minus 2 is 1, so that would be 1. And if x was equal to 3, I'd have 3 minus 3, which is 0. So the points in this graph will be 0, 3, so 0, 3. There will be 1, 2, so 1 across 2 up. There will be 2, 1, so 2 across 1 up. And there'll be three zero, so three across and zero up, like so. And if I get rid of my ruler and pencil, I can draw a nice straight line through those points, and it would look something like this. And that's it. That's the graph for y equals three minus x. Now, in a typical question, I'd imagine what they would do is draw one of these two lines for you, and you just have to draw the other one and then find out where they meet. Okay, let's have a look at our next one. So our next graph is y equals two x minus three. So we'll do an x y table x and y and we'll choose some points and again I just tend to use 0, 1, 2, 3 and I choose a few of them or in this case I choose four of them just so whenever I plot them I can see that all four of them are in a nice straight line if they're not in a straight line then I know I've done something wrong so what I'm going to do is so to find y we do 2 times x and we take away 3 so we're going to times all these numbers by 2 and then take away 3 so let's start off with 0 2 times 0 is 0 take away 3 would be minus 3 then we've got 1, well 2 times 1 is 2, take away 3 would be minus 1. Now we've got 2, 2 times 2 is 4, take away 3 is 1. And finally we've got 3, 2 times 3 is 6, take away 3 is 3. So we've got our coordinates, 0, 3, 1 minus 1, 2, 1 and 3, 3. So let's plot them, 0 minus 3, 1 minus 1, 2, 1 and 3, 3. I get our ruler and pencil, we'll draw a nice straight line through those points. And as you can see here, the two straight lines meet at the point 2, 1. This is the point of intersection here, 2, 1, there. So that means they meet at the point 2, 1. Now when we're solving simultaneous equations, what we're trying to do is find the value for x, and we're trying to find the value for y. So if we look at this point 2, 1, we're going 2 across, that means the x value is 2, because the coordinate's 2, 1. The first number is the answer for x, and the second number is the answer for y. So x is equal to 2, and y is equal to 1. And let's just check that. 2 across 1 up, the x value is 2, and the y value is 1. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is tally charts. And whenever you're doing a tally chart, it's important to know that whenever you've got to five people, you go 1, 2, 3, 4, and the fifth person is across. And then you just carry on. So here we've got a tally chart, and we've got Monday. There's five 10, 12, and that's the frequency 12. On Tuesday, there's 1, 2, 3, so let's complete this, 3. On Wednesday, the frequency 7, so we need to do 7, so that'll be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then we've got two more, 6, 7. On Thursday, let's count up in 5s, 5, 10, 15, and then another 4, that's going to be 19 people on Thursday. And finally, Friday, there's 10, so that's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and that's it. So tally charts, if you want to revise tally charts, it's video 321 on corporate maths. Our next topic is frequency tree. So here's a frequency tree, and we've got morning appointment, evening appointment. So we've got those 40 appointments all together. We know there's 23 in the morning and there's some in the evening. And then we've got on time, late, on time, late. So we've got 40 appointments all together, 23 are in the morning. So if we do 40 take away 23, we'll find out how many evening appointments there were. So 40 take away 23 is 17. So there must have been 17 evening appointments because they need to add together to be 40. Now if we focus on the 23 morning appointments, 21 were on time. So that means there must have been two that were late because 21 plus this number must be 23. So that must be two. And in the evening appointments where there were 17 altogether, 5 were late, so if we do 17 take away 5, that's 12. So 12 must have been on time. And that's it, so we've completed the frequency tree. And video 376 in corporate miles will give you more information on that. 
Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is two-way tables. And if you want to revise two-way tables, it's video 319 on corporate maths. So here we've got a two-way table with some subjects at the top, English and art, and then total. And then we've got our information about whether they passed the course or failed the course. And again, we've got total at the bottom. So we've been asked to complete this two-way table. Or well, we haven't, but I'm saying it now. We're going to complete this two-way table. Uh, so we've got, um, first of all, let's look at art. We've got 12 students that have failed art out of 19 in total. So 19 students studied art and 12 of them failed. So that's must have been quite a hard test. And we, we can find out how many students passed it because we know there's 19 altogether and 12 failed. So if we take that 12 away from 19, that leaves us with seven. So seven students must have passed the art course. Next, well, I'm looking at this top row here for how many students passed English and art, and we can find this total. We know 25 students passed English and seven students passed art. So if we add those two together, we can get the total. 25 plus seven is 32. So 32 students passed their courses. Next, I'm looking at these total. So we know 32 students passed the course and 13 failed their course. So if we add together the 32 and the 13, we can see how many students there are in total. So 32 add 13 is 45. So let's put that in. Next, let's look at the students that failed their courses. Well, altogether 13 students failed their course and 12 of them were from art. So that means that only one student failed English. Uh, so that means that we've got that number of one. And then finally, how many students studied English in total? Well, we've got 25 that passed and one that failed. So altogether, that'd be 26. And let's just check our answers. 26 plus 19 is 45. So that's a two-way table. So next topic is pictograms. So you can find videos on pictograms on video 161 and 162 on Corbett Mavs. So here's an example on a pictogram. So a pictogram uses symbols to represent a number. And here we've got a pictogram shows the information about the number of hours of sunshine in four cities during a day in June. So we've got Paris, Cork, London and Swansea. And we've got each circle here and we've got a key. And it's very important that if you are drawing a pictogram, you include a key. And we've got this key, a circle represents four hours. So that means that the whole circle represents four. Half a circle would represent a semicircle would represent two. A quarter of a circle would represent one. And three quarters of a circle would represent three. So let's have a look at Paris. We've got four. And then we've got another four, so that's eight. And then another two, so that's going to be ten altogether. Then you've got Cork, so that's four, eight, 12 so there's 12 hours of sunshine in cork london so you've got four and then another three so that's seven all together there and then you've got swansea and you've got four eight and then another one so that's nine all together there and the question says how many more hours of sunshine did paris have than london so paris had 10 and london had seven to find out how many more hours of sunshine we just need to take those away to find the difference 10 take away seven is three so the answer would be three hours Okay, and our next topic, our next topic is bar charts, and that's videos 147 and 148 in Cobra Mavs. And here's a typical question. We've got a bar chart, and we've been asked some questions about it. So here's a bar chart showing the number of ice cream sold going up vertically from zero up to 400. And we've got day of the week going across the horizontal axis, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And the first question says, on which two days were the same number of ice cream sold? So we're looking for the same number of ice cream sold. So we're looking for the bars being the same height. So if you look here, we've got Wednesday and Friday where we've got the bars that are the same height as each other. So that means that Wednesday and Friday would be the two days of the week where the same number of ice creams were sold. So Wednesday and Friday. Okay, the next question says, how many more ice creams were sold on Thursday than Friday? So if we look at Thursday, we've got our bar going up here and we've gone past 300. So let's see what this number would be. So we've gone up from zero up to 100. So let's see how many squares there are gone up from zero to 100. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. So if we divide 100 by five, we get that's equal to 20. That must mean we're going up in 20. So let's check 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, yeah. So if we're at 300, that's gonna be 320 and 340. So altogether, there were 340 ice cream sold on Thursday. And on Friday, well, we've got 100, then it's gonna be 120, 40, 60, and 80. And then another one would be 200, so yep, so that's 180. So it says, how many more ice creams were sold on Thursday than Friday? So if we take away 180 from 340, that would tell us how many more ice creams were sold. And that would be 160. 
Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is geo bar charts. And that's video 148B on corporate maps. So here we've got a geo bar chart. We've got this key that shows us in blue is last year. And in yellow, we've got this year. And we're told the geo bar chart shows the number of goals scored in the cup by three ice hockey teams. So we've got the teams at the bottom, the Flames. And these two bars are for the Flames last year and this year. We've got the Steelers last year and this year. And we've got the Blaze last year and this year. And Catherine says that the three teams scored more goals in the cup last year than they did this year. Is she right? So let's have a look at the Flames. So the Flames scored six goals last year. So let's write six above that bar. And this year, the Flames scored 14 goals. So the Flames scored a lot more goals this year than last year. The Steelers, they scored seven goals last year. You can see it's seven because in between six and eight. So that's seven last year and seven this year. They've scored the same number of goals last year and this year. And the Blaze, they scored 11 goals last year. You can see it's 11 because in between 10 and 12. So it's 11 last year. And this year they scored four. So Catherine says the three teams scored more goals last year than this year. So let's add up what they got last year. So let's write last year. And last year they scored six for the Flames, seven for the Steelers, and 11 for the Blaze. So let's add those up and see what we get. Six plus seven is 13, plus 11 is 24. So 24 goals were scored last year. Let's have a look at this year. So this year the Flames scored 14, the Steelers scored seven, and the Blaze scored four. So we're gonna do 14 plus seven plus four. And 14 plus seven is 21, plus four is 25. So we've got one more goal this year than last year. Now, the Catherine said that three teams scored more goals in the Cup last year than this year. Well, no, they didn't score more last year. They scored more this year. So is she right? No. They scored more this year. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is composite bar charts, and that's video 148A on Corporate Maths. So here's a composite bar chart, and it's a bar chart, but yeah, as you can see, each of the bars is split up into different sections. So we've got this bar for January, and in if we have a look at our key, in pink we've got hot drinks, and in grey we've got cold drinks. We've then got for February the hot drinks and the cold drinks, and for March we've got the hot drinks and the cold drinks. And we're told this composite bar chart shows us information about the number of drinks sold over three months. So if we look at the bars and we look at the totals, in January we can see the 600 drinks sold, in February we can see the 650. 50 drinks sold and in March is 750 drinks sold but also because it's a composite bar chart we can actually see the breakdown of cold drinks and hot drinks sold as well by you looking at each of these regions so for instance for January there's 450 hot drinks sold and there's 150 cold drinks sold and we can see the same for February and March and the question says in which two months were the same number of hot drinks sold so let's have a look at our key. In the question, we wanted to find the two months that got the same number of hot drinks sold. So that's going to be the pink sections of each bar. So if we look at the bar for January and the bar for February, they both got up to 450. So that means that in January, there's 450 hot drinks sold. And in February, there's 450 hot drinks sold. Whereas in March, there's not as many hot drinks sold. Maybe it's a bit warmer. And in March, there's only actually 300 hot drinks sold. So in which two months were the same number of hot drinks sold? That will be January and February. Our next topic is line graphs. So here we've got a line graph and we've got frequency going up vertically and we've got the time of the day going across horizontally. So we've got 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 going up vertically. And then we've got the time 9 o'clock, 11, 1 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock and 7 p.m. So we're going up in two hours there as we go across. And the question says, Sally records the number of cars in a car park every two hours. So this is the number of cars in the car park at each of the times. She began at 9 a.m. and finished at 7 p.m. The line graph shows her results. When were the most cars in the car park? So that would be whenever the line graph's at its highest point. And as you can see here, uh, it had 90 cars at 1 p.m. And the question said, when were most cars in the car park? So that would be 1 p.m. The next question said, how many less cars were in the car park at 3 p.m. than 1 p.m.? So if we look at 1 p.m., well, we know there's 90 cars then. And if we look at 3 p.m., we've got us just above the 60. Let's see what we're going up in here. So we've got we've got 10 squares, and that's 20 cars. So 20 divided by 10 is 2. So we're going up in 2s. So that would be, if we counted up the 2s, that would be 20. So we've got 60, 62. So if we do 90, take away 62, that would tell us how many less cars were in the car park at 3 o'clock than 1 o'clock. And that would be 28. 
Next topic is pie charts. So here we've got a table, we've got rugby team, and we've got frequency. So 90 rugby fans were asked which team they supported, England, France, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. And we've got 20 supported England, five supported France, 15 supported Ireland, 25 supported Scotland, and 25 supported Wales. Okay, and we're gonna draw a pie chart for this information. So if you draw a pie chart, typically there'll be a circle drawn for you, with a line there going from the center up to the top for you. And we're gonna draw a pie chart for with it. So to draw a pie chart, the first thing you need to do is add up the frequencies. Well, we know there's 90 rugby fans, so if we add them all up, we'll find there's 90. Then we need to divide the whole circle, 360, by that number of people. So 360 divided by 90 is equal to 4. So that means that each person is given 4 degrees in the circle, so each person is 4 degrees. Now, 20 people supported England. Now, each of those people get four degrees. So if we multiply that by four, we'll see how, what size of angle they should have in the pie chart. 20 times four is equal to 80. So the angle we're gonna draw for England fans would be 80 degrees. Next, we're gonna multiply five by four, and we're gonna multiply all these numbers by four because each person gets four degrees. So we're gonna multiply by four, multiply by four, multiply by four, and multiply by four. So five times four is 20 degrees. So we'll draw 20 degrees for the French fans. 15 times four is 60 degrees for the Irish fans. That should be much bigger. Then we've got 25 times four. 25 times four is 100, so 100 degrees for the Scottish fans. And 25 times four, 25 times four is 100. And then we've got all our angles. Now I like to add these up to make sure I get 360. 80 plus 20 is 100, plus 60 is 160, plus another 100 is 260, plus another 100 is 360 degrees. And that's it. So whenever you draw on a pie chart, you need to add up the frequencies, then divide 360 by the total frequency to find the number of degrees per person or per item or whatever you're looking at, and then multiply all the frequencies by that number to find the angle you should draw. Okay, so we're gonna draw 80 degrees for the English fan. So let's start off by going to our pie chart, and we're gonna get our protractor and we're going to line it up like so so that the cross goes in the in the center of the circle like so and then the zero goes at the top and we're drawing an 80 degree angle so we're going to go around to where 80 degrees is so that's here and we'll do a little dot now you'll move your protractor and you will draw a nice straight line so let's move our protractor and you draw a nice straight line from the center through that point to the edge of the pie chart like so so that's for the English fans, so let's label it for English fans, so England, so like so, and that's that sector done. And it's an 80 degree angle, so we can put that in as well if we want to. Next, we're gonna draw an angle of 20 degrees for the French fans. So we're gonna get our protractor, we're gonna to have to turn it so that we put our zero along the line we've just drawn. You always put the zero on the line you've just drawn, or if there's no lines there, you have the one at the top. So we started off with the zero at the top line because that was the only line. Now we've drawn this line, we're gonna put zero there, and we're gonna draw an angle of 20 degrees. So we go to zero, we go around to where 20 degrees is. So that's here, so put a dot, and then move our protractor and draw a nice straight line through there with a ruler and a pencil. So it looks something like that. So that's 20 degrees. You don't necessarily need to put the angles in, but we do need to put it in. We do need to label that it's France. Okay, next was Ireland. And if we go back and look, that was 60 degrees. So we're going to get our protractor. We're gonna turn it. So the zero is along the line we've just drawn. So we're gonna rotate it slightly. Again, the cross has to go in the center of the circle and zero is on the line like so. And then we're gonna go from zero around to 60 degrees for the Irish fans. So to there, 60, move our protractor. So move our protractor and draw a nice straight line from the center of the circle through that point and to the edge. And again, what we're gonna do is we're gonna label it for Ireland. And we can put the angle in if we want to, so that's 60 degrees, so you don't need to do that bit, but again, label it for Ireland. Next was the Scottish fan, so that was 100 degrees. So again, take our protractor and rotate it so that the zero is on that new line like so. So start off at zero and we're going to go around to 100 degrees. So we're going to start on the outside, go around 10, 20, all the way around to 80, 90 and 100. So remember, we are dealing with the outside numbers here. So don't look at this in inside 100. We're dealing with the outside numbers. So we're going zero all the way around to 100 there. Again, move our protractor and draw a nice straight line from the center of the pie chart through that point to the edge. And that will be for the Scottish fans. So Scotland. 100 degrees and finally the last sector will be for wheels that should be already drawn for us for 100 degrees because that's all that's left but let's check it so let's take our protractor and rotate it and when you do that you can clearly see that is 100 degrees and that's it okay so we've had a look at drawing pie charts now let's look at reading them or interpreting pie charts and that's video 164 in corporate maths 
So we've been told 180 year age students were asked how they travel to school and the pie chart shows their responses. So we've got bus, some travel to school by bus, some walk, some travel by car and some cycle. And we're asked what fraction of the students travel by bus. So sometimes when we're given a pie chart, we're asked to find a fraction or a percentage. So we could be asked what fraction of the students walk to school or what percentage of students travel by bus to school. And to do that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the whole circle, the whole pie chart, and figure out what percentage or what fraction is that region. So if we look at this sector for bus, we can see it's got a right angle. That means it's a 90 degree angle. And a 90 degree angle will be a quarter of a full circle. So that means that this is a quarter off the pie chart. So what fraction of students travel by bus? A quarter off them. If we were asked what percentage of students travelled by bus, that would be 25% because a quarter is 25%. And think back to our fractions, decimals and percentages. If we were asked what fraction of students walk to school, because that's 120 degrees, to find what fraction of students walk to school, we would write that as a fraction. We would write down 120 out of the whole circle, which is 360, and we would cancel that down. We could divide both of these by 10 to get 12 over 36, and then we could divide both of them by 12 to get one over three. So if we were asked what fraction of students walk to school, the answer would be one third. If we were asked what fraction of students travelled by car, we would write 80 out of 360 or 80 over 360 and then just cancel it down. It can be useful to remember some key angles whenever we're dealing with pie charts. So for instance, if you've got 180 degrees, a straight line, 180 degrees would be a half. If we had 120 degrees, because three 120 degrees is 360 degrees, that means 120 degrees would be a third. If you've got 90 degrees, that would be a quarter, as we've seen, a quarter. If you've got 60 degrees, that's a sixth, because six sixties is 360 degrees. Another useful one to remember would be 36 degrees. That would be a tenth, because 10 times 36 is 360. So those are some useful ones to remember. But if you don't remember it, or if you're given an angle such as 80 degrees, what you can just do is write that out of 360. 360 or over 360 and cancel it down. So our next question says, how many students walk to school? So we've got 120 degrees for walk, so that's going to be a third. So that means that a third of the students walk to school. And altogether, there were 180 students. So we need to work out a third of 180. And to get a third of 180, we're just going to do 180 divided by 3. To get a third of a number, you just divide it by 3. So 180 divided by 3 is equal to 60. So that means that 60 students walk to school. If we wanted to find out how many students travelled by bus to school, because it's a quarter, we would find a quarter of 180, and so on. And we're going to look at the probability scale. So here we've got the probability scale, where we've got zero is impossible. So if someone's got a probability of zero, that means it's impossible, it cannot happen. For instance, rolling a seven on an ordinary dice. If we had an ordinary dice and we roll it, we the highest number we can get is a six, so we can't get a seven, so that's impossible. So it's got a probability of zero. Then we've got in the middle here, we've got even chance. So in other words, if you flip a coin, getting a head or a tail, the probability of each one would be 0.5, an even chance. Anything in between those, so anything bigger than zero or less than 0.5 is unlikely to happen. Now, some of them are very unlikely, perhaps winning the lottery, that's going to be almost zero. It's very, 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 very unlikely. Whereas maybe, you know, rolling a number two or three on a dice, because there's two out of six and that's a third, so it'd be around here somewhere. So that's quite unlikely. So you've got anything between between 0 and 0.5 is unlikely. Then you've got the probability of 1, well that's certain to happen, so for instance if we chose a day at random and it ending in the letter Y, well that's certain because every day ends in the letter Y, so it has to happen, so then that's certain, so that's 1. And anything in between 0.5 and 1, anything in between them is likely happening. So in other words, a day chosen at random in July being sunny, well that's likely, so it'll be in there somewhere, and that's it. So this is the probability scale. And if you want to do some questions on those, if you look at video 251 on corporate maths, there's practice questions beside those. But also remember, you've got that question, that bumper booklet in the description below. Next, let's look at some probability questions. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is probability, and that's where we're going to express the probabilities as fractions, decimals, or percentages. And that's video 245 in corporate maths. So here we've got a question, and it says, Thomas has 12 tiles, each with a letter on it. So we've got these 12 tiles, they spell out Corbett Mavs, C-O-R-B-E-T-T-M-A-T-H-S. And we've got these 12 tiles, and each of them has a letter on it. And he's going to pick one of them at random. And we've been asked to find, what's the probability that it is the letter S? So what we're going to do is we're going to write this as a fraction. And first of all, let's consider how many different possible answers he could have. Well, altogether, there's 12 possible tiles he could pick. So we're going to put 12 on the bottom of our fraction on the denominator. And then we're going to put how many S's there are on the top. So there's one tile with an S on it. So the probability that he could get the letter S is 1 out of 12 or 1 12th, like so. 
because there's one S and there's 12 tiles altogether. Next, we've been asked to find the probability that it is the letter T. So again, he could pick any of these 12 letters, so it's out of 12. And in terms of the ones with T on it, there's one, two, and three tiles with the letter T on it. So that means he could choose any of those, so it could be three out of 12. So the probability that the tile he picked at random has a T on it would be three out of 12, or three twelves. Now this fraction could be simplified. The three and 12 are both divisible by three. They're both in the three times tables. So if we divided both of those by three, we would get one quarter. But unless you're told in a probability question to simplify a fraction, you can write it like so. You could write it as three twelves and only simplify if you're told to. So the probability of getting the letter T would be three twelves. Okay, let's have a look at our last question. So our last question says, what's the probability that it is not the letter C? So altogether there's 12 tiles, one of them's got a C on it, and 11 don't. So the question says, what's the probability that it's not the letter C? Well, altogether there's 12 tiles, and 11 do not have the letter C on it, so the probability of it not being the letter C would be 11 out of 12. Another way to do that is to say, well, the probability of a C is 1 12th, and to take that away from 1, and that would leave you with 11 twelfths, and that's how to find the probability of something not happening, to do 1 take away the probability of it happening. But that's it. So to write something as a probability is a fraction, you put down the total number of possible outcomes on the bottom of the fraction, so here you could have picked any of the 12 tiles that goes on the bottom, and how many of the ones that you're looking for on the numerator. So for the probability of an S, well, there's one S, so it's 1 out of 12, or 1 12th. The probability of a T, well, there's 3 tiles with the letter T on it, so it's 3 out of 12, or 3 twelfths. Or finally, the probability of not the letter C, well, there's 11 without the letter C on it, so it's 11 out of 12, or 11 twelfths. That's it. Okay, let's have a look at another probability question. So here's our question. It says there are only pink, yellow, green, and blue counters in a bag. So there's four different colors of counters in a bag, and the table shows the probability of picking each color. So the probability of picking a pink counter is 0.5. The probability of picking a green counter is 0.1. The probability of picking a blue counter is 0.2, and we don't actually know the probability of picking a yellow counter. And the question says find the missing probability, so that's the probability of picking a yellow counter. Because there's only pink, yellow, green, and blue counters in the bag, there's no other colours, that means it's certain that we're going to pick one of these colours. So that means that these probabilities will add together to give us one. So that means that if we add together 0.5, the missing probability, 0.1 and 0.2, they will add together to give us one. So if we add up the probabilities that we know, so if we add those probabilities together, we get 0.5 plus 0.1 is 0.6 plus 0.2 is 0.8. So that means the probability of picking a pink, green, or blue counter is 0.8. So to find the probability of finding the yellow, we're gonna take this away from one to see what's left. So one take away 0.8 is equal to 0.2. So that means the probability of picking a yellow counter would be 0.2, and that's it. So the next topic is actually the probability of something not happening, and that's video 250 in corporate maths. So as we looked at previously, the probability of something not happening is one take away the probability of it happening and that will tell you the probability of something not happening. So here we've got the probability of Hannah winning a competition is 0.28. So the chance of her winning a competition is 0.28. And we've been asked to find out the probability that Hannah does not win the competition. So to do that, we just need to take away 0.28 from one. So we just do one, take away 0.28, and that would be equal to 0.72. So if the probability of Hannah winning the competition is 0.28, the probability of her not winning the competition would be 0.72, because one of these two things will have to happen, so that means they have to add together to give us one. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is expectation, which is video 248A in Corporate Maths. Now, if you know the probability of something happening, and you know how many times an experiment or something has taken place, if you multiply those two things together, you'll find out how many times you should expect something to happen. So let's have a look at an example. We've got a factory makes 6,000 plates each day. So the factory makes 6,000 plates each day. And the probability that a plate is faulty is 0.0035. So it's quite unlikely, it's very unlikely that one's faulty. Um, it's got a probability of 0.0035. And we've been asked to find out how many faulty plates would be expected in one day. So if we multiply how many plates that are made by the probability of one of them being faulty, we'll find out how many faulty plates we'd expect. So if we do 6,000, multiply by 0.0035, that would tell us how many faulty plates we would expect. And that is 21. So we would expect 21 faulty plates. 
if you're asked to find out how many plates weren't faulty, then you could just take the 21 away from 6,000 and that'll tell you how many plates would be not faulty. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is called relative frequency or sometimes called experimental probability. And that's video 248 in corporate maths. So here we've got some letters and I've done an experiment where we've picked a letter at random from the letters A, B or C. And the letters picked at random were, and I've done it seven times, were A, A, B, A, C, B, A. So a letter's been picked at random from the letters A, B, or C, and we've done the experiment seven times, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times, and these are our results. So if we were asked to find the relative frequency or experimental probability of an A, we just write down what fraction of our results were A's. So as there were seven altogether, it would be out of seven, and there's one, two, three, four A's. So the relative frequency of an A would be four sevens. If we're asked to find the relative frequency of a B, well, we've done the experiment seven times, so it'll be out of seven, and there's two Bs, so the relative frequency of a B would be two sevens. And if we're asked to find the relative frequency of a C, it'll be one seventh, because there's one C out of the seven results. Okay, so relative frequency or experimental probability is just found by writing the number of successes over the total number of trials. Okay, let's have a look at another type of question now. So this time we've been given a table and we've got two people, Susan and Helen, and they've done an experiment. And Susan's done the experiment 20 times. She span a spinner, she span a spinner 20 times. And on that spinner, there's different letters and we're told the number of Bs that she got whenever she span it 20 times was it. So if we're asked to find the relative frequency of spin in a B, so because she spanned the spinner 20 times, it would be out of 20. And because she got eight Bs, the number of successes is eight, we write eight out of 20 or eight twentieths like so. We could write this as a decimal or we could even simplify our fraction. Simplifying our fraction, well dividing both of these by four would give us two fifths. So we could write an answer of eight twentieths or two fifths. If the question doesn't tell you to simplify it, we don't have to, so we could just write eight twentieths. Alternatively, because Helen's result is a decimal number, we could also give it as a decimal number. We could write, well, two-fifths as a decimal will be 0.4. Okay, let's look at our next person, Helen. And Helen spun the spinner more times. She spun it 120 times. And this time, we don't know how many Bs she's got, but we know the relative frequency of her getting a B. We know the relative frequency is 0.35. Now, to find the number of Bs that Helen got, all we need to do is multiply the relative frequency by her number of spins. Thinking back to, we had a topic called expectation, where to find how many times you expect something to happen, you just multiply the number of trials by the probability. So if you multiply the, the relative frequency of the experimental probability by the number of trials, it'll tell you how many successes you had. So if we multiply 120 by 0.35, that will tell you how many times Helen Spinner landed on a B whenever she spun it. So that would be 42. Okay, so our next topic is listing outcomes, and I really like this topic, and this is part of the Corporate Miles Revision card, and we've got Emily is making a pizza with two toppings. So she's gonna make a pizza with two toppings, and she can choose from ham, chicken, olives and pepperoni. So you can choose any two toppings and they've got to be different toppings. You can't go for like double ham or double olives. So she's going to choose two different toppings and we've been asked to list down all the possible combinations. So whenever you're listing outcomes, it's very important that you don't just work in a random manner. So you don't just go like ham and pepperoni, olive and chicken, chicken and pepperoni. You work through it in like a systematic way. So what I mean by that is you start off with choosing ham and you choose down what can she have with ham. So she could have ham and chicken, so HC. She could have ham and olives, H O, and she could have ham and pepperoni, so that's HP. Next, we've done all the possible combinations with ham, now we're going to move to chicken. So she could have chicken and olives, so chicken and olives, or she could have chicken and pepperoni, so that's chicken and pepperoni, CP. So we've done all the combinations with chicken, now we move to olives. Now with olives, we can only have olives and pepperoni, so she can have olives and pepperoni, and that's it. So in terms of if she had these possible toppings, these four possible toppings, and she had to pick two different ones, the possible combinations would be ham and chicken, ham and olives, ham and pepperoni, she could have chicken and olives, chicken and pepperoni, or she could have olives and pepperoni. So they would be the possible combinations. Okay, and that's it. And this is part of the Corporate Miles Revision Card and Listing Outcomes. So if you have a look at that revision card, that'll be useful for you as well. Okay, so our next topic is sample spaces. And here we've got a sample space question. And it says the counter is picked at random from each bag. So we've got two bags, bag one and bag two. In bag one, the counters have the numbers two, one, and five on it. And in bag two, the counters have the numbers four, three, and two on them. And it says the counters picked at random from each bag and the numbers are multiplied together. And we've got this table and this will help us find all the results. So we've got bag one and in bag two, we've got two, three and four and the numbers are being times together. So we could get a one and a two. Well, one times two is two. 
we could get a two and a two. Well, two times two is four. We could get a we could get a five and a two. Well, five times two is ten. We could get a one and a three. Well, multiplying those together is three. A two and a three. Well, that would be six. Multiplying them, five times three would be fifteen. One times four would be four. Two times four would be eight. And finally, we could get a four and a five, or a five and a four, and that would be twenty when we multiply them. And the question says, what's the probability of getting a multiple of four? Okay, so let's look at our outcomes and see which ones are multiples of four. Well, two is not a multiple of four. Four is a multiple of four. Ten's not. Three's not. Six isn't. Fifteen's not. Four is. Eight is. And twenty is. So out of our nine possible outcomes, four of them would be multiples of four. So our probability of picking a multiple of four would be four out of nine, or four ninths, and that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. And our next topic is scatter graphs, and they are videos 165 up to 168 on corporate maths. So here's a scatter graph, and it shows the cost of 10 plumbing jobs. So we've got these 10 plumbing jobs. You've got the duration from naught up to five hours, and the cost from naught up to 300 pound. And you've got all the points there. And our first question says, what type of correlation is showing? So because the points are going upwards, in other words, as the hours are going up, the cost is going up, that is a positive correlation, so positive. So if the points were coming downwards in this direction, it would be a negative correlation. And if the points were just scattered around everywhere, that would be no correlation. Okay, our next question. Our next question says, draw a line of best fit. And I've just drawn a line of best fit like so. I've got my ruler and a pencil. I've drawn a line going straight through as many of the points as possible, uh, or as close to the points as possible. This point here is an outlier, so I've, I've just ignored that one. And I've drawn my line of best fit, so it's as close to possible to these points. So I've tried to sort of minimize the distance between my line and all the points that I've been given. Um, I normally go for roughly half on either side, but because some are a bit lower down here, I've sort of put it around there okay um, now the good thing is with lines of best fit the examiner has a template that they put over and they've got sort of a range of areas where you can put your line of best fit so um, you know you don't need to sort of worry too much about it as long as you think it looks good okay so our first question says draw a line of best fit We've done that our next question says estimate the cost of a job lasting two and a half hours so if we go down to our horizontal axis here for hours, two and a half hours would be here. And if we get our ruler and pencil, and so use a ruler and pencil whenever you're doing this and go up to the line of best fit and then go across, you can clearly see that the cost would be £150. So our estimate for the cost of a job lasting two and a half hours would be £150. Next, the question says, estimate the duration of a job costing £180. So if we go to £180 on the vertical axis here, and we get our ruler and pencil, and we draw across to our line of best fit, and then we draw down, we can see that's three and a half hours. So the answer would be 3.5 hours. And that's it. Okay, so we've drawn a line of best fit, and we've used that to make some estimations. Okay, let's have a look at the next part. The next part says, circle the outlier. So here we've got a scatter graph, and you can see this point just stands out. It just stands out from all the rest, so it's what we call an outlier. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is stem leaf diagrams. So stem leaf diagrams is one of two topics which differ really between the exam boards at foundation level, where edXL cover stem leaf diagrams and frequency polygons, whereas OCR and AQA don't. So if you study for edXL foundation, you need to watch this and learn this and do the practice questions and write notes and so on. If you're studying for OCR or AQA, it's only two minutes. I would probably watch it because it's good practice for the mode and the range and the median anyway. Uh, but feel free to skip ahead if you do OCR or AQA, but it's up to you. Okay. Our next topic is stem and leaf. So stem and leaf is a great way to represent information in order. So represent numbers in order. And we've got here, this would be videos 169 and 170 in corporate maths. And the question says, the following stem and leaf diagram shows the times taken for 15 people to complete a jigsaw. So we've got the key, and that's very important for a stem and leaf. So three line one means 31 minutes. So we're dealing with minutes here. And we've got 31, 39, 40, 43, 46, 51, 57, 57, 58, 59, 60, 63, 64, 66, and 75 minutes. And the question said, what is the modal time taken? So the modal is the most common. So we've got 31, 39, 48, and so on. So if you look here, we've got 57 and 57. So the modal time taken would be 57 minutes. The next question said, find the range of the times taken. So the range is the largest, take away the smallest. So the largest amount of time taken was 75 minutes. And we're going to 
take away the shortest time, which was 31 minutes, and 75 take away 31 would be equal to 44 minutes. So the range, the difference between the largest and the smallest is 44 minutes. And the last question says, find the median time taken. So the median is the middle value. So I like to do this by crossing off the values in pencil, of course, so crossing off the smallest, and then the largest, the next smallest, which would be 39, then the next largest, 66, the next smallest, 40, 64, the next smallest, 43, the next largest, 63, the next smallest, 46, the next largest, 60, the next smallest, 51, the next smallest, 59, and then cross off, cross off, and we're left with 57. So the median time taken is 57 minutes. And make sure that with this seven, you remember it's 57. So it's 57 minutes. That's it. So it's a stem and leaf. So it's very important whenever you're doing a stem and leaf diagram to read the key. And if you're drawing one yourself, make sure you include a key. So our next topic is the mode, and here's part of the Corp Maps revision cards. So the mode is the value that appears most often. So here we've got the number of goals scored in eight football matches, and they are two, four, one, zero, three, two, four, and two. And as you can see, two appears most often. It appears three times. So the mode is two. So the most common result. Okay, our next one. Our next one is the median, and the median is found by arranging the numbers in order and then selecting the middle value. So here we've got the number of goals scored in seven netball matches. So we've got 47, 41, 51, 58, 32, 55, and 49. Now we're looking for the median, so that's the middle value. So let's arrange them in order, so 32, and then we've got 44, and then 47, and then 49, and then 51, 55 and 58. Now we're looking for the median, which is the middle value. So I tend to cross them off in pencil, okay, in case I need to rub them out. So cross off the smallest, cross off the biggest, cross off the next smallest and the next biggest, the next one and the next one. And we're left with 49. So 49 is the median, it's the middle value once they've been arranged in order. That question was quite nice because we had an odd number of numbers, so there was definitely one in the middle. So what happens if there's an even number of values? So let's have a look. We've got nine, five, four, 10, seven, and one. So let's arrange these in order. So one's the smallest, then four, five, seven, nine, and 10. Cross off the smallest, cross off the biggest, cross off the next two. And then we've got five and seven in the middle. Well, to find the median, that's in the middle of those two values. So in the middle of five and seven would be six. So the median for this one would be six. If the two numbers in the middle are the same, well, then there would just be that value. Because for instance, if it was here, eight and eight, in the middle of eight and eight is eight. Okay, our next average. Our next average is the mean. So the mean is found by adding up all the values and dividing by the number of values. So here we've got the ages of five basketball players, and they are 23, 30, 20, 27, and 30. So let's start by adding these values up. So 23 plus 30 plus 20 plus 27 plus 30. And the nice thing is M1 is a calculator paper, so let's add them up on our calculator. And that gives us 130, so the total is 130. Now we need to divide by the number of values. So there's one, two, three, four, five values. So if we take 130 and divide it by five, that will tell us the mean. So dividing that by five gives us an answer of 26. So the mean is 26, and the mean is found by adding up all the values and dividing by the number of values. Okay, and the next topic, the next topic is the range. And the range tells us how spread out our data is, our data is. So we've got our data, our data, and we've got the range is the largest, subtract the smallest. And the number of shots taken in Crazy Golf are five, eight, four, three, five, two, and seven. And we want to find the range. We need to find our largest value. So our largest value is eight, and our smallest value is two, so take away two, and eight take away two is equal to six. So the range for this information, avoiding the word data, data, is equal to, the range for this information is six. It's the difference between the largest and the smallest value. Okay, our next topic. Okay, sometimes we're asked to find the mode from a table. So here we've got some information, and we've got the age of some people, and they're five, or people, or animals, or whatever it is, with the age of something, and the ages are five, six, seven, and eight, and we've got the frequency. So there's two five-year-olds, two six-year-olds, five seven-year-olds and one eight-year-old. Now, whenever you find in the mode from a table, it changes the word from often the mode age to the modal age. And we're trying to find the modal age. That just means the most common age. And remember, we had five seven-year-olds. So that means that that was the most common age. So the mode here would be the one with the highest frequency, which is seven. So the mode or the modal age is seven. Our next topic is finding the mean from a table. So we want to find the mean from this table. And remember to find the mean, we add up all the values and divide by the number of values. So we've got two five-year-olds, two six-year-olds, 
five seven-year-olds and one eight-year-old. So we could write down two five-year-olds, so five five, two six-year-olds, six six, five seven-year-olds, write those all out, you know, so seven, 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 and one eight-year-old. And then you could just add them all up manually, but these numbers might be quite, might be a bit larger. So let's find an easier way to do that. So we want to find the grand total. Now, this, if there's two five-year-olds, I add on this column called the FX column, and that stands for the frequency multiplied by whatever column this is. So if there's two five-year-olds, well, five plus five is 10, but another way to do that is just two times five, and two times five is 10. If there's two six-year-olds, we could do six plus six, but two times six is 12, so 12. If there's five seven-year-olds, well, five times seven is 35. And one eight-year-old, well, that's just gonna be one times eight is eight. So we find this column called the FX column, and it's found by multiplying the frequency by whatever the values are in the table. And then if we add that up, we will get the grand total, because we know that if there's two five-year-olds, that's 10 years. If there's two six-year-olds, that's another 12 years. If there's five seven-year-olds, that's another 35. And if you add those up, you'll get the grand total. And that's equal to 65. So if you added up all the ages, that would be 65. Now we need to divide that by how many people there were. Well, if we look at the frequencies and add those up, there's two, two, five, and one. So it's two five-year-olds, two six-year-olds, and so on. So two plus two is four, plus five is nine, plus one is 10. So altogether there was 10 people. So if we did the total, which is 65, divided by 10, that would tell us the mean age. So 65 divided by 10 would be 6.5. So the mean age is 6.5. Okay, our next topic. The next topic is to find the median from a table. So the median is the middle value. So if you look at this table, we're trying to find the middle value. So one way to do it is to arrange them all in order. So to write down two 18 year olds, we could write down two 18 year olds, three 19 year olds. We could write down 13 20 year olds and one 21 year old. So there we've got all the ages and then we want to find the median or the middle one. So we can then just work out the middle one. So. And as you can see, the median age is 20. So the median would be 20. So that's one way to do it, is to list down all the ages in one list and then just find the middle one. So another way to do it though, is we can consider the frequencies. Now altogether, we've got two people, three people, another 13 people and one person. So if you add those up, you'll find there's 19 people altogether. And if we were to line up 19 people, well, the median person would be the 10th person. And let's see why that would be. Well, if you had three people, one, two, three, the median is the middle one, which is the second person. And then you can find that by doing three plus one, which is four and half it is the second one. If you had five people, one, two, three, four, five, you could then add one, which is six people, and divide by two, which is then the third person. If you had, for instance, six people, one, two, three, four, five, six, you could add one, which would be seven, and divide by two is 3.5. And if you look, one, two, three, 0.5, that would be the median. So if you had 19 people, you could add one, which is 20, and, and divide by two, which would be the 10th person. And the 10th person, if you line these people up in order of age, the 10th person wouldn't be in here. There's only two 18 year olds. The 10th person wouldn't be here because there's only five so far. And the 10th person would definitely be in this group of people. So the 10th person would be 20 years old. So you can choose which way you want to do it. You could list out all the ages. Or you, so if they're values such as 18, 19, 20, 21, and so on, you could take the frequency, add one, and divide by two and that'll tell you the position of the median and then you could find it and it's up to you which approach you use. Okay, our next topic is to look at the combined mean. So to work out the combined mean, let's just make sure we know what the mean is. So the mean is found by adding up all the values and dividing by the number of values. So that's gonna be very useful. And what's also useful is if we know the mean is found by adding up all the numbers and dividing by the number of numbers, if we have the mean and multiply by the number of values, that will give us the grand total. So that's very useful as well. Okay, so our question says, there's 20 students in class A and 10 students in class B and they sit the same test. The mean test score for class A is 60 and the mean test score for class B is 40. And the question says, work out or calculate the mean test score for all 30 students. So we're going to do this question by considering if we know what the mean is for class A and we know how many students there are, we can find out the total number of marks received by class A, by the students in class A. So we know the mean score for class A is 60, and we know there's 20 students. So if we do 60 times 20, that gives us 1,200. That means there are 1,200 marks obtained by the students in class A altogether. That's the total number of marks scored. And if we divided that by 20, we get the mean score of 60. So that's the total for class A. Now let's get the total for class B. So their class average was 40, and there's 10 students. So if we multiply 40 by 10, that's 400. So that means in total, the 10 students in class B scored 400 points or 400 marks altogether.
So if we add together the 1,200 and the 400, that tells us how many marks were received by all 30 students altogether in this test. So 1,200 plus 400 is 1,600. Now we're trying to work out the mean score for these 30 students, so if we divide the grand total, the 1,600 by 30, we will get the mean test score for these 30 students. So 1,600 divided by 30 is equal to, that would be 53.33333, so on, or 53.3 reoccurring, or let's just round our answer to two decimal places, so 53.33, and that would be the mean test score to two decimal places. And that's it. So whenever we're working out the combined mean, it's very useful to be able to work out the grand total, and that can be found by taking the mean and multiplying it by how many people were involved with that mean, and that will tell you the total, and that will be very useful. And if you want to watch the video on this on Code Maths, it's 53A. And just remember, you do have that bumper pack of questions, that M2 practice booklet, which has loads of questions, and there'll be questions on that on the combined mean also. Okay, our next topic. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. Our next topic is called the estimated mean, and that's video 55 in Corporate Maths. It's one of my favourite topics, and we've been asked to work out an estimate for the mean age. So we've got a group of people, and we know that there's 9 people from 0 up to 10. We've got 13 people from 10 up to 20. We've got 16 people from 20 up to 30, and we've got 2 people from 30 up to 40. And we've been asked to work out the mean age. And remember, to work out the mean age, we add up all the ages, and we divide by the number of people. Let's actually start off by finding the number of people and to do that so we'll add up 9 13 16 and 2 and that's equal to 40 so we know there's 40 people now we want to add up their ages and divide by 40 the number of people but unfortunately we're not able to do that in this question because we don't actually know all their ages we've made this group frequency table to make the data a bit more easier to interpret but unfortunately we're not going to be able to work out the exact mean that's why the question says an estimate for the mean age okay so we've got nine people that have an age from 0 up to 10 we don't actually know their ages. They could be four, they could be eight, they could be they could all be nine year olds. We don't actually know. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose a fair age or a representative age for these people. Because they're from naught to ten, we're gonna use the midpoint, which is five years old. We're gonna add a column on called midpoint, and that will be the age that we're gonna use for these people. So for the naught to ten year olds, we're gonna pretend that they're five years old each. We're gonna pretend there's nine five year olds. We don't actually know their ages. That's the fairest thing to do. Now we've got 13 people with an age between 10 and 20. So let's pretend they're 15 years old. So let's use the midpoint of 15. And for 20 to 30, the midpoint would be 25. And for 30 to 40, the midpoint would be 35. We're going to imagine there's nine five-year-olds, there's 13 15-year-olds, there's 16 25-year-olds, and there's two to 35-year-olds. That's the, the best estimate we can do in this situation. So whenever you're doing this estimate of mean question, so you'll find the midpoint of each of these groups and you'll make a column for that. So now what we're going to do is, because we're imagining there's nine five-year-olds, rather than doing five plus five plus five nine times, what we're going to do is we're going to just do nine times five. So we're going to do nine times five, 13 times 15, 16 times 25, and two times 35. So that tells our estimate for the total ages of the nine people between 0 and 10, the 13 people between 10 and 20, and so on. So we'll call this column FX. And whenever you're doing the estimated mean question, you'll add on a column for midpoint, and you'll add on this FX column. And you'll times the midpoint by the frequencies, and that will tell you your FX column. So 5 times 9, or 9 times 5, is 45. 13 times 15 is 195. 16 times 25 is 400 and 2 times 35 is 70. So we've completed our FX column. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add those up to find our estimate for the grand total. So 45 plus 195 plus 400 plus 70 gives us a total of 710. So our estimate for the total of the ages would be 710. Now what we're going to do is we're going to divide that by the total frequency. So the grand total divided by the total frequency gives us our mean, our estimated mean. So 710 divided by 40 is equal to 17.75. So our estimated mean age is 17.75 years old. And that's it. So to find the estimated mean, you add a column on for the midpoint, you find the midpoint of all the categories, whatever that is, you put the midpoints down, you then multiply those by the frequencies, and that will tell us the FX column, and then you divide the total of the FX column, the grand total, or the estimated grand total, and you divide that by the total frequency, and that will be your estimated mean. 
sometimes we have grouped frequency tables, what we need to do is find the modal class interval. So remember the word modal, it's similar to mode, and that just means the most common class interval. So the most common class interval, well, we just look at the frequencies. So we can see that this category with 16 as the frequency is the most common. So that means that this is our modal class interval. So D is larger than or equal to 20, but less than 30, and that's it. So the modal class interval will be the class interval with the highest frequency. And if you want to recap that in Corporate Maths, it's video 56A. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is finding the class interval that contains the median. So here we've got a grouped frequency table with duration going from 0 up to 10, from 10 up to 20, 20 up to 30, and from 30 up to 40. And we've got the frequencies and all together, and if we add up these frequencies, there's 40 altogether. And we've been asked to find which class interval contains the median. So if we knew these 40 durations, and if we wrote them all out, we're asked which of these categories, from 0 to 10, from 10 to 20, from 20 up to 30, or from 30 up to 40, would the median lie in? Would it be in this category, this category, this category, and this or this category? Now straight away, I can see this is not going to be in the first category, because there's 40 altogether. And so because there's 40 altogether, if we divide 40 by 2, that gives us a rough idea as to where the median would be. So 40 divided by 2 is the 20th. So the median would be roughly the 20th value. And because this is group data and we don't actually know the actual numbers, we may as well just use that 20th value. Now, strictly speaking, if we knew all the values and we could write them all out in those 40 numbers, we would do 40 plus 1, which is 41. And we would divide that by 2. 41 divided by 2 is equal to the 20.5th value. So if you had 40 people and you lined them all up and we wanted to find the median, the median would really be the 20.5th value. But for grouped frequency tables where you don't actually know the values anyway, where it's just nine people in between these values, 13 in here and so on, we can just divide this frequency by two. So that's the 20th and find where the 20th one is. So normally in a question like this, the 20th and the 20.5th value will be in the same category anyway, just to make sure that, you know, whenever they're making the questions that, you know, you don't have a, a sort of a difference so that if students went for this value or if students went for the 20th one, they would design the question so they'd be in the same category anyway. And let's just see if that's the case. So here we've got nine people in the first category. Now we're looking for the 20th one. It's not going to be in there because that's a, there's only nine people there. Now we've got another 13. Well, 9 plus 13 is 22. So up to the end of this category, there's 22 people. That means if you were to line up those people, someone in this category would be the median, or it would be either the 20th or the 20.5 value. And as you can see, that means that both of them would be in this category. So the question says, which class interval contains the median? Well, it's going to be this class interval, 10, which is less than or equal to D, which is less than 20. And that's it. Okay, so our next topic is frequency polygons, and along with stem and leaf diagrams, frequency polygon is the only other topic where there's a bit of difference between the exam boards, where Edexcel says you should know frequency polygons, whereas AQA and OCR don't mention frequency polygons. So if you're studying for Edexcel, you're going to have to watch this section. Uh, it should take a minute or two. Um, if you're studying for AQA and OCR, you may want to skip on, but then again, it's only a minute or two, so I'd probably watch it anyway just to see what frequency polygons are, and they're not that complicated. So let's have a look at frequency polygons. That's videos 155. 156 in Corbett Mavs. So here we've got a table and we've got time, not to 20 minutes, 20 to 40 minutes, 40 to 60 minutes, 60 to 80 minutes, and 80 to 100 minutes. And we've been given some frequencies for them. So there's five times that are between 0 and 20 minutes, 11 times between 20 and 40, and so on. So to draw a frequency polygon, what we're going to do is we're going to plot the frequencies in the midpoints of each of the categories. So if we've got 0 to 20 minutes, we're going to go to 10 minutes, and then we're going to go up to 5. So we're going to go 10 minutes and up to 5. Next, between 20 and 40 minutes, well, 30 minutes is in the middle, that's the midpoint, so we're going to go 30 across and 11 up, so 30 across and 11 up. Now, whenever you're dealing with how far up to go, make sure you know the scale. So if we have a look, there's 10 boxes for 5, that means each little box is 0.5 here. So we're going to go 30 across, we're going to go up to 10, and then we're going to go up two more boxes to get to 11, so we're going to go to there. Now, our next one, we've got between 40 and 60, so it's going to be 50 across and 20 up, so 50 across and 20 up. Next, we've got between 60 and 80, so that's going to be 70 across and 15 up, so 70 across and 15 up. And finally, we've got between 80 and 100, that's going to be 90 across and 9 up, so 90 across and then 9 up would be, well, we've got 10 here, each little box is 0 0.5, so we want to go down 2, and then that would be there. So we've plotted our points, now what we're going to do is get a ruler and our pencil, and we're going to join them up, so like so. 
And that's it, that's our frequency polygon. One thing to note is not to join up the first point and the last point, you're only joining up the consecutive points. So you join up the first one to the second, the second to the third, the third to the fourth, and the fourth to the fifth. So it's a frequency polygon like so, don't join up these points. And that's it. And another thing you can be asked to do with frequency polygons is to compare them. So this could be the times for class A. We could also have on the same grid of another frequency polygon for class B. And you could have a look at them and compare them and see you know, which class was faster whenever you look at their frequency polygons. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So we're going to look at Venn diagrams now, and that would be 380 and corporate maths. And the question says, 90 people were asked if they liked three drinks. So we've got drink A, drink B, and drink C. And 11 people liked all three drinks. So let's put that on the Venn diagram. They like all three drinks, so it's going to be 11 people in the middle. Eight people liked drinks A and B, but not C. So they like A and B. So they're going to be in the middle of A and B, so here, but not C, so it's going to be here. Eight people like drinks A and B, so they're in those circles, but they're not in the C circle, so that's there. Next, 17 people like drinks A and C, so A and C would be here, but not B, so that means that 17 people will go in there. And nine people like drinks B and C, so they like drinks B and C, but not A, so that means that's going to go there. We're also told that four people only like drink B, so four people, only four people like drink B. And we're told that 50 people like drink A, so that means that the whole circle here for A will be 50. So if we add up the numbers we know in this circle for A, we've got 17 plus 11, that's 28, plus another 8 is equal to 36. So that means that 14 people must go there. And three people did not like any drink, so they're going to go outside. And we've been asked to complete the Venn diagram, so we've done most of it, and there's just one missing number here. Now we're told that 90 people were surveyed, so if we take all these numbers away from 90, we'll see what number must go here. And when we take away all these numbers away from 90, we're left with 24. So that means there must be 24 people in here. So we've completed our Venn diagram. So in M2 or M3 or M4, you may encounter a Venn diagram with three circles. Okay, so we've looked at a Venn diagram question whenever we're dealing with a wordy situation. Now let's have a look at some notation that you may encounter whenever you're looking at Venn diagrams. So here we've got a Venn diagram. So we've got A and B, and as you can see, here's A, here's B. This is the section where they overlap, and this is the section that is neither in A nor B. And then this is the universal set, which is the whole rectangle. And you've got A, and A, if you've been asked to shade A, that would be inside of A. If we're asked to shade B, that'll be inside of B there. Then next, we've got this A with a little dash above it. That means the complement of A. And the complement of A means not A. It means anything that's not A. So if you have a look here, whenever we shade it in, it's going to be anything that's not in A. So A dash means not A, or the complement of A. And that means anything that's not A. And then here, if we've got B dash, that means the complement of B, or not B. So it's anything outside of B. So that's A, B, a dash, which means the complement of A, which is anything that's not A. We've got B dash, which is the complement of B, which is not B. Now we've got A, and then this symbol, B. And this is A union B. And that means A or B. It means anything that's in A or B, anything at all. And that means that it would be this region here, anything that's in A or B, because it's A union B, A or B. Now we've got A, and then this symbol, B. And that means A intersect B. And that means A and B, so it's the region that's in A and it's in B. So that's the overlap region in the middle. So this is the court mouse revision card. It's very useful and it's very important to know this notation that A is inside of A, B is inside of B, A dash means the complement of A, so it means not A, and B dash means the complement of B, so it means anything that's not in B. A union B means anything in A or B, anything at all that's in A or B, and A intersect B means A and B, it means anything that's in that middle region, that overlap, and that's it. Okay, let's have a look at a question now where we're dealing with that notation. Okay, so here's a Venn Diagrams question, and we've got the symbol as well, and this symbol means the universal set, and we've got the universal set, so that's all the numbers that we're going to put in the Venn Diagram are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And we're told that the numbers inside of A are 2, 5, 7, and 8, and the numbers inside of B are 2, 4, and 9. And we've been asked to complete the Venn Diagram. So whenever I'm completing a Venn diagram like this, the first thing I would do is look and see what numbers are going to be in the middle. So in other words, what numbers are in A and in B. And if we have a look here, 2 is in both of them, A and B. So we're going to put a 2 in the middle. And then we've got no other numbers. So that means let's put the rest of the numbers in A, in A side. So that's going to be 5, 7, and 8. And if we look at B, B has got 2, 4, 9. So that's 2, 4, 
and 9. So if we look in A, we've got 2, 5, 7, and 8. And in B, we've got 2, 4, and 9. Now we're going to put the rest of the numbers outside of A and B because the rest of the numbers are in the Venn diagram, but they're not in A or B. So that's going to be 1. We've done 2. We've then got 3, 4, 5. Then we've got 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So we've completed our Venn diagram. And let's just check. We should have 10 numbers in this diagram. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we've, been asked to complete, so we've completed the Venn diagram. We've done part A. And then we're told a number is chosen at random. So one of these numbers is going to be chosen at random. And we've been asked to find the probability of A intersect B. So in other words, that's A and B. So it's any number that's in A and B. So if we look, that's going to be the region here. So we want to find the probability of choosing a number that's in this region. Well, there's 10 numbers all together. So we're going to put 10 on the denominator. And there's only one number in A intersect B in this region in the middle. So the probability of choosing this number would be 1 out of 10 or 1 tenth. Okay, next question, part C. Part C says find the probability that the number chosen at random is in A union B. In other words, it's in A or B. So that means it's anywhere inside of A or B or both any of these numbers at all. So if we have a look, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six numbers in A or B. So it's going to be six. And then there's 10 numbers all together. So the probability of choosing a number in A or B, in A union B, would be six out of 10 or six tenths. So the probability would be six tenths. Or if you wanted to simplify, that would be three fifths. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is called tree diagrams. And it's a probability topic. And a tree diagram is a really useful way of showing what can happen whenever two or more events take place. And it's video 252 in Corbin Maths. This is a very important topic. So I highly recommend you watch that video and try the practice questions as well. So let's have a look at our questions. Our question says, John and Dan are taking it in turns to throw a ball at a target. So we've got two different events. John's going to throw the ball at the target, and then Dan's going to throw the ball at the target. And what's great is this diagram will show us all the possible outcomes of what can happen. And we've been given some probabilities. So we've been given the probability that John hits the target is 0.6, and the probability that Dan hits the target is 0.7. Now before we get started, let's actually label the probabilities on the diagrams. Now the probability that John hits the target is 0.6. So let's work out the probability that John misses the target. Now it's certain that he does one of these two things. He's either going to hit it or he misses it. That means these two probabilities need to add together to be equal to 1. So if we want to work out this missing number, we're going to do 1 take away 0.6 and that would be 0.4. So these two probabilities we need to add together to give us 1. Okay, now we've got Dan throwing the ball at the target. Well, he can hit the target, which is 0.7. So the probability that Dan misses the target is 0.3. And below for Dan again, we've got 0.7 is the probability that he hits the target, or 0.3 is the probability that he misses the target. Okay, so we've now got our tree diagram with our probabilities labelled on it. Now let's consider the outcomes of John throwing the ball and then Dan throwing the ball. Well, if we go along the branches, we can find out all the possible outcomes, and that's the great thing about a tree diagram. So let's start here, and John throws the ball and he can hit it, and then Dan can hit it. So we've got a hit and a hit, hit and a hit. So that's a hit and then a hit. Then we could have John hits the target and Dan misses the target, so that would be a hit and a miss. So that's a hit and a miss. Now if we go down this way, John could actually miss the target, and then Dan could hit the target, so that would be a miss and a hit. And finally, John could miss the target, and Dan could miss the target, so that would be a miss and a miss. So we've got all the possible outcomes here. We've got a hit hit, hit miss, miss hit, and a miss miss. And what's fantastic is we can use the probabilities we've been given in the question to work out the probabilities of a hit hit hit, miss, miss, hit, and miss, miss really easily. And all we do is multiply the numbers along the branches. So if we wanted to work out the probability of John hitting the target and Dan hitting the target, because it's and, what we do is we multiply the properties together. So we're going to do 0.6 multiplied by 0.7. So we go along the branches and we do 0.6 multiplied by 0.7. So let's write that down. 0.6 multiplied by 0.7 is equal to 0.42. So the probability of John hitting the target and Dan hitting the target, the hit hit, would be 0.42. Next, let's work out the probability of John hitting and Dan missing, so a hit miss. So that would be 0.6 multiplied by 0.3. So 0.6 multiplied by 0.3 would be 0.18. Next, we could have John missing and Dan hitting, so that would be 0.4 multiplied by 0.7. So 0.4 multiplied by 0.7, and that'll be equal to 0.28. And finally, we've got a miss miss, so that's John missing and Dan missing. So that would be 0.4 multiplied by 0.3. So 0.4 multiplied by 0.3 would be equal to 0.12. And what's great is if we add these properties together, 0.42, 0.18, that's 0.6, plus 0.28, that's 0.88, and then plus 0.12, that gives us 1. 
because obviously one of these four things will have to happen either hit 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 miss miss hit or miss miss okay so let's go to our question so our question says what is the probability that at least one man hits the target so at least one man hits the target which means either one of them could hit it or both of them could hit it so hit hit that would work hit miss yep one of them's hitting the target that would work miss hit yep one of them's hitting it that would work but miss miss wouldn't work so that means we're interested in this probability, this probability, and this probability. And we want to find the probability that either it's a hit hit, or a hit miss, or a miss hit. So if we add these three probabilities together, we will find the probability that at least one man hits the target. So we could do 0 0.42 plus 0.18 plus 0.28. And when we do that, we get 0.88. So the probability that at least one man hits the target would be 0.88. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at our next topic. So our next topic is reading tables, and sometimes you might be given a table, and you might be told to find some information from that table. And if you want to practice reading tables, it's 387 on Corporate Maths. So here we've got a table, and we've got some caravans, a luxury one, a basic one, a family one, and a comfort one. And it tells you how many people they sleep. So the luxury sleep six, the basic four, the family one six, and the comfort one four. So it then tells us which caravans have cots in them, so the basic and the family one. It tells us which ones have decking, so the luxury and the comfort. And it tells us which ones have barbecues, so the luxury, the family, and the comfort. And then we're given the price to hire that caravan. And the first question says, which caravan sleeps four people and costs more than 300 pound? So let's look at the caravans that sleep four people. So we've got basic here and we've got comfort here. And the question says more than 300 pounds. So we've either got basic or comfort. And the basic one costs 290 pound and the comfort one costs 325 pound. So which caravan that sleeps exactly four people and costs more than 300 pound? That's gonna be the comfort caravan, so comfort. Okay, the next question, which caravans do not have decking? So the ones that do have decking are the luxury and the comfort caravan. But the basic and the family caravans do not have decking because they're not ticked. So it would be basic. So it would be basic and family. Now, samples can be very, very useful. Rather than surveying or interviewing everybody, for instance, in a school, if you wanted to find information about what color blazer you would like, rather than asking every single student, it can be very useful. And that's called a census, asking everybody in a population. Rather than a census, you can do a sample where you ask a smaller number of people. But it's very important whenever you do samples, they're fair. So, for instance, if I was doing a survey of students about blazers, it's making sure that you ask people from different year groups, you ask a range of different classes. So it's very important that you get a good sample, a fair sample, to make sure that your sample is representative of the whole population. But here we've got a question, and it says 480 students attend a school, and a teacher asks 50 students which color blazer they would like. So we've got black, 20 students would like a black blazer, 15 students want a navy blazer, nine students want a green blazer, and six students want a maroon blazer. And the question says, estimate, how many of the 480 students would like a navy blazer? Now, altogether, we knew there was 50 students altogether, and we want to work out an estimate for how many students would like a navy blazer. Now, if I look at the sample, we know that 15 out of the 50 wanted navy. Now, if we work out 15 over 50 as a fraction, that's equal to three tenths. So that means that three tenths of the students asked would want a navy blazer. Now, if this was a good sample, a representative sample, that means that it should be the same fraction of the whole school would want a navy blazer. So if we work out three temps of all the students in the school, we'll find out how many should want a navy blazer. So if we work out three temps of 480, that will tell us a good estimate. So we'll do 480 divided by 10, that's equal to 48, and then we'll do 48 multiplied by three, and that's equal to 144. So that's it. If we were asked how many of the 480 students would like a black blazer, we would have done 20 over 50, which is two fifths, and then work out two fifths of the 480 and so on. And that's it. So that has been the whole of the GCSE Foundation Maths course for LXL, AQA and OCR. So I've gone through every single topic. I know I said I would spend two or three minutes going through each of them. So some of them maybe have been a bit longer than that and some of them a bit shorter. But that's been a eight hours of going through all of those topics. I hope you found it useful. I hope you've watched it in chunks and you haven't just watched all eight hours in one go. We went through the number topics to begin with. We then went through the shape, space and measures topics or the geometry topics. We then went through the algebra topics and we then went through the statistics or the probability topics. So that has been the whole of the GCSE Foundation Maths course for edXL, AQA and OCR. And as I said, there's only very subtle differences around stem and leaf and frequency polygons. 
And that's it. So if there are any topics that you need a bit of extra help on, so as you've been watching this video, if you've identified a few that you need to go through, if you go to corpmaths.com, you can watch the video tutorial on that topic. So for instance, if you needed some extra help on Venn diagrams, you could go to video 380 and watch that video tutorial to help you on Venn diagrams. And then there's the practice questions and the textbook exercises as well to help you. Also, remember, as you've been going through this video, there has been that ultimate GCSE foundation revision question booklet. Catch your title, I know. That booklet, as you've been going through the video and watching the video, there has been a question on every single topic as you've gone through. Um, so that booklet may have been useful for you, and you've got the, the answers there. So if you scan the QR code, that'll bring you straight to the answers. If you haven't tried that booklet, it may be a good idea now to have a go at that booklet. Also in this video, there's been lots of references to the Code Miles revision cards. The GCSE Foundation revision cards would be a fantastic tool to support you as you study for your GCSE Mavs, your Foundation Mavs. Um, so there's a link to them in the description below. Also, there's the five a day booklet. So that little and often approach to your revision be really useful. And for Foundation, I'd highly recommend the Orange, the Foundation books, and the Yellow Foundation Plus books. And this has been the Corporate Maths Ultimate GCSE Foundation Revision video. I really, really hope you find this video useful. It's taken a lot of time and effort to make this video, so I really hope you found it useful. If you have found it useful, could you please like it? Could you please subscribe to your YouTube channel as well? And maybe could you share this video with your friends because then maybe they might find it useful as well. And um, the video has been quite long. It was about eight hours long, but it's gone through every single topic of the GCSE Foundation course for AQA, Edexcel, and OCR. The whole aim of the video has been to make sure you're familiar and confident with those topics. So I really hope that it's it's done that. Thank you so much for watching. Good luck with your studies. Good luck with your exams and all the very best. Cheers. Bye.